Welcome. This video is a long time in the making and we're really excited to present it. Today, we're diving deep into the mysterious and strange world of the homunculus, a being that has captivated the minds of alchemists, mystics, and philosophers for centuries. It has been referenced throughout history by several reputable historical figures of science such as Paracelsus and John Dee. But is this simply a made-up story? The homunculus was said to be a tiny, fully formed human created through mystical and or alchemical means. But the question is, was the homunculus ever more than just a myth? Was it only possible to create tiny humans? What was this process of creating this supposed miniature man? Or could this even be a reference to some type of ancient form of cloning or artificial reproduction for full-sized humans? The ancients were known to be curious about the secrets of life in the natural world. Could it be that they had devised a method to artificially create humans without the need for sexual intercourse? An early form of a test tube baby that could lead to the creation of a human being. Keep that question in mind as we continue to explore. I want to give a big shout out to Juan from the Juan on Juan podcast. He sent me some books and a bunch of notes that really assisted us in creating this video and I really couldn't have created the video without him. He's the guy that knew the most about homunculus in the community, so definitely go check him out on Instagram, YouTube, and just go show him some love. Also, before we start, make sure you check out the Cabbage Patch video series playlist as it connects with everything we will be discussing. And this video is a continuation of the series. With that, enjoy the show. Warning, what you're about to watch is the most insane video you'll ever see. Now is your chance to turn back. Most people in the modern day are very familiar with the concept of a homunculus. A tiny artificial man created in a jar. It's one of the most searched terms on Google, and in 2016, the term was revived due to viral videos under a Russian YouTuber who insisted he had discovered the method of creating a homunculus. These videos convinced millions, but it wasn't long until they were proven to be fakes. This ended up with the term losing credibility and leading many to believe that this entire subject is just a joke. The idea of the homunculus in the scientific community in the modern day has been denounced as the mere fantasies or imagination of medieval writers in the 17th century. Yet, these mainstream historians are not willing to explore some areas of thoughts on this topic, specifically esoteric secrets as it is outside their expertise where this knowledge delves into the science and art of the alchemist. Alchemy is the foundation of modern science, so it's important for one to take the subject seriously, especially when we can read what the scientists of that time actually wrote on the subject. We must remember as we begin to dive into this material that the term homunculus may have dual-fold meaning, meaning that it's not so singular in its definition and may have multiple layered meanings. We know the homunculus is Latin for little person, culus meaning little and homo for man or mankind. Interestingly, the origins of the word go back to Proto-Indian European term dogoman, meaning of the earth, similar to the old Irish ndena. This connects to the clay references that we will see later as the homunculus is also said to be depicted as small statues made out of clay. One of the earliest historical references to the concept of the homunculus is found in the work of the ancient Greek philosopher Aristotle. He explored the notion of abiogenesis, or the idea that living organisms could emerge directly from non-living materials. 
this is referenced to as spontaneous generation. In his work, De Generation Animalium, Aristotle examined the belief that certain life forms like mice and maggots could spontaneously arise from inanimate substances such as soil or grains. It gets really interesting because many if not all the ancient Greek philosophers believed in a form of this abiogenesis or spontaneous generation. This was based off an ancient biological science known as preformationism. Preformationism states that organisms develop from miniature versions of themselves. It's important to note that preformationists believe that the form of the living thing exists prior to their development. We'll connect this later. Also, Pythagoras is credited as one of the earliest thinkers to explain the origin of form in biological production, suggesting that the father contributes the essential characteristics of the offspring, while mothers contribute only a material substrate. It's important to note the similarity between supposed ancient Greek Neoplatonic thought and the magical systems used by the alchemist. The question is, were the Greek philosophers secretly alchemists in discussing a different type of biological production? This will all be brought to question. Spontaneous generation can be found in ancient works by revered poets like Ovid. In Ovid's Metamorphosis, he describes the creation of life through alchemical elements, the earth, the air, and water, bringing forth suggesting that living organisms originated from inanimate elements when combined with fire. Another ancient Greek author on the subject is Anaximander, who believed that life originated from a primordial mixture of earth and water and that simpler organisms emerged first, followed by more complex life forms. This arguably is the precursor to modern evolution as Anaximander suggested that humans initially arose from a different type of animal, possibly a fish or fish-like creature, and that the early human ancestors underwent a process of gradual development and adaptation to life on land. The key difference other than natural selection being Anaximander believed in a primordial mixture in the concept of spontaneous creation. There are other authors who speak on this. Interestingly, the Greek philosopher Empedocles, who lived in the 5th century BC, proposed that heavy rainfall mixing with the earth would become fertile and spontaneously generate various life forms. He believed that the combination of water and earth produced a wide range of organisms, including insects and other small creatures. The idea is that these ancient authors, including Aristotle himself, were just simply mistaken, according to these mainstream historians. Interestingly, in Homer's Iliad, there's a section in Book 19 where it discusses a body being defiled by flies and the possibility that worms would come from them digging into the wounds. What this shows is that they were well aware of the life cycle of a fly, so Obviously, they were discussing some other matter here when it comes to the spontaneous creation of other animals such as mice and frogs. They knew about the fly life cycle, but it would take over 2,000 years from this first reference to supposedly debunk spontaneous generation? I'm not so sure if I buy that whole story. Before we get into the details of the homunculus, it's important to understand that there was an entire debate on this subject. This is a matter that had already been discussed for thousands of years and then took hundreds of years of debate. But even in the mid 1800s, when Darwin published On the Origin of Species, his entire theory depended on spontaneous generation, or as Thomas Huxley termed it, a biogenesis. According to the skeptics, the late 1600s experiment by Francesco Reddy supposedly debunks the notion of spontaneous generation entirely. This really isn't a fair argument as it's debatable whether or not this experiment completely debunks spontaneous generation as a whole. First, it is important to note that Reddy was a Jesuit with a mission to debunk spontaneous generation, a belief that was widely held at that time. And interestingly, during the 17th century, around the same time as Reddy's experiment, the concept of the homunculus began to fade from the mainstream scientific discourse. Reddy is often considered a turning point in disproving the theory of spontaneous generation. But the subject of spontaneous generation is not limited to simply flies and worms. 1. It was an experimental design, and it really was not comprehensive enough to fully debunk spontaneous generation in its entirety. Yet, it is constantly referenced in that manner. It is possible to argue that this experimental design did not account for all the possible scenarios. 2. 
There are numerous historical references to spontaneous generation from respected figures such as many Greek philosophers and even Roman poets, yet they were aware of the life cycle of the fly? 3. It really is a subjective interpretation of the outcome of the experiment and could be argued flawed completely. For example, the reason the maggots did not form in the sealed jars is because the necessary conditions for their formations were just not met. In many cases, the instructions for spontaneous generation are cryptic and ritualistic in nature. Who's to say he performed the ritual correctly? These experiments were in the late 1660s. It is an important experiment to note, as it initiated further scientific study, but of course, that's just the mainstream narrative. Ironically, modern mainstream historians scoff at the idea of spontaneous generation, but in many cases, they are willing to consider alternative sci-fi ideas such as panspermia that suggest life could have originated from extraterrestrial sources, which could be considered a type of spontaneous generation. This presents an intriguing point for consideration, as there appear to be some contradictions within the mainstream explanation. The prevailing view is that alchemy began to fade following Reddy's experiments in the increasing prominence of research using modern scientific methods. Supposedly, these experiments started to challenge the ideas held by alchemists a few centuries prior during the Renaissance. However, this time period was also known as the Enlightenment. So which is it? Were the alchemists simply misguided? The situation seems paradoxical because even after alchemy had begun to fade from mainstream science, prominent scientists in the 1700s, such as Isaac Newton, remained interested in alchemy as if it were a lost secret knowledge awaiting rediscovery. Why was Newton studying alchemy even hundreds of years after it declined in scientific thought? He would even correspond with Robert Boyle, the first chemist and one of the founders of modern chemistry, discussing the subject of alchemy and secrecy. Not only did they keep their interests secret, but it also became their life's work. Newton was the president of the Royal Society for over 20 years. That's a pretty big deal, and although there isn't any specific proof that Newton was a Freemason, there are many arguments that support that he could have indeed been connected or associated with a secret order of some kind. I mean, the Royal Society itself, as well as the foundation of modern science, was influenced by masonry, so it's a pretty fair question. Now as we progress, we'll be taking a look into the history of secret societies and the use of cryptic occult symbolism. This will assist in understanding how some of this information may have been lost or suppressed over time. The Royal Society was founded by Robert Boyle, who we know was deeply associated with alchemy, and by another figure named Christopher Wren, the famous English architect responsible for rebuilding 52 churches after the Great Fire of, oh, what a coincidence, 1666. Which, that's a whole story of its own on how it was possibly a setup by the Masons. Forgetting all that, it's well established that Christopher Wren was a Freemason, therefore, what we're looking at with this revival of alchemy is that during this later time period of the early 1700s, knowledge from a previous generation of elite brotherhoods were lost and discussed between the higher echelons of society. In this case, the scientific elite of the later enlightenment period were attempting to rediscover or preserve the secret of the sciences of earlier brotherhoods. So, some people are willing to believe that in the present day, that aliens have the ability to clone and we've seen this in many movies many times, or that the government is secretly cloning individuals and that there are hidden underground cloning laboratories. Whether this is true or not, if you're willing to consider such possibilities in the modern time, well, it's only fair to consider that similar activities may have occurred in the past as well. Cloning? This could have been the most closely guarded secret of the esoteric societies, which were controlled by the royal elite families during that time. Of course, some may argue that this is because we possess a different technology and scientific understanding today. However, that argument originates from a perspective fed to us by these royal societies, Rosicrucians, Jesuits, and Freemasonic brothers, or the 17th century scientists unveiling new scientific advancements and technological progressions. But many of these scientists and their findings are funded by these royal elite institutions which can be clearly identified through their coat of arms. Even if we trust the mainstream narrative and the level of technology presented for each age, we should always consider that the highest forms of technology would be guarded by the elite of its time. For example, something like the Ark of the Covenant. 
Perhaps the science didn't involve or depend on the need for modern machinery or electronics, but instead, it was an advanced occult art whose technique had been guarded for ages. The homunculus can essentially be divided into multi-layered definitions because it simply does not refer to one thing. This will be clear as we progress. The ancient practice of creating a homunculus far precedes alchemy, but we'll highlight that the subject of the homunculus is deeply integrated with the deepest secrets of the alchemical and hermetic tradition. Many have interpreted the Philosopher's Stone as simply a means for creating gold from base metals, but the bigger secret is that the Philosopher's Stone was used for creating artificial life. The homunculus represents far more than just a tiny man or creature created in a jar. One, it refers to a secret ancient art and knowledge of generation in combination with alchemy or the capturing and moving of souls. Two, a secret occult double, a double body, another vehicle for consciousness. Three, the capturing of a soul into a non-living object. Four, esoteric secrets, which we'll get to towards the end. There is much to cover, and every definition will be explained. But this is a huge subject because the homunculus embodies humanity's quest for forbidden knowledge and our curiosity to uncover the mysteries of life. Many different subjects connect especially when we connect it with an understanding of alternative history, false timelines, and other subjects we have covered in the past. In this investigation of the homunculus, we will cover some of the most prominent subjects associated with this concept shedding light on their historical significance and impact on the development of modern science. We will focus on the contributions of several influential scientists who were captivated by the mysteries of the homunculus and the principles of alchemy, and how their work significantly shaped the course of scientific inquiry. I'm sure that most of you have heard about John D, or the real 007, the advisor to Queen Elizabeth I, who was also known for his heavy association with the cult attempting to communicate with angels using an Enochian language, which he claimed was used by supernatural beings. He was deeply interested in alchemy and amassed a massive library of alchemical text for his studies. He's a very interesting figure because it shows the connection between the governments or elites at their time and how the courts were filled with high-ranking figures well-versed in alchemy and the occult. He is claimed to be the founder of the Rosicrucian Order, a secret society preceding the Masons said to be founded around this time period, but it's very likely that they're a secret ancient Catholic order, and we will show this later, but it can indeed be quite shocking as the Rosicrucians are typically associated with Protestants after the 1600s, but there is more to that story, much more to connect when it comes to secret societies, their ancestry, and their relation to this knowledge. The Rosicrucians were fascinated with alchemy, hermeticism, and blended these ideas with Christian motifs. Some say that there's no evidence to suggest that Dee was a Rosicrucian, but Dee's writings were responsible for an occult revolution in Europe. But the question is, did this interest in alchemy and the homunculus really all start in the early 17th century, or does this tradition go back from before the creation of religion? Well, there's much more to that story, and there were many other prominent figures from that time period who not only had a massive impact on science and history, but were deeply associated with secret societies. We have an entire section where we dive into the Elizabethan era later and explore his other associates. It would be a great task to cover occult philosophy in its entirety, but it may be important to note for a moment some key points. Hermeticism, an ancient philosophical and spiritual tradition, traces its roots back to the legendary figure Hermes Trismegistus. Often described as the founder of the tradition, Hermes is believed to have authored the Emerald Tablets, a collection of texts that laid the foundation for Hermetic philosophy. These teachings, which have persisted for centuries, delve into the concepts of duality, the union of opposites, and androgynous symbols. At the core of Hermeticism lies the Emerald Tablets, a series of writings that outline the key tenets of the philosophy. Among these principles is the idea of the union of opposites that suggests that everything in existence possess a dual nature. This concept of duality is further explored through the symbolism of the sun and moon, which represent positive and negative forces respectively. In addition to the notion of duality, Hermeticism also encompasses androgynous symbols, signifying the perfect balance between masculine and feminine energies. This union is often depicted through the marriage of the sun and moon, embodying the harmony of opposing forces. 
Hermes Trismegistus is said to be the messenger of the gods and can be traced back to Thoth, who was believed to be an Atlantean. This ancient ancestry links Hermeticism to a lineage of knowledge that dates back thousands of years. During the medieval ages in the 1600s, Hermeticism gained prominence among scientists and thinkers who were intrigued by its ancient wisdom. The teachings of Hermes Trismegistus were passed around and studied, fueling a revival of interest in the Hermetic tradition. This resurgence of Hermeticism had a significant impact on various fields, including alchemy and the exploration of the homunculus. The homunculus embodies the Hermetic principle of the union of opposites, illustrating how the fusion of opposing forces can give rise to new life. Even the origin of the term hermetically sealed, or the process of creating an airtight container, which was crucial to the progression of the scientific enlightenment, can also be traced back to Hermes. We're going to see a lot of three symbolism in this video, as Hermes Trismegistus means thrice greatest Hermes. This figure was believed to be the divine scribe, credited with authoring the sacred hermetic works that explored both the material world and the pursuit of spiritual perfection alchemist, or the leading scientist of their time, were deeply interested in these subjects, and they adopted Hermes Trismegistus as their patron. Another aspect to consider is the Mandrake, as interestingly, it's brought up many times during this period, but this lore, although not exactly the same as the homunculus, is definitely connected and most of us are well aware of this plant. But the Mandrake has been associated with this concept of the homunculus and according to the occult tradition and alchemical philosophy, the mandrake acts as a homunculus and can be sealed in a bottle to serve or represent the magician themselves. It is also said to have hallucinogenic and supernatural properties. If uprooted, it would scream, killing anyone who heard it. This is very similar to another story we'll hear later. It also seems that this has alchemical applications in the forms of potions and spells in that the power of the mandrake extended beyond ingesting it. To use it as a fertility aid, the root could be placed under a person's pillow, or it could be kept close to someone ill to treat their condition. In the film Pan's Labyrinth, for example, the heroine places the root in a saucer of milk under her sick mother's bed. Roots were sometimes carved to enhance their human form, and could be carried on the person as a charm or talisman, not only to help with conception, but to help find love and bring good fortune. It has a long history of medicinal use, and one of the oldest and most common uses was a fertility aid. In Genesis, the first book of the Old Testament, Jacob's wives, the sister, Leah and Rachel, compete to provide him with children with the help of a mandrake. In the first century, the ancient Greek physician and botanist Padanius Dioscorides noted the human-like form of the mandrake's roots and indicated its use as an anesthetic for surgical procedures such as amputation. The golem is also connected with this. There are some differences, but it's important that we cover it. A golem is an anthropomorphic being crafted from lifeless materials like clay or mud and is brought to life through ritual incantations and sequences of Hebrew letters. In many golem stories, the creature serves as a helper, companion, or savior of an endangered Jewish community. However, in some tales, the golem spirals out of control and becomes a threat to its creator. The most renowned golem legend takes place in Prague and features the scholarly Rabbi Lo. The first practical instructions for creating a golem can be found in medieval commentaries on the Sefer Yetzirah. It is believed that fashioning a golem was a means for medieval Jewish mystics to draw closer to God. The story of the golem of Prague is set in the late 16th century during the reign of Emperor Rudolf II. At this time, the Jewish community in Prague was under threat due to anti-Semitic attacks and accusations of blood libel. Rabbi Lo, a respected leader and scholar, sought to protect the Jewish community from these threats. According to the legend, Rabbi Lo created the golem using clay from the banks of the Vitava River. He then performed a series of rituals, including the use of divine names, to bring the golem to life. The golem, named Yosel, was tasked with protecting the Jewish community from harm. Yosel, the Golem of Prague, was said to be immensely strong and able to turn invisible. It patrolled the streets of the Jewish ghetto at night, protecting its inhabitants from anti-Semitic attackers and even foiling blood libel plots. However, the Golem could not speak and eventually became uncontrollable, leading Rabbi Lo to deactivate it. 
The golem is brought to life by inscribing Hebrew words on its forehead, such as the word emet, which means truth in Hebrew. To deactivate the golem, one could remove the aleph in a met, changing the inscription from truth to death. Met, meaning dead. The history of the golem reaches back to early Judaism. In the Talmud, Adam is initially created as a golem when his dust is kneaded into a shapeless husk. Just like Adam, all golems are created from mud by those close to divinity, but no anthropogenic golem is fully human. Essentially, it is a story of the magical power of the Hebrew language. Its origins can be traced back to the Sefer Yetzera, which is a book attributed to the biblical Abraham. Medieval commenters on the Sefer Yetzera have even believed that Abraham and Jeremiah were able to utilize the knowledge within the book to create, quote, living beings. The fact that Abraham was aware of these methods of creating artificial life will be relevant later in the video. Albertus Magnus, sometimes referred to as Albert the Great or Saint Albert, was a German Dominican friar, bishop, philosopher, theologian, and scientist. He was born in Lauingen, Swabia, present day Germany, and was a well known figure in the intellectual and spiritual spheres of the 13th century. Albertus Magnus was a prolific writer. His works covered a wide range of topics, including logic, metaphysics, ethics, natural sciences, and theology. He was a key figure in the development of scholasticism, a philosophical and theological system that sought to reconcile faith and reason by integrating Aristotelian philosophy with Christian theology. Albertus Magnus is also linked to a very mysterious piece of ancient technology, the brazen head. This mysterious head supposedly made of brass or bronze was believed to answer any question and provide wisdom to its creator. Some say Albertus Magnus was its creator and others claim it was the creation of Franciscan friar Roger Bacon. Legend has it that Bacon built the brazen head to help him in the pursuit of knowledge and to uncover the universe's secrets. Sadly, the brazen head was destroyed when Bacon didn't listen to its advice, causing the loss of its wisdom and knowledge. In another story, Albertus Magnus is said to have created a brazen head that could speak and answer questions. However, his student, Thomas Aquinas, allegedly destroyed the automaton, fearing it was a tool of the devil. It's not entirely clear where the brazen head originated. Some people think it was inspired by the Greek myth of Talos, a massive bronze automaton crafted by Hephaestus, the god of blacksmiths and artisans. Others think that it may have come from the Jewish legend of the Golem. In a way, this can be seen as the ancient form of what we're seeing today with ChatGPT. Is this some historical reference to artificial intelligence that they were using in the exact same way that we're attempting to do? The difference is that modern AI systems are purely code and simulate the brain. And most of what we experience today in language transformers have to be thoroughly trained manually and depend on complex hardware. However, with the brazen head, this would have been powered metaphysically with true artificial intelligence. This would be far more powerful as they essentially had the ability to speak with some type of all-knowing spirit. It literally involves the creation of a non-human entity, or you could say, homunculus, capable of processing information, answering questions, and providing knowledge. It seems to be the exact same thing as ChatGPT, but far more powerful, and if it's possible that this may be a true story, then what other kind of technology did some of these royals or secret brothers have access to? So I guess you could say that the brazen head was an early precursor to the idea of artificial intelligence, with both aiming to create an entity capable of providing knowledge and wisdom. However, the way that they were created and the forces that powered them are vastly different. There's actually more to this story and we'll come back in a later section. Alchemy can find its roots in Egypt, with the term itself originating from the Arabic al kamiya and a possible root is the ancient Egyptian word kemet, which refers to the black soil of the Nile River Valley. This fertile soil was associated with life and transformation, concepts that would later become integral to alchemical practices. Egypt was extremely occult, with its rich esoteric symbolism and complex rituals permeating various aspects of daily life and spiritual practices. Egypt was home to a complex pantheon of gods and goddesses, as well as initiation ceremonies in the mystery schools, both of which showcase the occult and alchemical aspects of ancient Egyptian spirituality. 
the moniker Hermes Trismegistus, an amalgamation of the Hellenic deity Hermes in the honorific title Thrice Great, finds its roots in the ancient Egyptian pantheons Thoth, the divine patron of scribes and master of sacred symbols. Egypt's beliefs surrounding the afterlife, rebirth, and mummification further contributed to alchemical values. The preservation of the body through mummification was essential for the survival of one's life force, or Ka, in the afterlife. We all know of the ancient astronaut theory. Mainstream scholars and popular authors for some reason conclude that aliens are involved with Egypt, such as with the Dendera light bulb. Is this really a light bulb? Or is it instructions for creating a homunculus? The Dendera temple is dedicated to the goddess Hathor. Comparable to Mary, she was the mother of Horus and Ra, yet also Ra's feminine counterpart, forming an androgynous being. Hathor embodies both Mary Magdalene and the Whore of Babylon, the Scarlet Harlot. She also helps souls in the afterlife as they transition and is often accompanied by another god. This god is Heket, the Egyptian goddess of fertility who is represented in the form of a frog. The symbol of the frog was their ancient symbol of fertility and it seems to represent spontaneous generation. The princess kissed the frog. These gods often had counterparts, serving not only as spouses but also as divisions of a primary hermaphroditic deity, illustrating the duality and unity in their divine nature. If we look at the full depiction, who's operating the ritual? Heket, and this is all for Hathor. The snake is being held by two hands, and we see a snake inside the light bulb, or more likely, a sperm in a flask. This seems more likely to be an alchemical process of the creation of an artificial life rather than some type of light generator, as Egypt was known for having tools to assist in the process of getting pregnant and giving birth. Before going any further, we must go over Paracelsus. Born Philippus Areolus Theophrastus Bombastus von Hohenheim, the Swiss physician, alchemist, and philosopher who lived during the Renaissance period early 1500s, but shockingly, he is literally the father of toxicology, so we know that all his credentials check out. He was a revolutionary figure in the history of medicine, challenging the traditional medical practices of his time and advocating for a more holistic approach to healing. But beyond his contributions to the field of medicine, Paracelsus was also deeply involved in the world of the occult and was a member of various secret societies, such as the Brotherhood of the Rosy Cross, or in other words, the Rosicrucians. This brotherhood predates the Freemasons by hundreds of years and back to the Knights Templar. The similarity and connection between them is evident in their images and coat of arms, but this will be explained later in the video. He was a contemporary of Leonardo da Vinci, Martin Luther, who was responsible for Protestant Reformation which shows how the Rosicrucians did have an impact and influence the Reformation. Paracelsus inspired an entire medical enlightenment period, and the reason I'm going on about this is because, well, let's delve into some of the lesser known aspects of Paracelsus' life and work particularly his connections to the homunculus and the darker, more secretive parts of his writings. First off, most of his depictions are post-human portraits, and he's typically seen holding a sword and a prophet for the Rosicrucians. But in one depiction, there's something in the background suddenly placed. It's the head of a baby emerging from the ground. There's an open book with a ripped document and key, as well as a fire in the background making it look as some type of ritual. Paracelsus believed that the human body was a microcosm of the universe, and he sought to understand the secrets of creation by studying the human body itself. In his quest for knowledge, he turned to alchemy, which he saw as a means of unlocking the mysteries of nature. One of his most famous quotes, Let no man belong to another who can belong to himself, speaks to his belief in the individual's ability to harness the powers of nature in the universe. In his book, De Naturo Rerum, Paracelsus wrote extensively about the creation of a homunculus, a small, artificially created humanoid. He believed that through alchemical processes, it was possible to create life from inanimate matter, and he detailed a specific recipe for creating a homunculus. The process involved placing human sperm inside a glass vial and sealing it with a special alchemical seal. The vial was then buried in horse manure for 40 days, after which, a small, transparent humanoid would allegedly begin to form. 
Paracelsus claimed that the homunculus would continue to grow and develop over time, eventually gaining the ability to speak and perform tasks. He believed that the homunculus could be used for various purposes, such as healing, divination, and even controlling the weather. His writings on the homunculus have been both praised and criticized, with some scholars arguing that his ideas were a precursor to modern genetic engineering, while others dismiss them as the ramblings of a madman. So again, which is it? Well, let's take a look at the writing of Paracelsus himself. But it's important to note that some scholars such as William R. Newman in his Promethean Ambitions describes this as pseudo-Paracelsus. The text is genuine, but apparently another alchemist released this under his name. Regardless, it's still classified as a book of Paracelsus. In his book, De Natura Rerum, or Of the Nature of Things in Nine Books, we will read what Paracelsus had to say because many times when looking to the homunculus or watching documentaries on the subject, you really just get a quote from the experiment, but to put this more into context, we're going to read the beginning of book one, which deals with generations. We're going to take a look at a German version or reprint from 1584. We got this translated into a much more readable version, and there's an English version published in 1650 that can confirm the accuracy of the translation. In book one, he first starts with the most important topic it would seem, quote, generations. But it's key to note that this is not limited to just homunculi, but it's a part of a greater topic. Quote, the generation of all natural things is twofold, natural and without art, or artificial and visualized by the alchemist, end quote. Paracelsus tells us straight and simple. It's his first point, really. Putrefaction is the key to the generation of all natural things. We'll discuss this more in detail later. But listen to this part carefully. I'm paraphrasing, but, quote, Book on nature, one, it may be possible for humans to be born without natural fathers and mothers. That is to say, they can be born not from a woman's body in a natural way, as other humans are born but through the art and expertise of an experienced Bajiric alchemist. A human may thus grow and be born, as will be further explained. Quote, It is also possible in nature that humans can be born from animals, having their natural causes. However, it cannot happen without heresy, that is, when a human mixes with an animal, and the animal-like female takes in the sperm of a man with lust and desire in its womb and encloses it, in this case, the sperm must go through decay and through the constant warmth of the body. A human and not an animal will be born. For every time the sperm is sown, a fruit grows from it. If this did not happen, it would be against the philosophers and against the light of nature. For as the seed is, so a fruit grows from it. From onion seeds grow onions, not peas, not nuts, not lettuce. So from various grains, different plants grow. This is explaining to you what they were thinking, to not only create humans without natural fathers and mothers, but to be born without a mother entirely. Then he goes further to explain how you can even birth these humans out of animals. Okay, wait, what are we even talking about here? Quote, It is also possible, and not against nature, that a woman and a person can give birth to an animal, and it is not to be judged with a woman in this like with a man, that is, one should not regard her as transgressor, as if she acted against nature, but rather attribute such things to her imagination. For her imagination is often to blame for many things. For the imagination of a pregnant woman is so great that she can transform the seed and the fruit in her body in many ways, for her inner astral forces act so strongly and powerfully upon her fruit that they give an impression and influence, Therefore, the child stands in the mother's body in the creation, in the mother's hand, and will, like clay in the potter's hand, from oats to oats, from barley to barley, and the like with all other fruits, what has seeds and is sown. We will explain this more later, but he's essentially saying that women have the ability to be alchemists and shape their babies through the use of their imagination. But we must clarify that we're speaking of a different type or tier of imagination as will be further explained. Okay, so now we're about to get to the full breakdown of this art of generation and let's remember this typically does not get brought up when discussing homunculi which leads many modern scholars to doubt the legitimacy of the claims. 
But if we're diving deep into how detailed and vast the science really was, they were playing around with the power to generate life artificially. But even more importantly, they could influence the outcome. Quote, five, and as you know now, through putrefaction, many and various things are born and become alive. So now you should know that from many herbs through putrefaction, very wondrous animals are born, as experienced people know. It is important to note that such animals which grow and are born from within decay all have some toxicity with them and are poisonous, some more powerful and stronger than others, and each is shaped and formed differently from the other. As you can see in snakes, vipers, toads, frogs, scorpions, basilisk, spiders, wild ants, various worms, caterpillars, moths, beetles, all of which grow and are born from within decay. End quote. Quote, it is also no less true that many monsters are born among animals, and these are their offspring, which often happens that they give birth to an animal or another monster from human seed, according to the strong imagination of the mother on the child. They often grow from decay themselves and are brought about in a glass, as has been reported. The same often appears in many and wondrous shapes and forms, so terrifying to behold, as often with many heads, with many feet, with many tails, sometimes of many colors, sometimes worms with fish tails or wings, and other strange forms, the likes of which have never been seen before. Therefore, all these creatures are monsters that have no parents and are not born from other animals of their kind, but rather grow from other things and are brought forth and created through art as you will see with the basilisk." End quote. Quote, but it is not here to deal with these homunculi, since they can be generated naturally and artificially, as from the greater matter and the lesser matter, such as from man and from monkeys, from horses and from donkeys, and from many other animals. End quote. Let's remember that donkey for later. But there you go. In clear language, he's explaining what this is really about. Generating any animal you please. Hybrids and creating humans or any type of life in a variety of different wombs. Again, Reddy did not debunk spontaneous generation or the artificial generation of the alchemist. Remember who we're reading from? This is from Paracelsus himself, one of the founders of the scientific method. There's no reason to believe that this information is false, or at least it would seem that the author and many of his followers believed it to be true. They could have been creating all types of different beings. Also, on the basilisk, it would seem that the alchemist during this time had a certain issue, which we'll go into detail on as we progress, but to take note, the basilisk is considered as the feminine evil twin, some kind of feminine evil that gets brought forth during the experiment, and this can manifest in different ways. The basilisk is a type of homunculus created by the alchemist as a result of the putrefaction of menstrual blood and thus female-derived. Some scholars argue that this was a form of early female medieval misogyny. There may be more to it than just that, as we're dealing with two different qualities of results. In De Natura Rerum, another reason why some scholars bring question to the author is because it shares many similarities with older Arabic text. And in Paracelsus' other work, De Homunculi, he takes the approach to using a womb instead, as it seems the method of creating it in a bottle came with some problems that needed to be solved. Now before we leave De Natura Rerum, or The Nature of Things, I want to read the actual quote from the book of the experiment because I'm going to show you how you really don't get the full context. If you try reading the English one from the 17th century, it's still pretty difficult to read. You can understand the words, but it's more difficult to process what's actually being said. So this is a translation based on the German version and then checked by the English version. Quote, now the generation of the artificial man is also not to be forgotten in its own way. There's something to it, although such has been kept in great secrecy until now and has been completely hidden, and not without a small doubt and question in secret of the ancient philosophers whether it is also possible for nature and art that a human being can be born outside a woman's body and a natural mother." End quote. So wait, he's telling you straight up that this is the biggest secret and it's ancient in origin. Quote, to this, I give the answer that is not contrary to the art of the spagyric and nature in its own way, but it's entirely possible. How such access and occurrence may be, 
Its process is as follows, namely that the sperm of a man enclosed in a sealed cucurbit with the highest putrefaction in the belly of a horse is putrefied for 40 days or as long as it takes to become alive and move and stir just like this. It becomes visible after some time. After such time, it will appear to be somewhat like human, yet transparent, without a body. When it is, then daily fed with the arcano, a whitish substance. Remember this whitish stuff for later. And nourished until 40 weeks have passed and kept in the constant warmth of a horse's belly. It will become a living human being, resembling another child born from a woman, but much smaller. We will call this a homunculus and it should be raised like any other child with great care and attention until it reaches maturity. This is the greatest and highest secret that God has allowed mortal and sinful humans to know. It is a miracle and a great work of God, a mystery above all mysteries, and should remain a secret until the end of time when nothing will be hidden and everything will be revealed." End quote. Okay then, they were creating humans without a mother. It resembled any other child born from a woman. Okay, so it's not just a tiny human? And that they could raise these things, it seems. But let's remember what he said. This is the greatest and highest secret. The secret of generation and putrefaction. There is another component to this, as we said. There are multiple layers, and we will cover them all. But he does continue to say that these homunculus then go on to change to become magical beings of different kinds. The blur between the astral and physical have led many modern scholars to perceive this as mere fantasy, but there really is no reason to conclude that just yet. We must take into consideration that Paracelsus, being one of the founders of modern chemistry and one of the earliest to experiment with homunculus, was specifically being cryptic. That's important to note because it allows one for interpretation but furthermore, it explains on why this is still a mystery. Because whoever was looking into this stuff at the time truly did not want this to be unveiled in detail to society. Their methods are never clear, but almost as a cryptic message to inform other brothers, and we are left with the remainders to piece together the puzzle. While it's clear that Paracelsus is bringing importance to the subject of generation and that there are two forms, natural and artificial, this would essentially mean that a homunculus is a science and art of artificial generation, guided and directed by an experienced alchemist, and the variety and forms therein are numerous and they can be combined with any animal. Now the deeper level is that he's actually discussing how to use natural chambers or wombs for the artificial creation of a homunculus. And he's saying, yeah, you can do this with a lot of different animals. This will be confirmed as we look through more sources. And we're not just talking about making more animals by artificial insemination. It's actually different and much more occult. They're talking about the creation of chimeras, like literally growing a human in different wombs from different animals. What kind of minds are we dealing with here? Because this doesn't make sense to be just some made up fantasy. There are many details to this process. Don't believe it? Well, let's continue. So the main quote from Paracelsus on the homunculus is literally a recipe where he uses a horse as a surrogate mother of the homunculus and the semen of a human male is left inside the womb of the animal to putrefy for 40 days. Then the homunculus is born. Paracelsus also makes reference to the phoenix as an alchemical symbol. Quote, Paracelsus, his way for the raising of a dead bird to life and for the generating many serpents of one, both which are performed by putrefaction. A bird is restored to life thus, viz, take a bird, put it alive into a gourd glass and seal it hermetically, burn it to ashes in the third degree of fire, then putrefy it in horse dung into a mucilaginous phlegm and so by a continued digestion that phlegm must be brought into a further maturity, being taken out and put into an oval vessel of just a bigness to hold it by an exact digestion and will become a renewed bird, which, saith Paracelsus, is one of the greatest wonders in nature and shows the great virtue of putrefaction. Cut a serpent into small pieces, which put into a gourd glass which you must hermetically seal up, then putrefy them in horse dung, and the whole serpent will become living again in the glass, in the form either of worms or spawn of fishes. 
Now if these worms be in fitting manner, brought out of the putrefaction and nourished, many hundred serpents will be bred out of one serpent, whereof every one will be as big as the first. And as it is said of the serpent, so also many other living creatures may be raised and restored again. End quote. Now we're going to look at historical authors from the same time period who wrote on the homunculus because this will prove that multiple minds had time to debunk this supposed theory and put it to rest, but that's not what happened. Cornelius Agrippa, renowned German polymath and occult writer, was born of a noble family and he had several influential texts that played a pivotal role in the culture of the Renaissance. Interestingly, many scholars take note that he was not only a secret agent, physician, and legal scholar, supposedly he set up a secret society in Paris devoted to the occult. In his Three Books of Occult Philosophy, he alludes to the homunculus in many ways. He first tells a story of a hen giving birth to a man in a strange way. Quote, also, domestic birds are not without some agorias, for cocks by their crowing promote hope in the journey of him that is undertaking. Moreover, Livia, the mother of Tiberius, when she was great with him, took a hen egg and it hatched in her bosom, and at length came forth a cockchick with a great comb, which then Origories interpreted that the child that should be born of her should be a king. End quote. We can confirm that Agrippa is not telling us everything when he discusses the nature of blood and the basilisk's special abilities, which was discussed by Paracelsus, so we know that he's read his work. He mentions the basilisk over six times. This is a symbolic reference as well to the homunculus. At this time, it was hush-hush, so they had to be more cryptic and fantastical, but they considered this to be 100% real. The basilisk is an alchemical creature. Quote, they say also that the blood of a basilisk, which they call the blood of Saturn, hath such great force and sorcery that it procures for him that carries it about him good success of his petitions from great men in power, and of his prayers from God, and also remedies of diseases, and grant any privilege." End quote. He's just only covering the negative twin of the homunculus. Quote, Again, in the vapors of the eyes there is a great power, that they can bewitch and infect any that are near them as the cockatrice or basilisk killing men with their looks." End quote. I'm not saying that every person that mentions the basilisk is being symbolic, but it's safe to assume that Agrippa was well aware of the homunculus. Robert Flood, a renowned English Paracelsian physician, held a diverse array of interests that encompassed both scientific and occult domains. As a prominent figure in the early 17th century, he delved into various fields such as astrology, mathematics, cosmology, Kabbalah, and Rosicrucianism. His penchant for exploring the esoteric side of knowledge often led him to engage with contemporary scientists and thinkers of his time, notably engaging in a series of exchanges with the esteemed astronomer Johannes Kepler. Flood's rich contributions to the fields of occult philosophy make him a significant figure when examining the concept of the homunculus. He's remembered as an astrologer, mathematician, cosmologist, Kabbalist, and Rosicrucian. Now it's interesting because we'll see this double-fingered pose with these figures associated with secret societies. Also, look at the coat of arms of the Hidden Knight. We're going to come back to Flood because he was associated with John Dee and studied with the Jesuits, even went to Oxford, and his father was a high-ranking government official, the treasurer for Queen Elizabeth I. A collage of 12 coat of arms of Flood's ancestors are shown in the painting above his right shoulder. His paternal arms goes back to Rarid Flaid, whose name originates from Welsh meaning bloody or red wolf. Martin Ruland the Elder, 1532-1602, was a German alchemist, physician, and writer. He authored several works on alchemy, and he's best known for his Lexicon Alchemy, a comprehensive dictionary of alchemical terms and concepts. Quote, Homunculi are small images, which contain within themselves an invisible starry human being made in the likeness of humans, small human portraits, or images made of humans that have the invisible celestial human in their brain." End quote. That's a rough translation, but he does bring it up, also connecting the images component. Gian Battista della Porta, 1535-1615, was an Italian polymath scholar and author known for his various works in scientific fields, including natural philosophy, optics, 
and cryptography. He was also interested in alchemy. His book, Natural Magic, is a book that we've brought up in the past and it definitely deserves its own video, but for now that'd probably take too much time. However, there are some interesting things discussed such as the generation of hybrids and monsters. But not just that, it goes into a sort of animal husbandry that involves the mixing of animals to create new strange creatures as the author puts it. There are also several historical accounts in the book from notable authors where he not only agrees with Paracelsus, but references several ancient Roman and Greek authors. These authors include several reputable sources, such as Pliny, Ovid, and Aristotle, all discussing the nature of putrefaction and generation. He makes it clear in the prologue that natural magic is the top and the complete faculty of natural science. It's important to note this because modern science, although the child of alchemy, has completely left out the most important part of its application, the knowledge and understanding of magic. This may be outside the scope of the video, but it's important to understand and we will cover this as magic is the father of all sciences. He continues to say that the knowledge in the book unveils the secrets and history of this natural magic. Then, in chapter 1, which deals with putrefaction, saying essentially the same as Paracelsus, that new creatures can be generated through putrefaction, but he details the history stating that Porphyry thought that living creatures were begotten of the bowels of the earth, soaked in water and quickened by the heat of the sun. Of the same mind were Archelaus the Athenian, Anaxagoras, Cosomenius, and Euripides his scholar, Cleodemus, and after him Theophrastus, thought that they came of purified water mixed with earth, and the colder and fouler the water was, the more unfit it was for their generation. Diodorus and many other good philosophers hold that all living creatures did arise of putrefaction. Now to explain putrefaction to those who may not understand what we're discussing, the best way to think about it is fermentation. But when these alchemists are referring to this process, they really mean like a fundamental aspect of our reality. That putrefaction is the transformative process that occurs within matter, naturally. All things go through decay and transformation, even in a controlled environment. The alchemists sought to understand the mechanics of putrefaction, or in other words, the secret workings of the universe. Why do things break down and go under change? They truly believed that they had found the secret to this process and how to influence it. For now, I'll leave it at that. There's no direct reference to Munculus in his work, but he discusses the secret thought process behind it, and it's a good reference to see how serious they were about this subject, and also that they were the leading thinkers of their time, instructing others who also believed it to be true. The only reason this could be as clearly stated in the book is that certain rituals and processes of generation were evident to these alchemists. I'll bring this book up later, but we shall proceed. Oswald Kroll, or Crollius, 1563-1609, was an alchemist and professor of medicine at the University of Marburg in Hesse, Germany. A strong proponent of alchemy and using chemistry and medicine, he was heavily involved in writing books and influencing thinkers of his day towards viewing chemistry and alchemy as two separate fields. Now that may be the case, but that doesn't mean he thought they should be separated, as from his book Basilica Chemica, there are clear Rosicrucian and alchemical symbols showing the cryptic nature of the art. He even makes mention to Paracelsus saying, quote, but none of the mortals, with the true word of pardon, in the whole of philosophy and medicine, with undoubted heavenly favor, has known such hard and hidden secrets and brought them into public domain as Theophrastus, that Paracelsus, a man and philosopher of all eternity, memory, and honor most worthy, whose skill no one has yet been found who can touch, much less surpass, the true monarch of medicine and the first physician of the microcosm." End quote. This is another credible source verifying the works of Paracelsus. Johann Hartmann, 1568-1631, in 1609 became the first professor of chemistry at the University of Marburg. His teaching dealt mainly with pharmaceuticals. Quote, in Lecture 23, the Arcanum of Hermes Philosophy, Sendivogius says that there are two types of dissolutions, although there are many other useless dissolutions. One is only truly natural, and the second is violent, under which all others are included. The natural one is such that the pores of the body are opened in our water, so that the digested semen is emitted and placed in its matrix. 
Our water, however, is heavenly, not wetting the hands, not of the common people, but almost like rainwater. The body is gold, which gives semen. Our moon is not common silver. It receives the semen of gold. In Treatise 10 of the New Light of Alchemy Saturn, having accepted the vessel, drew the water parts ten times, and immediately took the fruit of the solar tree and placed it. And I saw the fruit of the tree consumed and dissolved like ice in hot water. This water is like a woman to this fruit, and no other thing can the fruits of this tree putrefy except in this water, nor can any other water penetrate the pores of this fruit except this one, and know that the solar tree also comes from this water, which is drawn from the rays of the sun and moon by the force of the magnet. Therefore, it has the great harmony between them. End quote. Just in case he wasn't making it clear that he's hinting towards something, he continues, quote, In the Dialogue of Mercury, Regarding this feminine seed or adepts dissolving waters, we have decided to discuss with you the dissolving waters at this moment. This alchemical treasure is indeed great and immense, but for everyone who does not possess the individual keys to the storehouse, without which not even the adepts themselves could dissolve or coagulate the bodies, it is completely inaccessible. If you are ignorant of the dissolution of our body, there is no need to work, warns Dionysus Zacharias, quote, Whoever knows the art and secret of dissolution reaches the secret of art. Michael Meyer, 1568-1622, was a German physician and counselor to Rudolf II Habsburg. He was a learned alchemist, epigrammist, and amateur composer. He also happened to be Imperial Count Palatine. He doesn't actually mention homunculus directly, but in his book Atlanta Fugions, the entire thing is a metaphor for him pursuing golden apples. It's based on the Greek myth of Atalanta, a virgin hunter who was raised by bears, but it is more so a reference to the race when Hippomenes dropped apples in front of Atalanta. Unable to resist, she lost the race because she picked up the apples and was forced to marry. Well, this is a symbol for these alchemists, and each one of these emblems is a secret. One of them, Emblem 21, specifically deals with the homunculus. I'm sure that many of you guys have seen these engravings before, it's been seen by many eyes. This is a secret code for the development of the homunculus, or artificial generation. Quote, Emblem 21, make a circle from the man and woman, then a square. From that triangle, make a circle, and you will have the Philosopher's Stone. Epigram 21, let the man and woman be united as one circle from which a square arises having equal sides. From here, draw a triangle that is rounded on every side into a sphere then the stone will be born. If such a thing does not come to your mind soon, if you understand the doctrine of geometry, you will know everything. There are a few more references in here that equally could be considered, but we will show a few of the emblems and then continue on. Not only are there several occult alchemical symbols such as the hermaphrodite, they even have Miss Liberty. Floating cubes in the sky, the Lion of Venice, mermaids, and even an early Freemason candle symbolism, which we'll see this repeated many times. It's also important to mention that, yes, around this time, there were many charlatans and frauds. True alchemists disguised and encoded their secrets with mysterious symbols as it was against their order to reveal anything to the uninitiated. The fake alchemists are the ones who spent too much time on the Philosopher's Stone or trying to promise some method of producing gold. This has led modern scholars and historians to believing that these alchemists were simply madmen and misinformed scientists. However, another interesting aspect to this is literally the government of the time believed it to be true, and there were literal laws passed as with Henry IV's edict against reproducing gold and silver. So why make laws against it then? In 1404, Parliament passed a statute called the Act Against Multipliers, making alchemy, or more specifically, the multiplication of gold and silver via alchemy, illegal. We continue with exploring a fundamental text known as the Theatrum Chemicum, or Chemical Theater. It's a compendium of early alchemical writings in Latin published in six volumes in six decades. It was the most comprehensive collective work on the subject of alchemy ever published in the Western world. The physician and philosopher Sir Thomas Brown possessed a copy while Isaac Newton filled the margins of his copy with annotations. There's even a letter from Roger Bacon on the secret works of art and nature. Now, there are many books in this work, 
And although there's no clear homunculus reference, it is a crucial work referenced by several other important figures that go over the secret of making one, although it does not use that terminology. Also, there's a section from Aristotle and Alchemy. But interestingly, there's a Theatrum Chemicum Britannicum, which was done by Elias Ashmole, another publisher. In this book, the cover is clear homunculus symbolism, which we'll break down later. But this book is a little bit too cryptic to really gain that much value right now. We're going to continue, but as mentioned, we're nearing the 17th century, so of course, the people writing books on this subject became increasingly secretive. Not to mention that Paracelsus was already cryptic to begin with. The next alchemist on our list is a little bit different, Johann Ambrosius Siebmacher, a German heraldic artist and copperplate engraver who made heraldic multi-volume books of armorial bearings of coat of arms for the Holy Roman Empire. This shows how the Rosicrucians were deeply integrated with the church, implementing the tactic of divide and conquer by controlling both Catholic and Protestant sides. That's outside the scope of this video. But there is a reason that heraldry is involved and it has to do with these Palatine rulers actually hiring alchemists as their personal physicians and guides. He has a book on alchemy with these very interesting depictions. It's essentially a divine hand emerging from a floating triangle in the sky. It's holding a torch as it lights the candle or flame of this heart, which could be representative of the act of love or procreation. It's really a reference to why alchemy only works for the advanced practitioner. It has to do with the timing and collection of certain spiritual or etheric powers. This will be examined more as we progress. Next, we're going to continue but kind of go into the spontaneous generation debate as well as starting on Johann Baptist van Helmont, 1579-1644, who was a Flemish chemist, physiologist, and physician. He's known for his work on plant growth and the chemical composition of water. He even coined the term gas and is considered the founder of pneumatic chemistry. He was a disciple of Paracelsus, so no doubt he had read all of his works. Even the Helmont coat of arms is the hidden knight, and you can even see the dual symbolism with his portrait. He also has the Rosicrucian finger pose. There's no reference to the homunculus, but this is another important scientist who was not only well aware of the subject, but most likely was keeping a secret. He even wrote instructions on spontaneous generation saying, quote, When water from the purest spring is placed in a flask, steeped in leavening fumes, it putrefies, engendering maggots. The fumes which rise from the bottom of a swamp produce frogs, ants, leeches, and vegetation. Carve an indentation in a brick, Fill it with crushed basil and cover the brick with another so that the indentation is completely sealed. Expose the two bricks to sunlight and you will find that within a few days, fumes from the basil, acting as a leavening agent, will have transformed the vegetable matter into veritable scorpions. It took until the late 1700s to really completely denounce spontaneous generation because so many reputable sources for thousands of years were adamant that it was not only possible, but obvious to anyone who was aware of nature's secrets. It's not possible for such men to be simply mistaken. They are either willfully lying and being cryptic, or they're telling you what they know and they believe in spontaneous generation to be true. Both support the case that this subject deserves more investigation. And no, it's not possible that we're dealing with these minds simply misunderstanding the phenomena. That could be argued with some writers who suggest spontaneous creation with bugs as Aristotle does with lice, but it cannot be argued with a generation of other animals, such as mice and scorpions. These scorpions will be mentioned again later. Oh, and let's not forget philosopher and father of modern chemistry, Robert Boyle, perhaps most known for Boyle's Law. Boyle did reject Paracelsus' theory on elements and substituted for atomic theory, but he, like Isaac Newton, was still interested in discovering the Philosopher's Stone. Boyle had his own thoughts on the generation of animals and contributed to the start of redefining spontaneous generation. This all changed because of the microscope. The microscope is what allowed Boyle and his associates, the famous Robert Hooke from the Royal Society and the Jesuit Marcello Malpighi, finally putting to rest this whole idea of spontaneous generation. The idea was that Robert Hooke, with his discovery of the cell and microorganisms, 
had found evidence that debunked spontaneous generation. Basically, because the microscope allowed them to look closer into objects, they saw that in non-living matter, such as a cork, there were tiny little organisms and so, this proved that living beings weren't just popping out of non-living matter, there were living things in it. But how does that debunk spontaneous generation? It doesn't. It's just that at this time, especially after the development of the Royal Society, which was Freemasonic in origin, and Hoke was one of the leaders and had to have been associated with Masons at the time. That may not seem relevant, but then you tell me the need to put coat of arms and secret symbols on these published discoveries connecting all these scientists to Palatine Roman rulers who were in control of the Rosicrucians. You really think the telescope was invented in the 17th century? This is kind of weird, they don't even know the real inventor of the telescope, or at least it was shrouded in mystery since its origin. It's more likely that the knowledge of optics has been shrouded in mystery and secrecy similar to the subject of alchemy. I mean, think about it. We're discussing the eye, light, images, imagination. These are all subjects of alchemy. Therefore, it is safe to assume that the subject of optics would have been crucial to the alchemist. The story doesn't add up with the telescope. Okay, so in 1655, a Dutch diplomat William de Boreal tried to solve the mystery of who invented the telescope. Okay, so not a good start. Already in 1650, they had a telescope and had to initiate a process in rediscovering who was the inventor. Okay. He had a local magistrate in Middleburg follow up on Boreal's childhood and early adult recollections of a spectacle maker named Hans, who he remembered as the inventor of the telescope. So wait, we're going off of a memory? The magistrate was contacted by a then unknown claimant, Middleburg spectacle maker, Johannes Zachariasen, who testified that his father, Zacharias Jansen, invented the telescope and the microscope as early as 1590. This testimony seemed convincing to Boreal, who now recollected that Zacharias and his father, Hans Martens, must have been who he remembered. Boreal's conclusion that Zacharias Jansen invented the telescope a little ahead of another spectacle maker, Hans Lippershey, was adopted by Pierre Borel in his 1656 book De Vero Telescopi Inventor. So to get this straight, the mainstream story says that the microscope and telescope was invented after the 1650s, but they also have this weird story on how it might be from the 1590s. But that doesn't really add up because in the 2nd century, almost 1500 years prior, Claudius Ptolemy, a 2nd century Greco-Roman mathematician and astronomer, wrote a significant treatise on optics. So we had extensive knowledge of refraction and optics for over a thousand years, but nothing happened until the 17th century? That doesn't really make sense, especially since the Romans were also expert glassmakers. In fact, even Roman Emperor Nero used a glass globe of water to magnify text in order to read books, so they were well aware of magnification. The reason it wasn't mentioned in their books is because what they teach us about the era of the ancient Romans and Greeks and the supposed medieval ages are actually of the same era and there was essentially a reset. But that's outside of the scope of this chapter and we can come back to that in a minute. The reason I bring this up is because this would not only be a top priority for their time but also one of the highest kept secrets as this would have been one of the primary tools of the astrologers and alchemists. We know for a fact that this knowledge was known before the 11th century by Arabic astronomers and physicists of the Islamic Golden Age. Al-Hazan, or Al-Hasan ibn al-Haytham, is referred to as the father of modern optics. He even wrote a book on the topic and was cited by Newton, Kepler, and Galileo. During his time, there was no separation between alchemy, chemistry, and science. It was all under the science of the wise, or really alchemy. He also assisted in the development of the Camera Obscura, which is another component to this that has been shrouded in secrecy, as there have been suggestions that this is another tool that was used by the elites to control the power of art. Whoever controlled refraction, projection, and images had the ability to control population. As we will see, the royal palatines were using astrologers to read the stars and make changes occur from a distance. You could read the future in the stars as well. So. Around the near end of the 17th century, 
Hook and Malpighi were using this new founded invention which was released and approved by royalty to support their findings and quell all talk on alchemy in Paracelsus. But they never debunked spontaneous generation. And it's strange because even Boyle was still using terms like plastic power or plastic force. They were desperately trying to remove metaphysical definitions and philosophies from their work, but it's clear that they still depended on them. Plastic power can just be another term for aether or even an orphic field that assists in the development of matter. With Malpighi, he also debated and argued with other proponents on spontaneous generation during his time. Malpighi could be argued as an atheist because he tried to explain anatomy in terms of a machine and with explanations completely devoid of reliance on the soul. So essentially, these guys all teamed up and decided to put spontaneous generation to rest. Yet, they never debunked it, they just provided evidence that challenged it, and even during their time it still wasn't over just yet. This just initiated the debate, and they were back and forth on the subject. After the works of Malpighi and Hook, Filippo Bonanni, another Jesuit interestingly, was a seashell collector who fought back on their points and released a new experiment in which he tried to show using a three lens microscope. In his work published in 1691, that spontaneous generation was possible in animals without blood and a heart, in contradiction of Francesco Redi's experimental work. Even more interesting is that Bonanni defends Aristotle and metaphysics and even references Redi's experiment, stating that he finds Redi's assertion that spontaneous generation never happens ridiculous. For some reason, even though the microscope and the discovery of microorganisms was relatively a new discovery, Bonani's scientific experiments on spontaneous generation were dismissed and even considered an inexcusable transgression. I don't think that we can conclude that they were attempting to attack or even challenge the ideas of Paracelsus or the alchemist because it's really the same exact people. They just moved into a new phase where they decided to be hush-hush about their secret knowledge. Reddy actually eventually responded to Bonani later that year. His book had to do with the generation of parasitic worms and Reddy provides within his treatise a continued defense of his claims that all animals originate from eggs. The first response came from someone who was influenced by Banani, Trioni Feti, who argued that not all life comes from seed, that some plants don't come from seed or eggs, but have other center leaves or foliage. Many years later, Banani replied in 1691 stating that he defended his work and that spontaneous generation could happen without the use of seeds. This actually left Malpighi with no argument, and so he went to Boyle for a response. And ultimately, they never really finished the debate. Even after Reddy's experiments, they really never debunked anything. It would seem that this is right around the time that the Jesuits, Rosicrucians, and secret brotherhoods left the Aristotle philosophy, but there were still some scholars left over that were dedicated to the original science. So since Malpighi couldn't debunk Bonani, he ended up going to the count and literally just complained about him and just put words in his mouth. It seems that Bonani didn't really want to talk bad about Malpighi or he just wanted to make amends as they were both students of Kircher. Even Robert Hooke purposely avoided even mentioning spontaneous generation. They were just playing a game of semantics because some methods of spontaneous generation describe it as arising from non-living matter but that's not really the point. The point is that they were generating creatures through ritual. It doesn't matter if it actually spawns from some source, and it most likely did. And even Banani defines spontaneous generated animals as, quote, are those living beings whose matter is able to be moved even by itself in just the same way that the seed usually moves in the generation of other animals, end quote. I don't think the proponents of spontaneous generation were literally saying it's non-living, as in no life source or living components, but more so that it was not moving or animated. It was not a living creature, and so they were speaking of specific techniques and lost rituals that were used since ancient times to generate these creatures. As we've already shown you multiple alchemists who thought this knowledge was obvious. But this is kind of weird. The debate was still not over. Almost 60 years later, in 1745, 
interest in spontaneous generation was renewed when a Roman Catholic, John Natum, came out with new microscopical discoveries showing that large numbers of organisms subsequently developed and prepared infusions of many different substances that had been exposed to intense heat and sealed tubes for 30 minutes. It took over 30 years to respond to this argument, and the answer came from another Italian named Lazzaro Spallanzani where he supposedly repeated them and said that Needham just didn't heat his tubes long enough or didn't seal them correctly. But he lost this exchange because the most influential naturalist of his time, George Louis Comte de Buffon, supported the work of Needham and believed in spontaneous generation, suggesting that organic molecules could assemble to form simple organisms under certain conditions. Interestingly, it seems that basically there was some back and forth they were really trying to debunk the spontaneous generation, but it just wouldn't go away. Even to the point where after a number of further investigations had failed to solve the problem, the French Academy of Sciences offered a prize for research that would throw new light on the question of spontaneous generation. So they literally funded the research with the desired outcome already set. How scientific. They weren't even really interested in getting to the bottom of the truth. They just wanted spontaneous generation to die and be done with. But they couldn't do that without someone coming in and debunking it. The person who would respond to this challenge is Louis Pasteur, which is really crazy that he ties into this story. I don't want to say anything directly why, but it will become evident as we proceed. He developed an experiment using flasks that were coated with a sugar G solution to a variety of conditions. He demonstrated that the creatures that developed were from microorganisms in the air not from the air itself. Now, it never explains how he conclusively shows this, and in fact, this wasn't actually proven until 1876 with John Tyndall, who devised an apparatus to demonstrate that the air could carry particulate matter. Finally, after Tyndall and Pasteur's work combined, it finally put the subject of spontaneous generation to rest. Or did it? First, let's bring up one of the main issues in the debate. Semantics. Many of the times, the evidence brought forth is really just debunking one definition of the term of spontaneous generation, usually that it is life emerging from non-living matter. But spontaneous generation has two forms, generation from non-living matter, also called abiogenesis, and generation from living matter, called heterogenesis. The reason why spontaneous generation was being rejected in the early 18th and late 17th century is because this was a period in time where they were trying to understand biology and its processes. Obviously, the answer of generation from non-living matter would not suffice as an explanation. Therefore, heterogenesis became their main concern. But interestingly, heterogenesis would not work as a complete doctrine in the explanation of the generation of life as by 1859 it was almost completely discredited. As the experiments with Pasteur and the understanding of parasites continued, it was the very breakdown between organic and inorganic matter that led to the dilemma. The issue became clear with the release of Darwin's The Origin of Species, for any evolutionary theory resting on natural causes logically demands the acceptance of a biogenesis. The term was coined by Thomas Huxley, so we've come full circle. Literally, their theory depends on the notion that life can evolve or emerge from non-living matter at some point. Oh, and also, Thomas Huxley is depicted with a glass bottle with what appears to be a homunculus in the famous 19th century fantasy novel, Water Babies. This book is really crazy, we're gonna have to break it down in the future, but apparently, Thomas Huxley is mixed up with a bunch more stuff. A biogenesis is also related to the concept of the primordial soup theory, which is another attempt to try to explain the mechanics of a biogenesis. They never debunked spontaneous generation, they just changed the name. Now this is an interesting character because the encyclopedias try to call him an amateur. However, Andrew Cross was an important scientist in the history of Britain. He's most famously known for his experiments on electrocrystallization which were conducted in 1836, during which insects appeared. In other words, spontaneously generated. Around the age of 12, Cross persuaded one of his teachers to let him attend a series of lectures on the natural sciences, the second of which was on the subject of electricity. This was the cause of his lifelong interest into the subject, 
Crosshairs began experimenting with electricity during his time in the sixth form when he built a Leyden jar and after leaving school, he studied at Brazenose College, Oxford. Andrew Cross seems to be more than just an amateur as he had many contributions to science and participated in advanced experiments for his time. One of his prominent undertakings involved creating an extensive setup to explore atmospheric electricity. This setup employed an insulated wire measuring initially 1.25 miles and later shortened to 1,800 feet that was hung from poles and trees. Through this, he determined the polarity of the atmosphere under varying weather conditions. His findings were later published by his friend, George Singer. Cross along with Sir Humphrey Davy was among the early pioneers to construct large voltaic piles. One such described battery consisted of 50 jars with a coated surface area of 73 square feet. Using his wires, Cross could charge and discharge it around 20 times per minute, creating noises almost as loud as a cannon. This led to his local nickname, the Thunder and Lightning Man. In 1836, Cross attended a meeting of the British Association for the Advancement of Science in Bristol. There, he presented his discoveries, including electrocrystallization and atmospheric experiments and improvements to the voltaic battery. His further works included separating copper from ores using electrolysis, experimenting with electrolysis of seawater, wine, and brandy for purification, and studying the effects of electricity on vegetation. The year 1836 also marked a controversial phase in Cross's career. During an electrocrystallization experiment, he observed the formation of what he described as a perfect insect on the 26th day. Over the next few weeks, hundreds more such creatures identified as members of the genus Acarus were observed. This incident, when reported by a local newspaper, led to public outrage, with Cross accused of attempting to play God. However, his work remained unpublished due to the controversy surrounding Cross's experiment. The skeptics have a hypothesis that the insect eggs were just embedded in the samples, so the mainstream does not take his work very credible. Despite all that, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein was inspired by Cross's experiments. Some say that it's unlikely as the novel was published almost 20 years prior to Cross's experiments. However, Shelley did know Cross through a mutual friend, and it's reported that she attended a lecture by Cross in 1814. In the year 1837, during his electrocrystallization experiments, Andrew Cross observed the unexpected emergence of insects under conditions that would typically be fatal to animal life. Cross had been conducting experiments involving a mixture of water, silicate of potassa, and hydrochloric acid dipping into electrified porous Vesuvius rock. His intention was to produce crystals of silica, which ultimately failed. However, on the 14th day of the experiment, Cross noticed small white growths appearing from the middle of the electrified stone, which further enlarged on the 18th day and developed long filaments. Notice how we're talking about a stone. These formations were clearly distinct from the artificial minerals Cross sought to create and defied explanation at the time. So Cross identified these insects as Acarus electricus, later known as Acari crossi, and sought the opinion of entomologists who confirmed their classification as mites from the genus Acarus. The origin of these insects remained elusive with speculations ranging from hatched ova deposited by airborne insects to the influence of electric action. Cross replicated the experiment multiple times, achieving similar results, including observing the insects growing below the surface of electrified fluid. However, the insects exhibited no signs of vitality when trapped in a chlorine atmosphere. Despite Cross's attempts to understand the phenomenon, he refrained from forming any conclusive theories. It would seem the release of his findings without his authorization led to public outrage and the accusations of blasphemy, causing Cross to withdraw from society. While subsequent attempts to recreate Cross's experiments have reportedly been unsuccessful, the mystery surrounding the appearance of these insects remained unsolved through Cross's life. It would definitely seem that they were playing with underground experiments in electricity. Consider this chilling scene from 1818, Scottish chemist Andrew Ure standing next to a recently executed murderer's body at the University of Glasgow. Here they performed a very strange demonstration. Armed with a 270 plate voltaic battery and two metallic rods, Ure shocked the attendees as the lifeless body convulsed and contorted in a horrifying spectacle, 
brought about by the electrical stimulation of the corpse's nerves. There are actually modern studies in support of spontaneous generation. In a study from the 70s, Sidney W. Fox showed how inorganic molecules, or the amino acids that he called proteinoid microspheres, would actually grow and divide when heated. He created the world's first protocell out of proteinoids in water. Fox was a proponent of abiogenesis, the creation of life from non-living matter. Interesting that he heated it in water similar to the alchemist. Now we're prepared to get deep. We know the history, the main arguments of both sides. Now it's time to really dive into this material because we're just getting started. We're going to begin this section with maybe one of the most insane and strange books ever to be written but it's also extremely rare. Let's do a disclaimer. I'm gonna tone down the graphic details, but there's no getting around how weird and disgusting this book is. The book we're discussing is The Book of the Cow, or Liber Vagi, named after the experiments contained within. Interestingly, this book is actually attributed to Plato, or it was believed and referenced by several others who considered it to be from Plato's Book of Laws. The name in Arabic is called Kitab al-Nawamis, which translates into the Book of Laws, but it's also translated as the Book of Sacred Secrets. It was also called Liber Enigrimis, a translation of Nawamis. It's important to note that they consider this to be pseudo-Plato, which as we brought up some questions, especially with the timeline, there are arguments that suggest that Plato and Aristotle are not from the timelines that they give us. But regardless, they say that in the 12th century, a Latin translation was copied in Spain with a different title, Liber Anaguimus. The ones that do exist are handwritten, difficult to read, and even some authors were suggesting that some of these works have been purposely altered in order to hide information. There are many references to this book in other works. Even one breakdown gives this table of contents of the book. Quote, This is for our teacher and leader, Plato. I have seen two books by him. The name of one of them is the Greater Book of the Laws, and the name of the second is the Smaller Book of the Laws. In the Greater Book, he speaks of affecting by means of images abominable things like walking on water, causing the appearance in whatever shape you may wish of the forms of composite animals which are not found in the world, causing rain to fall at time unseasonable for its falling, or causing it to be obstructed at time proper for its falling, making meteors shooting stars, and lights appear in the sky, lightning bolts to descend at unreasonable times, and the ships of one's enemies or whatever one wishes at a great distance to burn, walking in the air, causing the stars to rise at unseasonable times, and seeing them when they have fallen from their heavenly places to the center of the earth, conversing with the dead." End quote. This is discussed in David Pingree's book on the subject. Now it becomes clear that this homunculus is just a subcategory of a much larger and higher science. Artificial generation, or even spontaneous generation, connecting to an even higher science, the occult arts that allowed the practitioner to cause real world change. Obviously we need to discuss the blur between the astral and the physical, and we can discuss that, but some things do become evident. They were not playing around with just artificial creation but wombs and literally, quote, creating any type of creature they wish. Now, we can't go into everything right now, but it's important to take note that the alchemist, who we know for a fact, worked for the Holy Roman Church and her Palatine rulers, well, they believe this information to be true, including the ability to make meteors, shooting stars, and lights appear in the sky. I mean, that sounds pretty specific. How about burning whatever you want from a great distance? Hmm, that sounds familiar. If they didn't believe it to be true, then why were they hiring these alchemists to work for them? It would seem the ideology behind this is Greek metaphysics, but a more esoteric form in which you would actually move your soul or a soul into other material bodies or objects. That the soul is what allows things to move. Now this is where it gets interesting, and this also takes an occult mindset, but otherwise, Scholars typically begin to see this as allegorical, but it's not. It's based on philosophical concepts, but I argue that it's not only allegorical, but literal on multiple levels. They just viewed the soul differently, and we can use different terms for this, 
spiritual power, or aether. Now the secret here is that this soul contained any form, or the spiritual power of the magician, was synonymous with an image. Literally, by viewing an image in your mind, you were encapsulating a soul, if you will, into that form, creating an image. But that image represents something or is attached to something, a soul. This is the philosophical concept behind the alchemists, but they believed literally that the imagination was a real thing. That just by imagining something or creating an image in the mind, you were constraining a soul or consciousness to that image. This is the process of implanting. A magician can take certain spiritual powers or souls, not of the magician, for example planets, and implant them into objects, goals, or desired outcomes. It must be noted that this was not something they believed or hallucinated, but this was the beginning of the scientific method itself. Ancient magicians through trial and error undeniably proved the ability to affect the material world through the power of focused thought. Open any book on magic and this is what you find. And this is what is at question. Did these scientists in the 1600s actually have the ability to cause these real world effects through the combination of an early physical and spiritual science that was revived from an even more ancient source? Things to consider are the strength of the will of the magician. This includes a variety of factors such as focus and desires, but also to consider the type of spiritual forces implanted and into what body and at what time. This is the foundation, because in order to understand homunculus, we have to understand the greater science behind it. Homunculus is simply the name for the experiments done by the medieval scientists trying to revive the ancient art of artificial creation, but this process and science is much older and goes by many different names. So the Book of Cow does have a vast amount of miracle type spells and cosmic or heavenly transforming events causing changes to the Earth's atmosphere. It describes how to perform miracles similar to the Bible, to turn a staff into a snake, or to walk on water similar to Jesus. But there's something clear to note about the Book of Cow or Kitab al Nawamis, and that is it covers the concept of artificially creating rational and irrational animals, or in other words, this book teaches how to literally implant souls into the creation and generation of plants, animals, and men, each of which, according to Aristotle, has its own type of soul. The author of the Book of Cow claims that animals can be created by artificial means. It's important to note, as it expands the subject beyond a singular humanoid creature or tiny human in a bottle. It's crucial to make that distinction, because as we explore this phenomena further, the more doors that will open as what we're dealing with is an ancient science of allowing semen from a male animal to develop within an artificial womb. But I find it fascinating that in the book of the cow, there's a detailed ritual for the manufacturing of artificial bees. Now on one level, this is interesting from whether they really did find a way to generate insects using spontaneous generation outside of just growing maggots. The ritual involves a young female cow who is slaughtered and her blood is placed along with some of its body parts. Again, this stuff gets kind of graphic, but they take this organic substance from the cow and they put it in an enclosed chamber. They let it rot for 7 days and for some reason a dog penis is thrown on top. Then after another 7 days, worms start popping up. Now it gets weird because then you're instructed to feed these worms with a fistful of dead bees on a specific timeline of every 14 days. This is mind blowing because it also gets into other strange worm subjects because they're also androgynous so they play into this occult symbolism. But after two weeks, the worms will grow wings and turn into bees. Now it seems there's a reason that worms are used and this is really interesting because the answer actually lies with Aristotle where he claims in De Anima that ants and bees possess a special power or faculty that they have a complex soul. So what that means is they can't just be grown through spontaneous generation, the alchemists actually have to grow the worms first since they have a different type of soul and they can be produced using spontaneous generation. Then the next step is using the ritual and the dead bees, the alchemist transfers the soul or implants that soul into a new vehicle, creating rebirth. 
This also explains the fascination with bees by secret societies and royal coat of arms. You can see it everywhere. In old alchemy symbols, Rosicrucian symbols, even in this old engraving of a supposed collection, which really doesn't get that much attention, but on closer inspection we can see that this is an early Freemasonic alchemy library, as we can see even humans in the bottles and the occult bee symbolism. The author of the Book of Cows states, quote, Whoever wishes to make a rational animal should take his own water, a quam swam, while it's still warm. This water is the semen, and Aristotle believed that this semen contained a soul but only while warm. One should mix this warm aqua with an equal amount of the stone, which is also to be called the sunstone. Interesting, that's important to note for later. Also, the sun is the father in astrology, but also signifying God's son. Here is a quote from the book. Quote, then one should look out for a ewe or a cow, whichever of these one chooses, and insert the mixture in her womb and plug up her genital with the sunstone. End quote. It would then seem they take blood from the cow to provide nourishment for this newly created being. Although primitive, this seems to be a reference to some type of ancient occult ritual involving male fluid of a magician that would be put on a stone, some type of special sunstone that then would be used in, well, artificial insemination. But not just that, that it creates a chamber in which this mixture can putrefy or grow, a hermetically sealed chamber. Then they take this cow and lock her in a house with no sunlight. This is to be the second womb. Now listen to this, another translation from the book. Quote, While awaiting the birth of the animal, the magician mixes a powder made of crushed sunstone, sulfur, magnet, and green zinc stirred in with the sap of aqua semen of a white willow. This is some type of mixture upon which the cow gives birth. The creature is placed into this powder and is instantly clothed in human flesh. Now this newborn tiny humanoid is kept in a large glass or vessel for three days until it becomes exceedingly hungry. It is then fed for seven days on its mother's blood and develops into a complete animal, with which other marvels can be performed. For instance, it can be placed on a white cloth with a mirror in its hands and suffumigated with the previously mentioned powder mixed with human blood. Then, the moon will appear to be full on the last day of the month, or it can be decapitated and its blood collected. If the blood is given to a man to drink, he will assume the form of a bovine or a sheep, but if he is anointed with it, he will have the form of an ape. Finally, if the animal is fed for 40 days on a diet of blood, milk, and semen, then its guts are extracted from its belly and rubbed on someone's hands and feet, he may walk on water or traverse the diameters of the earth in the winking of an eye." End quote. Now this is very interesting because at first, Many may think that this is all hallucinated or one could say some type of astral magic if you're going to be traveling at such speeds and performing miraculous feats. But on another level, there may be something else going on with this book. The homunculus is a soul that has been placed into an artificial body. As we'll see, it's not detailed in this book, but there's another component to this homunculus that must be considered. The reason that this being is magical is because it's an artificially created being that was manifested in accordance to astrology. But more importantly, the magician could implant the soul of the planets themselves into this new artificial body. We will discuss that more later, as it may complicate things now, but we can't deduce that this is false just because miracles and strange events start occurring. It may seem impossible, but we're dealing with different states here. The next part of the book makes the subject even more insane. The next chapter in the Book of Cow covers the artificial generation of a rational animal by a similar ritual with the cow, but this time it's with a female ape. It says that her offspring undergoes, quote, appropriate manipulations. Hmm, is this where monsters and cryptids come from? Even different type of deformed humans like the one-legged man? This directly connects the monstrous beings from Christianity to the alchemist in artificial creation. Could this knowledge have been wiped? The Book of the Cow was very difficult to find and there are no full English translations. 
they would literally create mythical beings, whatever they wanted. And they would sculpt, shape, and create these deformed beings physically, like merging different pieces from different bodies. And then doing this at such an early stage so that the being would then grow into all sorts of creatures. Think about it. The basilisk, monsters with human heads, even the demons from Grimoires. These are all different types of homunculus. In the book, it also discusses how one can take the organs of the creature and rub them into certain spots to gain the powers of that organ. Since the homunculus is a magical creature, the organs are magical and are connected more in tune with the astral, and therefore they can see and communicate with spirits. By rubbing the eyes of the homunculus into one's eyes, the ability would be gained to be able to see all spirits and demons, like the homunculus can. Henry Cornelius Agrippa actually references Plato, but scholars say that he's not speaking of the actual Plato, but of the same author as Picatrix in the Book of the Cow, as an authority on the manufacture of magical lamps. Again, why would these alchemists, the people who were writing the earliest versions on the book, say Plato? And then this was also believed by Agrippa? The Book of Laws, or also known as Liber Numic, the Hebrew translation, we can see clearly that Agrippa references the artificial generation of monsters and how they are not according to the laws of nature. The Book of Cow also interestingly has other extraordinary rituals that can cause the moon to split in half and also to cause the appearance of giants. Is it possible that someone could create a giant homunculus? There's a phenomenal paper by Liana Saif called The Cows and the Bees where she really dives into the Arabic sources and the differences contained with the Book of the Cow in comparison to Pingree's analysis of the book, concluding that it was an example of Neoplatonic thought. She breaks down some really crazy sources, but first, we need to discuss the bees. If you haven't seen the Ancient Cloning Factories video, go check it out as it's going to start really connecting here. There's bee symbolism throughout masonry, occult brotherhoods, and royalty not to mention alchemy. Yes, even the postcards. Now we know what they're referring to. Because this ritual discussed in the Book of the Cow or Liber Vacai is actually an ancient ritual of spontaneous generation that has been practiced for thousands of years. Supposedly, again, I have different views on the timeline, but forgetting that for now. The Book of the Cow and the Latin translation are dated around the 12th century, but the original Arabic sources could be of an earlier age. However, we can find a reference to this exact same ritual in ancient Rome, which we now know was used to create some type of demon homunculus, one that was prophetic in nature. The proof is contained in Book 4 of Virgil's Georgics, which is a famous poem. Virgil was an ancient Roman poet who played a vital role in shaping Latin literature. In lines 281 through 314, we get instructions very similar to Liber Vacai but a thousand years earlier. Quote, but if someone's whole brood has suddenly failed and he has no stock from which to recreate a new line, then it's time to reveal the famous invention of Aristius, the Arcadian master, and the method by which in the past, the adulterated blood of dead bullocks has generated bees. Well, that line on the stock was a little suspicious. They had to recreate a new line? But let's continue. What we're looking at is an ancient reference to alchemy, but it just wasn't called that yet. Now, that was from a later translation. It says a dead bullocks, but in the original Latin, it goes, quote, first, a small and contracted place is chosen and adopted for the purpose. And they press the walls of the narrow roof with tiles and add four hives at the corner, four slanting windows for the winds. Then a calf already curling its two-year-old horns on its forehead is sought. The double nostrils and breath of its mouth are stopped up with many obstructions, and having been killed by blows, its entrails are loosened through its intact skin. So they leave it lying in a confined space and put broken branches beneath the rib bones, in fresh thyme and cassia. This is done when the west winds first drive the waves, before the meadows blush with new colors, before the chattering swallow suspends its nest from the rafters. Meanwhile, the moisture, 
heated in the soft bones, seethes, in the miraculous animals that are to be seen by the modes, first deprived of feet, then buzzing with wings, mix together and more and more skim the thin air." End quote. So hold up, that's alchemy. And they're even using herbs and timing references. They even are hermetically sealing the cow. We'll come to find out there's actually a name for this ritual. It's called the Ancient Art of Bogonia. This was an ancient ritual on the generation of bees. And they even try to say on the wiki that it was more just poetic or some learned trope rather than an actual practice. Hmm, I think that seems like a cover up because it's clear that this is not poetic. This is the exact same ritual that's mentioned in Liber Vacai. It's also found in Byzantine Geoponica. Perhaps the earliest mention is by Nicander of Colophon. The Hermetic Chironides reported that worms are born after one week and bees after three weeks. Which again confirms without a doubt that is what we were dealing with in the Book of the Cow. But it specifically ties the creation of the homunculus to far more earlier origins. Especially if we consider the Queen Bee with Diana of Ephesus. Quoting Ovid's Metamorphosis 361-68, Florentinius of the Geoponica reports the process as proven and obvious fact. Quote, if any further evidence is necessary to enhance the faith in things already proved, you may behold the carcasses decaying from the effect of time and tepid moisture change into small animals. Go and bury slaughtered oxen. The fact is known from experience. The rotten entrails produce flower-sucking bees who, like their parents, roam over pastures, bent upon work, and hopeful of the future. A buried war horse produces the hornet." End quote. So let's keep in mind that he mentioned the oxen and a horse, and he's literally saying to have faith in it because it is a fact known from experience. We didn't mention this, but John Baptista de la Porta in Natural Magic brings this up and goes into way more detail. The fact that Aristotle did not mention Bogonia, yet does have a section on bees, have led scholars to believe that Bogonia wasn't real. Well, the authors discussing this were not just being poetic, but also cryptic, similar to the alchemist. Aristotle could have left that out because it's far too occult. Even Celsus, who spoke of the ancient Hyperboreans, was against the practice. This was a secret art form or a cult ritual which was only known to the adepts of the order. Archelaus calls bees the factitious progeny of a decaying ox. And in De Agricultura, written by Marcus Gatto, also known as Gatto the Elder, in 160 BC, the conversation between Vasius and another character touches upon the concept of Bugonia, or the belief in the spontaneous generation of bees from the carcass of an ox. The Greek term, Bogonius, born of an ox, is used to describe these bees. Okay, so it's not mentioned for like a thousand years, and then out of nowhere, it just pops up again in Liber Vacai, or Book of the Cow. Interestingly, it doesn't seem that the two are directly connected. But Petro de Crescenzi, an Italian jurist, agronomist, and author, refers to Bogonia around 1304, in the Book of Rural Benefits. Also, Bogonia is very close to Bologna. I wonder if there's a connection there. In 1475, Conrad of Megenburg, in the first German book of natural history, claimed that the bees are born from the skin in the stomach of an ox. Michael Herring gives a detailed description of Bogonia drawn from Geoponica. Johannes Kolletisch, whose book constituted the book of reference for many generations of apiarists expressing the same belief in Bogonia. The method appears even in European apiculture books of the 1700s. So, you're telling me that this was an ancient practice in Rome, referenced by several reputable sources, but mainstream scholars tell us it's just poetic? Then over a thousand years pass by, and then it's referenced as a very real thing by Italian and German writers on agriculture. It was still referenced and discussed as a practice up to the 1700s, so. Even Gato the Elder makes reference to the Bible 
that has a story or allusion to this. Quote, out of the eater came forth meat, and out of the strong came forth sweetness. Judges 14. In the book of Judges, where Samson puts forward the riddle of out the strong came forth sweetness, referring to a swarm of bees found inside of a dead lion. There are several commenters, including Vassius, who cited this allusion to suggest to Varro that while he might not know nothing much about cattle, his attempt to deal with the subject might prove some useful discussion. This reveals that, obviously, this was a secret practice. That will become more clear as we proceed. Okay, so let's go back to the Book of the Cow, or Liber Vacai, and take some more notes. So essentially, this strange book discusses how to use blood, or sperm, to produce an artificial or spontaneous generation of a magically powerful, rational animal that can tell the maker anything that it would like to know. This tends to lead people into thinking that it's just fantasy, but this just dives into deeper aspects of the occult that are not known by most people. This book is essentially showing you how to create a god being, some type of prophet. They obviously are not giving the full details and being cryptic, but we will see more examples of this as we proceed. They wanted to create an intelligent being that can learn, talk, and even give wisdom, but there became an issue. Because this was grown outside of the womb of the mother, it would seem this leads to dark and negative manifestations as the homunculus were turned demonic in nature. Some scholars argue that it's evident that Paracelsus read the Book of the Cow or Liber Vagai and it had influenced his writings. The fact that he didn't bring it up shows how well preserved the secret is. The author of the original Book of the Cow seems to view this being as demonic in nature. But interestingly, there are other techniques described where the adept can get around this issue and make a wholly new species, including for instance, a girl with the face of a boy or even, with a bit of luck, a being with prophetic powers. They were discussing how to literally cause changes in the way it looks, even the face. Okay, now this is insane. Inside the text, it begins to discuss a method in which you can get around the issue. How to create a non-demonic homunculus. The text explains by placing the glass vessel that contains the being in a large metal rotating sphere designed to simulate the effects of the crystalline sphere that rotate about the earth itself? Whoa, what? None of the later alchemists mention this device whatsoever. And think about that. We're getting really deep in this fantasy if it's all just imagination. They literally were designing imaginary machines? Or is it possible that this was actually a real device? Very strange. So there are more methods for creating a more pure homunculus written in this text. They knew exactly what they were trying to achieve. Also, some early alchemists who referenced or wrote on this text explain how the female seed is not necessary at all to contribute to generation. All that is needed is the male seed. We should also mention that the book does cover some extraordinary rituals such as how to cause the moon to split in half, and also how to create giants. It would seem the subject of giants may be related here, as Paracelsus even makes reference to this. So what do we know so far? Well, it would seem this Liber Vacai book is discussing experiments that require sex with an animal, the creation of a human-like being and or monster-like being, depending on the variables at play, and also, some type of skin that can be made from alchemical powder in which the creature is placed in this growing skin is quite detailed. Then it continues explaining the different abilities and powers of these beings. In this case of the cow, it would seem all holes must be closed and the female animal's private parts plugged. But there's another component to this powder skin. They had other methods. Now this is insane, so prepare yourself, but literally the text discusses how you can actually design a skin or a costume for the creature in which to place it in and it will grow and form into it. Basically, once you have the early form of the creature as the animal gives birth to this rotting tiny creature, then they use this powder and or create an artificial skin that they designed 
literally with different animal parts and or heads, then this outfit would wrap around the newly created being. So now let's look at the work that inspired the Book of the Cow. Because on its own, it doesn't really explain too much, and it seems as if it may just be one rare example. But that's the point I'm trying to make clear. It isn't. And the reason that we don't see more examples of this is because it was literally a secret art, and they only spoke about this between members of the Brotherhood. Why do we know this? Well, because they literally were translating this by hand, and it was kind of a thing that would be shared between the bros where they would copy the text and they were even found in Christian monasteries. So what were the monks doing with this information? Even John Dee is said to have owned a copy. What happened is these actually come from older Arabic sources, and around the 12th century, they began translating and exchanging this text between elite members. However, this led to the text eventually being released to the public, as there are some in private collections. Let's start off with Nabataean Agriculture, a 10th century text by Ibn Washia. This is a very important text and claimed to be the most influential, literally, the first text or book on agriculture. Really, and even the author claims that it's based on a 20,000 year old Mesopotamian text. That's interesting to note because that means they got it from somewhere else. There is a chapter on the Abraham tree where the author gives instructions for artificially generating an extraordinary creature. He described it as having the form of a winged, two-handed fish. This account is actually repeated in multiple texts. The generated animal has special occult abilities which are used to cause certain effects in the sky and stars. The author even clearly states that these were secret operations. Okay, so we gotta bring up Picatrix, which is suspected to be the first grimoire or the first major release on magic. This Arabic text inspired all other grimoires from the Western tradition. It was the foundation for the Western alchemical tradition. Picatrix is a Latin name. The original title is Gayat al-Hakim, which most scholars assume was written in the 11th century, though arguments have been made to place it in the first half of the 10th century. The name of the book translates to The Aim of the Sage or The Goal of the Wise, and there are some interesting things to take from the book. It's not so graphic as the Book of the Cow, but we bring it up because it's actually its counterpart, and some scholars argue that they were written by the same author. One recent study in Studia Islamica suggests that the authorship of this work should be attributed to Qasim al Qurtubi, who, according to Ibn al Farabi, was a man of charms and talismans. The Picatrix reveals how to create talismans using astrological influences and, in a sense, capture their energies into an object. Now, although there's no homunculus mentioned, there is a part on artificial generation. The Picatrix does include examples for the artificial generation of both rational and irrational animals, not by penetration, but how to create green scorpions and snakes, which shows Paracelsus had been reading these earlier texts, and others like Delaporta. He also mentions that the Indians are masters at this art, and I thought that was interesting because of all the references from ancient Greek historians and philosophers discussing as a fact that India was full of hybrid-like creatures and monsters, such as werewolves, blemmies, and the one-legged Bigfoot human. There's another Arabic text named Kitab al-Sumam. We find a description for creating a rational, wild animal, which is a beast with a human head, a tail and four feet, two of which will be hoofs. By looking at the creature, it can cause death. Well, that might be our earliest basilisk reference. It's just a slightly different variation. Interestingly, there's only one instance for the generation of animals with the heads and bodies resembling different creatures, and it only survives in one single manuscript. It's called Oyun al Hakal Ik. Saif gives us information on this in her The Cows and the Bees. The text translates to The Sources of Truths and the Explication of Paths a text on the magical practices which contain 26 chapters that correspond to the sections in Liber Vacai. This gives us a glance into the Arabic reception of Kitab al-Nuwamis. Quote, 
of the Arabic texts which bear some relation to Liber Vacae. Al Iraqi's Oyun al Hakal Iq corresponds most closely with the content of the Latin translation. End quote. She doesn't provide a full translation, but we do have the original text, it would just take more time to research. However, we do know that the text references the instructions on how to generate scorpions and snakes. Quote, Description of the fermentation of snakes. If you want this, take as many big spiders as you can, put them in a glass bottle and overwhelm them with genet milk, enough to submerge them and leave it in manure for four weeks. A red snake will be generated from it. If instead of spiders a big tarantula is placed, a snake like a serpent will be generated from it. If it stings a human, it kills her him on the spot and in the same hour, having no antidote. This book is really strange, and it has all sorts of creatures and hybrids. Perhaps, there are methods in which one could create their own monster. There's even a human-like creature hybrid with horns. Saif makes the argument that these writings correlate both with the Picatrix and Liber Vagai. The Arabs were the Saracens. This would hint that the Saracens revived this art and then it was erased. They were also connected with the Templars. They obviously did not want this to be known. Did they have the ability to create hybrid creatures? It would explain more clearly why they have hybrid symbols on their churches. We'll come back to that. The author of the Picatrix was greatly influenced by Ibn Washia's Nabataean agriculture and Jabir Ibn Hayyan. He's an even earlier Paracelsus and is the author of an enormous number and variety of works in Arabic, often called the Jabirian Corpus. The works that survive today mainly deal with alchemy and chemistry, magic, and Shiite religious philosophy. However, the original scope of the corpus was vast and diverse covering a wide range of topics ranging from cosmology, astronomy and astrology, over medicine, pharmacology, zoology, and botany to metaphysics, logic, and grammar. We know this because several authors throughout history have made references to his books. Jabir Ibn Hayyan is one of the most brilliant and intelligent scientists in the golden era of Muslims. He is famous for inventing various instruments for chemistry experiments. He discovered new chemicals which include hydrochloric acid. He was the first to produce sulfuric acid and nitric acid. Sulfuric acid is used in car batteries today. Hayan was a prolific writer, authoring more than 3,000 research articles and treatises in his life, and more than 70 books were translated into other languages. There is even some debate about whether he was actually able to complete that many works or if it even existed. This tends to lean towards the idea that they were actually manipulating the timeline and creating false figures to represent bodies of knowledge and then compiling that under a pseudonym or figure. But forgetting that, Hayan is well referenced and considered to be one of the founding fathers of chemistry. In his works, Hayan says that artificial generation of minerals, plants, and animals is the art of imitating nature, and that he also relates it to the Greco-Egyptian and hermetic practice of animating statues. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. Hayan argued that you could not only mimic God and his creations, but also produce ones never seen before. Hayan even refers to an experiment with elements familiar to us by now. Whoever takes a bull, it is best if it is red, then leads it into a house, throws leaves of hashashia to it, shuts the door through which it has entered, opens four windows above it, and around the house, and abandons the bull until it dies and putrefies. As a result, bees will generate from it. Jabir ibn Hayyan describes experiments of his own in his Kitab al-Tajmi. Using sperm and blood, he placed a medium inside a sphere that contained the image of an animal to be generated. Now this is insane, because we're getting into more details on these devices now. This is what makes Hayan's work differ from others is he actually describes this thing as some type of apparatus with concentric half spheres in which you were to place your mold or in some translations the image of what you want this being to be. It was a homunculus rotisserie machine. More so like some type of advanced armillary sphere to mimic the cosmic system in the homunculus in its artificial womb 
would be rotating within a sphere within a sphere. Heian's works goes into how to change the face or to give it different genders and different levels of intelligence. He even discusses different schools or methods in which you could create a winged man by mixing the sperm of a man and a bird. I don't know about you, but I feel like this deserves more attention because not only is this the foundation of all the other alchemists we brought up earlier, but it shows the deeper disturbing aspects of this art. It's quite shocking to realize that this is what some of the most influential minds of history were actually getting into. To explain more, Heian discusses this in more detail. This homunculus device was created to solve the issue of the demons manifesting. They wanted to literally create an intelligent human. So the works of Heian and al Kurtubi, the alleged writer of Picatrix and the Book of the Cow, prove the subject of Bogonia is connected to artificial generation and the creation of homunculus. This is because they are part of the same science and art of encapsulating a soul as mentioned earlier. This encompasses many different works on magic including talismans and causing change from a distance. al Kurtubi also speaks on the necessity of the planets and the infusion of their energies during spontaneous generation. This is something that is crucial to the process, but not brought up by later authors on the subject, and if they do mention it, they left details out and or were being cryptic. This seems to be one of the most crucial aspects to the art. The one who is ignorant of making talismans cannot artificially create life or the homunculus. That's not to say the homunculus is just a talisman, but they are connected. But keep that in mind that the generation of animals require fermentation or putrefaction. Also, in Nabataean agriculture, Ibn Washia tells us that the astrological elections are essential in artificial generation. Quote, None of these operations of generation can succeed without making sure that the moon is waxing and safe from malefics. Also, the tail of the dragon cannot be in its node nor in a crooked sign nor the end of signs. These creations and generations follow the same course as talismans, for they need elections in making good the moon in the same manner as these talismans require. End quote. Al Kurtubi defines taffin as creating a quote, moist material at the location of generation and the utilizing the receptivity of images and form. End quote. One of the authors that influenced Shabir, another author under a pseudonym apparently, Apollonius Sir al Kalika, The Secret of Creation, a work that discusses on how at the moment of conception, when semen and blood congeal, the resulting embryo stays still for an hour, then it undergoes fermentation. The heat of the fermentation initiates its development. In one of the experiments of artificial generation related in the Gaia, which produces a semi brute, Sheeb Hayawan, by inserting human or other animal semen inside an egg. The process of fermentation is referred to also as Heed Ana, incubation. So wait, is that the story that Agrippa was referring to? So they were inserting human seeds into eggs to hatch? Where have we seen that before? Also, in his work Nabataean Agriculture, Ibn Washia elaborates further on the theory of artificial generation particularly of plants, he emphasizes the benefit gained from the practice in it. Quote, the chapter with the greatest benefit, it is superior to grafting because it leads whoever knows it to achieve the generation of taquin, of fruitful trees, and the generation of tal lead, of pulses, herbs, beneficial medicines, and harmful poisons. The process called taquin, tal lead, or tafin, requires the power known as the nature of natures, Tabi ad ad tabi al, which humans are able to reproduce. This is a gift bestowed upon them by the gods. Every plant originated from an ancestor generated by an ancient inventor, al Kadim al Maghatari, who gave people the power to emulate his actions. The most essential natural action for the process is fermentation, tafin, which requires the joining of moisture and heat in the soil. If standing water remains stagnant, it will make the land around it wet. 
If the land is wet, the moisture in its cavity becomes salty and is absorbed by the soil. Moist and hot air hits it, a soft heat. Then the sun heats it with a heat that is fiercer than the heat of the air, and as the result, fermentation is achieved. If it ferments, it is changed, and if it is changed, it is altered. This alteration is a transformation. Once it is transformed through fermentation, it forms the nature which is the power generated from the four qualities in the earth and the collaboration of the two heats, air and sun, overwhelming the two colds, water and earth." End quote. So this is important because it's connected to Aristotle's account on generation, quite mechanistic, and does consider the influence of planetary effusions and rays, yet the Arabic sources do. Which makes no sense because some of these Arabic sources take on pseudo names and credit the works to these Greek philosophers. This will lend to the idea that Aristotle was leaving information out and or is from a different time period than they tell us. In a later passage, Ibn Moshiach adds that fermentation happens by constant exposure of moisture to heat, which leads the moisture itself to be transformed into a state between water and oil. This is how a truffle coagulates into a soft, solid mass. Then, a second fermentation is required to initiate growth. The Arabic sources go into more detail on the power of the moon. The prominent astrologer Abu Mashar al-Baqi notes the moisture and fermentation, tafin, are both lunar effects. This influential 10th century coterie of anonymous philosophers known as Iqwan al-Safa the Brethren of Purity, explain in their Ad Risala al Jamial, the comprehensive epistle, that the motion of the moon generates truffles and also some animals, like birds, silkworms, and bees, adding that most of them are created in 14 days and emerge after nursing in 21 days, for this is the period of the moon coursing from day of incubation until exiting from the sun. Basically what they're saying is that this is literally a natural process. Not just that, yes, sexual intercourse happens naturally, but they're describing phenomena in which animals are being generated due to astrological influences alone. During certain conditions and or time periods, this could spawn a variety of different animals. According to these ancient sages, it has to do with these energies being the crucial component to artificially generating life, and that it actually occurs in nature without human intervention. Okay, so there's actually another section of Nabataean agriculture where Ibn Washia discusses the bee ritual, but he mentions something else this time. Now this is insane. Ibn Washia discusses spontaneous generation of fauna and the generation of bees from bulls. This time, we also learn about regions where humans and animals exist only through spontaneous generation. For example, he relates that in the Indian Sea, during springtime, Sometimes, a hand emerged which people reported and contemplated. Every year, this hand had a different color, proving that the sightings related to many individuals, not just one. In the same sea, mermaids and mermen were reported to have been caught in fishermen's nets. They were alive, sentient, and mobile. The adult mermen had beards and were called the doctors of the sea, Tabib al-Bal, while those without beards had tiny teeth like those of boys. Weird that he mentions that because there's barely any historic images of this begonia ritual, the bee from the cow ritual, and the one image that there is of it literally shows mermaids, so not sure what to make of that other than they're telling you what this actually was. Even Washia continues and says, humans or human-like creatures can be artificially generated too. We're told about this Magus, Ankabutha, who described in his book on the subject how he generated a creature which was like a human but lacked speech or understanding. Ankabutha received this information from a certain book on the mysteries of the sun by Asclepius, messenger of the sun, Rasul al Shams, who related how he created the cosmic man, Al Insan al Khani. Anka Butha asserts that the artificial generation of humans in the microcosm is a sublunary reproduction of divine creation. 
Even Washia admits that for his own part, he failed to achieve an operation like this. Whereas Ankabutha did not fail due to the virtue of his knowledge in talismanic and magical works, because in practice, the method of generation is the same method of making talismans and magic. Whoever is able to make talismans, all the works of creation and generation are easy to him. So look at this. These ancient alchemists, who supposedly are the first sources, all write about earlier sources as if they did not compare to the original masters. Supposedly, the author failed in creating humans with intelligence, but the author of the book that he got his knowledge from was a master with even more wisdom, which proves that they had the art of creating humans mastered before the source. Therefore, in Ibn Washia's works in both Kitab al-Sumam and his Nabataean agriculture makes it clear that the understanding of fermentation, spontaneous generation, astrological influences, and occult properties is essential in performing artificial generation, or in other words, the creation of a homunculus. In these works, we actually also find a theory and operation which fit into the alchemical and magical tradition that includes the Picatrix, Liber Vacai, and the works of Paracelsus. Understanding this proves that the Book of the Cow or Liber Vacai and the Arabic works connected to the Picatrix are a part of the same tradition. There was an ancient Greek reference that we left out at the beginning because it's quite strange. However, we now have arrived at one of the earliest accounts of the homunculus. Zosimos of Panopolis, a Greco-Egyptian alchemist and Gnostic mystic who lived during the transition between the 3rd and 4th centuries. Zosimos is created with authoring the oldest known alchemical literature, the Chiric Meta, a Greek term meaning things made by hand. He is one of about 40 authors represented in a compendium of alchemical writings that was probably put together in Constantinople in the 7th or 8th century, copies of which exist in manuscripts in Venice and Paris. In Ibn Al-Nadim's Kitab Al-Farist, four books by Zosimos are mentioned. Although attributed to Thosimos, Dosimos, and Remos, due to transliteration inconsistencies, Fuad Zeskin, a historian, located Zosimos manuscripts in six libraries worldwide. Zosimos' works significantly influenced the Arabic alchemical tradition, as it is referenced in several works. While Zosimos' conception of the homunculus differs from the traditional alchemical version, renowned psychologist Carl Jung identified it as the first instance of the homunculus idea in alchemical literature. In his work on virtue, Zosimos recounts a series of dreams that demand symbolic interpretation, providing an intriguing glimpse into the early development of the homunculus concept and its relationship to alchemy and mysticism. Quote, I fell asleep, and I saw a sacrificer before me on the altar in the form of a flask. The altar where the priest was had fifteen steps. I heard his voice coming from above say, I have undergone the action that consists in descending the fifteen steps, radiating darkness, and in ascending the steps sending forth light. The sacrificer himself is remaking me by rejecting the thickness of my body and consecrated out of necessity. I am perfected as Numa. Having heard the voice of him who was in the flask, I asked him to tell me who he was. I am Eon, the priest of inaccessible places, for someone has come at the break of dawn, running, and he has made himself my master, cutting me apart with a knife, tearing me asunder according to the constitution of harmony, and skinning my entire head with the sword that he clasped. He intertwined the bones with the flesh and burned me up with a scorching fire from his hand until I had learned to become Numa by metamorphosing my body. Behold the intolerable violence that is my lot. And as he was saying these things, I was pressing him to talk. His eyes became like blood, and he vomited forth his flesh. And I saw him change into a mutilated homunculus, Anthroparion biting himself and wounding himself with his own teeth. Seized with fear, I thought, is it not thus that the composition of the waters is produced? And I was convinced that I had understood well. End quote. Um, that seems way more than just a dream. And where did they get the imagination for this type of stuff? Zosimus provided one of the first definitions of alchemy as a study of the composition of waters, movement, growth, embodying and disembodying 
drawing the spirits from bodies and bonding the spirits within bodies. End quote. Why is the eye such a prominent symbol in occult secret societies? Let us explore further as the symbol should be quite clear to see now. Let's dive down the rabbit hole with an alchemical text and let's just break it down. The work Kabbalah by Spiegel der Kunst und Natur in Alchemia, 1615, which translates to Kabbalah, mirror or art, and nature in alchemy. And in this fascinating alchemical text, authored by Stefan Mikkelsbacher, a German alchemist, it features four captivating engravings by artist Raphael Kustos. These are very unveiling because the idea behind these works is that it would merge hermetic symbolism, single point perspective, and the concept of mirrors, or a double self, to guide the reader through an alchemical journey of understanding. They literally put the meanings into these images to be decoded. It's obvious once you see it. The book attempts to use the concept of mirrors to understand the self, the mysteries of alchemy and divinity. The emphasis on mirrors is also connected to a trend during the 16th and 17th centuries, where several publications use terms such as the speculum or spiegel. What's interesting is that this single point perspective was literally a device in which they would communicate this secret meaning. Think about it. Perspective was just being developed during this time, so images with this technique, which revolutionized art and visual representation, were believed to have a deeper, mystical significance during this time. It brings you into the image, you go into another world, you go through the mirror. And they understood this type of symbolism extensively, but the stranger part of all this is their connection to royals and, well, human farming. People began to think that images drawn using the single point perspective system could create magical mirrors capable of revealing hidden knowledge and truths. They literally believe this to be a portal for demons and higher metaphysical beings, including John Dee, who was known to use magic mirrors, but also believed the single point perspective system could be a magic mirror on its own. This idea was rooted in the belief that such images could serve as a bridge between the material world and the spiritual realm, providing glimpses into the mysteries of the universe and the divine. We must consider that from this point on in our journey, we must look at this information from a more occult or esoteric point of view. The knowledge of the alchemist is secretly encoded within these images, and they're actually telling you within the text. They're attempting to speak to the inner levels of one's psyche. This knowledge is encoded within the image or speculum, the magic mirror. This is the only way we can read between the lines of many of these writers on these obscure topics. We begin the Hall of Mirrors with the cover of the book being a Tudor rose with a crown. There's also an emblem in the intro with a plant stem coming out of a cube. After the book goes in detail on the occult and alchemical philosophy, it even mentions the homunculus. Now we're not going to read the entire thing, but I couldn't find an English translation of this text. Therefore, we translated the original German text so that you could check it out yourself. This was published in 1663, after spontaneous generation had already begun to be debated. Yet this proves without a shadow of a doubt that they were being very secretive about this process. The book doesn't directly say the term homunculus, but let's really bring up some of the questionable quotes from this book before we get to the emblems. It's pretty clear what they're discussing now that we know some history. The author begins with the cryptic philosopher's stone, stating what a wise old stone and that it is threefold. Let's remember that. He begins with his analogy of mirrors after giving praise to the royalty of his time. He begins discussing the secret, or at least what they perceive to be the secret of single point perspective. He even makes reference to the reader being compared to the prisoners in Plato's cave allegory basically saying that the readers aren't on his level or that they couldn't even begin to understanding the forms that he's discussing. So that's kind of the approach that these scientists were taking with this type of knowledge. But he continues, he says the purpose of giving this knowledge of the mirror, for those who can understand it, of course, is so that according to their desires and create much fruit and benefit. Okay, so this is about creating fruits. Interestingly, the author says he is unworthy of this knowledge 
and the only way he can pass it on is through the secret art of mirrors. He says, quote, Through the understanding of this mirror, they can achieve great benefits in various aspects of life, such as maintaining good health, sustaining their bodies with abundant necessities, and nurturing their souls to find eternal life. As seekers of knowledge and practitioners of this art, it is essential to be open to understanding and learning. For only then can one grasp the true essence of this mysterious and transformative discipline." End quote. He begins discussing these mirrors in comparison to alchemy. The first mirror represents the initial stage, where the practitioner works with the basic elements of nature, mercury and salt, to extract the essential properties needed for the transformation. In this mirror, the author sees the wise and murky in their salt, which are the initial substances to be worked with. This could be seen as the mixing and combination of the elements. The second mirror symbolizes the stage where the alchemist works with sulfur, another key element in the alchemical process. Here, the author sees the sulfur of the wise, similar to the flower called chilodinium, which represents the transformative power of sulfur in alchemy. The vegetable essence mentioned signifies growth and multiplication, which is the goal of the alchemist. The third mirror stands for the final stage of the process, where the alchemist combines the elements from the previous stages and refines them further. In this mirror, the author experiences a fiery red substance that seems to contain divine power and mystery. This likely refers to the philosopher's stone or the ultimate goal of the alchemical process. Nally explains how the pictures in the book, or mirrors, reveal the secret behind the process. He even says, to bring the three mirrors into one, you must go through these degrees, connecting it to masonry. He finishes off in his conclusion on this ancient stone and that this is the foundation of the highest medicine of chemistry. He even mentions aqua viscosa, which is a clear reference to semen. Quote, aqua viscosa is the first essence as the wise teach you, born from and through the art of our nature, the highest tincture is created." End quote. Then just in case you had any question, towards the end of his conclusion, he mentions the living chalice and horse manure. So it seems that this is some type of secret manual. Now, let's try to decode the images. We begin with exaltation, with the title, Kabbalah. The first thing that draws our attention is the fire-breathing chimera with the old headwear that the popes used to wear and it had three tiers. So this is a hybrid pope creature and on its back is a flask that contains a raven, a peacock, and a phoenix rising towards the sun, creating the philosopher's stone. At the top of this flask we see a star emitting divine energies into the glass bottle. This is to represent the importance of astrological influences as we mentioned earlier. I do find it interesting that they have this threefold symbolism with the zodiac, and they happen to put Taurus, or the cow, under this chimera. Leo is the sulfur in this case, and Capricorn is the mercury, obviously leaving Taurus at the bottom as the transmutation or amalgamation. Therefore, this is undeniably a homunculus. The next page is called Mirror art and nature, and we get some coat of arms symbolism. We see a phoenix, or more likely an eagle, with a book saying Prima Materia. This is the pillar of nature. To the right, we get a lion, the Lion of Venice. This is the pillar of art, and the book says Ultima Materia, or the final matter, the final product of the art of alchemy. This begins to show that yes, Royalty and coat of arms is connected to everything we've been discussing. We see the hidden knight's helmet, because he's being cloaked and hidden, crowned with a literal phoenix cap that resembles the ancient Hebrew and Mesopotamian Phrygian caps. We also see the three spheres on his shield, and this is the three mirrors and stages of the alchemical process. These can also be seen on coat of arms. We continue to the middle section of this image, where we see to the left a man carving his way through a tunnel into the mountain and using a candle to help him lead the way. He also has his cap and on the ground you can see the square and compass. 
below at the bottom, we kind of have the underground components to the image. This is the underground laboratory. This is where the process of distillation and purification occurs. Above, we see the methods and template in which this takes place. We see that they're continuing with the symbols of Mercury, Saturn, Mars, and Venus. They have laid this all out geometrically and assigned the different arts. Then to the left, we see the extraction process with two snakes in dealing with two processes of nature. It says hot, dry, cold, moist. To the far right of this middle section is the final output. It's showing you the successful process being exported ready for pickup. Then, when we get to the next image, conjunction, we see arranged the zodiacal rulers or personifications of the planets. The goal at the very top is Mercury or Hermes. Even under, we see a phoenix representing the rebirth process and that it's all under a mountain. So, is it hidden beneath the earth or from plain sight? We see two men aspiring for this goal. One is chasing a rabbit into a hole, one that most likely goes very deep. And then, the other man approaches the subject blindly and with faith. There's an entire structure underneath this mountain, and this is the underground process and art in which this occurs. Inside, it seems to be a king with a scepter and a queen with a rose or a flower. Finally, the background is the zodiac followed by the four elements. Now we get to the end, multiplication. This scene depicts the resurrected Christ offering the water of life to the king and the queen. But underneath them underground, it would seem that we see the planets personified again, but almost as if they were some secret cult group. They are waving their bellows from below as they raise their arms to the fiery swords that seem to be preventing them from proceeding. Meaning, these are the planets that have been extracted, or in other words, their influences and that they've been personified and or captured into a form. The alchemical process is beginning. We see Jesus sitting in a fountain, at the very bottom crowned. The text in Old German says, the brown of the learned. Now I'm not going to break that down just yet, and we got a lot more to say on Jesus, but if you've been paying attention, you should know what's going on here. Also, the pool is filled with his blood as he has a hole on his right side. The next tier, or level of the fountain, is Mars and Venus, or Mary, holding a heart in flames. The next level is Saturn holding a baby and Jupiter with lightning bolts and a scepter. It actually seems to be Libertas. Finally, at the top, Hermes or Mercury, representing the transmutation process with the staff or Caduceus, representing the balancing of both positive and negative forces. Behind the fountain is a garden, the fruits of this understanding and art. This is the multiplication, the production or artificial generation of matter. We also see another code, which is most likely Rosicrucian in nature. We see a dove, which is a well-known symbol of the Holy Spirit in Christianity. The Holy Spirit is often associated with divine inspiration, and so this is what guides the alchemist. But more so, it represents the process of transformation, that this is also a spiritual pursuit. We see another compass or threefold symbol, with a dove following a path. Between the Tetragrammaton, Jerusalem, and the Fountain of Life, this serves as a messenger between the physical and the divine. That's it for this book, but in the following year of its initial publication, 1616, there appeared a new edition in Latin that contained a dedication to the Rosicrucians, which then unveiled the inspiration behind the work. The original German text does not have this dedication. But this alchemical text that we've been breaking down, Kabbalah, is clearly Rosicrucian in nature. 1614 is when the Rosicrucian Manifestos first appeared. The fame of the Brotherhood of the Rosy Cross was published, but it was circulated in manuscripts among German occultists in 1610. The goal was the creation and founding of a secret brotherhood of similarly prepared men. That is why they were publishing these works, to find people who could see through these hidden meanings and recruit more members. The Manifestos made a promise of a universal reformation of mankind, through a science that built on esoteric truths of the ancient past, which, concealed from the average man, provide insight into nature 
the physical universe, and the spiritual realm, which they even said would be kept secret for decades until the intellectual climate might receive it. So the Rosicrucians were a branch of Christian mysticism mixed with Kabbalah, Hermeticism, and alchemy. And we now know that they were using some crazy symbols like the creation of a chimera hybrid homunculus with a pope hat. We'll see more of these as we progress. But yes, this points and makes clear the type of thinking that these minds had. There's no reason to believe that it's just allegory just yet, as the details will continue to add up. Before we go into deeper matters, we need to discuss the importance of brotherhoods and symbols as it begins to all connect, because the Rosicrucians are their predecessors to Freemasonry. Anyone who thinks it's mockery to even bring up the Masons simply isn't aware of the history of secret fraternities. Furthermore, they all share one same lineage as we'll see. This idea of the Rosicrucian order inspired a lot of different famous occultists, some of which already mentioned, such as John Dee. Most scholars and historians are not willing to consider the possibility that there were invisible members, members who did not publicly announce their allegiance to the cause, but were simply inspired by it. And this gave rise to the Invisible College, which was the precursor to the Royal Society founded in 1660. In fact, even Robert Boyle wrote, The cornerstones of the Invisible, or as they term themselves Philosophical College, do now and then honor me with their company. So, whether the skeptics believe the subject of secret brotherhoods means nothing. We know that they were indeed having secret meetings on the secrets of life. As Rosicrucianism developed into Freemasonry throughout Europe, there was a strong presence of the Golden and Rosy Cross. In the ancient accepted Scottish Rite, which was first practiced in France, the literal 18th degree is called the Knight of the Rose Cross. The two earliest Freemasons were Sir Robert Murray and even Ashmole, the author of the chemistry book that we went over earlier. Now there's no denying the connection, or at least it's worth an investigation, that these matters are kept secret and the scholars showed no interest to connect this secrecy to the subjects of hidden arts and sciences. Masons make it clear that their ancestry goes back to the Knights Templar, and this is also clear in Rosicrucian philosophy and symbolism. However, the Rosicrucians preserve this knowledge with a little bit more secrecy, this path can be followed as a trail as we start to begin to see the similar themes in symbolism. But even stranger, it would seem that the Templars were well aware of the secret arts of alchemy. We'll come back to the Rosicrucians, but first, let's discuss how the Templars tie in with all of this. I highly recommend watching the Christmas video. It's much more than a Christmas video and goes into some crazy stuff involving the Templars. But we shall continue and connect it to this subject. The Knights Templar stand out as one of the most controversial orders. Their legacy, shrouded in mystery, has long been a debate among historians and scholars. We now have arrived to one of the crucial connections, but before we dive in, we must cover their history and also note the lack of conclusive evidence for both sides of the argument. There seems to be two main sides. One side believes that the Templars were accused unjustly, that they faced a fake persecution, on the grounds that they had reached such a state of wealth that King Philip IV and Pope Clement V sought to strengthen their positions by eliminating this supposedly powerful and independent organization. But we're going to take a look at that again because there is another side and it involves looking at this order with new eyes, which many may have a difficult time doing because it's Christianity's most popular military order. Countless video games, Movies have been made and their influence on our culture is quite significant to many people. It seems that we may be dealing with dogma, but interestingly, we will see how this ties into alchemy and the creation of modern day religions. We'll discuss more of that soon, but of course, if some of these accusations were proven to be even remotely true, then this would bring some serious suspicions to the church as a whole. Let's try to keep an open mind because I believe there are some serious arguments to consider here that deserve to bring suspicion to this powerful elite group of assassins, bankers, and literally pirates who were attempting to possess ancient antiquitech. The Knights Templar have this story that they were known as the poor fellow soldiers of Christ and of the Temple of Solomon, that after the first aftermath of the Crusades, the medieval Christian military order was formed so that the poor fellow soldiers, starting from just a small group of nine knights, 
which was led by Hugues de Pan and Godfrey de Saint-Omer. They had set off with the mission and took monastic vows to protect Christian pilgrims who were supposedly being attacked by Muslims on the way to the Holy Land. One of the strange things about this whole story is the whole donation stuff. Because what ended up happening is that they were literally donated massive amounts of money and architecture really for no apparent reason other than inspiring others because of their duties to protect. The Knights Templar derived their name from the location where they granted accommodations by King Baldwin II, within his castle and above the supposed remains of Solomon's temple. Not sure why he would do that, but okay. Then the members of the order took vows of personal poverty. Yet. The Templars as an organization accumulated substantial wealth and influence, which is contradictory. In 1129, Saint Bernard of Clairvaux not only contributed a generous sum of money to support the order, but also played a pivotal role in promoting their cause. Owing to their military prowess, the Templars were entrusted with the responsibility of safeguarding and transporting funds for individuals who were reluctant to travel with large sums of money fearing theft or assault. Let's remember that's the mainstream story because similar to the Vanderbilts, we have another rags to riches story. The Templars ended up gaining billions of dollars of wealth. Literally, the Templars were the first massive bank. By the mid 12th century, the order had established a network of preceptories, regional headquarters across Europe and the Holy Land. These preceptories generated revenue through donations land acquisitions, and agricultural production. As their wealth increased, the Templars began to develop financial services that laid the foundation for modern banking. They offered loans, issued letters of credit, and provided secure storage for valuables, which allowed them to establish a rudimentary banking system. This system, in turn, facilitated trade and enabled the transfer of funds across Europe and the Middle East. So, they were the predecessors to the Dutch East India Company. The Templars were arguably the first transnational corporation. The Knights Templar amassed an immense fortune in a relatively short period. The mainstream story being that they attracted both admiration and envy. As their wealth grew, they became the first true international banking institution, issuing promissory notes that would lay the foundation for modern banking practices, including the origins of the dollar bill, which explains more why we see the symbols that we do today on our money. The Templars acquired vast tracts of land and castles, solidifying their influence and power across Europe and the Middle East. So wait, they started from protecting pilgrims on the roads from Saracen thieves, and now they own their entire fleet of ships, a banking system that processes shipments around the world including to Muslim territories and then became treasure hunters seeking some type of ancient artifact known as the Ark of the Covenant? How does that all add up? There's no doubt that they were funded and supported by royalty. They owned much of the land in Europe and were the advisors to the European monarchs. This gave them much political power behind the scenes. That's why the reasons for the motive for prosecuting the knights are still unclear. Many secret societies in modern day orders claim ancestry to the Templars, and it is fact that the original Templar order, founded in 1119, was created with the assistance of the Muslim Saracens, or the Knights of Saladin, a fact that challenges conventional understandings of their origin. While the subject of the Templars often evokes passionate responses, to in part by many secrets and shady dealings associated with the order that would bring many things to question, so it's important to take a step back and examine the facts. We've been discussing the amount of influence that alchemy has had on medieval Europe, and we know that they share a similar Abrahamic bloodline and tradition. That will be shown soon. Although, it is true that some confessions from the Templars were allegedly extracted under torture, this does not discount the numerous other pieces of evidence and scholarly research that shed light on the Order's activities. So, the story is, from the humble beginnings of the Templars, as poor monks represented by the iconic image of two knights sharing a single horse, but this does not fully represent the tremendous wealth and power that they would eventually amass. Their initial purpose to protect Christian pilgrims traveling to the Holy Land 
evolved into a quest for the bloodline of Jesus and securing of Jerusalem. The support of St. Bernard of Clairvaux, a prominent religious figure, further legitimized their cause and catapulted the order to prominence. One of the most remarkable and unbelievable stories from the Annals of the Templars involves a battle where a mere 500 Knight Templars are said to have taken on Saladin's army of 20,000. That seems pretty unlikely, but the story is that they were on the side of God. During the Crusades, the Knights Templar played a pivotal role as a military order, actively participating in numerous battles and campaigns. While their stated mission was to protect Christian pilgrims and secure the Holy Land, their actions often resulted in severe consequences for the local population. The Crusades were marked by widespread bloodshed, with countless atrocities committed by all sides, including the Templars. In many instances, they engaged in ruthless acts of violence, such as mass killings and pillaging against both Muslims and fellow Christians alike. Rumors and speculation about the Templars' true motives and alliances were widespread during this period. Some accounts suggested that they were covertly working with the Saracens, collaborating with their supposed adversaries to achieve their own ends. Theories about motivations behind such alliances varied, with some pointing to a mutual interest in securing valuable treasures or access to the sacred sites of the Holy Land. Another possibility is that the Templars, and their association with the Saracens had gained access to secret ancient knowledge, including the mystical art of alchemy. This would have provided them with a powerful advantage, as alchemy promised not only the ability to turn base metals into gold, but also access to the secrets of immortality and spiritual enlightenment. As we were discussing, the origin of the Templars cannot be discussed without the Saracens, and let's keep in mind that this secret order of supposed devout Christians were working together in secret with the Muslims, which is really against the mainstream story that we've been told. Furthermore, let's keep in mind that the founding of the Templars was in the 12th century. The Saracens were the Muslims experiencing their enlightenment period during this exact same time. They were in control of all of Europe. This is undeniable as is evident in our languages. Spanish has 4,000 Arabic words, English 2,000, and French 500. The Islamic rule undeniably had a profound impact on European medieval culture discussed earlier with the Picatrix and other alchemical texts. But of course, we're told the entire story of the Crusades, the divide and conquer tactic so frequently used throughout the historical record, yet there's always a fingerprint. The fingerprint is the secret wisdom of the secret societies. Therefore, we can easily conclude that this was the exact time of Liber Vacae. Actually, one of the first citations we have of the Book of Cow or Liber Vacae is cited in a Latin work by William of Auvergne in the early 13th century. William of Auvergne was the Bishop of Paris. He was not directly a member, but he would have direct connections to the order in his capacity as a bishop. We covered this in the Christmas video, but Baphomet is connected to Mahomet, which is an old French word referring to Muhammad. But most people don't believe that the Templars were actually secretly worshipping Baphomet because the whole story is Philip IV of France began his campaign against the Templars. Why did he do this? Well, they say it's because Philip saw a rich target. So, in the story, we know that the Templars are obviously very rich, enough to get the attention of the king. So let's just say it's true. Where did they get all those riches? Were they obsessed with the bloodline of Jesus? Were they known to be assassins? Also, what's the need for collecting special relics? Furthermore, as we've stated, there is no definitive evidence for either side on whether the accusations brought against the Templars were true or not. So therefore, we can move on from that aspect, but it is crucial to note that they were questioned individually and the charges brought forth were very specific. You could say they were similar to the witch charges, and we can discuss that as well because there's definitely a connection. But forgetting the accusations, we still have every right to be suspicious of what they were up to based on the mainstream story alone. But there's external evidence outside of the Templars' persecution that we can explore. The first is, as I mentioned, simply knowing the history of brotherhoods and how Freemasons themselves claim they originate from the Templars. This is common knowledge, although Scholars do consider it to be speculative for some reason. There are some scholars throughout history who have investigated this matter, 
and connected the Templars to even older traditions that are based on the worship of generative powers. Thomas Wright's book goes in on the subject on these ancient sex cults and how even after the introduction of Christianity, these secret cults still survived and were even encouraged by the medieval clergy. Let's take a look at what kind of art they were into, and we can come back to the trials in a moment, but I'm sure you guys know all about that if you've gotten this far. But the key thing to note is that they were accused of worshipping a demonic idol. Regardless if it's true or not, let us investigate the matter. So there was actually a whole book on this subject in 1818 by Joseph von Hammer Pergstahl. He was an Austrian Orientalist, historian, and is considered to be one of the most accomplished Orientalists of his time. He wrote a book that translates into Mysterium Baphomet Revealed, or The Brothers of the Military Order of the Temple, Convicted of Gnostic Apostasy, Idolatry, and Impurity Through Their Own Monuments, by Joseph de Hammer Vienna. And in this work, instead of relying on the testimonies as evidences, he actually just examines a number of the Templars' artifacts, many of which are no longer accessible for viewing. There are some that we're going to take a look at, but this book is special because it has a record of their artifacts and is a reputable source on history. Now this book currently still has not been officially translated into English, but using new tools, we have access to many old texts translated into English so that we could take a look at the importance of what is being revealed. We have tested it and it's around 90-95% accuracy rate. There's only a few issues where it has difficulty with words that are unique or in different languages, which does happen time to time in this text, but I'll show the Latin as well. Essentially, I wrote a program for converting old books using the newest and most impressive language models via the API. It isn't perfect, but you can check out the Latin text if you want to and double check it and add corrections. This is a big game changer for allowing us to do research and to look at history from a new lens. We now have access to any historical document in English. You'd be surprised how many important alchemical and historical texts have not been translated into English. In this curious document, written in Latin, it's a part of a larger book entitled Fund Gruben des Orients, usually translated Treasures of the Orient. The preface begins with this interesting phrasing of the Templars as an order of assassins. He may be actually referring to another order altogether that is integrated with the Templars. The first page is an introduction to the Templars, the accusations brought against them, and begins to lay out his approach to dealing with the subject. He starts discussing secret societies and the knowledge that was shared between them. He wishes to discuss the secret order of the Templars and the assassins. Quote, Both orders covering their ambitions with a cloak of piety, either disregarding piety or subjecting it to earthly desire, as long as their wicked discipline remained hidden, grew immensely in power, until, with their mystery of iniquity exposed, they were attacked by the Pope and King with anathema and sword, expiating their hidden dogmas with blood, and extinguishing the fire with their own downfall." End quote. Then he makes it clear why he's discussing this. You see, the author was a specialist in oriental history, and so he's saying that the history of the Templars and their secret doctrine is more relevant to the East as that is where it was derived. He's actually discussing the Canaanite Phoenician Babylonian religion that spawned near Syria. He even says that this comes from the Phoenicians and Egyptians. But remember, we're not talking about mainstream Egypt as there's also a huge cover up with the dating of many of these monuments as well. He then discusses the traces of this secret philosophy, listing off some important order names such as the Gnostic doctrine of the Nasareans, and explains his sources that have nothing to do with the Nag Hammadi text which was found in 1945. This is 1818, and he's referencing ancient Persian sources. Many modern Christians have this argument that the entirety of the Gnostic doctrine was created and forged in the founding of these Nag Hammadi texts. But that argument relies on simply ignoring the history of secret societies and their influence on the creation of religion. He also mentions the system of the Drusus and Mutavilis, the heresies of Manichaeans and Ophites. He then proceeds with a caution, one that should be considered well. Following these traces and making public the history of the assassins and the doctrines of the Templars, which, after the destruction of the order, 
have risen again in the order of the architects, as, at least as far as symbols are concerned, we know we are walking on treacherous ashes through fires and are aware of the risky game we are playing. If we dare to reveal the head of Baphomet to our readers, something that has remained hidden for seven centuries. End quote. The Order of the Architects It's obvious that the author is attempting to be subtle, but it would seem that this is a clear reference to the Masons. Now, he's about to dive in and I just wanted to give another warning. This kind of gets really insane here. This is a historical source that not only is saying some shocking things about the Templars, he's showing their actual artifacts. He's taking their statues, coffers, emblems, and symbols for everyone to see. The author makes it clear right after this paragraph that he does not care and it's his duty to reveal the true secret behind the order because it is simply the truth and the right thing to do. He first begins by mentioning the argument of both sides, skipping the entire story of the persecution as we're already very familiar with and begins to dissect the matter with his question. Quote, if we do not wish to argue against them from betrayal of Louis the Saint and King of Jerusalem, from the surrender of the castles of Karak and Acre, from the aliens struck with the assassins, from the connivance with the Sultan of Egypt, if we do not care to give credence to the frequent confessions about the worship of the idol, the spitting and the trampling of the cross and the unspeakable crimes committed or permitted, what prevents us from considering all these things not only as probable, but also true? When we consider the nature of men in the times and find a similar doctrine and similar customs in so many other sects of the Middle Ages. End quote. He's basically saying, why are we to consider as the historians tell us that these things are false, yet they have the exact same philosophy as the orders of the Middle Ages? He believes this connection is the evidence, but it takes one who can see symbols to understand them. Also, there are more controversies that he mentions, like the unrestrained military conduct in various Eastern sects, and especially in the famous Manicheans, Albigensians, Mazdeans, and Assassins, during the wars for the recovery of the Lord's tomb. That the plague of this doctrine and crime also crept into the society of Christian soldiers, whose founders could not associate a single candidate with themselves for a decade until they took refuge in the bosom of the church concealing the secret doctrine, according to all probability, already existing at that time under the institution of St. Bernard. Which is interesting if we consider the plot and background of the Assassin Creed games, but this is history. The Assassins he's speaking of is an order that normally does not get brought up when discussing the Templars. That this Christian military order was doing secret business with the Nazari Ismaili, or the Assassins, a medieval Islamic sect led by Hassan Sabah, which was operating in the same time period and founded 200 years prior to the Templars at the beginning of the millennium. There are several references to this one popular account. It's called the Old Man of the Mountain, who was an assassin that is referenced in the Book of the Marvels of the World by Marco Polo. There's a lot to break down on the Assassins, but we can say this, that the Assassins were essentially the mystery sect or Islamic version of the Christian mystery sect, and both these sects have very similar initiations and philosophies, and that's the main premise of this book, Mysterium Baphomet Unveiled. Okay, but back to the book. Perkstall is saying that these religious sects were operating under the guise of religion. It was just a front. So he starts off with the term idols, because remember, our term Baphomet is what we use to communicate in terms of the possibility of the deity that they worshipped. But he says it that way because typically, Baphomet is a goat-headed demon, but there are other forms to consider. He does this by looking at their artifacts, and this includes their mysterious cups, or chalices, sculptures, and the coins of the Templars. One last line from the preface, and we're going to dive into these symbols. Quote, For this reason, Bundles of original documents and processes sealed to this day in Rome lie hidden, which, as all things were eventually brought to light, we do not doubt will wonderfully agree with the monuments we've discovered and revealed when they become part of public law. In the meantime, these stone and bronze monuments, taken from the secret discipline and harmful doctrine of the brothers of the military order of the temple, will suffice to convince all who, without prejudice, seek the pure truth of history.
end quote. We're ready to look at their idols, but he does mention that they were using Arabic to make secret transcriptions. And the author goes into detail on this, but basically, these inscriptions are not actually Arabic words, they were references to hidden gods. One in particular which we'll discuss is meat, and the description says omnipotent meat. Now who is meat? Meat, or Metis, is a Greek titan. She was the first wife of Zeus. But that's not actually who the author is discussing right now. Although, I do think there's some connections to be made, as Metis is in Greek mythology and she's swallowed by Zeus because he was afraid that his new child was going to overpower him, but it seems that Athena just spontaneously generated from Zeus's forehead as some type of homunculus. Also, there's another strange story with the creation of Zeus from Kronos. The wife of Kronos had to trick him by substituting a fake baby Zeus, and somehow Kronos falls for this, and then Zeus lives and tries to figure out how to get everyone else out of Kronos, and so he decides to poison his father and the person who gave him this poison, the titan alchemist witch, Metis. But again, even if it is connected, this is not the meat or Metis that we're discussing. So we're just going to use meat, but according to Perkstall, meat is some type of hermaphrodite deity that is the personification of Sophia from Gnosticism. He explains this in the book. Inscription number 14, on the largest marble crater, see tab 2, figure 1, meat, holding a figured hand and unfolding a membrane on which these words are clearly legible, quote, exalted or omnipotent meat, our germinating root. I and seven were, you were one of the renegades, the return is made." End quote. He then thoroughly examines these symbols and inscriptions and explains how he got the translation. But wait, our germinating root? What are they talking about here? And take a look at this. This is from the book, he referenced these diagrams constantly. This is the inscription that he was referencing. But notice how he left out an important detail. This is exactly why you have to look at these matters with new eyes. But do you see what this is? This is the secret right here. It's going to take the full video to explain it, but it's all right there. That is a baby coming out of a vessel, and there is a sun above the baby as if it is rising. So birth of a sun or sun? And then we see some type of horned androgynous priest point to the inscription that was just translated. Perikstal says that this is meat, and he believed that the Templars were secretly worshipping this figure through their ancient philosophy of Ophite Gnosticism. A very dark and pessimistic outlook on the world that at its entire core, viewed the entire creation as some sort of prison cell. Now it's important to note that this is some sort of ritual, and this can be further explained towards the end as we're entering some more advanced occult symbolism. But we can summarize by saying that this is a reference for harnessing the powers of the seven planets and capturing those powers into a newly created homunculus or being. That's what this lady to the right is doing with the pouring of the water over the menorah. Perkstall is essentially saying that the Templars will worship Sophia through this figure and this was their secret ritual. As the entire story of Sophia and the Archons is its own subject, but we can summarize by saying that Sophia desired to achieve higher states of light or awareness, and in doing so, she actually fell, and she was taken advantage of by some self-willed lion power that then merged with her and forced her to become pregnant, which is the birth of the planets and our universe. But most importantly, these are the powers and or attributes that make up our realm in Kabbalah, and these powers can be influenced or harnessed as these energies literally make up our realm. Ophite Gnosticism is a branch of Gnosticism, a religious movement that emerged in the 1st and 2nd centuries. The name Ophite is derived from the Greek word Ophis, which means serpent. This sect held the serpent from the biblical story of Adam and Eve in high regard, viewing it as a positive symbol of wisdom and spiritual insight. The idea being that the serpent never lied and was attempting to give knowledge to humanity as they weren't even aware that they were naked, much less prisoners in a garden. But this gets deeper as we discuss the alchemical origins to the Bible. Essentially, this Gnostic Sophia has been translated over time into multiple different deities and is considered to be androgynous. 
He goes quite in detail on how the Gnostics viewed Sophia with both female and masculine traits. Theophytes diverged from other Gnostic sects in their interpretation of the Genesis story. While many Gnostic sects consider the material world to be a flawed creation of a lesser deity, the Demiurge, the Ophites, believed that the serpent in the Garden of Eden was a divine emissary sent by the true higher god. They viewed the serpent's role as providing humanity with the knowledge of good and evil, allowing them to break free from the control of the Demiurge, who they identified with the Old Testament god, Yahweh. Ophite Gnosticism is thought to have emerged around the 2nd century, but much of what we know about their beliefs comes from the writing of early Christian heresiologists such as Irenaeus, Hippolytus, and Epiphanius, who aim to refute and condemn heretical teachings. As a result, our understanding of Ophite beliefs may be somewhat skewed as these early Christian writers were not impartial observers. The author continues explaining the ancient origins of his philosophy and how it resulted influencing Arabic and Krishna philosophy discussing the concept of a spiritual baptism or fiery tincture. So some of these depictions were carved on craters or craters which is Latin for mixing bowl. He says that this is a secret rite and the proceeds to discuss the symbolism. Quote, the infant in a crater or mixing bowl with flames Medes, plate 1, figure 14. Second, another boy of this type, and a flaming crater, standing above the surrounded by a whirlwind of flames and smoke. See tab 3, figure 3, which we will better illustrate in the following chapter on craters. Quote, Craters or cups were used in all the mysteries of antiquity, as is well known. But here, we'll illustrate the primitive meaning of these craters more clearly. There is a great crater in which the Ophitic orgies are carved in the upper part and there is a double crater figure that modestly prevents us from displaying here in print, only to meet the needs of this commentary. We must say that the two craters represent both sexes, the male congress at the female birth, therefore this crater represents nothing other than the female sex as a symbol of Genesis, which is also seen at the feet of the three idols, with the difference that there in place of the phallus there is a burning fire that is seen, representing the generative power, so in the idol, See Table 1, Figure 9, taken from the Booklet of Curiosities, on the female side, at its feet, it is noted in another idol, see Tab 1, Figure 15, a double crater is placed with the bottoms facing each other, one of which is filled with fire, that is, the symbol of the generative power, and the other shows an infant emerging from the womb. The neck of the crater is sometimes shorter, sometimes longer, shorter in the marble crater and in its figure, Tab 2, Figure 14 longer in the vase that has the shape of a bottle, commonly called Karaf, which appears to be the base of a two-headed idol, tab 2, figure 9, and in the choir of spiritual or fiery baptism ceremonies, see tab 2, figure 2, held by one of the ministers who is closest to the pyre. The letter G, which is inscribed on the base of the two-headed idol along with the Arabic word Gnosis, is the best commentary on this vase, which is the first symbol of Ophitic Gnosis in Genesis. End quote. This is some really strange symbolism if you ask me. And also consider what we were discussing at the beginning with spontaneous generation. So what are they talking about here? What are these symbols? These clearly are not made up and we do see the same tools used in alchemy, but also references to birth, rebirth, astrological influence, and even a baby sprouting from a vessel? The only conclusion would be to call it fake. But there is an interesting detail. Notice that all of them have the same style of breast. And also, this strange being that Pergstall was calling me, well, we're about to see this being everywhere. And now we have a direct reference connecting it to alchemy, the homunculus, and secret order symbolism. We're talking about a squatting hybrid bat horned demon with the exact same style. And this can be seen on the Church of St. Marie. Other interesting symbols at Templar churches include skull and bones and also the Templar cross within the Star of David. If the Templars were Christians, then why did they feel the need to put these symbols on the churches that were donated to them? Now we can't fully dissect this book right now, but we'll be including all the references and the translated books in the description for everyone to see and study. Now let's go back to that earlier description of the baby with the sun head and let's look at the entire piece. We see a hybrid deity squatting with arms crossed with the head of an owl 
and it seems that the beak is also a snake, so some type of chimera-like being, and it is sitting on some type of winged vessel. To the left, we see what looks like a male genitalia pointing down into the vessel, which seems to be indicating the aqua of the alchemist, with the moon above. To the right, we see the baby from earlier being born, with the sun, new life, a new day, a new birth. Also, there's more to the specific figure on Tablet 2. To the far left is a scene where a bunch of these members are naked in front of a large book. But it's as if you're seeing behind the scenes and they're playing with snakes. But strangely, it almost seems sexual. This was one of the components of the Orphic Mysteries, which I'm sure many of you have heard of the Orphic Egg. Well, Orpheus was supposedly a real person, and started all of this from the Dionysus or Bacchus cults. Orphism was practiced by the elites of ancient Greece, and it just so happens that we see this same Phrygian cap. The Orphic mysteries are just another brotherhood mythos explaining the story of Sophia in another way. The Orphic creation myth is centered on the figure of Dionysus Zagreus, the son of Zeus and Persephone, who was torn apart by the Titans. Zeus then destroyed the titans with his lightning, and humans were created from the ashes of these titans. The myth suggests that humans possess both divine, Dionysus, and the impure, titan elements, and the soul's goal is to escape the material world and reunite with the divine. The idea is parallel to the Gnostic creation story, in which a divine spark becomes trapped in the material world due to the actions of the Demiurge. In both traditions, the soul seeks to return to its divine origins through acquiring secret knowledge and achieving spiritual transformation. This is what we're discussing with the origin of alchemy, but the difference is, is that most scholars stop there and will see this only as a spiritual transformation, not considering that it could also be true, literally. The first tablet features some of the strangest statues to be seen. Hybrid humans marked with occult symbols. Generative symbolism with animals for the generative organs. We even see the formation of skins as these secret Freemasonic aprons. Interestingly, Masonic aprons were also made from lambskin. The figure is distorted in a strange fashion, and to the right, I'm not quite sure what that is, but it almost looks like a knight with its arms cut off sitting in a lion chair. As you can see, the priests are men in dresses. The one on the left seems to be female and looks sad. She had the fire crater. The next statue is a priest strangling the snake. This is the harnessing of the snake-like arconic powers of the planets. The first tablet has some really weird statues. We see a statue of Diana of Ephesus as some sort of Templar, and many of these priests look to have Hebrew influence. Interestingly, there is some weird stuff here with this lady holding the child. Then yeah, there's this father and his kid. And then to the right, we see a statue of an androgynous man-like woman. Basically, a man in a dress, giving birth but with some type of burning chalice, fire on top, and the baby comes out the bottom. He is holding an ankh-like cross symbolizing rebirth, and behind him is the sickle of Saturn. In Tablet 2, the one with the baby coming out of the vessel, there's more to this tablet that we shall discuss, but we know there's clear alchemical references, even a banyo or ritual bath of fire. But there is something interesting to the right that I'll only cover briefly. What we see is a child being pulled away from some type of creature. Then we see more statues and one in particular had a strange head-like radish. But take a look at the body. Notice these strange emblems in front of the genitals. It's almost like another mouth. That'll be crucial to note for later. And also, on this tablet is a baby riding an eagle, which looks very similar to the US seal. So we're on the last tablet and there are only really a few more things. One is that there's clear Gnostic references to the Garden of Eden in one of their depictions with the snake and Saturn. But interestingly, there is one that shows some type of hybrid snake creature throwing up or feeding on a baby in front of a king. The last thing to point out is the crossed legs of the Templars, because what we're dealing with here is an ancient sect that wanted to become in a sense more like a woman so that they possessed both masculine and feminine traits, like Sophia or an androgynous god. In doing so, it was rumored, outside of this book, that the Templars participated in castration rituals in order to become more like their goddess meat. The reason this is brought up is because you can still see this in Templar churches today. 
And it's like this mystery. Usually people are saying that the Saracens did this, but now we have more context. Perhaps it's a part of a greater mystery. We will now move on to discussing how the Templars gained their wealth and some of the activities outside of the persecution that they have taken part in. Well, if it's true that the Templars were practicing Ophite Gnosticism, then where did they get that knowledge? Let's also keep in mind that this is around the 12th century, the exact period that Liber Vacae is getting translated into Latin. Also, many scholars have stated the knowledge of alchemy was originally founded by Arabic sages. However, they say that their wisdom came from Aristotle and the ancient Greeks. Whatever the case, the knowledge of alchemy was widespread through the Islamic world, and the Knights Templar were known to be the first transnational corporation. Is it possible that the Templars ever became interested in alchemy? Perhaps this could be one of the ways they amassed such a vast wealth. One clue is on the Templar churches themselves, such as with Notre Dame showing vast reliefs that depict the alchemical process secretly. It is said by some scholars that the Templars learned this knowledge of alchemy and then brought it into Northern Europe as they would have had access to those libraries during the Crusades. There is a series called The Twelve Bass Reliefs located near the bottom and some scholars insist that this is showing the stages of alchemy right in stone on the church. And it's interesting, it's called the Scala Philosophorum. We see clear hermetic symbolism and even a knight protecting an Athenor which is a furnace used in alchemy. This also brings to question some of the gargoyles. Are they there for protection? Or is this building some type of alchemical result as well? Is the building a homunculus? Marsilio Ficino, the 15th century architect, called buildings the homunculi of the architects and the architects of the demiurges of these buildings. There are more clues that the Templars were interested in alchemy, as we can discuss the alchemical meaning behind John the Baptist and how both the Templars and Masons seem to have recognized this saint. The Templars were accused of believing John the Baptist to be their savior and rejecting Jesus. This is interesting because baptism is a ritual and it is the purification stage, but perhaps there's deeper meaning. The Templars were claimed to have literally worshipped skulls and they supposedly had the skull of John the Baptist. For some reason, the beheading of John the Baptist is a holy day. It would seem that the Templars were some type of head cult. They also were responsible for obtaining many relics, including the skull of Mary Magdalene, the Shroud of Turin, and the Ark of the Covenant. As for Mary Magdalene, there is a cult significance, but this is celebrated in France where they actually bring the skull out. It's really strange. Quote, displayed in a golden reliquary at the Basilica of Saint Maximin La Sainte Baume in southern France, which has been described as, quote, one of the most precious relics in all Christendom, and one of the world's most famous sets of human remains." End quote. Okay, but how did this get into France, and why do they have a festival where they literally carry the head through the city? It definitely reminds me of the Ark of the Covenant. In 1204, during the Crusades, the Templars were taking over Constantinople, and some scholars argued that this is when they took many relics. This is when they would have had access to the Imperial Library of Constantinople, in the capital city of the Byzantine Empire. It was the last of the greatest libraries of the ancient world. During the Fourth Crusade, much of the building was destroyed and its contents removed. Today, no portion of the library has ever been discovered. There are some authors who even suggest that the skull or head of the Templars was the head of Jesus himself, as they were supposedly searching for the tomb of Christ. Well, the story goes deeper than that. And it's not the full focus of the video to dive into all the alternative histories surrounding the Templars, but we'll keep it to the matters that are crucial for the subject. Now for a moment, I want those who view Jesus as purely astrotheological allegory to be more open to the idea that perhaps there's another alchemical component to this entire story. For the moment, we'll take the story at face value. There's research to suggest that Jesus may have had a family with Mary Magdalene and the Templars are actually in order from the time of Christ. It is to protect the bloodline of Jesus. And no, this is not a Dan Brown novel. Apparently, there's literal historical evidence and a lost gospel that claims Jesus and Mary Magdalene had children. Well, what this gets into is the Holy Grail, which is the Christian version of the Philosopher's Stone. It is said to be a cup 
dish, or a stone with miraculous healing powers and can even provide eternal youth or sustenance in infinite abundance. The Holy Grail is a significant symbol in Christian theology. However, it's interesting to note that not only is it the object that is held by Jesus in the Last Supper, but it was also used to collect the blood of Jesus by Joseph of Arimathea during his crucifixion. Joseph of Arimathea was a rich elite member of the Zealots, and he claimed Jesus' body at the cross and placed it in his tomb that was owned by Arimathea. There's an entire story on how Mary had given birth to three children, a Jesus, Joseph, and Tamar. These are the supposed ancient Knight Templars, the protectors of the original Grail, who then traveled to Britain for a place to find and keep these holy relics safe. The interesting aspect about all of this if we consider the phantom time hypothesis and that there may be something else going on when it comes to Rome being 2,000 years ago, well, that would also bring into question the birth and death of Christ. How could they still be searching for the tomb of Jesus in the early 13th century? It was just kept in Golgotha? Jesus was crucified at a spot outside of Jerusalem called Golgotha, which in Aramaic means place of the skull. Well, maybe we're discussing other matters here, as this seems to be some clear reference to bloodlines. We'll tie this back in a later chapter. The evidence for this is in a notable literary work that links the Templars to the Holy Grail. It is a German epic poem, Parzival, written by Wolfram von Eschenbach between 1200 and 1210. In this story, the protagonist, Parzival, embarks on a quest to find the Grail which is described as a mysterious, life-giving stone. While the Templars and Gnostic sects practice Johannism, also known as Johannite heresy, which is a term used to describe the belief that John the Baptist, rather than Jesus Christ, was the true Messiah. This belief has been attributed to various Gnostic sects and other esoteric groups throughout history. The idea of skull worship and idol worship in Hebrew is also called a teraphim, which is referenced in the Bible. Is it possible that they got a hold of a skull and use it as some type of brazen head? They were speaking with artificially generated spirits or astral homunculus. Remember, talismans are also homunculus. And in this case, it would in a sense be powered by the skull. It could also be possessed by other spirits and had magical powers. Now we can briefly discuss the Merovingian dynasty, which comes from Merovius, who was the first non-Roman ruler of Gaul, or modern-day France. The legend is, is that Merovius can trace his ancestry back to Joseph of Arimathea, the man who buried Jesus. There's another interesting legend that states that the Merovingian bloodline was birthed from fallen angels. And in another version, it's Enki, the horned sea god that started their dynasty. This comes from the historian Priscus, who claimed that he was sired by a mysterious sea creature, which is some type of reference for this alchemical knowledge as you remember the serpent hybrid symbolism from the Templars and the Phoenicians? One explanation of this is that during Mary Magdalene's trip on a ship to the shores of France, she gave birth to the son of Jesus. But what if it was through means that we're not aware of? This will be further examined as we explore later who was Mary Magdalene and did she have any knowledge of alchemy? We hear nothing for around 700 years until the Merovingian prince Dagobert II was brought up in Ireland and educated in a monastery, where the skull still lies to this day. It's said to be a part of Freemason ideology. The idea is that this bloodline to protect Christ had to move into England and France, and they were descendants of the fallen ones. These are the ancient Templars and were the origin of the Templars all the way to the time of Jesus. We have more to discuss on that, but for now, it's important to note that the very people who not only mated and took the bloodline from Jesus, the descendants then took leading roles in royalty. I felt it was necessary to cover a brief history of the Templars as what we're discussing is the history that the royals believe. It doesn't matter what the historians believe because remember, they work on evidence. What is evidence for them? Well, evidence for them, particularly with time periods in ancient times, relies on written sources. The one thing that they don't consider is that ancient societies were indeed flooded with mystic and secret societies, 
So who's to say that the historical record truly reveals all that which is hidden? Who's to say that these records cannot be forged? Most of the ancient record and evidence for the Templars is all handwritten, and we aren't even considering private collections. One single document has time and time again can change our entire perspective of history. That is why the evidence is guarded and locked up. There's no proof against the claim, but there is certainly a body of work to support it. Apparently, the Templars were also getting high. The entheogenic or shamanic use of cannabis can be traced back to ancient civilizations and various pagan cultures where it was often used for spiritual and healing purposes. As a powerful plant with psychoactive properties, cannabis has played a significant role in religious rituals, ceremonies, and the exploration of the human mind and consciousness throughout history. The use of cannabis in ancient rituals date back to the Vedic period in the Indian subcontinent, where it was considered a sacred plant capable of relieving anxiety and bringing enlightenment. In ancient China, cannabis was used by the Taoist priest to facilitate meditation and reveal future events. In Central Asia, Scythians and Thracians employed cannabis in their shamanistic practices, using it to smoke to induce visions and trances. In Africa, various tribes incorporated cannabis into their religious ceremonies, with some even forming cults dedicated to the worship of the plant. In the context of ancient and pagan magic, cannabis has been used as a tool for connecting with the spiritual realm and unlocking the mysteries of the human mind. And theogenic use of cannabis allowed practitioners to enter altered states of consciousness where they could communicate with spirits, deities, and other supernatural entities. This profound connection to the spiritual world made cannabis an essential element in the rituals and ceremonies of various ancient and pagan cultures, with its use often being associated with healing, divination, and the pursuit of higher knowledge. Chris Bennett is a well-established author on this topic and has even done research to extensively connect the Templars to the Saracens and marijuana use. He has two books on the subject, Libra 420 and an early work called The Green Gold, The Tree of Life, Marijuana and Magic in Religion. He brings up several quotes from other authors that are very relevant, but in his Libra 420, quote, to return to the Templars and their association with the Grail mythology and the Assassins, the question remains, what evidence do we have of the Templars' own actual use of cannabis? Dr. Camillo de Sico, a dermatologist from Rome, Italy, in his paper, Heresy in Science in the Middle Ages, refers to a cannabis-infused wine preparation used by the Templars under the name of the Elixir of Jerusalem. Quote, the Templars created a mixture with the pulp of aloe, pulp of hemp, and wine of palm called Elixir of Jerusalem. With therapeutic and nourishing property, they used the Abariscans aloe for its antiseptic, bactericidal, and fungicide action and for its capacity to penetration in the deeper layers of the skin. Interestingly, cannabis is the safest natural or synthetic medication proven successful in the treatment of most forms of epilepsy. The esoteric inheritance and the alchemical spagyrics acquaintances were handed from the Templars to the Crocifers. From these orders, that one of Saint Giacomo, or Jacobite, managed many hospitals during the 15th century. To the Jacobite monks, in quality of experts in the cure of the diseases of the skin, the task was entrusted to cure the wounded soldiers during the Crusades. In the hospitals of Malta and Cyprus, to them, in fact, was attributed the capability to create miraculous ointments. In such historical context, it must estimate the work of the Templars concluding with recognizing that they, anticipating the times, had a modern vision of the medicine and although they were considered heretics and consigned to the fire. In another source, quote, the Knights Templar were said to have developed a brew or concoction of palm wine, aloe vera pulp, and hemp, an elixir that they called the Elixir of Jerusalem, and to which they attributed their health, strength, and longevity. Interestingly, even Von Hammer Perkstall brings up the use of cannabis by the Templars. Quote, in relation to this, it is interesting to note the use of cannabis and other herbs in various tincture preparations of alchemy, known as quintessences in arcana, wine, and alcohol infusions that begin to appear in alchemical texts in the Mideast as early as 1300s and occur later in a number of alchemical and medical treatises in Europe. References to a tincture were also associated with the grail. 
end quote. This is all crucial because it connects the Templars to Ophite Gnosticism, a branch of Gnosticism that emphasizes the importance of the divine wisdom figure, Sophia. Now this is really interesting. There's the Secret of Four and Twenty, and this is mentioned in Pista Sophia. It is thought to hold significant importance in understanding the connection between the use of cannabis by the Templars and the Gnostic beliefs. Also, supposedly, when the Templars were arrested, their properties were seized, and they found cannabis. Quote, Arrests at Templar sites in France and elsewhere in October of 1307 were followed by simultaneous synchronized raids at Templar properties on the same day in the British Empire on January 8, 1308, through top secret orders that have been delivered on December 15th of 1307. By royal decree, the following orders were given that after the Feast of Epiphany, January 10th, early in the morning, the sheriff and his assistants are to take into custody all the Knights Templar, all their land and tenements, goods and chattels, are to be seized into the king's hands, together with all charters, writings, monuments, relating to the same, and an inventory made. Templar lands in England, Wales, Ireland, and Scotland were seized, and all knights and monks were arrested. A 1308 inventory of seized items from a Templar site in Britain included three stones of hemp canopy on a list that included everything from tunics to crossbows to cups and plates, but no food items or wines. Lord, 2002. According to Bennett, the stone or stone weight is an English and imperial unit of mass, now equal to 14 pounds, so about 42 pounds of cannabis was taken. There even seems to be evidence to suggest that Templars were doing dealings with the Saracens and actually getting paid in weed. There's a work published by Manchester University where the scholars Malcolm Baer and Keith Bate translated original documents of the Templars from their book, The Templars, Quote, 40 years before their arrest, at the peak of their prosperity and influence, in a declaration of the colonization by Moorish settlers at Villa Star, 1267, both Christian and Saracen, Arab Muslim, settlers are given control of an area of land in Spain, with part of the deal being that payment to the Templars include one quarter of all corn, wine, hemp, flax, gardens and vegetables and all other fruits both ripe and good that you gather from them in perpetuity, along with the first fruits of everything you gather from said properties." End quote. So they were farming some type of special fruit. So is 420 really just a reference to Bob Marley? Or is there something much more ancient with its numerical association with cannabis? What is the significance of 4 and 20? In Pista Sophia, the first mystery is described as being the 4 and 20th mystery. Pista Sophia, chapter 1, page 1. This number, 24, or 4 and 20, is mentioned multiple times throughout the text, indicating that it's obviously very important to the Gnostic belief system. For example, Jesus speaks of the first mystery surrounding the first commandment, the five impressions, the great light, the five helpers, and the whole treasury of light. This suggests that the secret of 4 and 20 is deeply intertwined with the core concepts of Gnosticism, such as the emanations of the divine and the nature of the universe. The connection between the Templars' use of cannabis and Gnosticism can further be explored by examining the potential symbolic significance of the number 24 in relation to cannabis. Some researchers have suggested that with the number 24, or 4 and 20, could be a reference to the 24-hour cycle of the day, which may have been significant in the ritual use of cannabis by the Templars. Additionally, the number 24 has been associated with the concept of spiritual enlightenment in various esoteric traditions, which could further link the use of cannabis by the Templars to the pursuit of Gnostic wisdom. Also, let's not forget that the alchemists had access to or were master glassblowers. Many early alembics in alchemical lab equipment resemble bongs and, in fact, in Libra 420, Bennett discusses ritual golden bongs for this ritual use. He goes over some very interesting things like Paracelsus having a secret stash, and gives several references from historical sources such as a 16th century text on the history of plants that discusses the widespread use of cannabis. Now the story brings us to England and Europe. Another thing that makes no sense about Rome is that after the fall, for like 500 years, 
we just get small kingdoms and territories that grow up without anything major until the 5th century. Then we get the first ruler of the Franks, Merovius. Basically, these are the first kings of Europe. Now in terms of Tartaria, well, they claim ancestry to the Scythians, but this connects because they're essentially the Phoenician hybrid clan that was integrated within the old church and then hijacked it, and they're proud of that history. This is to say that the Templar churches were not built by them, or at least the majority of them were donated, defaced, and renovated. Remember, they were supposed to be poor soldiers. How did they become architects and wealthy bankers? Another thing to consider is that some of these symbols on these ancient buildings were stolen from the original owners and used in the creation of the new church. This is the new Rome, or the Rome of history, which is not from 2000 years ago, but more likely 500 years ago in the medieval ages. We'll see the evidence for this as we proceed, but essentially, this bloodline, the one of Jesus, which again, we're saying is not from 2000 years ago either. Jesus very well could be from the medieval ages. That's a lot to unpack, but something to consider is what we're looking at with the first Merovingian dynasty is a time before the new Holy Roman Empire during the process of the hijack. That's why there's such a difference in architectural style. It's actually in reverse. The Gothic structures are from the time of Tartaria, which are dated to starting in the 12th century. However, many Roman structures very well could be Atlantean or early Celtic structures that were built upon, let's say, in the Gothic Age by the Scythians or Tartarians, and then it is after these initial Gothic Celtic builders that these fallen ones, the Phoenicians and or the Merovingians, who were also a part of this time period, initiated a process to hijack and create a controlled bloodline of rulers and power. This is why we see a common source to all brotherhoods. There is no explanation on why across different languages and cultures we see the same Phrygian cap used. The Phrygian cap could have been stolen as well, as the parasites have no ability to think creatively. They only possess the reptilian survival logic faculty, which eventually corrupted itself. The secret orders stole their knowledge from the ancient priest of Iessa and corrupted the allegories of spiritual enlightenment and turned them into literal and physical black magic. Yes, this is to say that just because the elites use this information for evil, does not make the information evil, and if it does contain power, then that means it must be a process of a natural system of the realm we live in. They just abuse that power. The ancient priesthood of the druids were initially created to preserve divine knowledge, but of course, the story we're told of civilization is the history of occult brotherhoods after this corruption, starting all the way to the priest of Enki, the Sumerians, and Mesopotamian cultures, meaning these brotherhoods are not as ancient as we've been told. Our history is really their history after the hijack. Of course, the perspective of the Templars that we're told is that they were trying to protect the Holy Land. But is that truly all to the story? Did they ever desire to search for the secrets contained within the temple? Much of this ties into how and where the Roman Holy Church got her information. It would seem that there's some serious forgery at play involving the entire story places, and dates of the Bible including Jesus being in Bethlehem. After the hijack, the Merovingian rulers were a part of the takeover of Rome. This is the setup of the new Palatine rulership, the first real king of all the Franks, who is said to be the first, but he is the grandson of Merovius. He was responsible for bringing all of Europe under one ruler, re-establishing military dominance on the fragmenting Roman Empire. What we're discussing is the creation of the Holy Roman Empire and also insisting that the entire history of Rome could be considered a fabrication. If history tells us that Pompeii happened in the first century, yet there's some pretty convincing evidence that Pompeii happened in the 1600s, what are the implications? Another reference to use as a guide is the creation of religions, or the Abrahamic religions. We have much to say on that in relation to alchemy. Once the new empire was created, then there were multiple bloodlines, multiple royal families, and this is the way that the government was managed through the Holy Roman Empire, set up essentially by these medieval alchemists who had hijacked a previous church and completely stole their knowledge, architecture, and culture.
The seal is the double-headed phoenix, the rulers of both sides of divide and conquer. This is then how all of Europe got their royal occult coat of arms. It was a system of management of the Holy Roman Empire to assign different Palatine rulers that would become kings or keep management of several other kings. The Templars then magically appear in England. For some reason, King Henry II just decided to let them come live there. But not just that, he gave them free land and gave them a territory to where they supposedly built a round church. But you'll see this a lot, many of the Templar churches actually resemble a different culture's architectural style. And if there were instances of the Templars being donated actual castles and land, well, we need to consider if some of these architectures were just assigned as Templar architectures because it's an easy excuse to hide the actual source. Interestingly, similar to the Biltmore, there's a structure in Portugal that was built in the 16th century style, yet they say it was built in the early 1900s. This one in particular is very strange because there seems to be no construction photos. It's called the Quinta de Regularia. The person responsible was a bug scientist, so that seems weird. But he eventually became interested in building a Templar well. Mainstream says that this was built in order to be a garden for his little bug friends, yet he for some reason was obsessed with the occult. There are Masonic and Templar references all over the entire grounds, but one place in particular is this initiation well that features nine steps of initiation. There's a clear distinction in the architecture, and some believe this to be the actual remains of a Templar well. And under the state is a series of grottos and tunnels that also make it even more mysterious. The story is a major mystery because Montero wasn't even a Freemason, yet he had Masonic references on his tomb. The only connection that he has to Freemasonry is because of the architecture. So, did the Templars actually end after they burned at the stake in Paris for their confessions? Remember, we never really dived into that and explored how each Templar was questioned individually and their answers were quite similar and had much more detail than you'd imagine. But supposedly, the story goes that the property and monetary assets were just given to a rival order, the Knights Hospitallers. But it's also thought that the King Philip and King Edward of England seized most of the Knights Templar's wealth. What the story doesn't say is that there was a coded secret document that was actually released in 1324. It's called the Carta Transmissionis, or the Charter of Transmission. It's a coded Latin manuscript by Johannes Marcus Larminius, which details how the leadership was transferred after the death of Jacques de Molay. This document isn't mentioned because it's written in a devised ancient Knights Templar Codex, and it is kept in Freemason custody. In the document, Larminius states he has become too aged to continue with the rigorous requirements of the office of the Grand Master, and transfers his Grand Mastership of the Templar Order to Franciscus Theobaldus, the prior of the Templar Priory still remaining in Alexandria, Egypt. With this declarative charter, Larminius sought to protect the Order for perpetuity by continuing this legitimate line of Grand Masters of the Templar Order. The charter traces the Order through a dark period until its semi-private unveiling at the Convent General of the Order of Versailles in 1705 by Philip II, Duke of Orleans, elected Grand Master of the Templar Order. The Templars, when they came into England, were so rich that they acquired property within English towns, established churches for their brothers, and then they would set up new cities and markets. I don't think I need to mention the Templar influence on London, as that's well known due to tourism. If it's true that the Templars, secret societies, or even secret bloodlines had such an influence on the founding of countries and cities, how can we truly understand the history without the full context, especially with the translation of the Bible. Because now, we're in the time period of the Elizabethan age and the Tudors, and the Templars supposedly have been disbanded for over 300 years. Also, let's remember that the Rosicrucians have not been formed just yet, so it's a very interesting time. Alchemy is at its prime, as we saw earlier in the video with some of the leading scientists and minds of this period attempting to reach some philosophical goal of unlocking the Philosopher's Stone. Yet did the translators of the Bible know any of this information? And did it have any effect on the creation of the Bible in terms of what to leave in or what to leave out? In order to begin this investigation, we need to learn more about Francis Bacon. 
one of England's most influential scientists in history. It's not easy to find because they don't really want people to know, but many scholars mention that he must have been one of the translators as there was no one better qualified than him to do so. Not just that, he very well could have been the secret writer behind Shakespeare. So this guy is an important figure to remember because it gets into the Bible and how he was involved with all of what we've been discussing. Let's keep in mind that Francis was born of royalty, there is no question. He was the Lord Chancellor of England, but is most famous because he was one of the most influential minds behind developing the scientific method in progressing the later stages of the scientific revolution. We're not going to dive into the whole Shakespearean authorship thesis because I'm sure most of you guys know about it. But if proven to be true, it would connect as it would show the level of secrecy and planning that goes behind creating historical pieces of literature. But we can forget that for now, as there are many other things to criticize. He was very well educated, he even graduated from Oxford, and went to study at Trinity. Francis Bacon was fluent in several languages, including Latin, Greek, and Hebrew. This, along with his extensive education, would have made him a prime candidate for editor. He even advocated for the importance of Hebrew in his work, Advancement of Learning. He literally says the importance of studying the Hebrew language for a better understanding of the Bible. It would seem he was obviously very interested in this subject, as if he had been deeply studying it. Let's not forget that Francis Bacon was a close advisor to King James, who was the commissioner of the King James Bible. Francis Bacon, as Lord Chancellor of England and as a respected intellectual, it's pretty logical to conclude that he may have been one of the editors. Although there is no direct evidence to support that Francis Bacon was an editor of the Bible, that does not mean it isn't true. As we've been discussing, there's obviously some form of secrecy involved. This will be shown conclusively by looking into Francis Bacon's past. Officially, Francis Bacon was the youngest son of Sir Nicholas Bacon, who became Lord Keeper in 1558 and whose eldest son was also called Nicholas. His son Nicholas, the eldest son, was the first person to create a baronet. Okay, but it gets weird when you type in, was Francis Bacon the son of Queen Elizabeth I? Well, it looks like there's evidence to support this. Theory suggests that Francis Bacon was actually the son of Queen Elizabeth I, and this will come into play later. Let's start with the Vestal Flame portrait of Queen Elizabeth I. This portrait reveals that three children were her progeny. One child, however, is depicted in the shadows, symbolizing the queen's firstborn, who may have been stillborn or died early. This child represents the result of her first sexual affair, and presumably the loss of her virginity. The two children at the forefront and in the light are the eldest of the two, Francis Bacon and Robert Devereux. Devereux was almost five years younger, but both are shown to be sons of the queen. It would seem that the issue was that she had an illegitimate son. Francis Bacon was to be the next heir, but for some reason unknown to us, they didn't want Francis Bacon to be the next heir. And so Parliament enacted the Act of Treason in 1571. It established and confirmed that the right heir and successor to the Queen's Majesty should be the natural issue of Her Majesty's body. Both in the 1543-4 Act of Succession and the previous 1533-4 Act of Succession referred to the heirs of Lady Elizabeth's body being lawfully begotten. Therefore, this amendment in 1571 led many to speculate that the Queen could designate a bastard child or a child born out of wedlock as her successor to the English throne. This is actually from the Francis Bacon Research Trust, and they've got some pretty interesting research on the topic. In essence, this legal alteration suggested that the Queen may have engaged in a clandestine marriage. She could assert at any moment that she was secretly wed, sustained with the sufficient evidence. The historian William Warner indicated in his addition to Albion's England that Queen Elizabeth had concealed her heir, the Prince of Wales. Another historian, William Camden, referenced this. Even Francis Bacon himself addressed it in his collection of the felicities of Queen Elizabeth. He compares Elizabeth to Alexander the Great and Julius Caesar, both of whom who had no named successor but did have children. There are two primary affairs, but it appears that Robert Dudley is the most probable candidate for being Francis Bacon's father. Robert Dudley, 1st Earl of Leicester, was an English statesman and a favorite of Elizabeth from her ascension until his death. He courted her for many years, and as he would write much later in life, 
I have known her better than any man alive since she was eight years old. The narrative suggests that she became pregnant when they were confined as prisoners in the Tower of London. While this might seem like an odd detail of the story, it's important to consider how the Tudors tie into this. I'm not entirely convinced that this is all coincidental, but it seems as if the Tudors weren't sure who they wanted as their next heir. Perhaps they had different plans for Francis. However, to understand this, we need to question whether or not the Tudors had any connections to secret brotherhoods. We know for certain that Elizabeth was a Tudor, and that the entire Elizabethan period spanned from 1485 to 1603. Interestingly, there's a portrait of her with some peacock-like symbolism. Historical records suggest that there's no direct connection between the Tudors and the Rosicrucians, but is that true? This came from a time before secret societies, so it typically gets overlooked. But as we've discussed the history of the Templars, we can now link all of this together. And trust me, there's a reason we're discussing this. It'll all tie together. The Tudor's main symbol is the Tudor Rose. This is the most obvious and blatant connection that anyone with any knowledge of symbols would recognize as being from the same lineage as the Rosicrucians. The Rosicrucians were the Brotherhood of the Rosy Cross, yet historians refuse to see the connection. But there's more to think about. During that time, England saw a growing interest in the occult, alchemy, and hermetic traditions. John Dee, the famous occult philosopher, was a significant figure in the Elizabethan court. He had an extensive library on esoteric subjects, and it was rumored that he was a part of a secret society. Despite this, he had a significant influence on the Tudor court, Queen Elizabeth's most important advisor, consulting her on various matters including navigation, diplomacy, and the establishment of the British Empire. His knowledge of astronomy and the occult, which also includes astrology, were invaluable to the Queen. It's quite shocking that the Elizabethan court would have supported an individual like Dee, who was exploring alternative dimensions through his Enochian angelic communications and delving into alchemy while the Tudors actually funded it. Other members, such as Walter Raleigh and Sir Francis Walsingham, also showed interest in alchemy. Some fictional writers have suggested that John Dee actually created a homunculus for Queen Elizabeth. There's of course no way for us to confirm this, but John Dee did have an extensive library and is referenced as having a copy of the Liber Vacae. So, did the Rosicrucians have anything to do with the Tudors? To understand this, we'll first need to consider whether or not the Rosicrucians were truly founded when they claim. That was simply their announcement to the world. It doesn't mean that they weren't previous orders or names for the same concept or even the same bloodline. I believe that the undeniable proof of the connection is actually within the portraits of Queen Elizabeth. They say that the Tudors had nothing to do with the Rosicrucians, but if Queen Elizabeth herself was associated with the order, would that not be suspicious? There are two portraits that we must look at, the Pelican and the Phoenix portraits. We'll discuss more on this specific symbol later, but one of the most well-known symbols of the Rosicrucians is the Pelican, feeding her children with the blood from her own self-inflicted wound. We also see the rose and the white cross with the Freemason compass at the top. I've got a lot to say about this symbol and we'll connect it to alchemy soon, but let me ask you, why is Queen Elizabeth wearing the symbol? Also, this bird symbolism is interchangeable with the phoenix and sometimes the swan, as we'll see. Even in this image, she has a secret finger pose. So let's think about this. What are the implications of a secret society or brotherhood having this much influence over royalty? Interestingly, the Tudors even used Shakespeare as a sort of propaganda tool. Let's not forget that most of Shakespeare's plays are teeming with alchemical symbolism. Think about it. Historians should make clearer just how deeply steeped in the occult the works of Shakespeare really are. For example, in A Midsummer Night's Dream, there are love potions used to manipulate other characters' emotions. These are alchemical elixirs. The Tempest features sorcery and royalty. It follows the story of Prospero and the rightful Duke of Milan, who has been living on a remote island with his daughter Miranda for 12 years after being ousted by his brother, the King of Naples. Prospero becomes a powerful sorcerer with the help of a metaphysical spirit named Ariel. This shows royalty learning to master sorcery from the spirit realm. Prospero even uses his magic to cause a shipwreck to bring his brother to the island. There's Caliban, the half-human, half-monster character who's the son of a witch and the devil. We'll break this down more later, but there's also a section where the character Trinculo contemplates making a prophet 
from Caliban's unusual appearance. This connects to the concept of creating hybrids, which is detailed in older Arabic texts. Prospero uses his magic to resolve conflicts and then forgives his brother through the balancing of the elements, an ode to alchemy. He also times his actions based on celestial influences, again showing an understanding of astrology. The story ends with Prospero renouncing his magic and returning to Milan to reclaim his dukedom. We could spend a lot of time breaking down all the occult symbolism in Shakespeare. Julius Caesar is essentially an occult ritual sacrifice. Romeo and Juliet involves some sort of elixir. Pericles features the revival of the dead. Evelyn Hamlet references secret royal brotherhoods and the Philosopher's Stone. Let's not forget the curse associated with the Scottish play Macbeth. The play is believed to have been cursed due to its portrayal of witchcraft and the supernatural. To make the play authentic, Shakespeare supposedly included real incantations and rituals used by the witches of his time. This allegedly offended the witches, leading to a curse. Over the years, various incidents have been attributed to this curse, including injuries, deaths during performances, fires on sets, and the general misfortune plaguing entire productions. Most actors even refuse to say the name Macbeth in a theater, believing that by doing so will bring the curse upon them. Instead, they refer to it as the Scottish play, or the Bard's play, to avoid invoking the curse. And despite the controversy and alleged curse, Macbeth still remains one of Shakespeare's most popular and frequently performed works. Its exploration of dark themes like ambition, guilt, and consequences has made it a lasting piece of literature. It's clear that Shakespeare's works are layered with occult references. There are blatant ones dealing with magic, and then the more subtle ones like character transformation, which can be seen as alchemical symbolism. This is especially evident in the plays dealing with the Wars of the Roses, like Henry VI and Richard III. These plays tell the story of the conflict between the House of Lancaster and the House of York, leading to the rise of the Tudors. The White Rose of York and the Red Rose of Lancaster are references to the alchemical White Queen and Red King. The union of Henry Tudor and Elizabeth of York symbolizes the alchemical marriage, the Tudor Rose. This represents the alchemical concept of solue et coagula. The two conflicts represents the stage of dissolution, while the unification of England under the Tudors represents coagulation. If it's true that Shakespeare is layered with this level of occult and hermetic alchemical symbolism, then this would imply that whoever was behind this was associated with the lineage and knowledge of this suppressed art form. Interestingly, there's a book on this subject that discusses at great length the origin of the Tudors and the Rosicrucians. It's called The Rosicrucians, Their Rites, and Mysteries by Hargrave Jennings, published 1870. In part 2, chapter 19, there's a section that discusses the Arthurian mythos with the importance of the round table and its relation to the order, and it discusses the secret meaning of the rose. The five-leaved roses, red and white roses, Rodion, Rhodes, or Knights of Rhodes, or of Malta, the successors of the Templars. Typify their original ten signs of the zodiac, red rose, five signs, aspiration, or ascension, white rose, five signs or leaves, dissension, or condescension, or holy ghost, which is the key to apotheosis. Chapter 12 goes over a book that connects the Rosicrucians to the Jesuits. Quote, the following old book is a very extraordinary one, as the design and tendency of it will puzzle most persons who were acquainted with the nature of the antagonistic relations which were supposed to exist between the Church of Rome and the Rosicrucians. The book is exceedingly scarce and valuable. Rosa Jesuitica, which seems to have been published in Prague, 1620, the author says that it's truly a curious tract upon the relations of the Jesuits and the Rosicrucians. Now, this book is online, but there's only a German version, so we got it translated as well. It covers the relations between the Jesuits and the Rosicrucians. The author begins by detailing the etymology. The armies of Jesus are called so because they have allied themselves to protect the name of Jesus against all heretics. The Rosicrucians are named after the word rose and cross because they bear and endure the suffering and adversity walking on roses from the sharpest thorns. Then he goes into homonymy. The armies of Jesus is a term used in two ways. In a general sense, for all Jesuits, 
and in a special sense, for the newly emerged order of the armies. The word Rose Cross is not used homonymously. Then he covers synonymy. The armies of Jesus have several synonyms, including Jesuits, Societas Jesu, Lojo Litai, and New Knights. The Rose Cross has synonyms such as Crossbears, Brothers of the Blessed Roses, Brothers of the Cross, Contemplating Patriots, Heaven Gazers, and Godly People. Then he states that the difference between the two orders is that the armies of Jesus aim to rise above and exterminate all heretics, causing suffering to others, while the Rose Cross remains submissive, ready to suffer, and bear the cross out of contempt for the world and worldly things. Interestingly, the author was quite critical of the Jesuits, suggesting that Jesus would not love them because they cause destruction and are far from practicing brotherly love. The poem also calls the Jesuits wolves and say that they like to cut Jesus' body parts or members. He even calls them suspicious. Here's the poem. Quote, May I perish if Jesus can love you. He is the source and giver of all salvation to the human race. You, on the other hand, are the destruction of all innocence. Christ's law teaches brotherly love everywhere. How far it is banished from you requires... Neither Christ is the author, nor do you know how to give flames. It pleases you to cut the body of Christ's members, or you, who are taught by masters, use Jesus. Nature does not recognize, but proves to be wolves. Then there's this letter, and this gets pretty crazy, so I'll include the original German so that you can verify. Quote, Concerning the order of the Rose Cross, it began at the time of the beginning of the persecution of Christians especially shortly after the birth of Jesus Christ, during the reign or tyranny of Nero, for the reason that the small number of Christians wanted to stay together and confirm Christ's teaching with their blood under the tyrants. And such were the Rose Crossers, who remained constant during the times of the emperors Domitian, Trajan, Septimius Severus, Maximinus, and the Roman popes. The fraternity increased especially after the edict of Maximian Galerius, who granted Christians free life in the year 310 AD. So, this rare book, essentially, connects the Rosicrucians to a secret cult back to the time of Rome. That's kind of important to note. There's kind of a lot in this book that's mind-blowing, but it says a story that is described by Ludov Kamerar that around the year 1214, quote, at the instigation and movement of the clergy, monks, and priests, 20,000 young boys gathered in Germany. They were persuaded that they could reconquer the Holy Land, for it was written, Out the mouths of young children and nursing infants you have prepared praise. All of them were marked with the cross and sent forth. When they came to sea, some were thrown into the sea by sea robbers, others were sold to the Saracens. Hardly any of them returned to Germany. I think they have reached the Promised Land, let the application be made. Different causes produces different effects. If the primary cause does not act, the secondary causes do nothing or do not act properly. Different forms create different things. The fraternity of the Rose and the Jesuits are very different. End quote. The author seems to be fond of the Rosicrucians. It's obvious that they're both orders of a deeper hidden hand, the Roman Church. But it's that the Jesuits performed the darker and more hateful deeds as taking 20,000 children from German families, supposedly, and this author obviously was upset about that. Interesting that it shows the Catholic Church's ties with the Saracens. This is the show that the Rosicrucians protect the spiritual side. And so I'm not saying all people who are Jesuits or Rosicrucians are specifically evil, but more so that they are part of a bigger play and have been connected with ancient royal bloodlines since the time or the time that they give us of Rome. Not all Rosicrucians believed in participating in the darker aspects of alchemy, especially after the 1800s, but during the periods we're discussing, the issue of ambition, as the author brings up, begins to cause people to do horrible things. There's more to cover on this book, but we'll end it with the author basically saying throughout the book that the Pope Jesuits, and Catholic Church, in general listing a song that speaks about this and he also mentions other related orders, such as the Order of the Marianites and the Order of the Golden Paracelidos, 
and discusses various treatises and writings related to these orders. He warns against false brothers who may try to deceive others with false teachings. The reason we went over that is because mainstream historians refuse to see the connection between these secret brotherhoods, royalty, and the alchemical tradition, and the implications that would hold for our history as much of our information comes from these people. Furthermore, as we described, the Rosicrucians had a deep interest in the occult arts, such as alchemy, astrology, even manipulating the weather. But we went over how during this time in the Elizabethan era and the early 16th century, John Dee, Michael Meyer, Robert Flood were deeply interested in alchemical concepts, yet they were also pawns of royalty. We won't explore too far, but remember the table of contents for the Book of the Cow or Liber Vacai? They were covering how to literally cause mass cataclysm or burning from a distance, and it's speculated that the 1666 fire of London was a part of some type of secret ritual which shows that within the next century, there was definitely something going on when it comes to these brotherhoods. All we are asking is, where did it come from and how have they influenced or manipulated history? It's interesting to note that before the Tudors, Europe was still recovering from the Black Death. The cause is said to have been from the bacterium spread through fleas carried by rats. Is it possible that some of these could have been introduced to the ships deliberately, causing infections during trade routes? Let's keep in mind that the Templars were associated and probably working with the assassins. And the Jesuits believed that the world needed to be burned in fire, so there's that to consider. There's actually a movie that makes this claim with the Templars, so it's not just made up, it's actually been discussed in scholarly circles too, as supposedly, the Mughals actually weaponized the plague as some sort of biological warfare. It's interesting to consider how this may have benefited the takeover of previous civilizations and set up for the new rise in tutorship. Regardless if they directly influenced it, this isn't out of the question to consider because this period was literally called the Templar's Curse, and people believed that the Great Famine and Black Death happened simply on the notion that the Templars were wrongly executed, so this was their revenge. Even the Pope that ordered the execution of the leader of the Templars was struck by lightning and burned to death. Quote, Clement died on 20th April 1314. According to one account, while his body was lying in state, a thunderstorm arose during the night and lightning struck the church where his body lay, setting it on fire. The fire was so intense that by the time it was extinguished, the Pope's body had been all but destroyed. He was buried at the Collegiate Church in Euseste, close to his birthplace, in Villadrot, as laid down in his will. End quote. Okay, this is a very interesting find. So he came up earlier, but I never dived into him and made the connection. But this is pretty mind-blowing. It really shows the influence of the early alchemists on royalty, Jesuits, and even the Rosicrucians. So this Roger Bacon guy, supposedly, has nothing to do with Francis Bacon. And at first I really couldn't believe that, but that's what the historians say, that there's nothing in relation to them. However, there may be a link. It's hard not to notice some remarkable similarities between these two influential figures. Both were early proponents of the scientific method, and their contributions to the field have had a lasting impact. While historians have typically considered them unrelated, there might be a hidden connection, particularly in their coat of arms. Francis Bacon, the English philosopher and politician, was known to be the youngest son of Sir Nicholas Bacon. His family's coat of arms features an intricate design, which was also found on a 1574 gift plate from his father to the University of Cambridge. On the other hand, we have Roger Bacon, an English scholar and Franciscan friar from the 13th century. His coat of arms, as documented in the armorial Wigenbergen, features a design with six flowers, which are referred to as Flores de Aubepine, or Hawthorne flowers. This design also includes an entry for his son, Robert. Upon closer examination, we can see that the coat of arms for both Francis and Roger Bacon include the floral motif, specifically the Flores de Aubepine. It would seem that this is an earlier variant of Rosicrucian symbolism on family coat of arms. 
A source from the 19th century suggests that both Francis and Roger Bacon belong to the same Norman family. This family, known for its philosophers and scholars, held estates in various locations throughout England. The Baronet's Bacon, as described in an 1841 publication, details the lineage of the Bacon family, including Sir Nicholas Bacon and his descendants. These records provide essential context for understanding the possible context between Francis and Roger Bacon. So what does this all mean? The shared Norman ancestry between Francis and Roger Bacon, along with this strikingly similar coat of arms, hints at a connection that's been hidden or overlooked by historians. It ties the Tudors and the Rosicrucians to ancient forms of magic, but specifically the brazen head. Roger Bacon, often referred to as Dr. Mirabilis or Wonderful Teacher, is essentially an early wizard. But it's strange because these were wizard monks of a new order within the church, the Franciscans. This kind of ties in with many other subjects as they were also a part of supposedly finding new settlements in the new world along with the Jesuits. The idea is that there were many orders. People focus in on one order, but there are several and each one has a different purpose or function really. The Franciscans or the Franciscan order officially known as the Order of Friars Minor, was founded by St. Francis of Assisi in the early 13th century. The order emphasizes poverty, simplicity, and a close connection with nature, living a life of service to the poor and marginalized. This is sounding similar to the Templar story, yet there's a connection. The Franciscan friars were the chroniclers who told the story of the Templars. Supposedly, this group, these Franciscan monks, possessed supernatural powers. They were mystics who dealt with subjects of alchemy and secrecy. Now, we're coming back to that brazen head story because Albertus Magnus is credited with the creation of the head. But now that we know more about head skull worship, teraphemes, and the idea of talismans, let's come back and explore this Roger Bacon guy. It's really interesting. Bacon placed considerable emphasis on alchemy and even went so far as to state that alchemy was the most important science. The reason why Bacon kept the topic of alchemy vague for the most part is due to the need for secrecy about esoteric topics in England at the time, as well as his dedication to remaining in line with the alchemical tradition of speaking in symbols and metaphors. So these Franciscan monks were alchemists, and Roger Bacon even discusses how he read the Islamic works on alchemy. There's this text that we're currently translating it's this old alchemical text attributed to Aristotle. It's called the Secrets of Secrets, or Secretum Secretorum. The Islamic version is called Mirror of Princes, and Roger Bacon truly believed it to be attributed to Aristotle. Remember, I was mentioning this with how modern historians say that some of these alchemical writings that claim to be from Aristotle are just pseudonames. Well, Roger Bacon disagreed. Here's a small section from that book, The Secret of Secrets. Quote, it is said that Alexander had two horns, which symbolized the wisdom and power he possessed. The book was written in Aristotle's old age, when he was weakened by physical ailments and could no longer carry out his daily tasks and responsibilities in the royal court. Alexander chose Aristotle as his advisor and teacher, and greatly valued his wisdom, which was rooted in both secular and spiritual knowledge." End quote. Just in case I didn't make it clear, this is the book Secretum Secretorum, which was written by Roger Bacon, and it goes over astrology, alchemy, and magic. But notice how he attributes this to Aristotle, and he truly believes this, but mainstream says it's pseudo-Aristotle? Bacon goes on to explain that the sections of the book are on healing the body, the importance of justice, and how the author was a servant of the great. But interestingly, it goes on to say, quote, This book has been passed down through generations, and its wisdom has been praised by many great leaders. It was discovered in ancient Greek texts and was later translated into Latin so that its teachings could be more widely understood and shared." End quote. So yes, this whole book is an alchemy book and the Franciscan monks were seeking the Philosopher's Stone. That's open information because Roger Bacon wrote books on it and there are even depictions of him in an alchemy lab. This would be a solid argument for other orders in the church also being interested in this knowledge since he's such an influential figure. But now, let's consider the Francis Bacon connection. 
then this really starts to tie all together. Because essentially, Roger Bacon created a homunculus. And we already talked about it. It's called the Brazen Head. But let's cover a few more details about that story. So first, let's point out that the ancients had ChatGPT type technologies before the Brazen Head. It's just that these relied on masters of the alchemical and magical arts. You essentially had to be trained mystic or monk to be able to communicate with the spirits in order to get a question you wanted answered. So this has been done since the beginning of civilization. Religions and cults have formed on this very notion that you can get answers or responses through different inputs or rituals. But beyond all that, Roger Bacon actually used his spiritual ChatGPT to create the brazen head. And this is because they were attempting to find a way to capture the spirit, yes, just like a talisman, so that it could be used anytime. As spirit communication is limited to certain time periods and ritualistic ceremonies, there are certain limitations. But the goal here is that Roger Bacon was attempting to create an automaton of some sort, a literal physical machine or robot that would be powered by a spirit. Let's take a look at the San Francisco newspaper article from August 16th, 1896, titled The Brazen Head, How Roger Bacon Invoked Mystic Rite. So I'm just going to break it down because we don't have time to read it all, but it starts off by introducing how one of the experiments of Friar Bacon was the creation of a talking head of bronze. This is described in the book entitled The Famous Historic of Friar Bacon, containing the wonderful things that he did in his life. So, in this story, Friar Bacon and his buddy Friar Bungay wanted to create a talking brass head to protect England from invasions and make themselves famous. They put in a lot of effort making the head with all the parts of a human head, including intricate inner mechanisms, valves, and what could have been an early piston engine. It wasn't just a brass sculpture, it was a full-on machine that they were trying to build. It's like they were attempting to create an early version of a chatbot like GPT, but they were stuck. They must have had some existing knowledge about how to create artificial intelligences, which motivated them to take on this ambitious project. So Friar Bacon and his friend Friar Bungay were stuck trying to make this brass head talk. They realized that they needed some supernatural help. So they decided to summon a demon or a spirit. They prepared everything they needed and went to a nearby wood for the ritual. After performing the necessary ceremonies and speaking the right words, they successfully summoned the demon. The demon appeared and asked what they wanted. Friar Bacon told the demon about their brass head project and how they wanted it to speak and demanded the demon to reveal the secret of making the head talk or they would keep it trapped. The demon first tried to dodge the question, claiming that it didn't know or have the power to help. But Friar Bacon called it out, telling the demon to stop lying. He threatened the demon, saying that he would keep it trapped if it didn't tell him what they needed to know. Finally, the demon gave in and told them to use the fumes of six powerful herbs to make the head talk within a month. They had to be there when it spoke, or their efforts would be wasted. So they spent three weeks watching this head nod and stop. Eventually, they got super tired and asked Friar Bacon's servant, Miles, to keep watch and wake them up if he heard the head spoke. Miles tried to stay awake by playing music and the head finally said, time is. But Miles didn't think it was that important to wake up the friars. Another half hour passed and the head said, time was. Still, Miles didn't wake them up and actually mocked the head instead. Finally, the head said, time is passed and fell to the ground, causing a loud noise and fire flashes. So the friars wake up and they see the broken head. They're really upset and they ask Miles what happened. Then they find out that the head had spoken and Miles didn't wake them. They realize that they had missed their chance to protect England with a wall of brass. As punishment, Friar Bacon used his magic to make Miles dumb for a month. So the friars' big plan was ruined, all because of Miles' foolishness. Obviously this was just a retelling of the tale, but still, it would seem that this is the method expressed for creating such a device. The use of spirits and the creation of advanced automatons. And yes, they were capable of creating such a device. In the exact same time period, we have the Muslim polymath, Ismail al-Jazari, 
and he's best known for his writing, The Book of Knowledge of Ingenious Mechanical Devices, and he's even described as the father of robotics. This would be another Arabic connection on top of alchemy. Roger Bacon also took the works of optics as well from al Hazen. Again, the Arabic works claim Greek authorship for some reason, but then we have the pseudo-author issue. But some of the devices listed by al Jazari are said to be based on pseudo-Archimedes. Is it because this is some type of secret? The knowledge of automatons is deeply integrated with the subject of the homunculus. In his book, he lists water clocks, advanced pump machinery, but not only that, he literally created moving peacocks driven by hydropower and is also responsible for automatic doors. Even Leonardo da Vinci is said to have been inspired by Al Jazari. But it gets strange because remember, we're talking 12th century again, a mainstream history timeline, but it's fascinating that this Al Jazari guy was literally trying to create humanoid robots. So there must have been a foundation for this knowledge. And again, in the original works, they tell you that they're not originals. It's the same with almost every single ancient book on alchemy, which is what science was categorized during his time. So apparently the Greeks had these devices as well, and that would tie back to the aleopile of Heron's engine, which is a simple turbine. It seems this would be a reason to keep this knowledge secret. If the highest form of the science during this time was using it for automata and or brazen heads that could speak and give knowledge and wisdom to any question asked? Sounds familiar? The Greek god, Hephaestus, was said to have created automata in the form of self-moving tripods and other mechanical devices, so they definitely had the imagination for it. But listen to this, Al Jazari built more than just robot peacocks, which very well could be a symbol, but he built humanoid automatons, a waitress that could serve water, tea, or drinks. He invented a hand-washing automaton and a flush mechanism that was ignored until the late 19th century for some strange reason, yet they had the technology for keeping proper sanitation. There is this one strange depiction that's classified as a table device, but that doesn't look like a table at all. It looks like a man riding a cow, and the back legs, you could say, womb, has been converted into this massive golden vessel or chalice. So are we seeing the similarities? These are just the depictions they show us. Who knows how advanced it really was during that time? It would seem, based on their descriptions, that it doesn't really line up with their current time period. Automatic talking robots? It's not even whether it's true or not. What does the royal ancestor of Francis Bacon in mainstream history, around 300 years separated, okay? And he's attempting to get rich through alchemical means and attach a spirit to an advanced mechanical device and he got this knowledge from a demon? But this could have only been done looking through older text, Arabic sources that then got their information from the Greeks. Plato is the supposed author of the Book of Cal, or Liber Vacai. Now we may proceed to the Bible. And to be clear, this is in no way trying to harm or discredit Christianity. Although you may disagree with the conclusions, I mean no disrespect to any Christians by attempting to unveil the Rosicrucian influence on the Bible. Now that we know the Rosicrucian is a similar order with a bloodline that might go back to the time of Jesus, Let's take a look at the King James Bible cover from 1611 edition. This is the first cover ever on the King James Bible. This is an alchemical work. Above we have the sun and the moon and the Holy Spirit, the Trinity. However, if we look down, there's something that sticks out. The Rosicrucian mother bird with her young, literally feeding from the wound. All we have to do is connect this symbol to Rosicrucian as it's undeniable and clearly on the front page of the King James Bible. The significance would then be that the alchemists or those interested in the secret mysteries were a part of the translation of the King James Bible. Let's just start there, but we're not done. There is more with this cover. To the right is a young man or somewhat androgynous looking, and you could say possibly Hermes. He's doing something with his feet and looking directly at the translated by, 
indicated that this is a great work or final result. He's lifting the pin to finish, as above, so below. But on his hair is an interesting artifact that proves their secret symbolism. You can clearly see a skull. Behind this skull, if you zoom into the robe of the priest behind him, and at first I thought this was just a pattern of the engraving style for like shadowing, but no, look closer. It's literally an eye. Why is this on the cover of the Bible? The first cover of the King James Bible. To the bottom right is the phoenix, which is handing Hermes the inkwell. This is the cycle, the translation, the reiteration of what was new, burned up and revived again. Only alchemists could ingrain this much symbolism into an image. As we were discussing with single point perspective in mirrors, this too is a spectacle. Whoever made this undoubtedly was connected with Rosicrucianism and alchemy. We can confirm the symbolism is correct because to the left, we see the old priest. And who is that in the background? A one-eyed cow? This is the Babylonian Canaanite religion, the Phoenician Brotherhood that we've been speaking of. This is the old ways or the old brotherhood and the book is still open. It's almost as if she's cloaked and giving a look of seriousness or secrecy. Almost as if they are forging or leaving out certain portions of the older text. We see above this Rosicrucian flowers for decoration, another detail that we saw in the coat of arms. But also, above that, we clearly see coat of arms on Tartarian tents. But these aren't coat of arms for countries. They are occult armorials, often used in secret occult orders. Interestingly, there's a mirror in this image and it seems to be the centerpiece of it all. We see a cross, but it's rotated like an X. The man on the left is holding the keys. Behind him, someone is staring at him with a knife, and the man on the right is holding the sword. But in the middle, we see a strange baby mirror with the Lamb of God on the top of the earth. If you look closer, the Lamb of God is always depicted with the white and red cross, the Lamb of God also known as the Paschal Lamb, or Agnes Dei, as a symbol in heraldry. It's a lamb that's walking with a halo around its head, or a red cross on its body. The lamb's front right leg is bent over a cross staff, and there's a flag with St. George's cross on it attached to the staff. Now the Templars use this Lamb of God symbol on their seals. There were a few masters of the temple in England, like Amory de St. Moore, Robert of Sanford, Richard of Hastings, and William de la Moor, who all had seals with the Agnes Dei on them. So let's just talk about William de la Moor's seal from 1304. On one side, it had the Lamb of God, just like described earlier. On the other side, there was a small oval image with a bearded man wearing a cap. The words, Testis sum Agni, which means, I am witness to the Lamb, were written around the image. The seal was known as the Commune Sigillium Capituli. There's also paintings from Jan van Eyck that show the Lamb of God, and if you look at the architecture, this seems to be pretty advanced for the 14th century. But it's almost as if this was some type of ritual. They're collecting the blood, and we see that it's for the angels. So for the Rosicrucians, it seems that this symbol had more than just a Christ significance of purity. It's obviously some type of alchemical reference as we'll see, Jesus is used in this fashion by the Rosicrucians. This very well could be hinting to something much deeper. Now we're going to begin exploring divine mysteries. Were there two creations in the Bible? This is a famous topic of discussion, and it's because during the days of creation, specifically the sixth day, there's some type of reference to two different types of creation of man. We can all admit that Genesis chapter 1 is quite cryptic and alchemical in fashion. He's literally creating the divine world in the zodiac. Day 1. He creates a light. Apparently, there was already a heaven and earth, and in the beginning, the earth just had no form. Day 2. He creates a firmament, some type of barrier between the metaphysical and this new reality or form that he is about to create in this existing earth. Day 3. Let's notice the alchemy here. On the third day, God creates from the waters below 
and he gathered them into one place and made the land appear. Apparently, God has the ability to speak into existence, which is also very similar to ancient mystery religions and the alchemists who would use imagination to actually create forms. On this day, God created grass, herbs, and fruits, another reference to the result or final work stage as this is a yield. These fruits and herbs contained special powers, as God created them, and weren't they used by alchemists and witches for spells and witchcraft? How would that be possible? Is it because the plants and the stars are intimately connected and they are sort of like natural talismans, spontaneously generating from the ground? We know this to be true because the very next line, after stating the creation of the plant kingdom, God states, quote, let there be lights in the firmaments of the heavens to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years." End quote. So now on the fourth day, he created the lights, or the stars in this firmament, which remember, was some type of separator from the divine heavens. But there's a line that makes it clear that this isn't just for keeping time or signs. God says, that these stars give light upon the earth. So now we're at our second light. Now he's creating two lesser lights, a light for the day, a lesser light for the night. So sun and moon. Then he makes the stars again. So the fourth day is the setup of the astrological influence system of the realm. Day five, he creates sea creatures and flying creatures first. Doesn't explain why, but they are to multiply. Day six is where it gets interesting. God begins by creating living creatures on land, cattle, the creeping things, and beast. Now here is the most famous line, but still notice how God created man and female on the exact same day. It's important to note that we're not concluding that this is a singular being simply because of the use of the pronoun them. However, we will discuss some connections soon. The point to take is that this seems clearly noted that on the sixth day, after creating the cattle, God creates male and female, created he them. Then God blesses them and tells them to multiply but to replenish the earth, to subdue it and to have dominion over every other living animal. He even says, I have given you herbs and fruits which for you shall be meat. Then he makes clear that also the beasts during this initial stage were designed to eat green herb for meat. And that's the end of the sixth day, which seems to me to be some type of initial creation. But wait, on the seventh day, which is also the start of Genesis chapter 2, thus, finally, the work was finished. Seven is another reference for the stages of alchemy. On the seventh day, the work was completed, and he rested. God then blessed the seventh day. This is the ode to the seven alchemical stages to the creation of our realm. So the question is, why, after all of that, is God still discussing generations? He discusses how the herbs were actually getting water from some mist within the earth, and then God makes man out of dust, so from some type of soil or earth, and then breathe into man life. That's very similar to the Gollum story of Hebrew lore, and let's remember what we're reading, a translation of the original Hebraic tradition. It seems now that God takes this man that he had formed and puts him in the Garden of Eden, which we really never get a description on when this was created, but this man seems to have been sculpted. And notice how in the second creation, there's nothing discussing this being as a creation of the image of God or being a mirror, so this is different. This text is very alchemical in nature, as immediately the Lord God creates some type of tree of knowledge, a magical tree that contains the power to know good and evil. Then he begins discussing the four rivers as in the four elements or four angels. Each river has a head. He then begins describing full-on cities with resources, which doesn't really add up with what's being discussed, but he lists Python. So the first one immediately mentions the resource of gold. Why would this be mentioned on the creation of man part? It would seem the translators decided to list this information right here so that future readers could understand the context of where this may be, but why mention gold? 
right? The creation of man is already starting to come off occult and alchemical. But then you mention gold right when you place man in the Garden of Eden. Then Lord gave a command to just the man, saying, You can eat from the trees, but don't eat from the magical tree of knowledge. You will surely die. Now to be fair, this is sort of not true. And why would a god even test a human in this way? Seems kind of scary, honestly. I mean, if you were just created from the dust and you didn't know anything and God is just telling you, hey, so here's the deal. This is how it's going to work. You eat this stuff and you don't eat this or you die. So either this is a really strange story or possibly some type of alchemical symbolical reference. And if so, what type of occulted meanings are we discussing? God then decides to create a help meet for the created man because he didn't want the new human to be alone. So what does he do? Instead of creating just like he did with all the other animals, for some reason he puts Adam to sleep, takes one of his ribs, so some type of surgery, and then closes up the flesh. It even says that. And from this rib, he makes a woman. So to me, that seems to be some type of alchemical transformation. But further, the man and woman were not created at the same time. And also, there's no context to what this Garden of Eden situation is. All we know is that they're trapped here. God didn't want Adam to be lonely and set him up with a specific task. Also, they eventually get kicked out after eating the fruit. So, why is there two different versions of the creation story? Well, this has been a long debate, and the typical answer is just that the second part is just going more into detail on the first creation. However, this can be cleared up by looking at the original sources. As remember, the King James Bible was just a translation, and perhaps one of the strongest arguments for Genesis having two creations and being Rosicrucian and alchemical in translation is that the original alchemical Hebrew Bible has more details on this aspect of two creations of man. Think about that. If the translators of the King James Bible purposely left information out, that would verify one, they knew that information needed to be left out because they understood the knowledge, and two, that the Bible in origin and translation is an alchemical book. It's not reaching to suggest the context in which the Bible was translated during a period in the 17th century when King James and his team of scholars worked on the translation of the Bible, a period in which Hermetic and Kabbalistic traditions were also gaining popularity. In order to dive into the two creations of man, we must just explore the original Hebrew text that predates the King James translation. The Hebrew Bible or Tanakh contains the original language and stories from which the English translations were derived. By examining the Hebrew text, we can gain a deeper understanding of the potential meanings and implications of the two creation accounts. To be fair, as we mentioned, it is possible that the two accounts in Genesis represent different aspects of the same creation event. Some scholars argue that Genesis 1 describes the creation of humanity in general, while Genesis 2 focuses on the specific creation of Adam and Eve, the first man and woman. This interpretation implies that the two accounts are complementary rather than contradictory. However, the Lilith narrative which is rooted in Jewish folklore and not explicitly mentioned in the Bible, it offers a more intriguing explanation for these two creation accounts. According to the Lilith legend, she was the first woman created by God, formed at the same time and from the same material as Adam. Lilith's refusal to submit to Adam led to her exile, after which God created Eve as a more submissive partner for Adam. It's very suspicious that Lilith was left out of the King James Bible, and it seems intentionally considering that the translation was based on the original Hebrew text, which include references to her in various sources. The decision to exclude Lilith from the narrative kind of points to an intentional effort by the translators or editors to conceal certain aspects of the story or to promote a particular perspective. And remember that Francis Bacon was also the writer of New Atlantis, who we know very well could be related to the Friar Bacon or Roger Bacon, the original creator of the Brazen Head. Francis Bacon was also alleged to be the son of Elizabeth I, and the writer behind Shakespeare, and there's a body of work to support these claims. We know these translators would have been influenced by the esoteric traditions in some form or another as it was the science of this time. Therefore, 
the reason for the discrepancy between Genesis chapter 1 and 2 could be a secret reference by the early Rosicrucian scholars to this alchemical secret of the homunculus. This is revealed in older Jewish texts. The most famous reference to Lilith can be found in the alphabet of Ben Sira, a medieval Jewish text. According to this text, Lilith was the first wife of Adam, created at the same time and from the same earth as him. However, she left Adam after a conflict over equality and eventually became a demon, particularly associated with the nighttime and seducing men, so a succubus. The quote is quite hermetic, as they argue about as above, so below. Quote, when God created the first man Adam alone, God said, it is not good for man to be alone. So God created a woman for him from the earth, like him, and called her Lilith. They, Adam and Lilith, promptly began to argue with each other. She said, I will not lie below. And he said, I will not lie below, but above, since you are fit for being below and I for being above. She said to him, the two of us are equal, since we are both from the earth. And they would not listen to each other. Since Lilith saw how it was, she uttered God's ineffable name and flew away into the air. Adam stood in prayer before his maker and said, Master of the universe, the woman you gave me fled from me. End quote. Quote, the Holy Blessed One immediately dispatched the three angels, Sanoi, Sansanoi, and Samangelo, after her to bring her back. God said, if she wants to return, well good, and if not, she must accept that a hundred of her children will die every day. The angels pursued her and overtook her in the sea in raging waters, the same waters in which the Egyptians would one day drown, and told her God's orders, and yet she did not want to return. They told her they would drown her in the sea and she replied, Leave me alone. I was only created in order to sicken babies. If they are boys, from birth to day eight, I will have power over them. If they are girls, from birth to day twenty. When they heard her reply, they pleaded with her to come back. She swore to them in the name of the living God that whenever she would see them on their names or their images on an amulet, she would not overpower the baby, and she accepted that a hundred of her children would die every day. Therefore, a hundred of the demons die every day, and, therefore, we write the names of the three angels on amulets of young children. When Lilith sees them, she remembers her oath, and the child is protected and healed. End quote. I thought that was a strange quote, but there are others that make it quite clear what we're dealing with. Zohar 134b When the letters of the name of Adam descended below, together in their completeness, the male and female were found together and the female was attached to his side, until God cast a deep slumber upon him and he fell asleep, and he lay in the place of the temple below. And the Holy One, blessed be he, sawed her off him, and adorned her as the adorn a bride, and brought her to him. End quote. Zohar 3, 19. Quote, Come and see, there is a female, a spirit of all spirits, and her name is Lilith, and she was at first with Adam. And in the hour when Adam was created and his body became completed, a thousand spirits from the left, evil, side clung to that body until the Holy One, blessed be he, shouted at them and drove them away. And Adam was lying, a body without a spirit, and his appearance was green, and all those spirits surrounded him. In that hour a cloud descended and pushed away all those spirits. And when Adam stood up, his female was attached to his side, and the Holy Spirit which was in him spread out to the side and that side, and grew he in there, and thus became complete. Therefore, the Holy One, blessed be he, sawed Adam into two and made the female. End quote. Whoa, okay, so God's sawing off Lilith? And I know about the whole they, them stuff, but I find it interesting that, well, it seems to be actually true in this case, that God actually created an androgynous being literally according to the Jewish tradition that influenced the translation of Genesis. According to Patai, Samuel resembles the form of Adam and Lilith the form of Eve. Both were born in an androgynous form, corresponding to the form of Adam and Eve, below and above, two twin forms, and Samael and grandmother Eve, Lilith, who is the northerner or emanations from beneath the throne of glory, and the sin of Adam caused this evil. This kind of shows the hermetic connections between the Bible and the story of Genesis, as above, so below. 
In the Bakarak, Emek Ha Malek, 23C through D, it's an interesting text because we get context to Lilith in the Snake of the Garden of Eden. This is also verified by Christian paintings that depict the snake as a woman. But this is insane. So at some point in the passage, the serpent actually mates with Eve. But this is not just intellectual. Although the problem is, how did Lilith, a woman, mate with Eve? She's the woman of harlotry or even the whore of Babylon. So it was actually an injection of semen into Eve similar to Liber Vacai. The snake forced itself into Eve and the text says this is the origin of menstruation. Then it gets even stranger. When Adam goes to mate with Eve, this gives Lilith magical powers, but specifically domination over Adam sexually and forces him to have hundreds of demon babies. She's known to be a succubus, and this makes sense if you consider Plato's writings on the androgynous being. He explains what love is and how on separation of man and woman, this created an attraction to want to be whole again, and this is the origin of love. With Lilith, it manifested as an evil demon. Basically, there's two beings, and they're both androgynous. The first creation was Lilith and Samael. This is the first creation or being, and something happened and Samael was literally sawed off or separated. Samael also is considered to be the serpent and the seed of Cain. Some scholars argue that Cain was not born of Adam and Eve, but of Lilith and Samael. When Adam and Eve were created, the next androgynous beings, we can understand the rib analogy now. They were Siamese twins combined at the rib, but not twins a single being sharing two heads. We see this symbol throughout alchemical manuscripts. We can conclude that there are some strong arguments supporting the notion that the King James Bible secretly refers to these two generations of man. And the evidence is the original Hebrew tradition and text that it's based on, explaining the matter in detail. It's just that this is more of the Kabbalistic and esoteric tradition so it's not fully viewed in the same context as we're viewing it now. Now we're getting to the point where we need to start looking for alchemical references in the Bible. I mean, think about it. It was published in 1611, the exact time we've been studying where all the top leading scientists of the time were obsessed with alchemy. So is there anything else? I just want to make it clear too that it's not our intention to discredit the Bible. Not really. I find it to be a fascinating book. Magical, really. This is just to fully understand alchemy and her influence, but furthermore, to understand what does the Bible have to say about homunculus? Abraham, meaning father of many, is a significant figure in various religious and esoteric traditions, including some that credit him with being the father of alchemy. The Sefer Yetzirah, one of the most renowned ancient mystical Kabbalistic texts, is traditionally ascribed to the patriarch Abraham although others attribute its writing to Rabbi Akiva. The word Yetzra is more literally translated as formation, while the word Bria is used for creation. Dating back to around 200 AD, this text delves into the formation of the world. It serves as an early work on Jewish mysticism, unveiling the secrets of the Sephiroths and the map of the Tree of Life. Viewing Abraham in a Kabbalistic light is interesting, considering his role as the patriarch of monotheistic religions. As the father of Judaism, Islam, and Christianity, Abraham is claimed to be the father from each religion. Each of these three religions, though distinct in their doctrines and tradition, trace their spiritual lineage back to Abraham. In Judaism, it's Isaac, Abraham's son with his wife Sarah, who carried forward the divine promise, becoming one of the patriarchs of the Jewish people. Christianity, in turn, views the lineage through a spiritual lens, with Abraham's faith in God seen as a precursor to Christian's faith, and his covenant with God a foreshadowing of the new covenant through Jesus Christ. In Islam, it's through Ishmael, Abraham's son with Hagar. The lineage is believed to continue, leading ultimately to the prophet Muhammad. Ishmael is celebrated as the ancestor of the Arab people and recognized as a prophet in his own right. But let's remember the Abraham story. He faced the challenge of repopulating his lineage as his wife Sarah was barren. This is the story of how he was visited by three angels disguised as normal human strangers who came to visit Abraham. 
He's like going out of his way for these strangers too. Seems strange because he starts rushing to cook them this lavish meal of bread and a good calf. After the angels are fed, they did eat, Genesis 18 verse 8. But remember, Sarah's laughing and saying, wait, I'm way too old to have kids, are you serious? And laughs at the Lord within herself. God says to Abraham, why is your wife laughing? And they have this weird back and forth for a moment, but they move forward and the Lord brings up how now he's going to bless Abraham with a great nation. Right after, he talks about the way the Lord do judgment. This is a reference to the last judgment and repopulation. As the very next verse, Genesis 18, verse 20, quote, Then the Lord said, Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is exceedingly grievous, end quote. This will be more clear when we get to the last judgment section. However, it would seem that Abraham was tasked with creating a new population after God wanted to destroy two massive cities because they were wicked. After this, God assisted in a miraculous birth with Sarah, giving birth to Isaac. And how was this achieved? Was it just because God promised? Through magic? What are we discussing here? And let's also remember that he was about to sacrifice this son who was born of a miraculous birth on an altar and this faithfulness to God in his willingness to sacrifice his son Isaac has made him a symbol of faith for millions of believers. So, are there all chemical references in the Bible? Before we answer that question, we need to kind of point out the Bible's issue with sorcery and secrecy. So remember, with the brazen head and the spirits and how people or sorcerers were communicating with them in order to gain knowledge, they would ask a question, receive an output. So the Bible is acknowledging that this was occurring and that it was very real. Leviticus chapter 19 verse 26, quote, you shall not eat anything with blood, nor shall you practice divination or soothsaying. End quote. Leviticus 19.31 Give no regard to mediums of familiar spirits. Do not seek after them, to be defiled by them. I am your Lord God. Leviticus 26 In the person who turns to mediums and familiar spirits, to prostitute himself with them, I will set my face against that person and cut him off from his people. Leviticus chapter 20, verse 27 Quote, a man or woman who is a medium or who has familiar spirits shall surely be put to death. They shall stone them with stones. Their blood shall be upon them. End quote. Deuteronomy chapter 18 verses 10 through 12. Quote, there shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or his daughter pass through the fire or one who practices witchcraft or a soothsayer or one who interprets omens or a sorcerer or one who conjures spells or a medium, or a spiritist, or one who calls up the dead. For all who do these things are an abomination to the Lord, and because of these abominations, the Lord your God drives them out from before you. Samuel chapter 15, verse 23, quote, For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. Kings chapter 21, verse 6, quote, and he made his son pass through the fire, practiced soothsaying, used witchcraft, and consulted spiritists and mediums. He did much evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. Isaiah chapter 47, verse 12 through 14, quote, Stand now with your enchantments and the multitude of your sorceries, in which you have labored from your youth. Perhaps you will be able to profit. Perhaps you will prevail. You are wearied in the multitude of your counsels. Let now the astrologers, the stargazers, and the monthly pronosticators stand up and save you from what shall come upon you. Behold, they shall be as stubble, the fire shall burn them, they shall not deliver themselves from the power of the flame. Acts chapter 19, verse 19, quote, Also many of those who had practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all, and they counted up the value of them, and it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. Galatians chapter 5 verses 19 through 21 quote, Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in times past, 
that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Revelation chapter 21 verse 8, quote, But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So it seems that God has a problem with sorcery. But we need to make a distinction between sorcery, magic, and alchemy very quick. Sorcery specifically is a branch of magic and alchemy. It's a subcategory, not a root. This specific practice of sorcery, or also labeled as witchcraft, is the process of communicating with spirits to not only receive information, but to also manipulate and cause real-world effects, or black magic using the natural laws of the universe to communicate with spirits to manifest a physical, material desire. We can also see this connected to idol worship as God or Jehovah does not want his followers worshiping any other God or communicating with any other spirits of any kind. That is really what he's discussing. God never truly condemns alchemy or the positive attributes of magic or the occult because, remember, the occult simply means that which is hidden. God doesn't really condemn the hidden mechanics or explanations for how astrology or sorcery works. In the first place, why can humans do magic to communicate with spirits? It must be some type of natural faculty. Why would God give us the senses to be able to communicate with spirits? While many Christians may not view these practices as magic, there are several spiritual practices within Christianity that could be considered metaphysical, supernatural, or occult in nature. Praying, where one creates an internal desire or goal for God in hopes that he hears it and manifests it into reality. This can be for health, security, or even getting closer to God, which would fall into the pursuit of higher magic, very alchemical in nature. Exorcisms, the practice of expelling demons or evil spirits from a person or place, often through the use of prayer, ritual, or sacred objects. Regardless of the Bible is against spirits or sorcery, they do have magical practices. This magic, specifically for dealing with this issue, we all know about the exorcism. So what is it? Words of powers that demand a demon around and force it to listen to you. Now the difference some would argue is that the magic is powered by God and not spirits or demons. And that's true. Which is what I was saying on different types of magic or different categories. It's to show that the magical system is well integrated within the Bible. It's alchemical in nature regardless of where the spiritual power is coming from. This comes from Solomon's Goetia and his magical ring gifted by God for him to control demons. So it's okay for Solomon to use demons to build a temple? Now, not all Christians do this, but there are denominations that practice speaking in tongues. Also known as glossolalia, this is the practice of speaking in an unknown language, believed to be a gift of the Holy Spirit. And I know many Protestants and Catholics have nothing to do with this practice, but Pentecostals do and it's very strange. However, it's referenced in the Bible. Quote, According to the New Testament, glossolalia first occurred among the followers of Jesus at Pentecost, when all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages, as the Spirit gave them ability. End quote. Then there's prophecy, the ability to receive divine messages or visions about future events, often through dreams or meditation. That's essentially mysticism. You could even say clairvoyance. God is giving you images or dreams or thoughts to assist you in future events. This is a type of magic that was used by the alchemists and ancient sages. Christianity is also filled with charms and talismans. Some Christians may use blessed or consecrated objects such as crucifixes, medals, or relics to protect themselves from evil or bring about positive outcomes. This is the collection of certain energies or ideals within objects so that they symbolize a higher purpose. So there's really no getting around it. The Bible is an occult book. Well, let's explore more about what the Bible says on the mysteries of alchemy, and many of these references are symbolically coded now that we know the nature of the alchemists and Rosicrucians who participated in this translation. We already covered Genesis, but there were many alchemical references there including the Tree of Life and the Tree of Knowledge. And God for some reason wanted to keep this eternal life secret preserved, so he kicked humans out because man has now become like one of us, let's take away his eternal life. The us is interesting, but there are many more references that allude to alchemy. 
Genesis chapter 19, verse 26. The transformation of Lot's wife into a pillar of salt can be seen as an alchemical reference. In alchemy, salt represents the body or the physical aspect of the substance, and the transformation of Lot's wife into salt can be interpreted as the fixation of the volatile or the purification of the material. Genesis chapter 28, verses 10 through 22. Jacob's ladder can be interpreted as an alchemical symbol. The ladder represents the connection between the earthly and heavenly realms. The process of ascending the ladder can be likened to the alchemical process of spiritual purification and transformation. Genesis chapter 41, verses 1 through 36, describes Joseph's interpretation of Pharaoh's dreams, which indeed can be seen as an alchemical allegory. The dreams of the seven fat cows and seven lean cows, as well as the seven healthy and withered ears of grain, symbolize the cycles of abundance and scarcity. These cycles can be related to the stages of the alchemical process, which involve transformation, purification, and ultimately the creation of the Philosopher's Stone. This is also very reminiscent of the Book of the Cow, as this dream uses the symbolism of the cow to represent the process of transformation and renewal. In alchemy, the cow is often associated with the nurturing and sustaining aspects of the Great Mother archetype. Exodus chapter 7 verses 10 through 12 Moses and Aaron's staff turning into serpents is an example of alchemical transformation. And he took the calf which they had made and burnt it in the fire and ground it into powder and strawed it upon the water and made the children of Israel drink of it. This is also somewhat of an alchemical process as it also ties into Ormus and basically they were generating some type of mana to eat during their 40 year trek through the desert. Numbers chapter 21 verses 8 through 9 the bronze serpent on a pole, which healed those who looked upon it. Quote, he brought them into the wilderness, to the same mountain where he revealed himself to Moses, so that he could instruct them in what he required of them. Shortly after the amazing events at Mount Sinai, God brought them to the border of the promised land. But when the people heard the reports of the spies, their faith failed. They said that God could not overcome the giants in the land. As a result of this unbelief, God sent them into the wilderness to wander until that generation died out. In Numbers 21, the people again got discouraged and in their unbelief they murmured against Moses for bringing them into the wilderness. They had already forgotten that it was their own sin that caused them to be there, and they tried to blame Moses for it. As a judgment against the people for their sin, God sent poisonous serpents into the camp, and people began to die. This showed the people that they were the ones in sin, and they came to Moses to confess the sin and ask for God's mercy. When Moses prayed for the people, God instructed him to make a bronze serpent and put it on a pole so that the people could be healed. Typically, scholars try to say that the reason Moses had his staff turn into snake is because this was a symbol of royalty known to the Egyptians. But that is contradictory if we consider this passage. Obviously, Jehovah has some connection with snakes as he uses them for scaring people into faith. Kings chapter 7 verses 49 through 50 Solomon's temple contains many alchemical symbols, including the golden menorah, the golden altar, and the golden table for the showbread. Showbread in Hebrew means bread of the faces, and in the King James Version, they say shewbread. The golden menorah The menorah is a seven-branched candelabrum that was used in the temple. In alchemical terms, the seven branches can be seen as representing the seven planets known in ancient times. The Sun, Moon, Mars, Mercury, Jupiter, Venus, and Saturn, which were also associated with these seven classical metals. Gold, silver, iron, mercury, tin, copper, and lead. The Golden Altar. The altar in Solomon's temple was used for burning incense, which was seen as a way to communicate with the divine. Let's go back to the showbread for a moment. The golden table for the showbread, or shewbread, the bread of the presence, was an offering of 12 loaves of bread placed on a golden table in the temple. These loaves were replaced every Sabbath, and the priests were allowed to eat the old loaves. In alchemical terms, the showbread can be seen as a symbol of spiritual nourishment in the divine presence. Number 12 is also significant as it corresponds to the zodiac. This also connects to mana, the miraculous food provided by God to the Israelites during their journey in the desert. There is even a reference in the Bible to spontaneous generation. In Exodus chapter 8 verses 5 through 6, God causes frogs to emerge from the Nile River as a plague upon Egypt. Quote, and the Lord spoke unto Moses, Say unto Aaron, Stretch forth thine hand with thy rod over the streams, 
over the rivers and over the ponds and caused frogs to come up upon the land of Egypt. And Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt." End quote. Proverbs chapter 3 verses 13 through 18, wisdom is described as more precious than gold and silver. This emphasizes the spiritual aspect of alchemy. In Proverbs chapter 17 verse 3, the refining of gold and silver is compared to the testing of the human heart. In Proverbs chapter 25 verse 4, the removal of impurities from silver is likened to the purification of the human soul. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 25, God promises to refine the people of Israel like silver and gold, symbolizing spiritual purification. Daniel chapter 2 verse 31 through 45, Nebuchadnezzar's dream of a statue made of various metals represents the alchemical process of transformation. Zechariah chapter 13 verse 9 The refining of the people of Israel is compared to the refining of gold and silver, illustrating again the spiritual aspect of alchemy. Malachi chapter 3 verses 2 through 3 The messenger of God is described as a refiner's fire, purifying and refining the people like gold and silver. Matthew chapter 3 verse 11 John the Baptist speaks of Jesus baptizing with the Holy Spirit and fire, symbolizing spiritual transformation, and we're going to explore this further. But this can continue. As we see, the Bible is filled with alchemical references if you're looking for it. Remember, this was the nature of the alchemist to secretly encode symbols, and especially through allegory. Now, let's examine whether there are any alchemical components to Jesus. Well, let's just cover the most obvious ones. John chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. Jesus turning water into wine, an example of transmutation. Transmutation of water, a lower substance, into wine, a higher substance, symbolizes spiritual transmutation. The act of turning a lesser substance into a more valuable one is a key principle in alchemy. Multiplying loaves and fish. Matthew chapter 14, verses 13 through 21. Mark chapter 6, verses 30 through 44. Luke chapter 9, 10 through 17. John chapter 6, 1 through 15. The feeding of 5,000 is also known as the miracle of the five loaves and two fish. The Gospel of John reports that Jesus used five loaves and two fish supplied by a boy to feed a multitude. Now the argument is that the miracle is that they all shared it and they were cured of hunger. But that doesn't add up. Was he handing out crumbs? You realistically could not cut it up for that many people. Quote, and he commanded the multitude to sit down on the grass, and he took the five loaves and the two fishes, and looking up to the heavens, he blessed and brake, and gave the loaves to his disciples, and the disciples to the multitude. Five plus two is seven. This may be another alchemical process. Quote, and they did all eat, and were filled, and they took up the fragments that remained, twelve baskets full. There are many different interpretations but it seems clear the miracle of multiplying loaves and fish can be seen as an allegory for the alchemical process of multiplication, where a small quantity of substance is increased in quantity and quality. Walking on water, Matthew chapter 14 verses 22 to 33, Mark chapter 6 verses 45 through 52, John chapter 6 16 through 21. The act of walking on water is symbolic of the mastery over the elements, which is a central theme in alchemy. Healing the sick, multiple instances throughout the Gospels. The ability to heal others is a common theme in alchemy, as alchemists sought to discover the elixir of life, a substance that could cure all diseases and grant immortality, as with Paracelsus. Many of these alchemists were also great healers and the foundation of modern medicine. Resurrection, Matthew chapter 28, 1 through 10, Mark chapter 16, 1 through 8, Luke chapter 24, 1 through 12, John chapter 20, 1 through 18. The resurrection of Jesus is a powerful symbol of transformation and rebirth. The ability to rise again from the dead and eternal life are the core tenets of alchemy. Transfiguration, Matthew chapter 17, 1 through 9, Mark chapter 9, 2 through 8, Luke chapter 9, 28 through 36. The transfiguration of Jesus, where his appearance becomes radiant and divine is symbolic of the alchemical process of purification in the attainment of the Philosopher's Stone, which grants spiritual enlightenment and transformation. The Last Supper, 
the sharing of bread and wine during the Last Supper can be seen as an alchemical process, where the body and blood of Jesus are transformed into spiritual substances for his followers. Wait, let's dive a little bit deeper into that. Alchemy is all about transformation and transmutation, so when Jesus takes the bread and wine, he's not just giving his disciples a tasty snack, he's actually performing a sort of alchemical ritual. He's taking these everyday items and imbuing them with his own divine essence, which is then passed on to his followers as they partake in the meal. Let's take a look at some parables. Parable of the Mustard Seed In this parable, Jesus compares the kingdom of heaven to a mustard seed, which starts out the smallest of seeds but grows into a large tree where birds can find shelter. Parable of the Leaven Jesus compares the kingdom of heaven to leaven, which a woman takes and hides in three measures of flour until the whole batch is leavened. Leaven, or yeast, has alchemical significance as a fermenting agent that causes transformation. Parable of the Sower In the parable of the sower, Jesus tells a story about a farmer who sows seeds on different types of soil, some of which are more receptive to growth than others. This parable can be interpreted through an alchemical lens by considering the seeds as representing the divine spark or spiritual essence, while the various types of soil represents the different levels of receptivity and preparedness in the human soul. It's also called the parable of the four soils, connecting this back to alchemy and the four elementals. Parable of the wheat and the tares. In this parable, Jesus speaks of a man who sows good seed in his field, but an enemy comes and sows weeds, tares, among the wheat. The man decides to let both grow together until the harvest when the wheat and tares will be separated. This parable can be interpreted alchemically as a metaphor for the process of purification and separation in alchemy, where the wheat represents the pure, spiritual essence, and the tares represent the impurities that must be separated and discarded in order to achieve spiritual transformation. The Parable of the Pearl of Great Price In this parable, Jesus describes the kingdom of heaven as a merchant seeking fine pearls, who upon finding a pearl of great value, sells all he has to buy it. This pearl can represent the philosopher's stone, or the ultimate spiritual wisdom, which is worth sacrificing everything to attain. Now let's cover false time and Jesus. One of the key authors on alternative histories and chronologies is Anatoly Fomenko, the Russian mathematician and scholar known for his work in History, Fiction or Science, a series where he presents a new chronology. I believe it ties in here intimately with Jesus. Fomenko points out the lack of reliable primary sources for events dated before the 9th century. There's a vast gap in the record from the time of Rome all the way to the 12th century. Really, when we see many Arabic texts being translated into Latin. Essentially, Fomenko shows how historical documents have been tampered and or edited by later historians, making it even more difficult to ascertain their true content and chronology. But one thing that's interesting is how he discusses that Jesus Christ was actually born in 1053 and was crucified in 1086. This is fascinating to consider because it adds an entire different perspective to the Templar connection as they come into formation in only 32 or 33 years later. His evidence for this is the Shroud of Turin, you know, the artifact that the Templars were attempting to steal and possess. Well, in this case, they are the descendants, so perhaps they're the ones who already had it, or they took it from the Holy Land, and some authors suggest it was so that they could worship the head of Jesus. But what is the Shroud of Turin? Essentially, it's a photograph of Jesus. This is a holy relic that was used to wrap Jesus during his burial. This negative image is associated with a popular Catholic devotion to the holy face of Jesus. Now let's not argue the authenticity, but Fomenko points out, quote, These results have proved shocking for many. In September 1988, a report appeared telling of the analysis and the fact that it gave a certain dating of the Shroud's fabric, which turned out a thousand years more recent than the alleged date of Christ's death. Even if the Shroud is dated as a 11th century artifact. The author ceases the discussion of the dating after this and begins to ponder the veracity of Christ's image as seen on the Shroud. One arrives at the following conclusions. 1. Either the Shroud of Turin is a forgery. 2. 
The radiocarbon datings can contain errors of several centuries or even millennia. 3. Or the Shroud of Turin is an original, but dated to the 11th, 13th century AD. If this could be the case, it is natural to ask about the century that Christ's lifetime pertains to. Could it really have been the 12th century? End quote. As you can see, he's even open to the possibility of the radiocarbon dating being incorrect, but this would pose some other questions as well in the dating of other historical artifacts. Essentially, Fomenko lays out a base that the surviving chronicles of our entire history only begins around the 10th century as nothing can be confirmed before that date accurately. So Fomenko throws out this Gallagherian chronology, the typical viewpoint of the rise and fall of civilizations from 5,000 years ago with Mesopotamian cultures and Egypt, the modern historical timeline. However, with starting this hypothesis, a number of phantom duplicates are found on the dates preceding 900 or 1000 AD. Fomenko claims that phantom duplicates have their medieval originals located in the time interval of 900 to 1600 AD. Fomenko, being a mathematician, devised a formula for calculating the dates of these events, by comparing and contrasting four different derived chronicles of their original chronicle. By doing this, he calculates a method of shift or adding of years to calculate approximately 330 to 360 years, as there are certain distortions as he calls them that need to be accounted for in history. It gets even more interesting because Fomenko popularized and made well known the use of J in historical records for dating of manuscripts and art. Jesus, or the X, was declared to stand for the figure 10. The letter I denoted the name Jesus, but was used for 1,000 years. The idea is, did Rome truly exist 2,000 years ago, with technology and architecture that was lost after the fall leading to the Dark Ages? Seems strange that there would be such a gap in the historical record. And considering what we know about secret societies, there's no doubt that we can consider that Scaliger may have played his part in the rule of the new Holy Roman Church, a way to extend their rule and power to ancient times. Now we begin the next section, and I do want to say that this video is not here to discredit Jesus. It's not our goal to send disrespect, although this may be considered blasphemous. I will handle the subject to the best of my ability with an open mind, not attempting to make irrational claims, and truly just explore the idea from a research perspective as there are some serious connections to be made. So, is Jesus Christ a homunculus? Is it such a crazy thought? Let's just think about this for a moment. He is birthed of a virgin, so he was born without the use of sex. It's obvious that this was some type of miraculous birth. Well, there are people who have spoken about this very topic, not only in the modern day, but there are actual historical figures who discuss this although cryptically. This goes back to the early 15th century with Alonso Tostado, who was a Spanish theologian counselor of John II of Castile, and briefly, Bishop of Avila. His epitaph stated, Wonder of Earth, all men can know he scanned. A leading scholar of his generation, he's particularly known as an early theorist on witchcraft. Tostado proposed that Mary was a sealed vessel, although this is not the same as a traditional homunculus. It's very close because Mary had the menstrual blood and the womb. Dostado argued that Mary would not have enough blood for the full development of Jesus in the womb, therefore, he would have been condensed into a miniature version of a baby. Therefore, they were attempting to explain the creation of Jesus as a homunculus, or in this case, a miniature human kept in a sealed vessel from the moment of creation, through the same ideology that we witnessed with Liber Vacai. Dostado also discussed the potential consequences of creating homunculi, stating that allowing a homunculus to grow into a fully developed human could be seen as tempting God and would reduce the term mother to the status of a flask. Additionally, this concept would go against the views of the church, particularly the idea of salvation, where God died for everyone's sins, excluding spontaneously created life forms resulting from experiments like homunculus. This idea is reflected in the Arnaldian homunculus legend, where Arnold of Villanova would kill his alchemical homunculi before God might infuse a rational soul into the conceived. 
Arnold of Villanova was the ambassador for James II, King of Aragon in Sicily. He was known as the first physician that used alcohol as an antiseptic. This is in the 14th century. The first known mention of Arnaldo Villanova comes from this period, specifically after 1323, as documented in the Biblioteca Comunale in Palermo. Now why was Arnold suddenly the talk of the town? Well, it seems to be tied to a legend put forth by canonist John Andrea in 1346. According to this tale, our man Arnold successfully demonstrated alchemical transmutation to the Roman Curia in 1301. He showed the royal court how to create a homunculus. Now we're going to begin to take a look at medieval and early Christian art to assist us in our analysis. We didn't bring it up, but one thing to consider is that the great artists of history were typically initiated into the secrets as well, or they needed to embed the symbolism in their works. If we examine these paintings, we may find answers that are not to be found in the historical record. There are many curious details to consider. To begin, there are paintings that show the moments of Mary's Annunciation by the angel Gabriel. We'll start with one of the most famous paintings by Leonardo da Vinci, who typically does get tied into this story involving the Jesus bloodline and the Templars. However, if we examine his painting on the Annunciation of Mary, there are some interesting things to consider. Mary has her hand pointed up with a specific hand pose, but her right hand is in that Rosicrucian hand pose that I was speaking about earlier, and it's pointing down. What is she doing here? First, she's reading on a lectern, but it's some sort of chest with ornamental design. This is typically where people won't look in detail, and the Brotherhoods will put some of their symbols here. We see the seashell. We know that that is a sex symbol, but also a symbol for spontaneous generation. Then under, we see the Rosicrucian roses. In the background, we see a quite detailed city that seems to be of Leonardo's time. Yet, are these the type of buildings that they were building in Bethlehem or even Nazareth? Speaking of buildings, there are some paintings by Giotto de Bondone in the Scrovegni Chapel, Padua, that show the Annunciation through symbols where the priest is holding a building that is placed over the womb of Mary, and there are three figures behind the building representing the alchemical stages. There are two Marys, one in the front, which she's dressed in more church attire, and in the center, then there's another Mary in the back, dressed in red. Behind her is the angel Gabriel. From Simone Martini and Lipo Memi, in this painting of the Annunciation from 1333, it's very similar to Leonardo's painting, but this time, there's a vessel with white flowers in front of Mary. And also, this whole reading book thing is strange because it means that she was of a higher class or status. We can see the Holy Spirit is the dove encased in some type of circle of baby cherubim. Interestingly, we can see that there are rulers of the church depicted with portraits that seem to have dark skin. These are said to be the prophets that allude to the mystery of the Incarnation. From the left, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Isaiah, and Daniel. Interestingly, there's something else to consider. They don't really know who this figure on the right is, and they even say the inscription under her feet which identifies her as Judith is incorrect. In Fra Angelico's painting from 1437, and I remember this one from art history class because it was an early form of perspective. And there are things to gather from this as we can see the same rose ornamentation. However, there are previous other works that are far more detailed and colorful that show what these look like in completion. This seems to be the final work and it's mind blowing. In this painting, we see something clear. It's the same painting where they're both leaning over, but there's a beam of light shooting into here this time and it goes up to the right corner where there are hands so this is coming from God. But if we look close, God is actually shooting the Holy Spirit, but this is the middle pillar, another Kabbalistic reference, and the three again. Jesus is being sent into Mary as she is reading another book. Now you may think this is reaching, but it's not a matter whether this is true or artistic interpretation. It's the fact that we see this with such repetition and frequency through different artists. It starts to get really weird. 
There are paintings from the early 1300s showing the same thing. Let's take a look at Pacino de Boneguida and his Tree of Life. 1310, Tempera on panel. It seems blatant that these artists were well aware of the Kabbalistic tradition. There are a theme of Jesus paintings from the medieval ages called the Tree of Life paintings. This Tree of Life gold painting on wood represents a typical Franciscan subject, the genesis of creation and fall, with the cross of Jesus as the Tree of Life symbolizing God's provision for immortality in the Garden of Eden. The center of the painting depicts the crucified Christ, while the devil is depicted in the cave at the base, indicating that Christ's death is the result of Adam and Eve's sin. There's not much information on him or his work, so the mainstream art historians are no help at all. It seems obvious that this is Kabbalistic in nature. It is the roadmap, or the tree of life, connected to the Sephiroths, which are each different spiritual realms. You see this exact same image in alchemy, so there's no doubt that this is what they were discussing. Remember, this is from the 14th century, 1305 to be exact. That's crucial to note because I got some serious questions. Well, for starters, what's that above Jesus' head? The symbol of the bird and her young and the feeding from the womb? This is the homunculus symbol, and we know enough now to fully investigate this matter as we progress. But the key point is, what is this symbol doing in a painting predating the Rosicrucians by over 300 years? Because, officially, the mainstream historians will not accept that they even existed before the manifestos appeared between 1610 and 1615, the exact period when the King James Bible was published. Interestingly, even in the mainstream, the Rosicrucians claim that their ancestry goes back to 1313, and the order composed of 12 exalted beings gathered around a 13th and that these beings advance beyond rebirth, so they're literally telling you. I'll break that down in a moment, but the only argument for why this Rosicrucian symbol is any 1300s painting is simply because this means Christ's sacrifice on the cross, but if that's true, it must be an ancient symbol, and it's kind of gross because this symbol implies something far greater than what's being suggested on the surface. But back to the painting. So this painting is exactly what the Rosicrucians were saying. They said that they were there during the time of Christ, and they claimed their order started in the 1300s. Then we have this painting from 1305 with the Rosicrucian bird. Well, there's more. Because if you ask me, that's not a cave under Jesus. That's an Athenor, or a furnace used in the alchemical process. Also, it seems that this is a Franciscan monk that had his face scratched off, and we know about them and their connection with alchemy. Well, I think the answer is confirmed when we zoom into the Annunciation, Jesus is sitting in the throne in heaven, and then is reborn or sent as a tiny little homunculus through this beam of light into Mary. Look closely, it's an actual body. This predates all the paintings that I've showed you so far, and since there's similarities in the style, we can conclude that the later authors were also aware of this symbolism, as they secretly referenced the same things, becoming more subtle in progression. Baby Jesus is transported via the air through a stream of golden rays. We also see the same figure behind her, robed in black. And this isn't just a one-time scenario thing either, there are many more. And the illumination from Jean Mansell. Okay, this is even stranger. We see the Holy Trinity sitting in heaven. The banner around them says, Let's make man in our image and likeness. Then we see a beam of light shooting a literal physical baby into the bedroom with a sleeping woman. This time, the husband witnesses the miracle, but notice the candle symbolism in the middle. Just like the middle pillar, these artists use composition geometry, and alignment to communicate certain symbols. There's actually a website from over a decade ago that talks about a lot of this stuff. I'll leave it in the reference list. Here is the Annunciation 1380 by an unknown painter. It shows another depiction of the homunculus being sent to Mary. Another interesting piece is Robert Campin, Marode Altarpiece, 1425-1428. This Annunciation is different. Again, Mary is reading her book, but if we zoom out, 
Can you spot the homunculus? Right here. It's being shot in right through the window. But let's take a look at some of the other symbols. First, this is a threefold piece, so there's a painting on the left and right. This is a constant theme in these paintings that depict the church and even royalty being a part of this process. It doesn't matter if it's an artistic interpretation if it's consistent and worthy of note. You can even see the coat of arms on the window. In terms of alchemy, we see the mixing bowl or pot right over Gabriel where the baby's coming through. And in between Gabriel and Mary, above is some white towel and a red decoration, which seems to be a flower decoration with the face of a baby, but it's red. That's quite significant. She's also very close to this fireplace, where there are some interesting ornaments. Van Eyck has some of these same symbols. Now let me show you an Annunciation that does the symbolism in a different way. Roger van der Weyden, The Annunciation 1435, depicts another three-piece painting where we see three red pillows and three white flowers by Gabriel. This one has no baby, but there's a flask behind Gabriel. He did this twice supposedly, and in the second one, you can see that there's a dove being implanted. Sandro Botticelli, The Annunciation 1489, we see Gabriel holding the three white flowers again. This time, the symbol for a seed is the tree. From Petro Perugino, The Annunciation 1489, Gabriel is holding three flowers, usually either lily or violet. God is surrounded by baby angels and is holding a sphere as he sends down the dove to impregnate Mary. This could be seen as the seeding process. In Filippo Lippi's The Annunciation, 1440, we see a much more occult ritualistic setting and we see these seashells as well connecting Mary to Venus and spontaneous generation. Notice the three pillar symbolism and how the dove is being shot into Mary. It's very weird to see these symbols depicted in famous religious art. The next one's even stranger. Carlo Crivelli, the Annunciation with Saint and Matthias, 1486. In this painting, we see a different version. Gabriel is actually speaking with the Pope, or head of the church. But wait, the church wasn't created yet, so why is this constantly referenced as if they're watching over this process? And this time, look at Mary's pose and hands. This is some type of ceremony in a closed room. And notice the dove is being shot into her head. But look at the shell. There's a lit candle and a flask. The ornaments are showing the tree of life growing out of the chalice and also the Pope is trying to use this information or knowledge of Gabriel to create the structures or city in his lap. We see this symbolism by the trapping of the tree within a vessel and controlling its growth within a cage or window. I haven't mentioned, but take note that Gabriel always has a parrot or peacock-like colorful wings. It's an interesting detail. And in this painting, he has a serpent-like headdress. Andrea Mantegna, 1431, has a painting on the Annunciation that actually makes the peacock symbolism blatant. Not only that, but this painting clearly depicts the medieval ages. So as we can see, the early double-headed black phoenix of the Holy Roman Church. But even stranger, the head of the dove in this one is a baby. So it's some type of hybrid creature encased in light. The peacock is deeply associated with alchemy as we'll see, specifically with the creation of the homunculus. Mary is shown praying before a book and an Annunciation from the Black Hours, a very unusual and beautiful book of hours from 1480, colored entirely in black and blue, and the angel is sometimes depicted with a staff that looks to be a priest. Some other interesting paintings are Federico Baracci, Annunciation 1592, and Peter Paul Rubens, Annunciation from 1628. And it just goes on and on, there are many paintings and probably more mysterious ones still to be discovered if we look with new eyes. But let's go back to the Tree of Life paintings for a second, because those paintings from 1300s have interesting alchemical Kabbalistic symbols. There are other Tree of Life paintings showing Jesus on a Kabbalistic cross. The reason we bring it up is because you can see the same symbols of the Rosicrucian Phoenix and her young, which of course they say is a pelican, but break down what that means to feed your young in that manner. Then at the bottom, it seems sometimes it's depicted as a cave, 
but still the symbols of death and rebirth are clear. Why would Jesus be depicted in this way in some of the earliest Christian paintings in our historic record? Obviously some figures within the church notice the Kabbalistic alchemical similarities. Now this is interesting. According to a video from Vox in 2015, they seem to have a talent for alluding to great mysteries. A video called, Why Babies in Medieval Paintings Look Like Ugly Old Men. It's really weird because they basically say the secret in the video, but never fully connect it any further. The idea is that these medieval depictions of babies were drawn ugly on purpose. They had mastered perspective, lighting, and shading. There's no reason to draw babies in this fashion. But supposedly, the reason is that these babies were homunculi. So wait, medieval artists were intentionally painting homunculus and associating it with the child version of Jesus? The homunculus, or little man from Latin, heavily influenced depictions of infants, especially in religious artwork. This concept, deeply rooted in religious and philosophical thought of the time, suggested that Jesus, as the Son of God, was born in a perfected and unchanging adult form. They say that this belief resulted in a unique artistic convention where infants, particularly the baby Jesus, were depicted as miniature adults, sometimes with an uncanny resemblance to middle-aged men. Perhaps it's not an artistic convention, but more so a secret reference to a hidden science. It's shocking to me that this is commonly accepted, yet what are the implications if this is true? Vox seems to agree that it's not an error, they did it intentionally, that these babies in medieval art and in religious paintings are depicting homunculi. We can confirm that there are indeed complex symbols at play by examining another peculiar theme in medieval art. When viewed in isolation, this theme may appear as simply artistic liberty, but when placed within its appropriate context, it paints a different picture. I noticed when I was looking through some of the Fra Angelico paintings that Jesus was depicted with an opening near his robe. He was also green, but we'll touch on that another time. At first I thought of Adam and the story of Eve coming from his rib, but this was definitely Jesus and the mark is canonically from the spear that Longinus thrust into his chest. The blood from Jesus was said to have fallen into his eyes, healing him from his blindness. So I kept looking and found some more artworks with this wound. But instead of a wound, I found many artworks depicting this as a womb, and I think everyone has at one point thought that those words are awfully close together. One such example is the fresco in the Church of San Francisco in Arezzo, Italy, which depicts Jesus with a bloody opening on his side near his rib. Now, the placement of this opening on Jesus' rib, rather than in the genital region, is quite strange and sets it apart from typical representations of hermaphroditic figures. So, let's delve deeper into the symbolic nature of this very specific detail. According to some interpretations, Jesus giving birth through his rib could be a reference to the biblical story of Eve being created from Adam's rib. However, the idea of Jesus giving birth to full-grown people as depicted in some artworks, would certainly result in a deformed figure, the rib cage being an inadequate space for a fully grown human to gestate. So let's consider some more symbolic explanations for this vagina. One possibility is that it represents the concept of Jesus' blood being the source of new life or a son. In this scenario, the son could be more of a genetic duplicate or perhaps even a spiritual successor of Jesus, created by the alchemists of the time. The idea of Jesus' blood being used to create a son, or maybe a more familiar word would be a clone, ties in with this theme of resurrection and rebirth found in alchemy and Christian theology. The blood of Christ is often seen as a symbol of eternal life and redemption, and the concept of the homunculus, an artificially created human being, is within the same realm. The concepts are one and the same. So let's discuss Mary and secret orders, because a common point brought up by modern day Christians, who typically prescribe to Protestantism, they typically see Catholicism in a negative light. They bring up the Holy Roman Empire's obvious fascination with Mary, and I don't think we need to get too deep into that. You have to consider, why was the Virgin Mary just randomly chosen by God? Was she royalty? Was she special in any way? 
Another proof for the Rosicrucians being found 300 years prior to the beginning of the 17th century is the illustrious Brotherhood of Our Blessed Lady. It was a religious confraternity founded in 1318 in Sertogenbos to promote the veneration of the Mother of God. The Brotherhood was organized around a carved wooden image of the Virgin Mary. They are also known as the Brotherhood of the Swan. The reason I bring this up will be relevant for a future section. One of the most prominent members was Hieronymus Bosch, and take note of that for later. What we can point out is the use of magic in Catholicism through imagery and idolization of Mary. It's almost as if the Holy Roman Empire worships Mary, or the act of creation of Jesus, and not Jesus himself. Many modern Christians, or King James Bible advocates, claim that Christianity is separate and different from the Catholic tradition. While Catholicism is known for its use of holy relics, believing that saints and their remains have supernatural powers, there is also the worship of the Black Madonna, which is prevalent throughout Templar and Catholic churches in Europe. Some argue that this was just orthodox propaganda, painting the skin black. However, this can be seen in Catholic traditions and festivals. France seems to have a higher number of these black virgins, and it has been suggested that this is connected to secret societies and secret cult worship. The skull ritual involves the skull of Mary Magdalene, which is already very strange in a cult. Then there's the contraption that it's held in, which makes it seem like it's some sort of device or technology. This could be a method for keeping her spirit contained or connected with the earthly realm, which would allow her to be a guiding figure for those who seek her wisdom and guidance. Why else would you keep someone's skull as a holy relic and perform massive ceremonies with it? According to the Catholic Church, Mary is the mother of God, also the mother of the Church. This veneration of the Virgin Mary could be seen as some form of out-in-the-open goddess worship originating from ancient pagan practices. Now, I'm neither a Protestant or Catholic, but it could be argued by Protestants that some of this veneration comes off a little bit like idol worship, and that kind of distracts from the Trinity. Certain devotions to the Virgin Mary, such as the Rosary or the Litany of Laredo, might be perceived as forms of worship to some Protestants. It's a medieval practice that combines repetitive prayer and reflection on specific events or mysteries in the lives of Jesus Christ and the Virgin Mary. This rosary is considered a powerful form of intercessory prayer, where it's believed that praying the rosary invokes the Virgin Mary to where you can interact with her. Each bead represents a decade, and it is a mystery of the Virgin Mary. You're supposed to recite Hail Mary ten times while reflecting the specific mystery. Watching someone explain this is pretty interesting, especially if they're not interested in the occult at all. I don't really get the whole need to meditate on her mysteries. What are the mysteries? So there are secrets to be discovered. The mysteries involved four different categories and revolve around the entire story of Jesus Christ. But perhaps it's deeper, as many different cults and societies have been formed on this lady and we haven't even mentioned the amount of images and sculptures that have been dedicated to her all of which are forms of idol worship. The typical answer from Catholics is that they don't pray to Mary, but they venerate her for dedicating her whole life to the Son of God. And many Catholics may not worship Mary or pray to her, but that's not the point we're making. We're discussing that this is a form of ideological perspective of the church. The cults that idolize them do show signs of worshiping her as some sort of Babylonian goddess. Well. Did you ever think it was weird that you have Mary the Virgin, okay, but then you also have Mary Magdalene, which is typically presented as the wife of Jesus and a prostitute? Was her significance downplayed, or is there a deeper occult meaning at play? She was there to witness Christ's crucifixion, and we mentioned her earlier because she's connected with Joseph of Arimathea, who buried Jesus and traveled with Mary according to medieval texts to Gaul. In the Gospel of Philip's text, she is described as Jesus' companion, as the disciple Jesus loved the most and the one Jesus kissed on the mouth, which has led some people to conclude that she and Jesus were in a relationship. But there's much more to this story. Well, what if the Virgin Mary and Mary Magdalene are actually the same person? That may sound strange, but bear with me for one moment. First. We can just mention the issues of Mary and how they actually have mistaken her identity in history. The traditional image of Mary Magdalene as a repentant sinner 
is different from her portrayal in the Gospels. This discrepancy might stem from confusion with other biblical figures, specifically an unnamed sinful woman in Luke chapter 7, 36-50, and Mary of Bethany, sister of Martha and Lazarus. Mary Magdalene is mentioned in the Gospels as one of several Galilean women who followed Jesus and supported him and his disciples. She is described as having been liberated from seven demons, being present at Jesus' crucifixion, witnessing his burial, and being the first to witness his resurrection. Jesus also commissions her to tell the other disciples about resurrection. The confusion with the unnamed sinful woman in Luke chapter 7 could be due to the story's placement in the narrative. Immediately before the listing of Jesus' women's disciple in Luke chapter 8, Pope Gregory the Great declared in 591 that Luke's sinner, Mary of Bethany, and Mary Magdalene were the same person, which may have contributed to the development of the composite figure. However, the Gospels never identified Mary Magdalene as the woman who anointed Jesus' feet. Early Christians believed Mary Magdalene and Mary of Bethany were the same person, further contributing to the confusion. In the context of Gnosticism, Mary Magdalene is depicted as a prominent figure in several texts, such as the Gospel of Mary, Gospel of Philip, and Pista Sophia. These documents portray her as an enlightened disciple who grasped Jesus' teachings better than the male disciples and was especially loved by him. The Gospel of Mary is interesting because it reveals that Mary was almost a counterpart to Jesus in a way. It's dated to the 2nd century and has an alternative view on Christianity, focusing more on inner spiritual knowledge rather than suffering and death as the path to eternal life. Jesus tried to explain to his disciples post-resurrection that true sin arises from a lack of recognition of one's spiritual nature, that one must overcome the entrapments of the material world advising against false leaders. The disciples were confused, so Mary Magdalene comforts them and shares additional teachings she received from Jesus in a vision. This teaching explains the nature of prophecy and the soul's journey to its final rest, as well as how to combat the wicked powers that try to keep the soul trapped in the world. They actually start questioning her and are like, wait, why did Jesus give you, a woman, such advanced teachings and why do you understand them so well? Well, this gets into some interesting material, and it's fine if you're questionable about the legitimacy of these Gnostic scrolls found in the mid-1900s. However, there are scholars who have wrote on these subjects, and there's much more to cover outside of that. Now, in order to understand this next connection, we need to apply what we've learned in the context that alchemy seems to have emerged from the intellectual and spiritual climate of Alexandria during the first couple centuries of the New Era. This explains why all the early Arabic alchemists claim that they literally got their knowledge from Plato or Aristotle, and even in the Secrets of Secrets, as we've covered, the text is referenced by many different alchemical authors, and it says that Aristotle composed his book for the education of King Alexander. So there's a direct connection between the emergence of medieval alchemy and Ophite Gnosticism, or the ancient cults that practiced the secret wisdom before the Arabic scholars and the European alchemist. So if we now consider that Mary Magdalene was essentially a super apostle and is described as Jesus' most loyal follower and is even believed to be the wife of Jesus, is there any other significance to this figure? In order to explore this further, there were some even older alchemical references that were left out at the beginning so that we could discuss them now in the specific context. There's actually a mystery woman alchemist that is a historical figure that we never went over, and there are several references to her from multiple sources. One of the earliest of all alchemical manuscripts is the fragmentary Isis the Prophetess to her son Horus, discovered in the Codex Marcianus, a medieval collection of Greek texts. The information comes from Zosimos of Panopolis. We already covered him, but to recap, he was a Greco-Egyptian alchemist and Gnostic mystic who lived at the end of the 3rd and beginning of the 4th century. Carl Jung covered his work extensively and even considered his work the first reference to the homunculus in alchemical literature. Well, as we were saying, the earliest historical reference to alchemy claims that it originates from another source, and in this case, within Codex Marcianus. 
quote, Isis the prophetess speaks to her son Horus about his decision to battle Typhon for his father's throne. She shares his experience in Hermopolis, where she encountered an angel who desired her but couldn't answer her questions about the preparation of gold and silver. The angel informed her that a greater angel, Omniel, would come the next day with the knowledge she sought. Omniel appeared as promised, also desiring Isis, but she refused to yield until he revealed the mystery she sought. Omniel swore multiple oaths and instructed her to only share the knowledge with her beloved and legitimate son. Isis learned that in nature, like produces like. Wheat creates wheat. A man begets a man. And gold harvests gold. She emphasized staying with existing nature and working with the materials at hand. The adepts with divine assistance understood the mystery and realized they should work with metallic minerals without using other substances. We can now consider the Black Madonna and Sophia references, as we could be discussing a mother goddess of sorts. We discussed this thoroughly in the ancient cloning video. In mainstream history, Ephesus is also the believed site of Mary Magdalene's burial. This connects with Artemis of Diana, the Whore of Babylon, Astarte, is Mary of Magdalene and Mary the Virgin, but symbols representing the primordial female goddess, and we can even say a feminine androgynous god, as it's nurturing and generative in nature. Black Madonnas of the Virgin have specifically been tied to the occult, pagan worship, and even alchemy. The Black Madonna is seen as the alchemical prima materia. Just like God worked from a starting material, there was a void or some type of feminine material to form or start with, you could call it chaos, but the alchemists considered it to be an actual substance or process of nature. This is also the story of Sophia and the birth of the Archons. She was raped or overcome by a self-willed lion that gave birth to Yaldabaoth and the planets. Similarly, the Black Madonna, or the Virgin Mary, is the Prima Materia, the menstrual blood if you will, in which you can create the homunculus. In various paintings and icons, we often find Mary Magdalene holding a red egg. Why is this even associated with her? It's still alive in the Orthodox tradition, they hand out red Easter eggs. Today, while the mainstream interpretation by the Catholic and Christian churches connects the red egg to Easter and the resurrection of Christ, further investigation into esoteric and alchemical perspectives unveils a deeper meaning behind this powerful symbol. To understand the origins of the red egg symbolism, we must delve into the story of Mary Magdalene's proclamation of Christ's resurrection to Emperor Tiberius. According to the tradition, Mary Magdalene, a wealthy woman, denounced Pontius Pilate's conduct during Christ's trial before the emperor. As she spoke of Christ and his resurrection, she held out an egg, exclaiming, Christ is risen. Emperor Tiberius, unimpressed, state that there was as much chance of a human being returning to life from the dead as there was of the egg in her hand turning red. Miraculously, the egg turned red, serving as a testament to the truth of Christ's resurrection. This event has been immortalized in various artistic depictions, with Mary Magdalene often shown holding a red egg. The egg has long held symbolic meaning across various cultures and religions. In Christianity, it represents creation, spring, and rebirth. With the resurrection of Christ, the egg gained a deeper symbolism as the sealed tomb of Christ was likened to an uncracked egg. St. Augustine described Christ's resurrection as a chick bursting from an egg, reinforcing this symbolism. Although the sharing of Easter eggs has its origins in Mary Magdalene's proclamation and the miracle of the red egg, it's essential to recognize that Easter, as a celebration of Christ's resurrection, has roots in pagan holidays. Easter is closely linked to the spring equinox, a time of renewal and rebirth. So it seems that Mary Magdalene essentially created the Easter egg, which connects her with other fertility goddesses. It seems safe to assume that the red egg, a symbol of alchemy representing creation and rebirth, is a metaphor for the alchemical process. Eggs are referenced by alchemists and here's an engraving that shows the alchemical egg by Basil Valentine called Azoth. So when Mary Magdalene holds the egg initially, Christ is the white stone. This is the birth of the alchemical child king. 
this white stone then becomes the philosopher's stone, so the white egg becomes the red egg, meaning the consolidation of Aether or Spiritus Mundi, the originator of all things, called Azoth, which is another reference to this primordial black substance. This connects Mary the Virgin and Mary Magdalene into one figure, as she represents the alchemical process and creation. Just as Mary the Virgin gave birth to Jesus, Mary Magdalene assisted in the rebirth of Jesus. This is even further confirmed when we investigate another mystery, but fits perfectly into this context. In his writings, Zosimos refers to a few women who were influential to the field of alchemy. One of the most notable is Maria the Jewess, or Mary the Jewess, also known as Maria Prophetessima, who is considered to be one of the founding figures of alchemy. Zosimos mentions her in his work with great praise as one of the founders of alchemy in that she lived no later than the first century. She's credited with the invention of several kinds of chemical apparatus and is considered to be the first true alchemist of the Western world. This is a fascinating historical reference as she's mentioned by Zosimos and other Greek alchemical writers. So through Zosimos, scholars have been able to learn a lot about Mary the Jewess and apparently her descriptions on alchemy and metal all allude to terms such as bodies, souls, and spirits. Mary believed that metals had two different genders, and by joining these two genders together, a new entity could be made. By joining the different gendered substances together, a unity could be created. George Sincellus, a Byzantine chronicler of the 8th century, presented Mary as a teacher of Democritus, whom she had met in Memphis, Egypt during the time of Pericles. The 10th century Kitab al-Farist of Ibn al-Nadim cited Mary as one of the 52 most famous alchemists and stated that she was able to prepare caput mortem, a purple pigment. An early medieval alchemical text ascribed to an otherwise unknown Morenius Romanus called her Mary the Prophetess, and the Arabs knew her as the Daughter of Plato, a name which in Western alchemical text was reserved for white sulfur. So there are countless Arabic and Latin works that have yet to be fully translated into English that mention her. This isn't just some made up figure and if that was your argument then that would bring into question a large portion of other authors as well. Another aspect to this is that she's credited as the inventor of the glass apparatus used in alchemy but they have a couple different variations of these. Specifically the Bain Marie, the double boiler. She is responsible for the entire laboratory of the alchemist. The initial base concept where water in the central vessel is kept at a constant temperature through being submerged in another container of boiling water. Also called the Bonium Marii, interestingly, there's a religious significance as it means gentleness from heat, but it also references Jesus being the source of spiritual head and being nourished by water. Mary. From the Jewish Encyclopedia, quote, of a far less legendary character than all these seems to have been Maria Hebrea, who according to Hoffer, made one of the most important discoveries in chemistry, for she is said to have discovered hydrochloric acid. Her name survives in the Bonium Marii, the Bain Marie, a water bath extensively used in chemical processes in which gentle heat is necessary." End quote. Mangat, in his Bibliotheca Chemica Curiosa, Geneva 1702, publishes the symbol of Maria Hebrea Moses Sorer. She is thus identified with Miriam, the sister of Moses. On the other hand, Austenes, one of the oldest Greek writers, mentions her as the daughter of the king of Saba. In the Alexander book, second part of the Persian poet Nizami, Maria, a Syrian princess, visits the court of Alexander the Great and learns from Aristotle, among other things the art of making gold. Whatever the epoch of Maria may have been, her existence is a positive fact, and since she was mentioned by Austenes, she belongs thus to the first period." End quote. She is also known as Mary the Prophetess, which connects her to that earlier work from Zosimos and the Mary-Isis connection. So it would seem that this Mary the Jewess, or Mary the Prophetess, is acknowledged as the mother of alchemy, but this is not as well known as Paracelsus or other alchemists. Mary Magdalene is another form and manifestation of the original harlot goddesses, Aphrodite, Inanna, 
Hathor, and Isis. There's also the Golden Legend written by Jacobus de Vardagene in the 13th century. It's a compilation of hagiographies or stories of the lives of the saints. In this collection, Mary Magdalene is portrayed as a composite figure, combining various biblical characters and legends that had developed over time. The Golden Legend recounts that Mary Magdalene, along with other followers of Jesus, arrived put on a boat without sails or oars by the Jews and cast out to the sea. Miraculously, they arrived safely in France. Quote, Mary Magdalene had her surname of Magdalo, a castle, and was born of the right of noble lineage and parents, which were descended of the lineage of kings. End quote. So we do have some context. We just have to look at the earliest text on her, and what we find is that she was of noble ancestry, rich, depicted as a saint, holding a chalice and red eggs. There's definitely something strange going on. The medieval text known as the Golden Legend says that after Christ's ascension, she could no longer look at any other man and live naked, and she went into the desert where she stayed alone for 30 years, similar to Christ. She seems to have been blessed as she didn't starve or require water. She was then transferred to a cave where she lived naked until a priest found her and gave her sacrament. Also, there's some strangeness in the Bible verses involving the crucifixion and many different Marys. It's just the multitude and variety in which they repeat this is very strange as if it was a symbol. In Matthew 27, And many women were there at the crucifixion, beholding afar off, which followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering unto him, among which was Mary Magdalene, and Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's children. And there, at entombment, was Mary Magdalene, and the other Mary, sitting over against the sepulchre. John 19 Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother, and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. So wait, there were three Marys according to John at the cross. So are we to simply assume that that is because of the popular use of the name? Or are we to use our new lens to consider the hidden connection? But what if there's a secret significance? Images of the three Marys, in Spanish, Tres Marias, associated with the tomb are carried in Good Friday processions referred to by the word penitencia, Spanish or penata. Filipino for an act performed in fulfillment of a vow. They carry attributes or iconic accessories, chiefly enumerated as follows. Mary Cleopas, sometimes alternated with Mary Jacob, holding a broom. Mary Salome, holding a thurible or censer. Mary Magdalene, sometimes alternated with Mary of Bethany, holding an alabaster chalice or jar. According to a legend propounded by Hemo of Ursaid in the mid 9th century, but rejected by the Council of Trent, St. Anne had by different husbands three daughters, all of whom bore the name Mary and who were referred to as the Three Marys. However, if we consider all that's been said, it could be argued that Mary the Prophetess of Egypt and Mary Magdalene are the exact same person. They were both wealthy, independent women Mary Magdalene is depicted as higher class in all her paintings. Did Mary Magdalene ever go to Egypt? This is just a crazy topic because there's so many tie-ins and no, it's not simple to conclude that this is merely because Mary was used many times for naming females. There's definitely more to it than just that. We now have a fourth Mary to investigate. This is the Mary of Egypt. It's a completely separate historical figure this is not Mary the Virgin or Mary Magdalene, and it's not Mary the Jewess or the Alchemist. No, this is a separate Mary from all the other three, from the same time period. This is an Egyptian saint, highly venerated in Eastern Orthodox churches and Catholic churches commemorate her as a saint. In this story, Mary of Egypt is born somewhere in the province of Egypt, and at the age 12, ran away from her parents to live an extremely desolate life. In her Vita, it states that she often refused the money offered for her sexual favors as she was driven, quote, by an insatiable and irrepressible passion, end quote. Wait, so there's another independent harlot figure, and it even gets stranger. Quote, 
She undertook the journey as a sort of anti-pilgrimage, stating that she hoped to find in the pilgrim crowds at Jerusalem even more partners to sate her lust. She paid for her passage by offering sexual favors to other pilgrims, and she briefly continued her habitual lifestyle in Jerusalem." End quote. So somehow this all changed when she was kept outside the church by an invisible barrier and saw this as a sign that she was impure, so it made her really upset. Then, after seeing the image of the Virgin Mary, it made her pray for forgiveness and she would give up the entire world. She then, from doing sexual favors with a passion who could not control her lust, now all of a sudden is a master monk living in solitude. She then becomes a hermit and lives the rest of her life in the wilderness. But there's one detail that ties it all together. Remember the story from the Golden Legend? Well, now let's compare the end of Mary of Egypt. We see that this Mary of Egypt has the exact same story as the early legends of Mary of Magdalene from the medieval legends. But there's one interesting detail. At the end of Mary of Egypt, according to Mary of Egypt's story, one year before her death, she recounts her entire life to a saint or priest who she encountered in the desert. This priest is no other than Zosimas of Palestine. Now this isn't Zosimos of Panopolis, it's Zosimas of Palestine. Literally just one letter difference, but what are the chances of the similarity? Zosimas, who was a Palestinian saint and really only known for his encounter with Mary of Egypt, other than that, he really has no contributions. He's just referenced in the story. Even on the wiki page for Zosimas of Palestine, it says, quote, the story shares many similarities with the one recorded in the Western Church as a story of Mary Magdalene, with Zosimas renamed as Maximin as recounted in the Golden Legend and elsewhere. The fresco illustrated by Giotto in his workshop in Assisi shows this version. End quote. So even scholars see the connection, but they refuse to investigate it further. These are all the same figure. Mary Magdalene, Mary the Virgin, Mary the Jewess and Mary of Egypt is Mary Mage de Lin, or Mary the Alchemist. This is also interesting when you consider the Amazon women and how they are claimed to being population receders. That they were a race of androgynous beings that were feminine in nature and they were superior and advanced as they had balanced both aspects of mind and brain. These goddesses or queen bees would then generate entire civilizations through repopulation. So if Mary of Egypt left for Alexandria, then we have our direct connection to Mary of Magdalene being Mary the Jewess, as Alexandria is where Gnosticism infused with Greek and Roman mysteries developing into the beginning of alchemy. So we covered the three Marys, now we can connect that to the three wise men. Let's simplify it. We know that there were three Marys at the cross, and in Orthodox tradition, they are called the myrrh bearers. So they also brought myrrh, but the difference is these three Marys, or you could say wise witches, wise queens, were present during Jesus' death. Okay, so now the three wise kings, who remember, brought gold, frankincense, and myrrh. But who were these wise kings? The three mages, yes, they were mages, and what were they doing? They claimed to essentially worship, or if you prefer, venerate the Virgin Mary. So, the wisest of mages. These three wise men were the scientists and alchemists of the time. They decided to what? Follow a star, the star of Bethlehem, so that they could witness the birth of a prophesied messiah. So they knew the future, came to witness this birth under the star of Bethlehem, or perhaps it would be more clear to say the star of Astarte. That would make more sense that these three mage alchemists were coming to witness a master alchemist perform the creation of a homunculus. Let's explore to see if this holds water. The Renaissance artists were tasked with creating images and spiritual physical manifestations of the word of God. Early Christian paintings are crucial in understanding what these scenes were like if they truly existed. So examining art is history. It's just a different medium. We're not looking at the text. We're using images. And for this, one must know the language of symbols. In the right context, interpretation becomes an art of understanding what the original artist was trying to portray. 
and all we're trying to discover is, did the artist who participated in the paintings of the Adoration of the Magi have the secret knowledge of Plato and the Alchemist? Let's see what we can find. We'll start off with the most notable examples in linear order. Giotto de Bondone, Adoration of the Magi, 1304. And also, with some of these early paintings, you'll begin to notice this trend that some of these artists are attributed to two different versions of the scene. There are many paintings, and it seems to be attributed to him. This is one of the earliest and most famous paintings on it from 1305. We see two camels, two pages, the three wise magi with one kissing the feet of the newborn. We see three people behind the virgin. One is secretly hidden behind her, and there's no mention of who it is. Then on the left, it's Saint Joseph, and on the right, the archangel. However, at the top, that's not the star of Bethlehem. This is classified by art historians as Halley's Comet. That's pretty strange. So a comet appeared? Well, remember earlier with the Annunciation paintings, this is all going to come together now. There's another painting, and it seems attributed to Giotto from 1311. This one's similar, but this time, the secret lady behind the Virgin Mary is an open door or a room. This time we have three camels and two extra men with white caps on. The third one from Giotto, the Agnesanti Madonna altarpiece, is said to be around the same time, 1310, but this one also has duplicates of itself, so it's kind of bizarre. The first one has two angels in the front holding vases that look like flasks with red and white flowers in them. Mary is sitting on a throne, and the Christ child has some sort of star gesture about his head. Interestingly, if we look at one of the three kings in the background, one is looking through the mirror, and there is this really unnecessary detail. His robe is showing through the window in such a way to show a square and compass. You'll see this multiple times, and we can confirm that the other side does not have this. So these characters that hide in the background, and even geometry and proportions that were used to indicate secret symbols were being used. Not only that, but to point the eye in certain directions. Now a fourth one from Giotto in 1320. This adoration is unusual, completely different from the other two. The oldest mage is kneeling, taking the Christ child out of what seems to be a container or chest. Now, there are some strange things to point out. The camels are gone, and now we're introduced with some animals. In the front, by the crown of the kneeling king, we see three animals, two black or dark goats, and a lamb. Behind the Christ child, we see a cow and a donkey. It may not be fully clear that this is a donkey or a mule, but it will be soon. The Virgin Mary looks a little bit sad here, and above her, we see the same supposed comet. But this time, it looks sperm-like in nature. We also see to the far left a man in a robe similar to the physicians of the Dark Ages, holding what seems to be an Alembic and a dog on a leash. His partner behind him seems to be having some type of conversation with the angel, as if he is collecting something that the angel is dropping. Let's keep in mind, that the sperm comet star is facing the physician and the Olympic looking device is pointing to Mary, who is then looking at Joseph holding the king's gift. Joseph is looking at the Christ child holding a vessel or a small container. There may be many more, but the last one that we'll look at from Giotto is from the Stefaneski triptych. This shows the life of Christ, but notice the three symbolism. We have the bottom scene, the birth, top left scene is the hanging man, which is very strange that they would show Christ inverted like this. Then, on top of that, you have an Ethiopian pyramid and a Tartarian tent in the background. But take note of this character style. You can even see the three Marys. Then, the top right, we see a woman tossing the Lamb of God to the angels in the burial scene. This is showing a rebirth process in three stages. The middle is simple, the great work, as he's posed as Baphomet. You can see the triangle, three points, and or square and compass throughout this entire piece. But this is from the 1300s. This looks remarkably close even to older paintings. Giotto de Bondone significantly influenced European painting by introducing techniques like shading, three-dimensional form, and early perspective, which later became hallmarks of the Italian Renaissance. His innovative approach to art transformed the way artists create their works in Europe. However, an intriguing question arises when comparing the Adoration of the Magi in the context of ancient Rome 
to Giotto's work. There are numerous early frescoes and mosaics from around the 5th century, some even earlier, that depict the same scene. These ancient art pieces seem to be about a thousand years before Giotto, yet they exhibit similar techniques. So why do these earlier depictions of the Adoration of the Magi and Giotto's later work share these artistic techniques despite the significant gap in time? The Priscilla Catacombs in Rome, home to a 4th century fresco, arguably is the first scene with the Madonna and Christ Child. But there are some interesting variations and the entire place needs to be dissected for a second. This is pretty mind-blowing. Now let's remember the context here. We're implying that these early frescoes, mosaics, are not from the time period that they tell us. Let's see if we notice any similarities or alchemical symbols here. We see the four black birds on each corner. Then we see the peacock as well. Madonna with child and prophet who points the star. Maybe Balaam or Isaiah or the third or fourth decade of the third century, which is the oldest depiction of this kind. The Magi are here as well on this arch. And you can see this painting of the Last Supper, but it's all women this time. Why are these paintings down here? Seems quite strange. But you'll start to notice that with these frescoes, much of them seem to have been done in a rush and without really trying that hard. So they don't really explain this one, but in the right context, could this veiled woman possibly be Mary the prophetess? To the right, there's three Jewish boys in the furnace in Babylon. Interesting that these stories are all brought here into one context. About the young boys who, remember, didn't die because of their faith. Well, perhaps it's not that they didn't die, but they were revived. That's why there's a phoenix above them. In the center is the good shepherd. On his shoulder seems to be a goat. On the opposite side to the veiled woman is Jonah rejected by the hybrid sea monster. Hmm, where have we seen this before? Well, this may come to play later. In the catacombs of Mark and Marcellinus brings the adoration of the Magi to life. This one is one of the oldest ones, and there are a few different versions, including the three youths. The three youths who refused to worship an idol in the Persian court. They were thrown into the fiery furnace and they were saved only by invoking the name of the Israelite God. However, they do look feminine. Then we have the three Magi who look identical with the robe and Phrygian caps. The description says that when they saw the babe, they renounced their pagan ways. So these Magi were pagans. But the main painting to look at is at the Basilica of Santa Polinare Nuovo in Ravenna, Italy, showcasing a 6th century mosaic that immortalizes the Magi. Three wise men, or magi, wearing these strange trousers. We saw these trousers earlier in the alchemical section. These trousers are the trousers of secret orders. One key thing to note is that these early frescoes are more ritualistic. This can be connected to Mithraism, which was practiced by the elite in Rome during this time. The connection between the Phrygian cap and the magus is an important one, as we'll see it was important to the Renaissance artist. Also, one of these magi look to be similar to a Templar. If we zoom out and look at it from how we're accustomed with Giotto, we can start to see the similarities. This does not look to be almost 2,000 years ago. However, we see the same symbols. This time, there are four angels, the Archangels, Mary and the Christ Child. And also, with Sandro Botticelli, 1475, you'll see these massive ruins in many different versions. This one specifically is interesting. So with these ancient Roman fresco paintings, they have perspective with buildings, which shouldn't really be there during this time period. The building and architectural style is also very similar to Giotto. By Gentile de Fabriano in 1423, depicts the adoration with some new upgrades. In this one, we actually see three Marys. This time, the Virgin Mary is holding the Christ child while he anoints one of the kings. But it's not just the three magi. There's a massive line of people, looks to be thousands who have come to visit this event. Many of them are wearing red Phrygian caps or the Jewish hats. And it's interesting to see this building, an open dark lit room behind the Virgin. Above St. Joseph seems to be some sun floating orb that is also compositionally aligned with the Christ child. In the background, we see the ox and the donkey again, 
but in a cave hidden from light. Now from this point on, we're going to see this cow and mule symbol multiple times. And it's key to note that in the Bible, there is no reference to ox, cow, donkey, or mule specifically during this birth scene. This is something that was added by the medieval artists for the use of symbolism. The typical answer for why the ox and donkey are in the nativity scene is in the verse from Isaiah. It's quite cryptic. Quote, The ox knows its owner, and the donkey its master's manger. Israel has no knowledge. My people have no understanding. Also, the interpretation for this makes no sense, that the animals just know their place. But in our current context, it would make sense perfectly if it represented what we learned from Liber Vacai. The ox or cow is the mother womb or vessel. The donkey or mule is the experiment. The master is the alchemist Mary. That's why they're saying no one understands this. So let's look at a painting from Fra Angelico and Fra Filippo Lippi in 1440. It has a very interesting detail. There's a peacock on the building with the cow and donkey. Also, there are some buildings during this time period that show the adoration with ruins and strange buildings. In this one, we see some strangeness going on with the children playing on these old ruins, and we also have this large crowd of people who have come to witness this. Lippi had another one in 1455 that's interesting because in the background, we see a gray woman, and to the left, there's a robed man coming out of the ground. Next, let's cover Paolo Lucello as he has some very telling and strange paintings that may reveal some clues. One is in 1435. Looks like an early version, but there's another undated one that has ruins everywhere and the crowd has Phrygian caps. But he's also attributed to many different versions and styles, like this one. This is not the adoration of the Magi, but it's the adoration of the Christ child with St. Jerome, St. Mary Magdalene, and St. Eustace. It's pretty strange. We got these people underground, and they're taller than the trees and much larger than the animals, unlike the depicted above. The land beneath them is broken. So wait, what is Mary Magdalene doing here? She's depicted in red, and there's a lion, a stag, and a white dog. Yet we see the same nativity scene symbolism, with the donkey and the ox, and the angels. So what's going on here? We also see the star shooting light right at Christ Child. In a 1464 Uccello painting, there's another adoration of the child, and this one's quite surreal. We see two hands dropping the Holy Spirit, which then seems to be dropping an orb of light into the newborn child, as if this is transferring a soul into a newborn baby. Uccello has some fascinating paintings, one that may be relevant is St. George and the Dragon, which is on a chain and controlled by the princess. This could be a reference to the basilisk as well. He must have known of Gnosticism because he has a creation of Eve and original sin showing the snake with the head of a woman. Also, it may be barely noticeable, but this woman to the right, which seems to be Eve, has a reddish colored hat. It's barely noticeable. But notice how Adam is handing something to this Eve character and it doesn't look like a fruit, but more like a stone or gem. As we peek through his catalog, we'll know something's up and this guy's involved with some deep knowledge. This will be revealed. So this painting is mind-blowing because it's called The Creation of Eve. There's a full version online that's missing fragments so we can't see the full painting. However, one thing's visible. There's another tree. And if you notice that the apples are somewhat merging with a Phrygian cap, and in the very center is a little baby growing in the tree. So does this homunculus have something to do with the original sin? Is this the tree of life? Then we have what seems to be Eve, but we can't see the full picture. It's almost as if this is Eve in the same pose, on her knees, or it even looks like there's wings. Is this Lilith? Her skin is also slightly darker. One more thing I noticed from a distance, kind of on accident, is if you back up, there's actually an artifact in the tree above Eve and her Phrygian hat. Right behind her is some type of flask with the caduceus on it. There's no way that's an artifact or it leaves. There's something going on right there, and behind Eve is a large golden flower or apple. 
This undeniably connects the earliest painters to the subject and also the Phrygian caps. This is something they were well aware of. But we aren't done yet, because there's another mind-blowing painting from Uccello. This guy's a big deal. In his painting, Episodes of the Hermit Life, we get a view of the occult and esoteric side of the church. Also, it seems to be an earlier Bosch style. We see the monks living a hermetic life, and in the bottom left, one of them is speaking to Mary with red angels. These red angels are connected to this whole thing. On the right, there are some monks sitting in a circle. There's at least one woman among them, and she has her head covered, and a man on a podium is speaking. A few things to note. The podium, you can see that the wood grain is perfect, and we see this typical eyeball type pattern that is common with wood grain. Also, the speaker's hat resembles the tree in the paintings, like a round disc. The trees themselves sort of resemble antennae, or maybe a surge arrester. On the left bench, a man is about to be bitten by a snake that slithered up the bench, and then to the far right, two men are on a red bridge and seem to be eavesdropping on the monks. Underneath is a demon or devil. We see a mule in the middle of the scene, and the church set up some huge outside circle with trees, so some woods. There's a path that leads up the stairs to three women. One of them is praying and holding a skull. Here, we see monks are climbing the stairs to witness some type of event. We now witness an extremely gruesome scene. A man, or possibly a woman, with the same upturned disc headpiece is crucified. There's actually something coming out of this man. Both legs are tied together, and the cross has a snake wrapped around it. Below the crucifixion, there's an Athenor. The monks are shirtless, whipping themselves? To the right is two men preparing another man for something, and there's an open door. To the right are two men praying to the heavens on a cliff. The symbolism here is the rainbow above them is keeping them safe. But look at the clouds in the environment, and it looks like the crops aren't doing so good. Perhaps he's making it rain through invoking the angels? It's also strange because this angel isn't fully depicted. It seems to be red and it seems to be shooting something into the man or perhaps there are strings attached because we can see that the four beams strings are attached to the monk. It almost looks as if he isn't in control of his own body. Under them is another cave and it seems another ritual is happening. But notice how the man is much smaller than the one crouching. Behind him, we can see a dark figure that seems to have emerged from a crevice in the earth that sits smack dab in the middle of the painting. In the background, we see a building of a similar style as the one near the ritual alchemical crucifixion. Then there are the two church buildings, but their colors are inverted. Red building white roof, white building red roof. We see two more priests in the distance. Is this some type of operation? To quickly finish with Uccello, there's not much info on him. He was an Italian painter and mathematician who was notable for his pioneering work on visual perspective and art. So fascinating to see the clues he left over, and he has this one with a Masonic floor, two angels speaking to two devils, and this is a part of a larger piece called the Miracle of the Desecrated Host. The first scene has coat of arms, and interestingly, there seems to be a death and rebirth with scene 5 and 6. Let's continue with Roger van der Weyden, 1455, and this one's fascinating because there's three scenes. To the left is Annunciation, the middle scene is Adoration of the Magi, and the right is the Adoration of the Child. There's also the Holy Spirit being implanted in this last scene, but notice this bed behind Mary and remember this fabric detail for later. In the middle scene, we see the Magi with the red Jewish hat on the ground, and he also has some type of interesting pouch bag. We see the cow and the donkey, and we're in ruins. Above to the top left, we see the Star of Bethlehem, but it's hidden. We even see the church at the top right. So there was a church? Then the Virgin Mary hands the Christ child to the church so that they could show adoration. Now let's move on to Hugo van der Hus, 1470. He has some interesting details in this adoration scene. This is an insane painting to look at just in general, but let's really look at it. Well, it's a tri-panel, or in Christian art, it's called a triptych. There's some very interesting research that ties into some of these early triptych paintings of Jesus Christ, and researcher David Ewing Jr. has even suggested that Jesus lived in Europe. Fomenko argues that the biblical city of Jerusalem is actually what we know as Istanbul, 
formerly Constantinople, and that many events described in the Bible, including the life of Jesus Christ, occurred there in the 11th, 12th centuries AD, not in the 1st century AD as traditionally believed. We see paintings that show European buildings in the background, and even possibly, we see the Galata Tower and one of the paintings of Jesus on the cross. Very interesting. But as we were saying with this type of painting, the triptych, it's used to tell stories. But even more so, it's a device used by alchemical artists to symbolize different allegories or stages. Just like the alchemical process, and it's important that we take all panels into consideration. Hugo van der Hoe's paintings are far more realistic, and the crazy thing about that is he has multiple versions of this scene, just like the other artists, but he probably has the most. But in this particular painting by van der Hoes, we see a more occult scene. In the middle, it looks more like a ritual now. The angels are in a circle, and Mary is praying over Christ's child as if she was a priest. This is the birth, and we see the cow and the mule, but this time the cow is red. In the left panel, it seems Jesus is looking at his birth. We see the twins below, and the old man is ringing a bell. This means Jesus is walking his way into the middle scene. So then what is this right panel? We see the three Marys, or witches, and a young girl. You may say, well how do we know they're witches? Well, they have their hat wear, and also on the back of their robe is a flask with a demon face on it. They are pointing right to the Christ child compositionally, and they all have books, just like Mary did during her Annunciation. Also, the one with their hair back is holding her fabric to prepare for the baby and is holding some type of vessel. It would seem that the three Magi are quite strange in this scene. They look more to be thieves, and this guy has a mischievous grin. Look at the level of detail on their faces. One of the angels has wings that look like the pattern of a peacock, and also the other one looks like it has the wings of a parrot. Hugo van der Hoes has many versions, and some of them are very similar with some notable differences. There's kind of a similarity between Bosch, and also this is when we start seeing one of the Magi depicted as a Saracen. It's much more clear that he's a royal moor. There's also this painting called the Adoration of the Shepherds, which seems kind of strange. Notice this guy staring at the viewer. It's almost as if they're unveiling some secret. In the Monforte altarpiece, the Adoration of the Kings, on the sword of the Moorish Magi, there's a red and white Tudor rose. And this guy with the fur coat has something hidden in his jacket. He's also the one holding the chalice. Now we can move on to Jan van Eyck, who revolutionized painting, and I'd say, the most realistic for his time period in the early 1400s. There's no doubt that he must have had access to some type of advanced painting techniques, perhaps using a camera obscura, or other unknown texturing workflows, as it's truly unbelievable the amount of detail contained in some of these paintings. A well-known painting that we have seen is the Adoration of the Mystic Lamb, or the Ghent Altarpiece. This is pretty crazy if we break it down. It seems to be divided into three sections with four panels each. The middle section has Jesus crowned with a papal tiara. Adam is in the left section, representing an energetic force, the masculine left brain, and we see women reading books. And at the bottom, knights and men on horses. To the right top section, we have music and Eve. This represents the female force or the creative aspect of the right brain. Below this, we see the philosophers, or the sages. In the center, we see that the clergy have arrived to participate in some type of holy event. What is this event that the entire city came to see? That massive city in the background? A lamb? A ritual sacrifice representing Jesus? Or is there something else going on? Why are they collecting the blood of the lamb? Are they using it to create something new? Van Eyck also has an adoration of the Magi, but it was never finished. Now, let's look at a painting that I'm pretty sure almost everyone has seen at some point in their life because it's just far too realistic. It's called the Arnolfini Portrait, which seems to be a secret scene depicting Annunciation. This painting's well known because of the realistic lighting, texture, and the mirror in the background that shows the scene from reverse which also goes back to the spectacle section. They were fascinated with that type of stuff. So this is kind of next level symbolism. But I would argue that this is another Annunciation painting. First, you can see these exact same colors on the Virgin. And also look at all the red in the fabric specifically. 
This can be seen in the Annunciation paintings as well. This little droop of the fabric. The colors of the outfit in Van Eyck's work on this lady are only green and blue. But if you look over here, there are red shoes in the center. If these are her shoes, then this would be the missing link. And she's also pregnant. Perhaps we're seeing a different symbolic version of the same phenomena as this man in the black hat could be Gabriel. He's by the window of light. He has taken his shoes off and he has a black hat signifying that this is a secret wedding. This is interesting. The dog in the center is important, but the symbolism involves darkness. For now, it suffices to say that this is the Philosopher's Stone, the homunculus. Is that reaching? Well, let's take a look at the mirror where we can find out the answer. The mirror is filled with Christian motifs. It's the story of Christ in a cycle with the top being his crucifixion. But there's one very strange detail. Look in the mirror. This can't be an error. He even has the three oranges. He for some reason intentionally decided to leave the dog out. We see a red and blue person that clue will be clearly seen later in the video. But wait, where is the dog? We know this is a ceremony and it's a marriage. Someone is pregnant. We see the Annunciation symbolism. So hold up, why is this dog there and why is he not in the mirror? Dog in the mirror is God. There are also 12 artworks on the mirror as well. We see the top one's obviously Jesus on the cross. Van Eyck also has these strange paintings with a woman holding a fountain by the king with green and red and the Madonna is wearing red over blue. This is inverted compared to the older Christian artworks. The artwork is called Madonna of the King and they have many of these. It's the same painting but with different counts. They depict the Madonna and child but with one key difference. The baby is being handed to the king and these babies look very strange. It's almost as if this Madonna is being used as a symbol. There are multiple Madonnas. Is she a device for making babies or homunculi? Van Eyck influenced many artists and this is also where we begin to start seeing the Magi clearly identified as a Moorish Magi, which some historians interpret as African. In others, it's very clear that this is some type of grand mage or alchemist Memling was inspired to make this adoration of the Magi painting in 1470. It's fascinating because we see all the same symbolism. Notice all the coat of arms here to witness the event. To the left is the adoration of the child. Some type of strange ritual it would seem. Why is a donkey and ox still there? Then the adoration of the Magi. So three mages bless this baby. Or perhaps it has deeper meaning. Then we see a Madonna handing over the child to the church or count. But also, that one of the Magi are worshipping the feet of the child. This gets into some other strange topics such as feet worship. There's these strange depictions of feet worship in Arabic art with demons that also have the same regurgitating tale that we'll see later. The Madonna of Chancellor Roland. The Mary is handing this guy the baby Christ and he's holding a flask with the cross. Look at the scene in the background, what's going on? But look, there's a peacock. Jan van Eyck also has an Annunciation painting. It's very interesting. The angel has watermelon wings this time, and we can see the Holy Spirit is being shot through the window. But there's an interesting fine detail in these tiles here. There's an illustration of a giant being beheaded. The level of detail in these paintings are unreal. If we zoom in, at the bottom is a lion and a centaur. There are some strange symbols being told here. We see a scorpion, a night mermaid, which we'll see later. Then also the mermaid woman that looks like a star tag. So why are we seeing all these hybrids? And also what's with these roses on the angel's cape? Rosicrucians? Also with Leonardo da Vinci, he has an unfinished painting with the tree of life and people in astonishment with an old man ringing the bell. There's also Madonna and the two angels adoring Christ child. Madonna of the Carnation, aka Madonna with the vase or Madonna with the child. The young Virgin Mary seated with baby Jesus on her lap, depicted in precious clothes and jewelry. With her left hand, Mary holds a carnation 
a red flower representing rebirth. Leonardo called this painting the carnation or Madonna with the vase. Why? It looks like a flask. Of course, there are astrotheological components of the Last Supper, but we need to remember that the Holy Grail, in the Christian tradition, is the vessel that Jesus used at the Last Supper to serve wine. The Holy Chalice? Now we move on to Hieronymus Bosch. He has an adoration scene as well, and some other questionable paintings. It's fascinating because although this is the beginning of surrealism, he mixes works with religion. And just because it's surreal does not change that there still could be secrets contained within this work. In his Adoration of the Magi, we see a dilapidated strange building in the Bosch style, but we see some more info really. In this scene, we see a Moorish king that draws immediate attention. He's holding a sphere with a phoenix on it. This looks to be an alchemical master Saracen. The helmet under the baby, which also looks like an alchemical vessel, has two pelicans or herons at the very top. This is compositionally aligned with Christ Child. In the house, we see something weirds going on. There's a Pope-like figure, or perhaps even Jesus himself, nude and emerging from the house. In parallel, we see the donkey in front of the cow. This time, the donkey is staring right at the baby. Now Bosch is going to be in a later section. But as we mentioned earlier, he could have been aware of the secrets because he was a part of the illustrious brotherhood of our blessed lady. So now we're going to take a look at some juice paintings. From Sandro Botticelli, he has this mystic nativity. What's this? A witch circle? Three witches? A marriage ceremony? This is basically a Sabbath. There's this crazy painting from Fra Angelico, which is a coronation of the Virgin. But if you look at the bottom, there's a giant Jesus being born out of a tomb. There's also some very strange paintings in here. Some ghost handing this man a book. Even a horse stomping a man to death. Some really strange things are going on in here. There's also some weird illustrated manuscripts from the 1200s to 1400s that have this same symbolism. After witnessing all the similarities in the Adoration paintings, there's really only a certain amount of conclusions, all of which have not been fully interpreted in the full context by scholars and art historians. In order to fully be able to understand the symbolism in these images, one must be knowledgeable of the secrets and history of brotherhoods, and one must have a thorough knowledge on alchemy and expanding many different subjects. In this full context, there are some massive insights to be gained from these works of art. This is because it is clear that alchemy is involved throughout this symbolism. And whether or not they were originally designed with that purpose, the point to be made is that all of these painters who created the Christian biblical scenes encoded these scenes with symbols. Much of them were repeated as if they were all a part of a similar school and or brotherhood. The question is, did the authors of these works know anything about alchemy in the creation of a homunculus? If the answer is yes, and the interpretations match up consistently and align with every variable or artist we go to on this exact biblical scene, then why would they do this and what are they referencing? Why would they secretly encode these scenes with alchemical symbols? That's because there's been a great secret kept from humanity in regards to this practice of the homunculus. There very well may be levels to this that we'll never understand, but one thing seems to be clear. A large portion, if not all the biblical scenes on the Adoration of the Magi, from the 1300 to 1600 period, depict secret brotherhood rituals of the creation of a homunculus, Jesus. Jesus is seen as the symbol of the phoenix, but the Renaissance artists use this to secretly reverence the homunculus. They showed this in different ways. One method, through the triptych tri-panel paintings that would show multiple stages in one. Also, hidden background elements, flask, faces, and other symbols to represent the womb. You would see Jesus essentially go through the alchemical rebirth, and they treat the symbology as a rebirth symbol similar to the Ouroboros. This isn't reaching either. This is how it was designed. And this was the science at the time the Abrahamic religions were created. It's the most ancient art form and oldest secret. The secret to create life. Baptism is the purification process. It could be considered a form of sexual magic. This is for many reasons, but simply, the water is a female quality. Water is sexual by nature. But baptism is rebirth. 
Think about it. The Baptists believe that you are born again as soon as they accept that Jesus died for their sin and was buried and rose again. That is a form of alchemy and rebirth. Also, Jesus tells us in John chapter 3, verses 5-6, through six, quote, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. End quote. Alchemists use aqua as another means for semen, and the spirit is the aether. There's no apparent reason for why Jesus is crucified. Not his death or his sacrifice. Why specifically would the crucifixion method be used? Surely there are far better methods. The ritualistic and occult significance is never really explained outside of why Jesus came down in the first place. The question is, why did they nail him to a cross in that fashion of torture? Crucifixion is a method of capital punishment in which the victim is tied or nailed to a large wooden cross or beam and left to hang until eventual death. It was used as a punishment by the Persians, Carthaginians, and Romans. Before we discuss one of the possible reasons for crucifixion, there is a clue that can help tie this all together. It goes back to the series of Tree of Life paintings on the crucifixion from the early 1300s. Now we can return to the Kabbalistic work and understand what's going on. The Athanor is at the bottom of the cross and at the top, what do we have? The Rosicrucian pelican or phoenix. The bird is wounding itself with the intention of bleeding and from the wound it drips blood to sustain its children. The Rosicrucian's most prized symbol is not just a symbol of Jesus, but Jesus the homunculus and the alchemical process in which he was created. It's the phoenix. If we look through some of the Renaissance paintings on the crucifixion, we can see that the symbols are still there. They've just been hidden. The blood of Christ is collected at the bottom in the shape of an Athenor. The crucifixion was a ritual. We know this because people were present to witness it. And in the depictions, it's typically a circle, but obviously some type of death ritual. This ritual is initiated with the Holy Lance. And where was Jesus stabbed? Right on the side. But in the depictions, it seems to be right where his rib is. This connects to Adam and the creation of Eve or a new human. Also, the cross itself represents eternal life. It is the Ankh of the Egyptian tradition. Some possible evidence for this happens to be a Templar artifact. It's actually some graffiti that was left in the Tower of Caudre and Chinon in France. It shows clearly exactly what we just discussed. We also see the swan in lunar crescent symbolism. So the person in the upper right could be Mary, but there's also a spear, so perhaps Diana of Ephesus or Libertas. The top middle is the cross with the Athenor at the bottom. Then it seems to be a knight holding a shield with the star of Astarte or Inanna, and he's holding some type of cross, onk, flask-like device. Below the cross is an egg, or you could say pineal gland. To the right, some interpret it as a monk or a fetus. We also see the Florida Lee. Why would this be associated with the Templars? There's actually a multitude of depictions and alchemical engravings from multiple sources that depict the same knowledge with this understanding. The homunculus is not just a story made up by Paracelsus, but it is the Philosopher's Stone itself. We can see the Rosicrucian Phoenix or Pelican, the creation of an androgynous being, so they must have known that connection as well. Eternal Life, Jesus, the Phoenix, rising from the ashes, death, and rebirth. In the Orphic cosmogonies, the concept of the Orphic egg signifies a cosmic egg from which emerged the primordial hermaphroditic deity Phanes, also known as Protagonus. The deity has been associated with various other figures, such as Zeus, Pan, Metis, Eros, Arikapeios, and Bromius. The Orphic egg serves as an ancient symbol for the creation of a homunculus and is deeply rooted in archaic mythology. The egg is often illustrated with the serpent-like being Ananke coiled around it. Phanes, the golden-winged primordial entity, was birthed from the radiant cosmic egg that gave rise to the universe. 
referred to as Protagonus, Firstborn, and Eros, Love, an ancient Orphic hymn described him as follows, quote, Ineffable, hidden, brilliant scion, whose motion is whirring. You scattered the dark mist that lay before your eyes, and flapping your wings, you whirled about. And through this world, you brought pure light, end quote. The Ouroboros, a symbol of a serpent consuming its tail, has a significant place in alchemical tradition. This powerful image encapsulates the infinite cycles of creation and destruction, as well as the concept of eternal return. The presence of Ananke, the serpent-like entity coiled around the Orphic egg, alludes to the transformative and alchemical processes of the symbol. In various myths, the Ouroboros has been associated with deities who represent the cycle of life, death, and rebirth, further solidifying its connection to the idea of physical reincarnation. For instance, in ancient Egyptian mythology, the serpent god Mehen encircled the sun god Ra during his journey through the underworld, symbolizing the daily cycle of birth, death, and rebirth. If we consider the symbolism of the red eggs and the Gnostic imagery found in the Bible to begin with, it starts to reveal a deeper meaning. Jesus can be seen as the embodiment of the Orphic egg, symbolizing the Philosopher's Stone in the process of reincarnation, through which a new being emerges. This symbolism suggests a transfer of life or consciousness from one existence to the next, representing eternal life or the concept of reincarnation. With this in mind, one might ponder whether the ancients explored this concept and experimented with methods to transfer consciousness into a newborn life. This could serve as a more plausible explanation for the eternal life aspect of the Philosopher's Stone. It seems unlikely that a person could live indefinitely without aging, as the physical body would inevitably deteriorate over time. Instead, a more conceivable solution could include the intentional sacrifice of oneself with the hope of being reborn into a new body, perpetuating life through bloodlines and the continuous transfer of consciousness. Some may think there's no evidence to support that that's possible, but we must remember that we're speaking of an occult process of creating a new body and attaching that astral body to its new vehicle, if you will. We'll discuss the astral components of the homunculus in a later section. Through this occult lens, the ancient pursuit of eternal life becomes less about physical immortality and more about the continuous cycle of rebirth and the preservation of consciousness. By seeking ways to transfer their essence into a new vessel, the ancients were looking for a way to willingly sacrifice oneself with the intention that they would be reborn into a newborn baby, and that with this power, one could live forever through bloodlines and the transferring of their consciousness into a new avatar. We can now explore Mithras, and let's do another reminder that this is not Zeitgeist. One of the major flaws of Zeitgeist is, the author did not consider the alchemical components to the Bible. There are many allegories that clearly reference the processes and stages of alchemy. Two, the author had the goal of essentially debunking Christianity, which is not our goal at all. If anything, this knowledge strengthens our faith. Furthermore, the documentary Zeitgeist had no intention on considering the literal and physical symbols of the Bible that may suggest not only a secret science, but a brotherhood that has protected that secret for centuries. With that distinction in mind, let's see how Mithra, or Mithras the Homunculus, plays into this story. That's right, Mithras, without any question, is a homunculus. The reason we brought Zeitgeist up is because there are other similarities, however, the story of Mithras goes far beyond astrotheological parallels with Jesus. It touches on the very roots of this ancient art of creating a divine being, or a religious homunculus. With that context established, let's delve into Mithraism and its significance in this narrative. Mithraism, also known as the Mithraic Mysteries, was a mystery religion centered around the god Mithras, which was widely practiced in the Roman Empire, particularly among soldiers. This religion dominated Rome for an extended period and was considered a major rival to Christianity. Mithraism is intriguing for various reasons, not least because of its occult rituals and symbols, but the central figure, Mithras, can be linked to the concept of the homunculus, as he was born from a stone. The myth of Mithras being born from a stone is an essential aspect to the Mithraic mysteries. Known as the Petra Genetrix or the 
generative rock. This stone symbolizes the source of Mithras' divine birth. According to the myth, Mithras emerged fully formed and grown from the stone, wearing the distinctive Phrygian cap and holding a dagger and a torch. This miraculous birth is referred to as the Mithras Liturgy, which signifies the divine emergence of Mithras from the cosmic rock. The symbolism of the stone in the Mithraic tradition is multifaceted. On one level, the stone represents the cosmos or the world egg, which is an ancient symbol of creation and the origin of the universe. Mithras' birth from the stone signifies the emergence of light from darkness, or the birth of order from chaos. This also aligns with the role of Mithras as a mediator between the earthly realm and the divine, as well as his association with the sun. The stone is the Philosopher's Stone. You can clearly see Mithras coming out of the stone as if it is a vessel or a barrel even. Sometimes he's even holding a flask or a vase-like object. There are many symbols in these early reliefs that can be connected to alchemy, and also, they don't seem to be so ancient as we see the same symbolism with the alchemist. The emergence of Mithras from the stone is typically celebrated on December 25th, the same day as the birth of Jesus in the Christian tradition. This supposed coincidence has led to comparisons between Mithras and Jesus, with some suggesting that Mithraism may have influenced early Christianity. For those unfamiliar with Mithraism, the religion revolves around the worship of Mithras, who is often depicted as a young man wearing a Phrygian cap, engaged in the act of slaying a sacred bull, known as Tauroctony. Then there's also the Torobolium. The bull, representing the constellation Taurus, is shown being held down by Mithras, while a scorpion attacks its testicles and a dog, a snake, and a raven drink its blood. The symbolism is both rich and complex, with the bull perhaps alluding to the alchemical treatise Liber Vacae, or Book of the Cow. I mean, what else is going on here? Are we not to consider the influence of Mithraism on the new church? Why do we see the same Phrygian cap on Mithra that we see on the Magi in the frescoes and Renaissance paintings? Why are the Phrygian caps worn by French masons and assigned to Libertas? Is Libertas connected with Mithras? Liberty is Diana of Ephesus, the androgynous mother god of generation? The ancient cult of Cybele, or in English, Sibylle, also known as Magna Mater, or the Great Mother, shares some intriguing connections with the Mithraic mysteries. Both religions were practiced in the Roman Empire and involved underground rituals and initiation ceremonies. The Sibylle myth centers around her relationship with her lover, Attis. There are several variations of the story, but the most common version is as follows. Sibylle fell in love with the beautiful youth Attis, who was also her grandson in some of the versions of the myth. Attis was destined to marry a mortal princess, but Sibylle, in a fit of jealousy, drove him mad. In his madness, Attis castrated himself and died. Devastated by his death, Sibylle brought him back to life and he became her eternal companion. Another version of the myth suggests that Attis was not only Sibylle's lover, but also her son. In this story, Sibylle mated with her son, who then castrated himself and from his blood sprang a pomegranate tree. The pomegranate, a symbol of fertility, became closely associated with Sibylle and Addis. The cult of Sibylle held various rituals and ceremonies, including rites of initiation and ecstatic frenzied dances. The most striking aspect of her worship was the practice of ritual castration by her priest, known as the galley. This act of self-mutilation was a way for the priests to emulate Attis and demonstrate their devotion to Sibylle. The castration rites were a powerful symbol of rebirth and regeneration, linking the Sibylle myth to themes of transformation and renewal. What are the implications of these cults having such influence and significance in the exact same time period of the founding of Christianity? We see blatantly occult symbols. Mithras is sitting on the cow in a specific position, and we also see different stages of initiation during these depictions. One interesting detail is that these rituals were performed underground, but in some paintings, it literally looks like an Athenor, meaning the alchemical process goes far beyond just chemistry. There are occult rituals that come to play when discussing the science of creating a homunculus. The seven stages of initiation in Mithraism, known as the grades or degrees, 
each corresponded to a planetary sphere and had specific symbols associated with them. These stages represented the initiate's journey through the celestial realms and their spiritual progress within the Mithraic mysteries. The seven grades of Mithraism are Korax, the raven, symbolized by the raven or the beaker. This grade was associated with the planet Mercury. Nymphus, the bridegroom, represented by the lamp or veil. This grade was connected to the planet Venus. Miles, soldier, bearing the helmet and lance as its symbols. This grade was linked to the planet Mars. Leo, lion, the fire shovel and thunderbolt were the symbols of this grade, associated with the planet Jupiter. Perses, Persian, identified with the sickle, sword, or crescent moon. This grade was tied to the planet Luna, the moon. Heliodromus, sun runner, represented by the torch or globe. This grade was connected to the planet Sol, the sun. Bater, father, wearing a mitre or Phrygian cap. The highest grade was associated with the planet Saturn. This style of initiation and grades can be traced back through Sibylle and her eunuch priests, which then starts to show a possible origin to later forms of this practice. But also, it's connected to the seven stages of alchemy as well. This would go to show that occult knowledge, specifically the alchemical knowledge of the homunculus, actually predates the 12th century. These cults openly practice their rituals while cloaking their knowledge in occult symbols, ensuring that the deeper meanings were concealed from the uninitiated. It hadn't fully been revealed in works just yet. Little to no information is known on the true nature of these Mithraic rituals, as it was secretive and even involved passwords. It wasn't until the secret got out later and was translated through the word of mouth or manual hand transfer that this info got out later during the Arabic and European age of alchemy. The Knights Templar also had a hierarchical structure with various stages of initiation. Although the exact number of degrees in the Templar initiation system may not be precisely equivalent to the Mithraic mysteries, there were nine ranks within the order. These ranks, ranging from the lowest to the highest, include novice, sergeant, squire, chaplain, knight, banneret, commander, preceptor, grand master. While the specific ranks and symbols differ between Mithraism and the Knights Templar, both systems share the concept of a structured hierarchy of initiation stages, leading initiates through a progressive path towards spiritual development and enlightenment. This is another explanation on where the castration rites may have come from as this is one of the accusations brought against the Templars. It's just been rejected because Mainstream historians refuse to see the secret connections. Interestingly, nine is a symbol that has been used to represent transferring consciousness in the creation of a homunculus. Let's remember that even Crowley claimed that Baphomet was derived from Father Mithras. There are also several books that trace the history of religion with the mystical use of the mushroom. The most famous was by John Allegro, where he really stirred up the pot with his hypothesis on the sacred mushroom in the cross. He discusses the origin of religion through tracing the history of ancient fertility cults. The Amanita Muscaria can be seen throughout early Christian artworks. Even the outfits by the popes and priests resemble the mushroom. However, are we to consider the spontaneous generation aspects of the mushroom? Mushrooms do not have binary sexes, they have mating types or mating compatibility. So, they are androgynous in a way as they contain spores which have the ability to reproduce on its own if it finds a suitable environment. This is similar to the idea of preformationism, where the mushroom is already contained within each spore. The mushroom's ability to materialize, seemingly out of nowhere from a spore, suggests the idea of life can spontaneously emerge from non-living matter. This would be an interesting factor to how mushrooms could have had a role in the ancient cults, not only because of its natural qualities and symbols, but also due to the fact that mushrooms cause altered states of consciousness that these states were crucial for ceremonies and occult rituals in ancient times. From Mushrooms, Myth, and Mithras by Karl Ruck, quote, As with the original Christian Eucharist of the early Agape Halls, the Mithraea were not banquet rooms and the Mithraic sacrament was not ordinary food, but, as Elder Pliny called it, magical and theogenic. The initiate became deified in the Eleusinian mysteries by partaking in a meal which represented the body of the god. In the mysteries of Addis, 
A meal of bread and liquid, representing the body of the god, enabled the initiate to participate in his passion and resurrection. Such ideas were pervasive in the pagan world. Although other elements of Mithraic ritual may have varied over the long history of religion in its different locales, the sacramental meal was always essential, and the design of the Mithraea invariably was intended to accommodate it." End quote. This can be seen through many symbolic paintings, and it seems that the symbol of the mushroom is also heavily associated with Jesus. From the sacred mushroom in the cross, quote, the man-child born of a virgin. Describing the growth of the mushroom, Boletos, Pliny says, the earth produces first a womb, vulva, and afterwards, the mushroom itself inside the womb, like a yolk inside the egg, and the baby mushroom is just as fond of eating its coat as is the chicken. The coat cracks when the mushroom first forms. Presently, as it gets bigger, the coat is absorbed into the body of the footstock. At first, it's flimsier than the froth. Then, it grows substantial like parchment. And then, the mushroom is born. End quote. So as we can see, even early ancient writers saw the mushroom as some type of birth of a virgin. If we are to consider this and the use of entheogens through our ancient fertility cults, such as later derivations including Mithras, then it's very easy to conclude that the mushroom was not only an integral part of the divinatory process of creating a homunculus, but that it was also a symbol and manifestation of the divine Aphroditic symbol. There's another interesting thing we didn't bring up with the Templars earlier. Alephus Levy, the famous 33rd degree mason responsible for the creation of the modern representation of Baphomet. He actually has something very interesting to say about the Templars. It sheds some light to what may be happening. Quote, Would you care as a change to behold something less fantastic, more real, and also more truly terrible? You shall assist at the execution of Jacques de Molay and his accomplices or his brethren in martyrdom. Be not misled. However, confuse not the guilty and the innocent. Did the Templars really adore Baphomet? Did they offer a shameful solution to the buttocks of the goat of Mendes? What was actually the secret and potent association which imperiled church and state and was thus destroyed unheard? Judge nothing lightly. They are guilty of a great crime. They have exposed to profane eyes the sanctuary of antique initiation. They have gathered again and have shared the fruits of the tree of knowledge, so that they may become masters of the world. The judgment pronounced against them is higher and far older than the tribunal of pope or king. On the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die, said God himself, as we read in the book of Genesis. End quote. Right there. He continues that the Book of Knowledge has something to do with this secret wisdom. He continues, quote, What then is taking place in the world, and why do priests and potentates tremble? What secret power threatens tiaras and crowns? A few Bedlamites are roaming from land to land, concealing, as they say, the philosophical stone under their ragged vesture. They can change earth into gold, and they are without food or lodging. Their brows are encircled by an aureole of glory and by a shadow of ignominy. One has discovered the universal science and goes vainly seeking death to escape the agonies of his triumph." End quote. He then goes on to list more figures that were interested in the mysteries. But he says that they were guilty, but not in the way you may think. They were initiates who revealed the secret mysteries, and they practiced them in the open for the world to discover and that was not supposed to happen. So Levy is saying they committed a great sin. Let's keep in mind that this is only for the members of the order. Those who do not go under oath to receive this wisdom are not constrained to the same laws. However, he is claiming that the Templars exposed what went on in closed doors. That's very interesting, because it brings the Templars in a different light. They may have been the good guys in this scenario, in that they were wiped out because they were in order that let the secret get out. Then, the church used this slip-up by the Templars to hide it. They let people think that they were falsely accused. They let the Templars take the blame for everything. But in order for this to work, they had to be seen as the good guys. They had to be 
false accusations. Could it be that the homunculus, a being created through alchemical processes, has long been considered the ultimate goal for these clandestine groups? The allure of the homunculus lies not only in its creation, but also in the potential for the transference of one's consciousness, allowing an individual to attain a form of eternal life through reincarnation. Ancient orders such as the cults of Sibylle and the Mithraic Mysteries may have been the forerunners in this pursuit, guarding the secrets of the homunculus and the intricate processes associated with its creation. As centuries passed, these esoteric teachings could have been absorbed and adapted by subsequent secret societies who continued to seek the ultimate prize, the power of immortality through the creation and manipulation of the homunculus. Eternal life has been the ultimate goal of alchemists and secret societies throughout history, with the homunculus being one of the ancient techniques to achieve this ambitious aim. To generate a new body without the act of procreation, one would need to create a new form or bring about the birth of a child through unconventional means. The next crucial step would be the transference of the soul. This is also a part of the homunculus creation process, but it unfolds on a higher plane of existence. The alchemist crafts a body of light, an ethereal form into which they can project their consciousness, allowing them to separate from their physical body. This astral vehicle serves as a means of navigating the astral realm. However, the full secret of astral projection goes beyond mere navigation. One can use their astral body to attach to other soulless forms. This is akin to the actions of ghosts who might try to attach themselves to objects they hold dear. In the case of a physical homunculus, while in their astral vehicle or body of light, the alchemist can attach to it since it lacks a soul. This attachment is what enables the homunculus to survive. Without it, the homunculus would not last long in the physical realm. There truly isn't any reason to consider that this research on its own induces madness. However, this is the final warning. This section derails into what may be considered absolute insanity. So, how do the witches connect to this? And who were the witches? In popular culture, witches are often depicted as women with magical powers who practice witchcraft. Witchcraft can include different types of folk magic, some of which can be positive, like healing potions and spells, and others that can be negative, such as curses. However, the common perception of witches is that they use their magic for solely harmful purposes. They were believed to have cast malevolent spells on their own communities and were accused of interacting with evil spirits. In popular culture, witches are often depicted as women with magical powers who practice witchcraft. Witchcraft can include different types of folk magic, some of which can be positive, like healing potions and spells, and others that can be negative, such as curses. However, the common perception of witches is that they use their magic solely for harmful reasons. They were believed to have cast malevolent spells on their own communities and were accused of interacting with evil spirits. So let's connect these witches with the phantom time hypothesis. According to this idea, there may have been a time when women, referred to as witches, were manipulated to cause specific disasters, especially famines. This concept was explored in a Christmas video featuring the Benendanti, or the Good Walkers, who were a group of good witches. They had to use their knowledge of astral projection to protect their crops from these evil witches. The witches' broomsticks could symbolize the hidden power of flying during astral projection. It enables individuals to project themselves into a completely different reality that mirrors the physical world. And perhaps by influencing this mirrored reality, they can affect things in the physical realm. So, let's talk about the Three Marys, or the Three Witches. Interestingly, in Celtic mythology, the figure of the triple goddess embodies the aspects of the maiden, the mother, and the crone. It could use more symbols like the Tree of Life and Rebirth as well. The most well-known example of the three witches in mythology and literature is the Weird Sisters. The Weird Sisters, also known as the Wayward Sisters, are prophetic characters who predict Macbeth's rise to kingship and eventual downfall. In Macbeth, the themes of resurrection and rebirth can be observed through an alchemical lens. Macbeth's journey, starting with the prophecy of the Weird Sisters and culminating in his tragic end, parallels the cycles of death and rebirth depicted in the story of Jesus Christ. Just as Jesus went through betrayal, suffering, and resurrection, Macbeth's path is marked by ambition, corruption, and ultimately self-destruction. 
And there was one more thing about the three witches in Macbeth that we really never discussed in detail. And now we're more prepared that we can see it more clearly. It's the three apparitions. In Act 4, Scene 1, we get a very strange scene. The typical idea for the reason of the curse is because Shakespeare put a real spell in the play. But hold up, if that's true, then what is this spell and what does it do? Because that's kind of weird. He sees these apparitions, which are basically metaphysical spirits or astral forms. So they're not just visions, they're sort of like ghosts, you can physically see them. But what's shocking is that there's an armed head, so a knight or initiation, then a blood baby, and then a crowned child. This is showing you in literary form through allegory, the creation of a homunculus. This is also sort of like the book of the cow. It has very similar ingredients, the organs of animals and humans, but it's not even reaching because the artists who depict this scene seem to have a clear idea of the symbols being represented in the story. Why would they depict a crowned child coming out of the cauldron? Also, in one depiction, we see a bloody baby standing and it looks just like a homunculus. Also notice the Freemason symbols and the snake symbols. It's clear that the artist knew this was some type of rebirth and or reincarnation event with the snake and even frog being seen as a symbol of fertility or birth. These three witches didn't curse the play, but instead, it's a ritual for creating the homunculus, Macbeth himself. And that's why you can't say his name, because it's the art of the play. A secret coded ritual to be read and played out loud where you can create an artificial, divine, crowned being that goes through a rebirth cycle. This whole scene is because Macbeth is trying to make sure that his kingship is secure. So they're literally whipping up a new body, the new crowned vehicle for him to use, and then the witches reassure him that no man born of a woman can harm him. So is that to imply that he is now not born of a woman? The Sabbath, a sacred day of rest in Jewish tradition, has often been linked to witches through the concept of the witches' Sabbath a gathering where witches were believed to engage in various rituals and ceremonies. Prior to the medieval ages, the perception of witches was quite different from the sinister image that emerged later. Witches were often seen as wise women or healers who practiced nature magic and provided remedies to those in need. However, as Christianity spread and the church sought to consolidate power, the image of the witch transformed into something more malevolent. Perhaps we're speaking of a different group of people entirely. During the medieval ages, witches were often accused of participating in secret rituals similar to those allegedly practiced by the Jews in the Knights Templar. One such ritual, the Osculum Infame, or Kiss of Shame, involved kissing the devil's anus, a gesture that symbolized submission and devotion to evil forces. And this has been historically associated with the witches. This accusation was also leveled against the Templars. Interestingly, this ritual was not only attributed to witches, but also to other groups such as the Jews during the medieval period. In Europe, Jews were often accused of engaging in nefarious activities, including witchcraft and consorting with the devil. The Witches' Sabbath is an event where initiated witches and other occult practitioners gather to engage in ecstatic rituals, ceremonies, and the sharing of esoteric knowledge. These gatherings are often depicted as hedonistic and characterized by unrestrained indulgence, with participants appearing nude and engaging in sexual acts. To maintain secrecy and demonstrate their loyalty, attendees are required to perform the osculum infame, or the kissing of the ano. This ritual involves bending down and kissing the rear of Baphomet, symbolizing their submission and devotion to the secret order. The Phrygian cap is also known as the Jewish hat, this is important because Jews are deeply associated with witches, or as some scholars put it, the history of witches is anti-Semitic. But we need to make a distinction here, because we aren't talking about pagan nature druid witches, and we can't be talking about the craze that happened in Salem that was some type of violent misogyny against women. Supposedly, from the 14th century to the 17th century, the Europeans executed 200,000 to 500,000 witches, 85% or more were women according to a paper on the subject. Did they really exterminate that many innocent women? 
Or what if this is a cover story for something deeper? The term witch, before the whole witch craze, actually would just refer to someone who was accused as a heretic. It wasn't just a woman. Take a look at some 12th century German Jews. They look identical to our modern representation of the witch. Therefore, we need to be open to expanding our view to what a witch is. Later, we can discuss the origins of the Jewish or Canaanite religion and see if there are any more connections to be made. The witches are initiates of a secret order. They have their own secret language. They have secret meetings. They also wear Phrygian caps. The witch hat is a pointy Jewish hat, and many scholars have made the exact same comparison. They are said to have made deals with the devil, and specifically, they have a mixing pot cauldron where they make all their potions. But did they ever try to create anything else? Well, there are many depictions or engraving woodcuts of the witches in the Middle Ages that may hold some symbolic clues. There was a period of time where there were vast accusations brought against the Jews, including an association of cannibalism and Saturn. Let's remember that the day of the Sabbath is technically the day of Saturn. Saturn has always been associated with cannibalism, but there's a woodcut from 1492 of Saturn in Peter Wagner's Almanac. The depiction of Saturn is quite shocking, yet this was for some reason assigned to these Jewish witches. Scholars have examined the issue of the Jews and the witches and have concluded it's all just myth, but it may fit into our analysis of the homunculus, as this theme of the Jewish witches may have an origin with earlier prior cult worship. We won't go into extreme accusations, but from an art perspective, it's strange that such details would be associated with them. Yet, there are other symbols included such as Phrygian caps and even the secret knowledge of Kabbalah. It would seem that these accusations against the Jews stem from Hans Baldung Green, 1484. He has some very interesting paintings and engravings that may shed some light on the situation. Because they don't seem to be purely propaganda. They seem embedded with complex symbolism, as he was obviously a master artist. But even more so, he knew the secret. Hans Baldung Green was a painter, printer, engraver, draftsman, and stained glass artist, who was also considered the most gifted student of Albright Durer. He has some paintings and engravings that come after these earlier woodcuts of the medieval ages and begins turning that into encoded knowledge. The most famous one that you've probably seen before is called the Witch's Sabbath, 1510. We see three old witches in front of a vase with a lid, not a cauldron, that's important, and it seems to have ancient letters on it. The one in the middle is holding a plate with what seems to be a dead bird, but also kind of like an egg with worms in it. The woman near the vase is holding a spoon to show that something has been mixed. And it is releasing what seems to be bugs or small animals on a wave of astral generation. Under this wave is the third woman using her arm to hide something. This is the goat for Baphomet and there's clearly phallic worms doing some type of ejecting into a vessel that is being slowly heated and the smoke from that is being merged with the astral wave of chaos. The significance of the goat in the sexual fluid collection being under the main wave in the darkness is because that is a secret. Then above we have what seems to be a younger girl riding the goat. That is an initiation ceremony. So she's being initiated and collecting the mixed fluids She's riding backwards and collecting it all into another vessel. Also, look in the back. Someone, a male with a hat, is watching this all unfold. And finally, in the front, there's a hat on the ground. And this hat looks exactly like the hats that we saw from the Adoration paintings from Uccello. There are more of his paintings that can confirm that this is not just interpretation, but the ability and knowledge to read the language of symbols. He has another painting called The Two Witches. Now hold up, is that what I think it is? She's literally holding the homunculus. He's telling you straight to our faces. It's been there the entire time. The witches were capable of creating a homunculus. She's holding a glass vessel that is sealed with what seems to be an actual organ. Very strange. Inside of the flask is a demon. 
This is symbolism referencing the creation of a homunculus. And remember what I was saying about how one tool in symbolism communication is compositional direction through the alignment of certain figures. The baby is directly below the homunculus. That's what we're speaking of, the three states of alchemy. Not only that, it connects with the three Marys. Let me explain. This painting is called Two Witches, but it's actually three stages. The first stage is the young woman. That's why we're seeing her rear, and she's posed as if she was holding a staff of sorts. The other woman is posed like Baphomet, but is flipped horizontally. She's older as well. Then the baby is the rebirth stage. The homunculus is simply the result of these three stages. He has another that explains the exact symbolism precisely, called the three ages of woman and death. And interestingly, if we zoom in closer, is that Jesus on the cross flying in the sky above death? This is the three stages again. This time, there's an owl and a baby at the bottom, and also some strange break in death's spear so where it makes a square and compass or even three points. I'm gonna have to explain some things that are quite graphic in a second, but it's important to know from a historical context to understand whether the witches truly had knowledge of Liber Vacai or the creation of a homunculus. He also made erotic art, maybe some of the earliest of this quality in Europe. He even has something strange with Aristotle going on. One in particular is called the Witch and the Dragon, and at first, it almost looks like the dragon's tongue is coming out and doing you know what, but it's not that. There's a baby on the dragon and it's forcibly holding the dragon or Azoth's mouth open as the witch is emitting a liquid from her rear into the dragon's mouth. This very well could be menstrual blood. But look at what is happening at his tail. Something is coming out, which seems to be smoke and a baby holding this end as a trumpet. This baby seems to be a newborn. The witch is holding some type of grain spear that is being pulled from the rear of the dragon. He also has some pretty sus horse paintings I don't know what else to call it, but one in particular is a man on the ground who just got shocked by something or knocked out. He is holding a staff and another tool possibly for the stable, but the witch is looking over holding a flame, and there's a coat of arm that has a unicorn representing mythical creatures. Perhaps he just witnessed the events in Liber Vacai as it is said that the cow can be exchanged with a horse, donkey, and many others. He also has a witch that looks sort of like Madonna that is stabbing herself it seems, and she's on a tree. Another one too of Lucretia. There's a painting called the Holy Family in a Landscape. It's interesting because the virgin has a bowl in front of her with blood, not sure why, and then behind her, there's a man unraveling the landscape, or in this case, reality since it's a painting. And he is revealing something that is hidden and looking down inside. It seems to be an angel with red wings flying inside of a dark room with fountains. Then there is a painting of Jesus and it's called Appearance of the Risen Christ to Mary Magdalene. This shows Mary Magdalene on her knees in front of Jesus as he rises from his tomb. But in the background there's a woman in shock pointing to the tomb and there are baby angels flying out. This pretty much confirms that the early Renaissance artists did indeed have the knowledge and were embedding it into their paintings. It also connects the subject of the homunculus to the witch, and that there may be something more to this story than just made up myths. That's huge because then it shows that there was a shared language between different artists and that they all used similar symbols. They knew about the homunculus. There's actually an earlier woodcut of the Sabbath from Baldung that is harder to find. This one is the same idea and you can see the similarities, but there are some big differences. There are three witches but one of them is dressed and looks to be a Palatine Count with his flag. The woman in the front is holding a base and is emitting astral chaos or the primal substance from the vase and the woman behind her is holding a vase or vessel to capture something being thrown by a man in a tree. But that's not a man, it's Pan or a demon. So our Baphomet is climbing a tree and throwing something into the mixture, but there's nothing to be seen. Now remember, this is the exact composition as the one we saw earlier. So let's look in the bottom left again. 
we see similarly death under the tree hidden. But there's also this strange worm looking thing again. This time, it's ejecting what seems to be white blobs of aqua fluid under this pan figure. So this shows the witches were using the fluid given from Pan or Baphomet, the horned god, and then using that mixture in their vase to create something for this Palatine leader. While in the background, we see an Athenor, some type of smokestack is coming out of it. Then to the right of the Palatine, there's a massive flask or vessel with a lid. Then behind it, there's a dead bird, or if you look at it from a distance, it's the exact same bird that we saw in the Tree of Life crucifixion paintings. The Rosicrucian bird. What is that doing there? Now we are entering a very bizarre subject that receives little to no attention in scholarly circles. If the ancients were indeed looking for ways to create life without the need for sex, if you can use a glass vessel, then you can use an organic vessel. Now this topic is already graphic as is, so the details will be left out for you to conclude. But the question is, did the ancients ever consider some type of rectal birth? That may seem like the most ridiculous thing you've ever heard, but bear with me, as that organ has extreme flexibility and would serve the purpose of a vessel, and regardless if it's true or not, we're discussing whether the ancients considered that idea, specifically the alchemist. The reason we bring it up is because, well, it seems that the medieval artist had some type of fascination or obsession with the anus. It's actually shocking to see how many examples of this phenomenon can be found and there are different categories as well. These artworks show people being reborn as homunculus, who are then pooped out by a demon Baphomet. These are the Hellmouth paintings. There are different variations of this, but typically, you'll see a face in the pelvis area. You've all seen these creatures too. There's a famous painting of St. Augustine being presented a book by the devil. Now, there are some interesting details in this painting. The Pope figure is gripping the black fabric from inside his robe around the staff, showing that this is some sort of hidden or dark deal. In the background, there are three men standing from a higher vantage point. One has black red, the middle one black, and the one on the right red. Notice how the two men are actually mirroring the foreground and that they are sharing the same poses as our characters in the foreground. This would mean that they are connected. The man in the black is doing business with the man in the red, who is wearing a Phrygian cap. The demon is not a normal demon. Well first, he has fire coming out of his ears, so his head is a furnace, a hell mouth. But this relates to alchemy and the birth of the homunculus, as his mouth is the death and the breaking down of materials to his stomach where they are mixed and out his rear for rebirth. Just to make clear that it is the anus, there's a quote from St. Jerome that explains this matter. Quote, In the way that the hindermost part of the body in the passageway by which the dung of the stomach is discharged is distanced from the eyes and position at the back, so also that which is below the stomach to carry off the humors and drink by which the veins of the body are irrigated is hidden from God." End quote. There's even a story that involves reversing the digestive system as punishment. It involves St. Alban who was giving a sermon and a wealthy man said, why should I go to see him if he's a peasant like me who also craps just like me? Upon saying this, he began emptying his bowels from his mouth and he never pooped again. He was forced to empty his belly through his blasphemous mouth. End quote. Essentially, the anus was shameful and sinful because it was inverted, the head facing up, the ano facing down. But there's more to it than just that. Ano or año means year. In Latin, it means anus, which is year. Therefore, we must question why has it been associated with rebirth and cycles, excluding digestion, as it seems to go deeper than that. These demons are very familiar looking. We see the same demon that we saw earlier. It's the same Baphomet-like creature. So is this connected to some sort of alchemical transformation or sacrifice? Throughout medieval art, demons had faces on the groins, knees, stomachs, and butts throughout the medieval ages. And for sure, there are some that we can question whether they are purely the imagination of the artist. But there is a pattern specifically with these depictions associated with the Hellmouth. 
There are many strange demon paintings and some of them are made up of individual elements. Even some of these demons have blemmy features. However, we're looking for the category of art that is associated with swallowing and then rebirthing. Followed by these demons with faces in their rear, squatting, defecating humans. Some of these demons even have breasts. There's even a demon with the head of a donkey giving birth through his rear. This can also be seen in the witchcraft Sabbath paintings where demons defecate into ceremonial vases. On the surface, the Hellmouth is the entrance to Hell as the gaping mouth of a huge monster. This monster, in a horrifying fashion, swallows the suffering humans as demons forcefully direct them into the entrance. This is our current vision of Hell, and the way we see it is the way it was imagined by the Renaissance artist. However, that version doesn't really make too much sense. Even if the souls committed horrendous crimes, is the answer to literally torture them in this fashion for eternity? What type of being would watch over or approve of some type of system like this? I'm not here to question the logistics, but it seems fair to question whether there may be some deeper symbolism involved with these paintings, as many resemble some sort of sacrificial ritual. Hellmouth is a flaming pit, it's not just a mouth. And this pit, in many illustrations, are depicted as a boiling cauldron. This too can be seen on many medieval artworks. This resembles the fires of Moloch. In older depictions, we can see a mixing pot and demons throwing animals into what seems to be a mixing bowl. In fact, some of these depictions look exactly like an Athenor. The worship of Moloch is described in various biblical texts often involving the burning of children as sacrificial offerings, a horrifying practice that eerily mirrors the tormenting flames and suffering souls found within the Hellmouth. If we are to consider that time has gone missing and that these practices were actually far more recent, perhaps there may be some overlap, as let us remember how many witches were killed during the witch craze. The Hellmouth may be representative of some secret process that is hidden from God because it is inverted in blasphemous, as we see the same symbols repeating. There are many variations, some where the demons even resemble Krampus, and some of these seem to be very focused on the torture aspect. Many of these Hellmouth paintings with the Krampus also have humans that look smaller than the rest, which give the impression that these are children. But why would children be going to hell? This is a 14th century painting and it is conserved in the Pinacoteca Nacional in Bologna. In the close-up, we see a demon eating a human, and the demon is in chains, that's key to know. So this is some type of machine. It's obviously much larger than the other smaller demons, which many are hybrid creatures. The humans are being rebirthed and separated into different categories, being tortured and placed into pots. If we look at the original painting, we're actually seeing some sort of last judgment, but this one has a marriage ceremony at the top. There's a womb-like portal with crescents and blood is seeping from this marriage as it flows down, perhaps the angel of Gabriel, as then it releases into the head of the demon. Giovanni de Modena, The Inferno, 1410, features another insane depiction. We see that a woman or a man with long hair is being born from the demon and it kind of looks like the shape of a mitre from a distance. The demon, again, is chained. That means someone is controlling it or keeping it locked up, and it's underground. The humans are getting some type of spherical object shoved down their throat, some prepared recipe. The red demon that looks like a red angel has a demon behind him pouring gold into a bowl. If we zoom out, again, it's a sort of last judgment type picture but it's not quite the same. This perhaps is Michael as there's a sword. Also, there are people in the hanged man position. This looks like an occult ritual of transformation. Look at the queen witch who is not suffering. Also, in the bottom left corner, we see hybrid creatures like the centaur, so chimeras are being created. There's another fresco near this by Giovanni that is called The Return of the Magi, 1412. We literally see some type of building or factory because there's a chimney and a crescent on the roof. We also see that this boat is being driven by Hermes, 
showing that it may be alchemical in nature. It also looks very similar to the building in the Life of the Hermits painting by Uccello. Another painting of a demon birth that has all the same symbols from before the 1400s, it's the Inferno of Tadeo de Bartolo from 1390. This one is interesting because the Anno is depicted as a frog this time. The frog is an alchemical symbol for spontaneous generation. Remember the story of raining frogs? We also see the same androgynous symbol with the demon, holding two babies which is completely unnecessary if this is supposed to be punishing people for their sins. It makes more sense that this is some reference to a secret process. There's one painting of this that may have the answer behind what's going on with these images, and without a shadow of a doubt, it connects it to the subject of the homunculus. It's from Francesco Traini, a fresco from 1340, and it may be the earliest illustration of this quality depicting such an act. It's very hard to believe that this is from before the 1350s. This one is far more occult, and it seems to be a ritual. It's also a part of the Last Judgment series. This is some type of alchemical wedding, and to the right of the painting, there's the hell. Now let's take a look at the close-up. We see a hermaphroditic demon in flames holding two babies in each hand, and a baby is being eaten and born at the same time. The demons that we've been looking at seem to always have three heads. What are all these details? Including the seam harvesting of gold at the bottom? William Blake also seems to be aware of this hidden symbolism with his The Great Red Dragon and the Beast. Well, Fra Angelico, we looked at some of his paintings earlier, he has two Hellmouth paintings that are terrifying. And there are many more, even one that has three humans being eaten or regurgitated as he holds two snakes and sits on an alchemical pot. Giotto, the guy we went over in the earlier sections with the Adoration of the Magi, well, he also painted one of these strange demon things. The symbolism changes slightly, but the three is still there with the snake going through his head. There's this one detail in here specifically that's insane. It's a small section where there's a man and a woman, and these demons are forcing them to marry or have intercourse. On closer inspection, it doesn't seem to be a man, but Pan, and he has a bag of gold as an offer. He seems to be trying to seduce this woman to giving birth as she looks pregnant. There's also a basilisk reptile creature on her back. Seems to be that the artist is trying to represent a way in which these demons would replicate and create new hybrid beings. That's not to argue that it's true. It's simply to state that Giotto was so aware of the knowledge of alchemy that he even had a storyline in here that explained how they reproduced. These demons are torturing the new souls so that they can create new hybrids. It's not just things that go into the mouth, it's also things that come out. Demons, chimeras, even Jesus taking souls out of the hellmouth. Is the hellmouth a depiction for some type of workflow or event that involves cataclysms and apocalypse and alchemical technologies for creating a complete wipe and or baptism of a whole civilization? This was a transformation process where humans would be reborn again and then made holy. That is why they needed to suffer like this, so that they would accept the new age of the new church. Alchemy in the homunculus is deeply integrated with the creation of cataclysms, manipulation of weather, as mentioned in Libra Vacai. This is actually one of the abilities of the god homunculus. So there are a few reasons why I feel these paintings are alchemical in nature. The Hellmouth paintings are a part of the Last Judgment paintings. The Last Judgment is a recurring theme in Christian art, depicting the second coming of Christ and the final judgment of all souls. In these works, the saved are often showed ascending to heaven while the damned are cast into the fiery hellmouth. These paintings, in a way, are even more shocking as it shows how people are being transformed into holy saints. The Last Judgment and the Second Coming of Christ depict essentially a repopulation scene. The Last Judgment is a scene that depicts the second coming of Christ. An apocalyptic scene showing a split where one half of the crowd is saved and the other half is being tortured. All the demons giving birth are typically associated with the Last Judgment, so that means 
this androgynous being that we see giving birth is swallowing all the souls during the last judgment. The idea is that Jesus will come in 2000 years and watch over this event as a presiding judge. This is common throughout early Christian art, and we see the same three, the trinity, the same symbols, some that look like a square and compass. The strange part is that Jesus and sometimes Mary will watch over this and see all these people getting tortured as their souls get sent to hell for eternity. That story doesn't make too much sense with the kind, loving Jesus that we're told in the Bible to love your enemy. So then, is this really torturing souls? This is a 15th century fresco in the Church of St. Anne in France. We see trumpets, giant Jesus, and even Krampus in this one. There are very strange manuscripts showing giant Jesus watching over babies being reborn out of graves. The people in the bottom are getting thrown into the hellmouth, and the group to the right of the angel is being led to heaven or the kingdom. But notice how it's also literally a new kingdom. What if this is depicting the preparation before repopulating a ghost or emptied out city? So that's another thing. People are being put in graves or coming out of graves being directed into new locations. In Hans Memling's Last Judgment, 1460, he puts his visual in a play quite vividly. Yes, the kingdom is going to heaven, but that could be a symbol for a new age. And also look at the people growing out of the ground. It's quite strange. So people are being reborn into another reality? An astral realm? Where they're being judged? Possibly. And that would still be strange. However, there's a symbolism ingrained. We see the three symbolism. Jesus is wearing red, like the Madonna, and posed just like Baphomet. There's a rainbow that is shaped like an upside down crescent. In his ears, we see a flower with three main position points for the white flowers. And to his right, we see a red sword. And what is heaven? Because in these scenes, many of the times the people in the crowds in the heavens are still dressed, and it kind of looks like a church meeting. Also, in the top left entrance to the kingdom, there's some interesting details. There are three angels on each pillar, so there are three pillars in total, and there's a man sitting on the throne. Apparently this should be God, but it doesn't look like that. We can also see the four living beings, with the winged lion and the winged ox. This is some type of church. On top of that, there's a depiction of the creation of Eve from Adam's rib. Strange that that would be here in this reset scenario. Maybe there's something else going on with these paintings? There's one painting by John Provost, 1505, that holds the secret to the Last Judgment. We see the same Last Judgment scene, with people arising from the ground. But Jesus has his foot on a book, and the flowers and the sword are now more placed like a square and compass. Now this can't just be an accident or symbolism. These people are all referencing the same symbols clearly. To the right of the painting, we see a group of strange young humans holding a stone wrapped in nine different sections using rope. The top right square is a seven upside down, meaning the astrological influences are being captured and inverted. This is a flask with a frog entering and a bird's head is peeking out, as if there's a monster inside. There's also this strange boy or young child that is half human, half... I don't know what this thing is. A blue demon with one eye and a trumpet for a nose? This is merging with the boy as he points to some archaic occult-looking book. He's also right in front of a flask. Is this a homunculus? Now we're gonna look at the Coronation of the Virgin paintings. Here is a painting by Angoran Quarton, which is the coronation of the Virgin from 1454. What we see is Mary is being crowned by a mirror Jesus as the Queen of Heaven, and she has those hand poses. We also see that she's using this crown as a nest for the Holy Spirit, it seems, to be a direct symbol to the Rosicrucian pelican. In the heavens, we see the entire church witnessing this event. In the background, we see the red angels, or they seem to be newly born souls that are arriving into heaven, representing the blood behind Mary and for the Rosicrucian dove Holy Spirit. And there also seems to be a crowd of naked boys. 
It does not seem like they're angels because you can see the exact same group underneath the ground to the bottom left of the image. Beneath the Virgin is Christ on the cross, and we see this event taking place. People are being taken up from the ground and then being judged onto whether they can live in these new cities. It doesn't look like heaven to me. Interestingly, where the cave is, we also see some strange symbol of a man dressed in a star costume. And there's a wolf in sheep's clothing, or sheepskin. These wolves are dogs, and the dog seems to be in front of a Jesuit priest as behind him we see some strange worship ceremony. The coronation of the Virgin Mary can be seen in many early Christian paintings and many are embedded with occult symbolism. The coronation is granting Mary as the Queen of Heaven, so in a way, it's far more than veneration. And if we consider that Mary is a code for a secret process, then we can see these artworks in a certain light. We usually see Mary handed a crown and above her are cherubim. They are depicted in many different ways, but usually they are young in appearance and we see many floating above her head. It's not clear what this has to do with the coronation, but in the right context, it fits with our alchemical analysis. Now as we've entered the realm of the mad, let's take a look at the most mysterious and symbolic alchemical text. There's an alchemical drawing from Janus Licinius and Petro Bonus in the 16th century known as Petrosa Margarita Novella, the new pearl of great price. We see the same stuff that we've been seeing this whole time, just now from a different point of view. We see a red queen in a tree, and this tree is being burned at the root. The tree is contained in the most inner circle, which is red and resembles brick, so it's an oven or an athenor. There are also two priests with Phrygian caps directing this event. One is taking care of the union of opposites, and the other is pointing to the stars for astrological influence. So what's happening? Well, there are multiple stages or inner circles. The very far outer wall, or the closest circle to the foreground, is separated and we see another marriage, and in the center, there's some type of bird or basilisk-like creature with the four colors of alchemy, indicating that this is the final work. Then, the other walls have some interesting symbols. On the first wall with graffiti, we see a cow. So obviously, the cow or the ox is integrated within this alchemical symbolism of the homunculus. We see on the same wall, a newborn laying down. Two men are pointing to a union happening. One is the spiritual body creation, and the other is the physical, and they are uniting. Interesting that this unification is happening in the middle of the big three circles, and it has a lion. There's also another symbol on the red wall that seems to be some type of bee with a serpent tail, but it's not perfectly clear. This is the mystery of Azoth, the use of Prima Materia. Mary, the Virgin, the Red Queen, and she also represents this hidden knowledge of the Tree of Life. The Red Angels are another form of the homunculus. The Red Angels are Seraphim, and the other baby angels that are blue are Cherubim. Notice the similarity from Seraphim or Seraphim to Teraphim? Seraphim are fiery angels that protect the throne of God, but they also serve as his agents of purification. Quote, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, in the train of his robe filled with the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings, with two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of thresholds shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King and the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with the tongs from his altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. So they take part in this judgment process, but it's not just babies. Mary herself, one of these red angels, and the works of Hildegard von Bingen, 
who depicted surreal mystical visions. However, under the right lens, they're quite alchemical. We see angels of red, pregnant with a man in the stomach, and these angels are hybrid-like creatures, very iconic in nature. An angel would be beyond our understanding as seraphims are from another dimension. They would be similar to Enochian magic, having a language beyond our understanding, and even perhaps a form beyond our understanding. This is similar to the Afanim, which is a vision of Ezekiel describing some strange higher metaphysical beings with many eyes. The Afanim is some type of reset device that initiates this event and calls upon the Seraphim. Perhaps we're speaking of an advanced metaphor representing the wheels of some cycle or perhaps a mechanical device for initiating cataclysms. Let's keep in mind that the Ark of the Covenant does have two cherubs. Also, in ancient art chariots are typically associated being pulled from hybrid creatures. In Revelation chapter 4 verses 6 through 8, the passage reads, quote, Before the throne there was a sea of glass, like crystal, and in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion, the second living creature like a calf, the third living creature had a face like a man, and the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. The four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within, and they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come." End quote. The four cherubim of the throne of God can also be connected to the four elements, the four ruling signs of the zodiac. This would be winter for Aquarius, Scorpio for fall, which Scorpio is also the eagle or the phoenix, then Leo, summer, and then Taurus. They each have six wings means if you split them down the center, you get half the zodiac, so six. So these seraphims, since they are counterparts to the astrological cherubim and their sub-spirits, must be their physical counterparts. Typically, seraphim is associated with fiery, but they are used to represent certain feminine and maternal earthly qualities. The angels that are dipped in red are not fiery at all, more representative of the blood of sacrifice, the birth of new angels or spirits. We also have the Fountain of Youth paintings of early Christian art. They too contain the symbols we've become familiar with. From John Elder, this is called Le Bain Mystique, or Mystique Bain Marie, the mystical alchemical bath. We see a group of people bathing in the blood of Christ. They're bathing in a large golden vessel, and there's a woman to the left in red. Mary Magdalene or some goddess with the star of Inanna on her head. She's pushing this man into the bath of blood. The Fountain of Youth is also some massive orgy depicted in early medieval artworks. Like this 14th century fresco from Manta Castle, showing many people mating on the bottom level. But on the higher level, where there's some type of union of opposites, there's another fresco here that shows the coat of arms, and there are royal women with the three symbolism on the flags and a Rosicrucian swan. Van Eyck also has an interesting fountain of youth called the Fountain of Life. It has interesting architecture because we're going to see something similar in a minute. We see Jesus crowned as Pope and on the throne are four cherubim. Under him is the Lamb of God and there's water flowing out from it. This is the water of eternal life, flowing down into another device like fountain that is releasing water to a priest and a mage with a chest plate that contains talismanic stones. This is the breastplate of Aaron, and each stone represents a sign of the zodiac. He's being blinded by other members as they break his flag. It could be the triumph of the church over the synagogue. However, it's interesting that the high priest would even be here to bless the waters. There are many fountain of youth depictions throughout history. But it's interesting to consider whether this may be hidden symbolism referring to the process of eternal life. Well, let's continue. Now, we're going to discuss a famous surrealist artist, a favorite by many, Hieronymus Bosch, which is perfect because he also has a fountain of youth or garden of earthly delights and we can just start there. Now, I want to first mention that before Bosch, there was a slow transition into this type of surrealism. 
Hugo van der Hughes was doing something similar, but all the artists around the time were doing religious paintings. And we saw one earlier of Bosch in that adoration, but Bosch did religious paintings as well. And little's really known on what his intentions truly were and where did this all come from? So the question is, did Bosch know the secret? The reason I preface it with this is because surrealists could hide symbols more in the open under the guise of madness. As if anyone asked any questions, you could just say, oh, that's hell, or that's just imagination. So it would seem that Bosch was well aware of this, and or were witnessing the inner mind of one of these renaissance artists. Now let's take a look at the Garden of Earthly Delights. It's a triptych, so we have three different scenes to look at. Let's start from the left where we have Adam and Eve, and Jesus is holding Eve's arm. This must be the creation of Eve, as Adam is laying down, and below them is a dark pool of chaos with a variety of hybrid-like creatures. As we scroll up, we start to get a glimpse of how Bosch envisioned the Garden of Eden. It isn't just surreal, it's from another dimension entirely. Very alien when you look up close. This is the Garden of Eden, and the animals, when they first were generated, and it seems that they're all forming from these hybrid black creatures from the fountain. Also notice how the cow is the only one not drinking from the fountain. This fountain is an alchemical device. You can see it's pink so it's sexual in nature or indicative of love and we see the caduceus as two mushrooms intertwine. We then also see the three pillar symbolism and an owl. For some reason there are many owls in here. The animals in the background are living their lives in this surreal otherworldly landscape. We now move on to the middle scene. This is no longer the initial Garden of Eden, but now it's been overpopulated. Many beings have been generated and it's starting to look like the Sabbath as they are performing some sort of dance or ritual in a circle as the women bathe. If we back out and look at the foreground, let's work from the bottom up. One thing to point out before we do that is that the majority of these humans are light-skinned, but there are a few examples of dark-skinned figures here. There doesn't seem to be anything inherently racist by Bosch, other than the variety present. However, if we consider that this may be secret symbolism, perhaps this can be interpreted differently. There are other woodcuts and depictions of these dark figures from the Sabbath, and some medieval artists decided to use dark or black African figures as symbols for demons or monsters. This is not to argue that it's true, however, there are a few things to consider. 1. During this time, many of these medieval artists had certain biases on skin color and religious association, that's obvious. However, they could have used this as a symbol to represent beings such as demons that were also associated with darkness because of these inherent biases of their times. Two. We must also consider that the Saracens and the Islamic Moors of Spain were the ones who first got access to this knowledge after the reset, so perhaps this is a symbol for priests of hidden knowledge. It's interesting because we see these black figures with cherries on their head, and these cherries are delicacies. She's wearing it on her head. The cherry came from the trees, and they're massive, so they're most likely apples or symbols of knowledge. Look at how the dark woman is standing. She has more composure and wrapped leaves, looking like a priestess of this early chaotic wonderland. We see these humans feasting to their pleasure's delight. Notice all the egg symbolism in the front and the feeding of fruits and grapes. There's also this strange orange tower here with an upside down black crescent. There are black cherries here and it seems like this guy has a raspberry on his head attempting to imitate the other cherry priest. Also, this guy has flowers emitting from his rear. As we move to the right, we see another dark priest with a cherry on his head and holding some type of grape fashion around his arm. The birds seem to be mating symbols, but there are many different variations. As we look at the far right bottom corner, we see glass. Wait, hold up, what's going on here? There are people hiding underground and they're fully clothed? He's pointing to a woman with her mouth shut and she's encased in glass with these strange egg-shaped features. So there's an underground section to this environment? 
Look up above. There's an owl with a couple under a shell that makes this androgynous being. And they're holding a bunch of these big cherries, so that's some type of god with fruits of knowledge. An owl god? Let's keep in mind that the black priest is looking and pointing to this orange building. This is a clue. Because it's the only section in this bottom area that we see these black feather pointy looking things. It's almost as if the black represents the Azoth generative principle of chaos. But it may be that those who are holding the black fruits are practicing bad knowledge or a different type of knowledge. We'll see more of this. If we come back to the center foreground near the pond to the left, we see some strange things going on in the pool. A couple is making love in a glass ball, and on the bottom there's someone inside the end being born. There's only one way out. That's why the rat is there. To the right of this, we get a man in a seashell. This signifies that these humans are being spontaneously generated. It's not all through sex. We start to see some silver-like beings, and they're not just painted that way because of the shading. That is some other type of colored human in these paintings. One of them is hugging a giant owl, and there are a few more in this pond. Many different eggs and birds, all representing that this is a sex generative act occurring. I didn't mention this, but if you look at the red teepee looking thing, there's a bird with a tiny cherry, and these people are begging for a taste. It's almost as if this represents the church and the hoarding of sacred knowledge. In the center we have many beings, hybrids, chimeras, many phallic symbols, even another owl. If we look at the entire scene, we can see that there are mermaids, strange knighted hybrid fish like beings that have red fruits and black fruits. We see an Astarte like Phoenician mermaid, and the main centerpiece is this phallic alchemical flask in the center of the garden. This is a massive generation factory. We also see that the beings that are flying have cherries so they contain the knowledge of light. Now we enter the hell, and it seems as if this is some type of cataclysm as there are ruins in the background and even hordes of knights. What is Bosch trying to say with this painting? So did Bosch know about the homunculus? This painting seems to be a depiction of the world after the knowledge of magic was released. Because after seeing these rabbits, a hand with dice, and a lady with dice pouring out water, we see all sorts of strange depictions. Let's start with the most blatant. We see Horus eating a man and then birthing him out of his rear into a pit where a man of silver is defecating gold. Then we see this entire silver priesthood behind him. One even has the crescent to confirm this is a homunculus. Horus also has a cauldron on his head. Under the robe, his feet are in vases and there's a woman inside a strange glass contraption with legs made out of tree branches. There's also a woman with a frog on her chest being wrapped by some black creature. Now let's get to these music devices. So we have two cults, the cult of the frog and the cult of the crescent. And we can see that these are on different flags. The instruments are being played by victims and there is a gray man with an egg on his back, interestingly and the sky of this bottom section turns into black water. Now we see these activities are occurring on some body of dark fluid. We see some people trying to boat their way into this knowledge, but the one who made it the farthest to the left fell into this dark fluid, representing one trying to achieve the secret of alchemy. These people represent the fools who were trying to learn but failed to do so. The interesting thing about this area is we get clear symbols for secret brotherhoods. These blue beings are practicing some secret wisdom as this silver man seems to be initiated by climbing the ladder into their secret meeting. To the left, the silver man is a key and the blue man controls the lever. There is another cult that has the flag of this strange bagpipe organ looking structure. This seems to be the cult's flag and the people inside this white eggshell with the face are the order behind it. To the right we have knights who are being greatly punished and they are the cult of the frog. They are being destroyed. The answer seems to be below under the knife. 
There's a man riding an old lady or witch and heading into a vase. But look at who's watching this unfold. The white-robed man is telling this other man with the monk haircut what's going on. Then we make our way to the top and see that there's a reset happening. Even if it's also real, because he also integrates religious symbolism, we can conclude that there's more to this than just imagination. He has a Saint John with a lamb and there are these generative plants that serve as spontaneous generation symbols. The description literally says that he made these up himself so these are forms that he created by intelligent design. It's not just random. We know he had a fascination with owls and that he was a part of a brotherhood of Our Lady so he should know all about this. Strangely. There's even a painting by him where a Mary-like figure named Saint Wigglefortis is crucified at her feet and tied together like Diana of Ephesus. Look at the buildings in the background. Oh, and this is crazy. So he has this painting called The Conjurer. In the first one, we can see that this guy with the key in the foreground is being tricked by a conjurer to the right, and he's holding the ball to distract the wealthy merchant while the man behind him tries to steal his keys. Or is he? How would that even work? That would be noticeable. He's actually holding it and he has his cap to show you that this is the key of misdirection. And they fully understood this art and how to use it within paintings. Furthermore, this isn't the only painting. There's another one that is said to be a copy from the 16th century. Well, in this one, we see the exact same scene, but there's more to the right now what is this to the right behind him? We have three men eating at a table. There's a window to the inside of a dark room where there's an owl and a cow reading some ancient books. On the outside of this building is a fabric hanged up that has different sized flask or potion bottles. In the background, someone is getting hung so the hanged man. Then there's Christ breaking down the gates of hell, 1540. This one's interesting because we see a hell mouth and these people are going through a funnel into the water and Jesus is opening the door. So wait, souls can come out of hell eventually? So then it is sort of like a rebirth transformation in this scenario. So the purpose of hell is to cleanse and purify the soul through torture? I have to also mention that there are a bunch of followers of Hieronymus Bosch and these are what some of the copies are, but they are from that same era. Which is interesting because there are some that are not copies, but they don't have the author names. And they're just attributed as follower of Hieronymus Bosch, 16th century. One such painting is very alchemical. A follower of Hieronymus Bosch, an angel leading a soul into hell, 16th century, oil and panel. There's a flask-like building an Athenor building with frog-like demons guiding them. Look at the buildings in the background in flames. So yeah, there are multiple versions of each painting weirdly and then you have these followers so I don't know, it's kind of insane if this is all done by hand. And we also have to consider that there are multiple versions of each painting. After Bosch, we get a similar style from Peter Bruegel Elder and Younger. There is an alchemist engraving by Bruegel Elder. This is an alchemist workshop and on the surface it would seem they are attempting to make gold. But what's going on with the children with cauldrons on their heads and being led to the tunnel in the background? So as I was saying, there's this really weird thing where there are multiple Hieronymus Bosch authors and this guy has some engravings that he designed and they were published by a Hieronymus cock. Not sure what that's all about, but this guy is connected to Bosch and he has all the same symbols. He also painted a famous version of the Tower of Babel. Some of his engravings are extremely symbolic, chaotic, and show that there may be more to this early surrealism than just imagination. Interestingly, Younger has some similar paintings and there's also one with this similar flag that we saw from the Garden of Delights, the Crescents. Now we need to go into some of the secrets contained in some of the most cryptic texts on alchemy. These are crucial to cover. We didn't want to have them earlier without discussing everything first, as these are texts that are very difficult to translate, but 
Now that we've seen the symbols, we should be able to find some clues. We'll start with George Ripley, 1415 to 1490. George Ripley was one of England's most famous alchemists. His alchemical writings attracted attention not only when they were published in the 15th century, but also later in the 16th and 17th centuries. His writings were studied by noted figures such as alchemist John Dee, Robert Boyle, and even Isaac Newton. The Ripley Scroll is an extraordinary manuscript that describes how to create the Philosopher's Stone. This is crazy, so the scroll is like 6 meters long and there are 23 variations of this original lost 15th century scroll. So they have different details and hints and some are quite different, but we'll start with this yellow one that's on the wiki. So we're going to start from the top and make our way down. So we start off with the alchemist at the very top and he's holding a flask. This alchemist in this version is wearing red. Now we see these blood sperm looking things that we've seen before on trousers and in Freemason symbol patterns. This seems to be the origin of that symbol. It's some type of prima materia of the blood of Azov coming down into the vase to create a mixture with the frog as the highlight. Why the frog? This is Hecate. To the Egyptians, the frog was an ancient symbol of fertility. In this version, the frog is not emitting any fluids, but that's not the case in other versions. We see eight different spheres, and the ninth is Azoth, and the tenth is the center, the final word, the kingdom, Malkuth. What do we see in each one of these depictions? A woman being created with these sperm shapes raining from the top. Notice how this is washed by a group of people. And this is not the work of a single alchemist. Something that's not typically shown in our illustrations of the alchemist in popular culture. This looks to be some type of workflow and operation. We start like a clock and the Adam and Eve is the first sphere. Someone is cutting the entire tree of knowledge down, forget just the fruit. And Adam and Eve are depicted as sun and moon. We see the two in a flask together, while five men who look like priests watch this occur over an Athenor. Notice the bird. So they've created some type of union and a bird comes out. This is the Holy Spirit. The next sphere shows only three people now and there are three flasks on the right. Notice how there is a spirit being distilled from the blood mixture of the Adam and Eve. This would seem to be the origin of alcohol spirits. They too are homunculus. Now the process is iterated and refined. There are two bottles, one with the bird, one with the man. They're adding to the mixture. Then in the next stage, we see four men standing around a flask, watching as this refinement creates another birth. So they're doing this over and over, and it creates a tiny little human as the tiny sperm shapes fall. The next stage shows how the man that has dissolved in the liquid is gold, and there's this woman who is fully grown. The next three stages, the only noticeable change, strangely, is that the men are growing in count, and the woman is changing from silver to normal skin. There's a full crowd to witness this, and we've come full circle. But wait, look in the center large circle. There's a pope and a priest, and they're greedily hoarding this book with large chains. Each chain is a path to the different stages we were looking at. We see spirit, soul, body. This represents the results between each different stage, the mixture created. But notice that there's one chain that is missing. Could this mean that this is the knowledge that they've given out? But wait, that's the Garden of Eden. So is this the Bible? As we go down the scroll, we see that this entire depiction is also a homunculus as it too is on an Athenor. We enter the next scene. We see a Gnostic tree of life containing two magnets on the leaves with a Sophia as the snake with the label Spiritus. She's bringing down the fruit, which is a silver homunculus with the label Anima for soul. This soul is being brought down the tree and the vines break off as a current to where the sun and moon character are bathing. There are several alchemists working on this project, 
Seven, in fact, representing the different planetary influences as this is crucial for the creation of a homunculus. We can see that this container that the Sun and Moon characters are in is shaped like a castle or a star fort. Then we come to a lower level of what seems to be a being Marie. There's a man in the middle and it says corpus, so this is a physical body. This is the vehicle for the newly created homunculus. Then what do we see? The anima, which is the soul. Those are the cherubim. They are the souls of the babies. And then on the right, we have the spiritus, which is the seraphim, which finally explains why they are red. Spiritus, which is spirit, was also assigned to Sophia on the tree of life. It is the feminine blood attribute. Notice how this pool is filled with blood, and we also are getting a similarity to that bathing in the blood of Christ painting. Then we see the four elements, which are also assigned to the four-faced cherubim. They're not just the seasons, but the elemental forces that make up our physical realm. Then we see Leviathan, or the regurgitating demon snake that we've been seeing throughout this entire video, but this time, spitting out a frog. Then we see two lions guarding a fire. The next scene is raining semen with a red sun. There's a basilisk, which is a female homunculus representing menstrual blood. The two are mixing in the sphere. This is the mixing of the white and red stone. Then the final section shows the serpent of Arabia, a dragon biting its own tail while it gives birth into the final chamber below and then we see three cells get fertilized. This also looks like the orb and cross, if you notice that. This is the three stages, the red stone, the prima materia, Mary, Sophia, then the white stone, the aqua, semen, or anima force, and then the elixir of life, or the philosopher's stone, the final work, the homunculus. The famous Voynich manuscript ties into all of this, it seems that scholars are still struggling to decode the mysterious language used in the book. There is some new research that's interesting, but it's not conclusive as it hasn't been published fully yet. Instead of trying to translate it, we're going to look at some of the history and information connected to the Voynich Manuscript and see if it connects with our current research. The Voynich Manuscript is the world's most mysterious book. Countless minds have attempted to decode its mysteries. It was written in an unknown script by an unknown author, and supposedly, Yale suggests that it was purposeless. However, when looking through these images, you just can't help to think that it's some type of manual or book regarding herbal magic, astrology, and alchemy. The history of the book, in following the path of the different people who once owned it, allows us to pinpoint certain clues we can see that certain figures that we've already covered were fascinated by this book. According to some researchers, for example Gordon Rugg, John D. may have owned the Voynich Manuscript, as well as Lieber Vakai. John D. owned an extensive occult library, so we could conclude that perhaps he felt that this work was alchemical or magical in nature. Even scholars have clearly recognized the alchemical nature of the book. The beginning of the book are these strange plants, some of which are unidentifiable and look quite alien. But there are some questionable areas concerning some depictions that seem to be the generation of human beings. So after the plants, we see some strange foreign zodiac charts. Some of them have spirals or even flowers in the center. Then there's this one where we can see two fish that seem to be depicting a chart with Pisces in the center. And we see all these different stars represented as people in barrels. They do look like they're emerging or being birthed from the barrels, not bathed. We can confirm this because there are a few variations of this. We see clothed women, so they're bathing with clothes on. We even see the red hats from the Renaissance art. The next two charts are a white and black goat. The next page is unclear, but it seems to be a red stag, and the union of opposites. This would connect to the work of the Ripley Scroll. We have the black 
white, and red stone, followed by the androgynous being or couple. These zodiac charts are representing different stages of the alchemical process, but they are aligned in showing the necessary astrological energies associated with the process. We can't read the special names and forces because they've been coded. Notice how in each stage, there's progression with the humans in the barrels. At first with the Pisces one, they were naked in the baths, then they became clothed in the baths. Then the zodiac with the red stag or horse with horns will begin to see that they are fully emerged and even some of them look like a miniature human. If we look at the union of opposites one, although it's not clear, we can see that there are many more stars now and they're out of their barrels or baths. When we get to the next page where we now see a creature, possibly a four-legged land animal, and then a magus in a blue robe. The next zodiac is a scale balancing two different waters. Now we are separating this creation of the blue anima, the soul, and look at the humans now. They are fully formed holding stars and one of them is crowned. This looks to be a last judgment. And let's also remember that all these zodiac charts seem to be representing the months as well as there are 12, but within each is a stage of the alchemical process. The next page shows four women standing on top with the four elements. And there is a serpent of Arabia with its tail in a loop and it is eating the star instead. Finally, the last circle is the archer, but interestingly, it looks as if he is killing them as they are lying down and they are losing their stars. What this means is this was the alchemical process in which they collected the energies from each sign of the zodiac and assigned it a stage in the alchemical process. At the final stage with the archer or Sagittarius, it's showing how this is the final stage in which they have killed the stars and have extracted their essence. After this, we see these star beings manifest from the divine down a green fluid. Notice the similarities from the Ripley scroll. There are multiple levels. Although it's more organic and creative, they are flowing down. And what's the color of the fluid? Green. It's green because of the entire portion of the first section of the book. The Voynich manuscript seems to be an alchemical book on how to use herbs to forcibly manifest the divine energies into physical form. That's what we're seeing with these fluids, an analogy for the creation of a talisman. However, it's important to note that the plants are natural talismans, so they don't need to capture any astrological forces. The herbs and the stars are one and the same. The illustrations are showing the process in which different energies are extracted through the use of different herbs. After they drop down, one is captured in a tub, and the others continue down. Then on the next page, we have nine different glass jars used to extract the different essences from the stars using the herbs. In the blue area, above the jars are three symbols. One is unclear, but the other two seem to be a rose and cross. These jars each represent a sephiroth, including the blue and there are 10 women in total, and that green fluid is being collected. After this, we see further distillation. The green begins to turn blue as more divine stars from the zodiac earlier are being extracted. Okay, so that's the divine extraction section, but it's important to consider that although it's an interpretation, even if the text was fully decoded, it would still take an understanding of symbols to be able to decode the visual component. and. There are similarities to be made that require no language at all. From this point on, we get into detailed script that hasn't been fully translated as of yet, but we see small little depictions that may give us clues. These are the beings from earlier, so there's not much to conclude other than this is a manual section on what you can do with these energies once you've extracted them, kind of like a spellbook. This man is holding a horseshoe. So there could be spells as this is a symbol in witchcraft used to protect against evil spirits. We can continue to the next page where we see some strange pipes that resemble the glass of the alchemist. Now this isn't floral anymore, but this is showing tubing. So 
this could still be discussing the different essences that have been extracted and how they can be continually separated. It shows an essence being dissolved into particles through three tubes and then it's divided into two. So this must be separation. After creating the two separate energies, we have the cherubim and the seraphim again, and the woman and the male with the Phrygian cap. It does actually seem to be this, which is very strange. Then in the center, we see the creation of a homunculus, and it looks like Jesus, but with breast. You could say it resembles a Christ-like figure, because in the center, it has a nest, and there are three flasks underneath, for the trinity and the three stones. Remember in the Ripley scroll, this process is iterative and involves multiple stages of separation and distillation. From here, it seems that the process actually starts over again, so that the first entire mixture was the creation of that homunculus Christ figure. Now, we see that it started over again and there are new fluids being powered. This shows again that these are mixtures most likely resulting from the herbs in the beginning of the book. So what we're seeing seems to be a creative way to represent the distillation process. It's the same thing. Once captured, there are different stages as these essences are being separated one by one into different groups and then making their way down to create mixtures. This time, the final result of this one is a chimera-like being and there are multiple animals. They are hybrids. The large green pools are typically the final mixture of the distillation. We see this collect in tubs and they are the results. We continue to a new section where it seems that they start over again. At the top, we have 10 people, possibly the Sephiroths, but it's not clear as the two on the right may be an Adam and Eve-like figure. We see the distillation process begin and there's even a lady being baptized. These different bodies, who some of which have crowns, are again being divided, collected, and distilled further for a new mixture. In one of the tubs, we can see a pipe releasing blue fluid. Now it continues into another similar scene, with two of the humans on each side, and they are merging into a vessel or nest. But there's no human this time. Instead, right under what we see is a blue being, so Anima, is going through a four-way pipe and is being forced out the fire end, where a sun-like star is coming out and floating over to this other lady who is dressed in green, so this is a mixture and that anima is being collected into her through the black stone, the philosopher's stone. This is the transfer of a soul into another body. Then at the end, what do we see? The lady that was green before is now to the right, shocked. She's in a blue tub because she just got mixed with anima and now she's being added to a final pool or mixture of all these other ladies. This is the creation of a new human and the attachment of a soul. We continue further down and we see the different types of homunculus that you can create. We see a rainbow representing divine intervention and this is replicated towards the bottom where we see two rainbows, two people to the left, a female and a bucket, so the prima materia, the red stone, a male outside the bucket, so anima, white stone, and then the merged hermaphroditic creature holding a three-way pipe is in the green bucket with the black stone, the philosopher stone. This process is repeated a few more times. And if you were questionable on whether the herbs were related to alchemy, later in the book, there's an entire section dedicated to making these different mixtures. And it also goes with what we were viewing before. Notice how it's a distillation device, almost resembling an Athenor. But if we consider the alchemical illustrations from earlier, it seems logical to conclude that they are connected. If you look close, you can see that there are green fluids in the side of these vessels. They are using the roots of the plants, and clearly, this is a book on making herbal mixtures or potions. However, in the right context, we can see how it is more than just that. This is showing the process of astrological influence on plants and how to extract them. It's a book diving into alchemical secrets. We don't need to decode the words to deduce that information. Furthermore, why was it kept cryptic in the first place? If it was discussing the alchemical philosopher's stone, then that would make sense why this has been kept secret behind code, so that only those initiated or the ones with the cipher can receive the full knowledge. Interestingly, 
Roger Bacon plays into this because he was the one who started the use of cryptography and alchemy in one of his early books from 1270. He explains precisely why this was done. Quote, a man is a crazy who writes a secret in any other way that one which will conceal it from the vulgar." End quote. So we know that the alchemists use ciphers to hide their secrets. Is the Voynich manuscript an alchemical manuscript describing the secrets behind the creation of the homunculus? The peacock is a significant symbol in alchemy. The ancient Greeks held a belief that the flesh of the peacock didn't decay after death, leading it to symbolize immortality. As Christianity began to emerge, it borrowed symbols from older traditions, including the peacock. The bird came to represent the resurrection and eternal life of Christ, a theme often echoed in early Christian and Byzantine art. You can also see the peacock in the art throughout the medieval period and the Renaissance. Every spring, the male peacock regrows its tail feathers, a cycle of renewal that parallels the themes of resurrection. It is said that India is the birthplace of the peacock. The bird became a symbol of royalty and power. It's a national bird of India and holds significance in both Hinduism and Islam. In the realm of alchemical symbolism, the peacock holds an interesting and unique place. The peacock's tail, or Gauda Bhavanis, represents a specific stage in the alchemical process. This is the point where a blackened substance gives way to a display of colors, similar to the iridescent tail of a peacock. This stage is considered a sign of hope and progression towards the ultimate stages of the great work, the creation of the Philosopher's Stone. This concept was often depicted symbolically in alchemical illustrations, many of which are laden with esoteric and allegorical meaning. There's this really interesting piece called the Peacock Stage, attributed to Georg Bru the Elder, a German artist from the early 16th century. This painting, like many others, presents the peacock within a flask, further connecting the bird to the transformative process of alchemy. Now we move on to the book Amphithetrum Sapientiae Aeternae, 1609, and this is a fascinating text on alchemy. We left it for later because it's quite symbolic. It was written by Henrik Kunrath, and he even mentions the homunculus. Heinrich Kunrath, 1560-1605, was a German alchemist, physician, and hermetic philosopher. He's best known for his work Amphithetrum Sapientiae Aeternae, translated into Amphitheater of Eternal Wisdom, which was first published in 1595 and later expanded in 1609. So there's some really crazy stuff in here. To begin, the most famous depiction of the Emerald Tablets is from this book. Many of you have seen these engravings. The Emerald Tablet, also known as the Smaragdin Table or Tabula Smaragdina, is a compact and cryptic piece of hermetic literature that has fascinated scholars and alchemists for centuries. It is said to contain the secrets of the art of alchemy and the foundation of hermetic philosophy. The Emerald Tablet is written as a series of aphorisms, which are brief statements expressing a general truth or principle. Its opening line sets the stage for the profound wisdom contained within the text. Quote, True it is without falsehood, certain and most true. That which is above is like to that which is below and that which is below is like to that which is above, to accomplish the miracles of one thing." End quote. The first lines of the Emerald Tablet emphasize the concept of correspondence, stating that the macrocosm, the universe or larger scale, and the microcosm, the individual or smaller scale, are interconnected and reflect each other. This idea is commonly summarized in the Hermetic axiom, as above, so below. This principle can be explained in that higher forces, such as the astral, have a direct relationship with that which is below, the physical, similar to a mirror. The higher planes can be manipulated, and so will a reflection, the material world. This also can be seen as the inner and outer worlds, the outer being the exterior physical world we inhabit and the inner being the psyche. The cryptic hermetic emerald tablet was highly regarded by Islamic and European alchemists, and they used these principles as a foundation for their occult symbols and images. Here's a quote from the bottom of the Emerald Tablet that's in the engraving from the Amphithetrum book. The bottom paragraph of the tablet says, quote, When thinking about nature of things and raising the mind's action to the heavenly, with the body's senses now asleep, as usually happens to those who are suddenly seized by sleep due to fullness or fatigue, I seemed to see someone of immense size who called me by my name and cried out in this way. 
What is it, O oh Mercury, that you desire to hear and discover? What is it that you want to learn and understand? Then I said, Who are you? Pymander, he replied, the divine power and wisdom, and see what you want. I want to learn the nature of things and know God, I said. To this, he said, Embrace me with your mind, and I will teach you all things you desire. After saying this, he changed his form and suddenly revealed everything." End quote. On the next page, there's a tower at the top that says, Porta Amphitheatre Sapiente Aeternae Solvis Verdi, the gate of the amphitheater of eternal wisdom of the only truth. I'd assume that this is a metaphor for this book, as it reveals secret truths. In the foreground, there is a man worshipping a tiny cross with a skull and a flower in the front? That would mean something else is going on here. There's a man in the back behind this with the robes, so secret societies? Okay, but the weird thing is that there seems to be a bunch of eggs on this boat in the foreground to the bottom left. So these oarsmen are eggs? Or is this a symbol that they were born of an egg? So what's going on in these last two engravings? Well, if we go back to the emerald tablet depiction, this is an ancient massive tablet, and the entire environment is in ruins. This doesn't look like a mountain, but ruins. Is this knowledge from an ancient time, and then some cataclysm occurred? We do see this guy on his knees praying to the sky, but that's not all. This next page is absolutely mind-blowing. It shows a massive star fort being used outside a city for the purpose of an occult alchemical ritual. Wait, so is this what they were using star forts for? Also notice how the emerald tablet is in the center. So wait, were they using ancient star forts as a means for charging some type of massive event? Look at Azoth on top or the Arabian serpent biting its own tail. This entire thing is an alchemical device. There are seven points, and he even says the homunculus right here. It says, quote, The false philosophical homunculus, through the assistance of an evil familiar spirit, brings despair. Wait, so that would mean that it isn't a philosophical homunculus, because then how would it bring despair? And what is the context? He's saying, don't use spirits that are misaligned or evil or it will bring despair in the creation of a real homunculus. Look at the alchemical bases around this occult star fort. And are those power pyramids with light bulbs glowing? This is 1609, so what's going on here? Is this proving that some type of technology was used in the creation of a homunculus? And this also kind of connects with Full Metal Alchemist. Now on page 23, there's a zodiac celestial representation with a sperm and a child merged in the shape of a cross. It's actually a pentagram too. Below this, we see an egg with wings. There's also an alchemical lab in this book, and it's very detailed. This is no ordinary lab hidden in the basement. This is a royal palace chamber, and this guy's set up with everything he needs. Look at the chimney section. There's a coat of arms with a hidden knight. There's even an evocation tent where he can summon the spirits needed. This is basically his ChatGPT where he gets the answers to whatever he questions. Quote, Fortunate is the one to whom good counsel is given. So he's obviously getting some type of advice. We see a wide variety of vases, and alchemical vases all labeled and prepared for the alchemist. There's really a lot in this book, but to finish off, page 35, we see rings containing the stone, which is ancient in origin. There are 10 flames, 33 inscribed on the stone, so Freemason symbols. Then we see demons defecating, hybrids, rabbit people. And then on page 37, there's an owl holding a cross and two flames. This kind of connects to Promised Neverland. So there are many strange alchemical visions, some of them that didn't really make it into their own sections. But here are a couple that are just very weird. There's the Figurarum Egyptiatorium Secretum. From the 15th to 17th century, it shows a Rosicrucian bird in the creation of a homunculus, an androgynous bird 
which is also the same as the double-headed eagle on coat of arms. In this fountain image, we see the same blue, silverish figures from earlier, and there are nine of them. From the 16th century of Ramon Lull, there's an alchemical page that shows babies of multiple colors being grown from a tree in a fountain, and there are priests at the top watching over. On the bottom is a king, and the right Adam. Is this his new body? Petrus Bonus, also known as Peter Bonus, was an Italian alchemist who lived in the 14th century, with his most famous work being Pretosa Margarita Novella, The New Pearl of Great Price, written around 1330. It provides a comprehensive overview of the theory, practice, and spiritual aspects of alchemy, including the preparation of the Philosopher's Stone. In his work, there's a mansion section. The text describes a scene where a king is seated on a throne, wearing a diadem and holding a scepter, symbolizing his power. His son and five servants, wearing different colored robes, kneel before the king and ask him to share his power with them. However, the king does not respond to their request. Following this scene, the son is incited by the servants to stab his father as he sits on the throne. Then the text suggests making an amalgam with highly purified water. Is he talking about the aqua of the alchemist? We continue. In this additional excerpt, the text provides a series of allegorical mansions that describe a transformative process. Here's the breakdown. The son catches the father's blood in his robe, representing the second process of their art. A grave is dug in the furnace, indicating a stage of transformation. The son intends to throw the father into the grave, but both fall in together, suggesting a union of elements. The son tries to get out, but another figure prevents him, indicating a containment of the transformation. The father and son experience putrefaction in the tomb, representing a stage of decomposition and change. The putrefaction is inspected in the eighth mansion. The bones are taken from the tomb, symbolizing the extraction of the essence. Then the bones are divided and undergo a purification process. Angels are sent to cast the bones on purified earth, indicating a divine intervention or a more advanced stage in the process. The servants pray for the king's restoration, marking a shift towards rebirth. A series of angels place parts of the bones on the earth, resulting in color changes that signify stages of the transformation. Then, the king rises from the tomb with a spiritual and heavenly body, symbolizing rebirth and the completion of the transformation process. The Pretiosissimum Donum Dei, or the most precious gift of God, is a significant early alchemical work containing a series of 12 illustrations. It has over 60 manuscripts with the earliest dating back to the 15th century. It's a very strange text that shows the different stages within the vessel. It discusses the necessity of combining two bodies to create the elixir, which is capable of healing all infirmities and converting imperfect metals into gold. The process of alchemy described in the Donum Dei involves several stages, beginning with the dissolution of bodies into argent vive or quicksilver. This is followed by the formation of black earth, which is then dissolved into water and transformed into oil, referred to as the oil of philosophers. There's even a depiction that shows the androgynous being forming within the flask. The black earth is eventually turned white, symbolizing the elixir for the white, which can transform imperfect bodies into pure silver. The final stage involves the conversion of the whiteness into a transparent redness like a ruby, representing the elixir for the red, which can transform imperfect bodies into pure gold. The Rosarium Philosophorum, or Rosary of the Philosophers, is a 16th century alchemical treatise that has been widely influential in chemistry, medicine, philosophy, psychology, art, music, and literature. Its primary aims are the transmutation of metals, ultimately into gold, and the creation of the elixir or medicine, also known as the quintessence or the philosopher's stone, which has the power to perfect all people or objects it touches. The manuscript features various stages of the alchemical process, including the preparation of the prima materia, the conjunction of solar and lunar elements, and the demonstration of perfection. This text also incorporates Christian imagery, such as the crowning of the Virgin Mary and the resurrection, merging spiritual and alchemical themes. Then there's a tree sprouting a spirit that ascends to higher planes. This one's crazy. We see Mary as a priest getting burned, but it's actually her being dissolved and her blood is being extracted into the cell from multiple sperm-like shapes. 
Oh, and this is weird. Did you know that there's a world record involving the largest homunculus? It's credited to a historical figure in the 16th century named Count Johann Ferdinand von Kustein. This record is supposed to be the record for the largest one, supposedly getting to a height of 30 centimeters tall. The stranger part about this story is that, supposedly, very notable figures such as Count Franz Joseph von Thun and Count Max Lamberg came to visit these homunculi. It wasn't just one, but it seems that Count Johann created 10 homunculi. Allegedly, eight were physical and two were spirit form that could be summoned after muttering Hebrew words. One was red and the other was the color blue. At one point, one of the physical homunculus actually tried to escape its jar, but then died after being exposed to air. In a book called The Sphinx, edited by Dr. Emil Basensny, we find some interesting accounts in regarding to the number of spirits generated by Kustin. It would seem that the Masons were highly interested in these manuscripts, and these accounts come from the diary of Jos Kammerer, who was the butler to von Kustin. The ten homunculi, referred to as prophesying spirits, were created by Count J.F. of Kustin, and also Italian mystic Abbe Geloni. Stored in fruit-preserving bottles filled with water, they included a king, queen, knight, monk, nun, architect, minor, seraph, and two colored spirits. And listen to this, sealed with ox bladders and a magic symbol. These one span long spirits swam in the bottles and the count desired that they would grow further. The homunculi were buried under two cartloads of horse manure and sprinkled daily with a specially prepared liquid made by the adepts from repulsive materials. This caused fermentation and steaming as if heated from beneath. Every three days, the two gentlemen would visit the pile at night to pray and fumigate it. After removing from the manure, the homunculi had grown to about one and a half spans, with the males developing beards and long nails. Abigiloni provided them with the clothing suitable for their roles. The bottles containing the red and blue spirits appeared to hold only clear water. But when the abbey knocked thrice and spoke Hebrew words, the water changed color and the spirit's faces emerged. The blue spirit had an angelic face, while the red one's expression was terrifying. The homunculi were fed every three to four days with a rose-colored substance given in pea-sized pills. Their water was changed weekly, except for the blue spirit, which required no sustenance or water change. The red spirit received a thimble full of animal blood each week that disappeared without altering the water. Quote, By some accident, the glass containing the monk fell one day upon the floor and was broken. The poor monk died after a few painful respirations, in spite of all the efforts of the count to save his life, and his body was buried in the garden. An attempt to generate another one, made by the count without the assistance of the abbey, who had left resulted in failure, as it produced only a small thing like a leech, which had very little vitality and soon died." End quote. You know, all this information brings to question hybrid creatures from myth, or even the demons depicted on The Last Judgment. If it's true that the ancients thoroughly explored how to create artificial beings and the spontaneous generation of animals, who is to say that these experiments didn't go further, and that some of these creatures were actually created by the alchemist? There's a strange set of engravings in a book called The Cabinets of Curiosities, Wander to Neo de Nature by Levinus Vincent. They say he was just a collector of small animals and seashells, but also artificialia, which resemble the homunculus of the alchemists. There are also occult symbols in this book, such as hybrid creatures, and a man holding a hive pointing to the shells next to him filled with various jars. This brings to question the monstrous races of Christianity, such as the Headless Men or the Blemies. There are many different kinds, but countless historical figures considered these beings to truly exist. They are a part of Christian mythology, and they are categorized into different races. At first, it seems kind of like imagination, but now in the right context, these images sort of look like some messed up genetic experiment. The guy with the one leg and massive foot is called the monopod. And sure, 
Some of these do seem symbolic, as with the one with the androgynous being, but some of these may actually be physical depictions of creatures that were created from the secret practice of alchemy. Then, there was a period where these creatures needed to be all wiped out. That's why we see Alexander the Great fighting them. Now we need to discuss an aspect that has been ignored but alluded to throughout the video. There are some authors throughout history that do believe the alchemists were seeking gold, but not physical gold, a spiritual gold, and that specifically, this was a metaphor for creating the body of light. Two things can be true at the same time, as it's most likely that both physical and occult interpretations are a part of one thing. We need to discuss the occult double. The best author on this subject for people just getting started is Ophiel, as he breaks it down in an easy to understand fashion. He does speak on the homunculus, but he believes it to be a metaphor for what we're about to discuss. Everyone knows of dreams, and by now, everyone has heard of the concept of becoming lucid in one's dream. It's not just a made-up fantasy, and it does happen to people naturally or on random occasions. But if one was to look into how to pursue these matters and increase the frequency in which they occur, meaning the ability to wake in one's dreams, it would seem that the techniques developed are dependent on the occult and hermetic tradition, specifically astral projection. This is because lucid dreaming is something that you don't typically control unless you have a natural talent for it. But most of the time they happen by accident, or in other words, there's no training necessary. However, the ancients figured out that through mystic practices, meditations, and thought exercises, that they could directly influence not only lucid dreams, but open an entirely new world. These exercises include silencing the mind, mastering or focusing on the individual elements, and the skill to focus on one single thought for an extended amount of time. There are no demon, spirits, or witchcraft required. Although simple, these skills actually allow you to navigate the mind in a way that we were never taught. And this is one of the secrets of the occult orders. It's that essentially, they have techniques in which they can astral project and have meetings. This is what the Sabbath is and what witches have been doing for centuries. Shared dreams are possible and the ancients were aware of this, which would explain how so much has been lost as there's a whole other plane of existence that we're not aware of because we have never been taught the methods to train our higher senses and our entire culture promotes the indulgence of our physical senses. So we're stuck ignoring these higher forces unless we practice, then we can start to remember these higher senses. Dreams are you naturally leaving your body every night and exploring your psyche, but there are limitations and or boundaries. Once you begin to develop this skill or astral projection, you'll be able to travel freely. But what happens is, you begin to realize that the astral phenomena can be influenced by your will. Not only this, but in some cases, certain characters have different levels of intelligences. Some are NPCs, but there are other characters that seem to possess more intelligence than you. There are several books on the nature of the astral plane, including the astral plane, its scenery, inhabitants, and phenomena. This is not a full breakdown on the different planes or techniques, but I did want to provide some context so that we can better understand how this applies to the homunculus. Well, one of the techniques for astral projection is known as the body of light method. This technique takes the skills acquired from meditating on each element and you are to combine them into one source. So you have to literally do mental alchemy which would require focus for your vision to be clear without distraction. In certain mental states, this is more vivid, and it becomes an experience that becomes your new reality. You forget what you are doing and become the thing that you are doing. The subject meets the object, and as you do this, you are to still transfer consciousness without disturbing the flow, so that you have a lucid dream, which is much easier said than done. Once this is established, you are meditating, you merge subject and object, meaning you forgot what you were doing, but you're in a dream and still focused on what you were doing. In the state, you can begin to manipulate forms more easy or visualize with a clear precision. Then, you are to craft a body of light out of these elements. 
with practice, one can actually build an astral form to become whatever the alchemist desires. It can be a hybrid creature, set with the intent for protecting the house, but that would be a creation of a separate astral entity. For astral projection, your body of light is supposed to be your vehicle for exploring the astral realm without losing consciousness or having to force a lucid dream through trick methods that wake you up after falling asleep. The body of light is the Merkaba in which you can travel through different planes. This connects to the homunculus because your body of light is a homunculus. You can use your homunculus as a vehicle and or if you leave the body of light on its own, like Paracelsus said, it becomes a giant or a mystical being. In this context, the new astral body of light without a host will go on to become its own intelligence if left out in the wild resulting in a transformation into one of the elementals, most likely the element that is most focused based on the user's personality. This body of light can be created indirectly through trauma or intense emotions, so it happens naturally. For these as well can grow and become their own intelligences. One such example is the tulpa. Another version of the body of light method, which is not particularly as a cult, but a simple visualization exercise, is to practice imagining as if it was an augmented reality game where your imagined visual from your inner mind needs to overlay with reality, with your eyes open. You are to sit down and imagine a mirror image of yourself sitting in front of you. You can practice with an actual mirror if you want to. At first, it should feel like it's really just coming from in your head, your imagination. But over time, with practice, you can actually project this visual to the point where you forget what you were doing and the subject merges with the object. And in this state, your visuals will overlay more clearly. If you have no fear, you can practice in a darker room with dim candle lights, not to be a cold or anything, but it's that artificial and bright lights alter this ability. The visuals become far more vivid in this scenario, and even with just a few hours of practice, you can start seeing some weird things. In some stories, it's possible for this mirror reflection to begin speaking with you, which will serve as a means for connecting deep with the psyche, another chat GPT. But it's said that over time, if this being is constantly used or misabused, that it begins to develop dark and demonic traits, very similar to the homunculus trope. This can vary from user to user, depending on what is occurring internally, but the practice of developing these higher senses for exploring the mind with clear visuals is crucial to this practice. The ability to explore the astral realm and create forms, which is different because it feels as if you're in a realistic environment. Then, the ability to move consciousness into different bodies and or create astral forms with their own intelligences. These are all a part of the secret science of the creation of a homunculus. So now, Let's take a look at a translated full Libra Vacai. Before, we were just looking at the papers on the subject. I want to thank Juan for finding this book and sending it over. Without him, I wouldn't have found this book as it was extremely difficult to find. From there, I used the best OCR tools to extract the text and then feed it into GPT-4. Keep in mind that this text in no way, shape, or form is to serve as a final translation, but only as a base as we have not had expert Latin translators review the text yet. However, I do want to note that just because the text is not 100% accurate, and with some names and objects, there may be some mistranslation. But overall, because we have different snippets of the text from different papers and authors, there's definitely something in this Latin text found in a medicine book from the 16th century. It is in the Montpellier Inter-University Library, Medicine Section H277, and there are several other important alchemical texts as well, including the Secrets of Secrets. Now it's not perfect, and we are not translators, but GPT-4 is perhaps the best Latin translator as of yet, and the reason is because it understands context and how to correct for errors. For example, Google Translate or DeepL will not correct OCR errors or character swaps like with the F for S or the V for U in some cases. There are some very fascinating things to gain from this translated text. With that, there are several warnings throughout the text as GPT felt certain areas were hard to translate so it's letting you know when those areas are. 
it is a handwritten text, so it's not perfect by any means. The text begins, In the name of Christ, all blessings be upon this book of the institutions of the actions of the furnace, in which the human child lives by the law of Labak. Receive to dwell with perpetual residence this book of the placation of the philosopher and doctor, the great book of institutions, amplified and finished. And it opened to him the understanding of what he intended, and so much was it well accomplished in him that it was delightful to him and converted his and their minds and hearts, and he did good with the knowledge of the order of providing explanations for the book of the Platonic works. Those who are able to understand the gifts up to that point, when they are closed with clarity, they themselves will open it when they wish and close it as well. The place where they stand and say that it exists is where my actions and theirs are involved. I can also adapt and close it with their understanding and their actions, for they are prepared for the closure of their understanding. They intend to ask about it in a small way. They are involved in their own actions and closures. The entire age seeks the protection of the clamor for the existence of the divine. The two brothers, known to me and my soul, withdrew from it and did not take part in it. They received it in the same way and declined it, as it should be for the removal of the veil. They spread it out and prepared it for export, and they were tired. The human work of the great men of the world, they made their own body and their own work labor, and they made the books of the place and the preparations of the leaders in the pursuit of knowledge and labor in the experience of the books and the translation of permission of these books. The books that were given to the saints are now given to their encouragement. Their fatigue and their service to the Lord after others, they do not know where they are or what they are doing with them. The wise man Galenus, a friend of Philip, and his fellow man, who turned after them and sought to approach them, allowed them to give up the book or books of their knowledge. The ignorance and defense of their intellects, the more they become intelligent, the more they confess that they lack the understanding of their own actions. Now, I will not test so much the book of our knowledge, but I will seek the understanding of the wise man Philip Galenus. I will go with him to the investigations and these sacred appearances so that what is hidden and unknown becomes clear and open, and through the divine assistance, the human salvation is achieved. Philip did not neglect his book, nor did he abandon it after this time, but he returned to his own work. The great work of Plato is not done through it except for your kingdom, which you have and have always had. The entrance and exit of so many works, the creation of the heavens and the craftsmanship of the stars, the knowledge of the constellations and the sacred order of the heavens, do not doubt their truth. They do not falsify it, and they have already justified their cause for it. Why do they deny the knowledge and dismiss the truth of their works, when they are not the first or the last? They do not cease to seek the truth, even if they do not find it in the secular or the ancient. The saints, through their teachings, have increased their knowledge and returned to the truth and falsified the others. They have advanced with their wisdom and their lesser knowledge, and they have not been allowed to approach and participate in the divine work. If they were wise, they would not abandon their knowledge and their teachings, but they would understand the secrets and the hidden things, the great and the small, and they would make them known to themselves and to others, in the night and in the day, in the presence of the ultimate and the disciples. The hours themselves and every moment of their dissolution, the secret knowledge of the sun's power is sought. In the depths of their being, they find the essence of life in the secrets of the universe. In the midst of this journey, they encounter the waters in the paths of the trees. When the time comes for their transformation in the adaption of their colors, the trees' movements during their walk lead them to certain places where they form connections with other beings, both human and non-human. These beings, named by forces of nature, possess gifts that they share with those who are able to establish a connection with them. Among these gifts are the fires and eternal lighting that illuminate and reveal the hidden aspects of existence. Over these forces, certain beings hold dominion, and they manifest in various forms, some of which are beyond human understanding. These beings are able to change their forms and adapt to the needs of those who seek their assistance. They possess knowledge of the earth and its elements, and they have the power to heal and protect. They can also bestow abilities upon those who are worthy, allowing them to accomplish feats that would otherwise be impossible. In this realm of existence, these are beings who are neither good nor evil, but rather serve as agents of balance in the natural order of things. 
they can be called upon to assist in various tasks and challenges, but their allegiance is not guaranteed and must be earned through acts of devotion and respect. There is a stone of great power, known as the Kerbuncle, which can illuminate even the darkest night. It is said that those who possess this stone can gain access to hidden knowledge of the earth and its inhabitants. The stone is not easily found, and its true nature can only be revealed through a series of trials and tests. In their quest for the Carbuncle, the seekers must traverse a dark and treacherous landscape, filled with perils and unknown dangers. They must rely on their wits, their courage, and their connection to the forces of nature to guide them through these trials. At the end of their journey, the seekers will find the Carbuncle, and with it, the knowledge and power that they seek. But this power comes with a responsibility, for it must be used wisely and with care. The forces of nature are not to be trifled with, and those who would abuse their gifts will find themselves facing the wrath of the elements. In the white vat, let there be a mixture of good, diverse herbs, and enough earth with some dew from the sun of the siblings and all stones. And if you made more, add it to the nearby flesh with a binding, so that it becomes a vessel for a month. On that night, Aliabim will teach the sun the secret knowledge of the mixture, in which the essence will remain hidden. Carefully extract the form from the absent ones and mix it when the time is right. Take the first layer and mix it with blood and dew, and if it happens, pour it out of the man himself, so the form and stability remains. Let it be a firm base, whether from the sheep or the calcinite ashes from which the prepared mixture flows. And if it doesn't work, inflame the mixture with heat and form an iron crucible. If you break it, make it firm and feed it within the mixture itself so that it lasts for days and nourishes the child. Let it sit and not mix with anything else and not reveal its secret except by consuming it after a few days and heating it. When it is completely mixed, take it with your hands and feet and spread it on the ground. In a distant place, let it lie in a wide and tall structure. This act will produce an explanation, allowing the growth of plants. If this is done, it will bring forth water from the deep and mix it with the dew. Do this for the rational soul of another and let it rise to the heavens with grace at the hour of departure. Accept it in your hand and let it be with you. Afterward, place the stone in the sun and let it begin to dissolve. Add acid to the solution and when the time of separation comes, take it in your hand. Do not fear, for the result will be lines of powerful knowledge. Use it as a remedy for all ailments and it will be effective. Place it near the roots of a tree called arbor and let it absorb the essence. Take the sap from the tree and use it to make a powerful medicine. Combine it with the blood of a dead animal and mix it with fire, water, and earth to create a powerful potion. This medicine will heal many diseases and give life to those who consume it. Take the potion and after purification, let it sit in the sun for several days. Eventually, it will take on a new form and its power will be revealed. Use this knowledge wisely and with great care, for its secrets can bring great power or terrible destruction. First, concerning what is said about the creation of the cow and the manner in which the elements are mixed with water and placed in a small container. Remember the stone of the sun and gather it in a glass vessel. Then, take the white of the moon and mix it with a little of the great and necessary substance. Bind it with the hair and fragments of the animal and place it in a dark house where the light of the moon does not disturb it. Protect it with a certain stone so that no harm comes to it, and let it remain there for several days. After this time, take the wings of a bee, the leaves of the heliotrope plant, and the leaves of the mandrake, and place them on the parts of the cow where the leaves of the persimmon and the leaves of the alder touch the ground. Then place the cow in a corner and add a mixture of the ashes and the earth, along with small reptiles and insects. Close the house with a door and let it remain there for a few days. After this time, open the window and let in fresh air. If the cow is still alive, feed it with mixture of honey and ashes. If it is dead, bury it in the ground and cover it with a layer of earth. After three days, dig it up and place it in a new location. Surrounded by the remains of bees and other insects, and do not let it be disturbed by anyone or anything. In this way, you've created the cow, 
and it will be able to perform its miraculous task. It will be able to transform itself into various shapes and forms. It will be able to heal and protect those who are in need. It will also be able to create fire and light, and it will be able to communicate with the spirits of the earth and the heavens. To accomplish this, you must also create a special talisman made from the bones of a lion and the feathers of a bird. This talisman should be inscribed with powerful symbols and placed in a secret location where it will be protected from harm. When the time's right, you will be able to use this talisman to summon the cow and perform great feats of magic and alchemy. In addition to the talisman, you will also need to create a special potion made from the hairs of a horse's mane and the leaves of a certain plant. This potion should be applied to the cow's body and it will enable it to perform its miraculous task. It will also protect the cow from harm and ensure that it remains strong and healthy. Finally, you must also create a special incantation which will be used to summon the cow and control its actions. This incantation should be written in a secret language known only to you and a select few others. When the time is right, you will be able to use this incantation to call upon the cow and command it to do your bidding. Thus, by following these instructions and performing these tasks, you will be able to create the legendary cow and harness its incredible powers for your own purposes. In the white container, let there be incense and a good amount of various mixtures, along with a little bit of the sun sand and all of the stones, and when you have made more, add them to the nearby flesh. Let that mixture last for a month, and during the night, you will learn the secret. In the formula where the mixture was, the result will be cautious. Extract the form in the absence of others and combine it, as when you remove this first layer. Receive the form and prepare it with the help of the man himself, and establish it in a permanent form, whether it is of a sheep or a calcined form. If you then manage to create this permanent form and nourish it, divide it into the parts that are needed over several days, and let it not be mixed with any other substance. After several days, the substance will be exhausted and you will need to warm it up. In this process, you will use three legs, and with the help of the feet, you will prepare the soil for the half of the earth's surface. If you do this, you'll be able to use the parts of the tree named arbor and the habra tree, which will provide the substance for the entire tree. The substances will be tested and mixed with the heart of the tree and the liquid from the horse's stomach, and the result will be a powerful medicine. Place the mixture near a tree where it will catch the dew and be exposed to the sun. Afterward, apply it to the tree's wounds and the tree will heal. If you can capture the snakes and the large worms of the north, you will obtain a powerful substance. Mix it with the earth to create a solid foundation. You will have a remedy for many illnesses. In the dark of the night, the moon will shine brightly. Then, the substances will be mixed together to create a powerful formula. When you combine them with the earth, you will see incredible things that cannot be explained by magic alone. With the help of Saint Berti, you will create a strong mixture with the earth and the ashes from the fire. Afterward, you will let it cool and expose it to the sun, and the result will be a potent medicine that can cure many diseases. In the end, you will collect the remaining substances and use them to create a powerful remedy which will heal various wounds and ailments. Of the two palms, hide our knowledge and send it to the monastery where the wise gather and discuss the secrets of alchemy. On the back of a black hair, write your findings and bring them to the gathering place. There, the wise will study and debate the nature of the hidden knowledge. In this book, you'll find the secrets of alchemy and the methods to create powerful substances. Be cautious, for the power contained within these pages is immense and can be dangerous and misused. If you follow the instructions and combine the elements correctly, you will create a potion that can heal any ailment. However, if you make a mistake, the consequences could be disastrous. Take the water in which you have sanctified the sacred elements and mix it with the ash from the sacred fire. Then. Place it in a dark room where the sun's rays do not shine. After a time, a miraculous substance will form, and with it you can perform wonders. When the time comes, feed the substance to the sick, and they will be cured of their ailments. But be careful, for if you give them too much, they can become addicted to its power. In the dark room, you will also find the ingredients to create a potion that can grant the drinker the ability to see the unseen. Take this potion and share it with those who seek the truth, 
but be wary of those who would use it for evil purposes. Remember, the secrets of alchemy are powerful and not meant for the uninitiated. Treat this knowledge with respect and share it only with those who have proven themselves worthy. That seems to be GPT-4 advice. We continue. And so, many of them diligently perform this chapter either by name or by their own sanctity. Their knowledge has come to us which is pleasing to the community of men. They made this chapter with the assistance of spirits, famous and well guarded. With them, you will know the secret and pass it on to others. Swear by divine authority, by the laws and their errors, and the tablets of the house of wisdom, which are established by the order of the wise and those who pray and work. In this way, they have the power and knowledge of the tablets, divided into two parts, from which they learn and save the thundering universe, and the divine prizes of the angels who were summoned by the highest power to bind and release all things, and to give and to take away, to share equally in the reward and punishment, and are assigned to this work according to their abilities in the will of the spirits. Then, with the completion of the water, they work together with the spirits to create life in the alchemical elixir. They mix it with various ingredients, invoking the protection of the divine and the knowledge of the wise. They perform their work in secret, and when it's finished, they give thanks to the divine, their father, and to the spirits who have guided them. They share their knowledge with others, teaching them the secrets of alchemy and the mysteries of the universe. In this way, they became masters of the art, and their fame spread far and wide. They are sought after their wisdom and their ability to heal and transform. They work tirelessly, day and night, to protect their craft and to serve their fellow men. And so, the legacy of their knowledge is passed down through generations, from master to apprentice, from one age to the next. In this book, we find the secrets of the wise, the knowledge of the divine, and the mysteries of the universe. In the beginning, a powerful force created a balance, sitting it on its heels, and set forth a path for the wanderers. From the fields, the light came forth, joining forces with the mysterious al Gruba line. In time, the sacred heart solidified in the void, awakening through the energies of the ancient Magi. Levi, who dwelt in the heavens, brought forth an abundance of knowledge and power from the sun and the earth. The sacred F, hidden in the shadows, provided guidance and protection for those who sought their path. In the days of the old, the wise ones would gather the essence of the heavens and the earth, mixing them with the sacred waters to create powerful elixirs. These elixirs could grant great abilities, healing the sick and bestowing gifts upon the worthy. The alchemists would work tirelessly, refining their techniques and seeking the ultimate truth. In their quest, they discovered the secrets of the elements, the power of transformation, and the mysteries of the universe. They learned to harness the energies of the cosmos, bending them to their will and shaping them to wondrous creations. Through their art, they brought forth new life, new hope, and new understanding. But with great power came great responsibility, and the wise ones knew that their knowledge could be used for both good and evil. They guarded their secrets closely, ensuring that only the worthy would have access to their wisdom. They established a sacred order, dedicated to preserving the balance between light and darkness. In times of need, the chosen ones would gather, sharing their knowledge and power to overcome these challenges that faced them. They would stand united, a beacon of hope in a world of uncertainty. And through their efforts, the light would prevail, driving back the shadows and ensuring the survival of all. This is a legacy of the ancient alchemist, the guardians of the sacred truths. Brand, in his secret writings, speaks of all the hidden things and discourses of them, saying that from the mixture of certain elements, a substance can be created. This substance, when combined with the power of words and rituals, will radiate light that can transform the ordinary into the extraordinary. To achieve this, one must follow the instructions laid out in the Book of the Cow. First, Take the weight of 50 days of labor and mix it with the 7 days of pure thought and contemplation. From this mixture, create a substance that can be used to anoint the body of a man, so that he may see and communicate with the spirits of wisdom. This anointing should be done on the ninth day, at the threshold of a door, either in the morning or evening, depending on the desired outcomes. Next, gather the ingredients necessary for the creation of a powerful talisman. These include the bones of saints, the ashes of burned sacred text, and the hairs of a great magician. Combine these items with the blood of two men, take it in equal measure, and then bury the resulting mixture in the ground for a period of time. 
typically during a holy day. After this time has passed, dig up the mixture and carefully combine it with the anointing substance created earlier. Apply this new compound to the body of the man who has been anointed and he will gain the power to see and communicate with the spirits of wisdom. He will also gain the ability to influence the thoughts and actions of others, as well as to control the elements and the forces of nature. To ensure that this power is used wisely, the man must also undergo a series of tests and trials designed to strengthen his character and prove his worthiness. These tests may include physical challenges, mental puzzles, and moral dilemmas, all of which must be overcome in order to gain the full benefits of this magical substance. Once the man has successfully completed these trials, he will be transformed into a being of great power and wisdom, able to shape the world around him according to his will. He will be able to heal the sick, raise the dead, and even create new life from the elements themselves. However, he must always remember that with great power comes great responsibility, and he must use his newfound abilities for the betterment of mankind, rather than for personal gain or selfish desires. Well, if you want to name what everyone knows or what they have learned today, it will be prepared, and it was given to them by the angels through the land. The book was sent to me with the angels, and the heavens revealed it. It is said that if you follow these instructions, you will be able to achieve the desired result. This will lead to the work that must be done, and the mixture of substances will be prepared at night. In this place, men will face the challenges that have been predicted. The sacred words are spoken, and the forces are gathered. When the time comes, the fire will be lit, and the process will begin. The alchemist will prepare the vessel and the divine substances. The mixture will be created with various elements, including minerals and plants. The whole process will be done in secret, away from the eyes of men. If everything is done correctly, the result will be a powerful and transformative substance. The alchemist will then take this substance and apply it to the chosen object. The object will be a place in a hidden location, and a ritual will be performed. The ritual will involve the use of sacred wood and fire. The object will be left in this location for a set number of days, after which it will be retrieved. The alchemist will then continue with the next step of the process. The alchemist will take the object to a secluded place and perform another ritual. This time, the ritual will involve the use of water and the invocation of powerful forces. The object will be submerged in water, and the alchemist will drink from this water. The water will have absorbed the power of the object, and the alchemist will gain this power. The final stage of this process will involve the creation of a new substance, one that has the power to bring great change. This substance will be carefully prepared and applied to the object. The alchemist will then wait for the desired result, which may take some time to manifest. The Book of the Cow begins with the preparation of the bones and the bile, and the use of the feathers of the Abigail bird. All these elements are combined and placed under the protection of Fuberto. The bones are then buried with equal parts of earth and stone under the guidance of the white stone of Lenai. The book continues with the story of Luisco, the son of Lagadai, who was known for his mastery of alchemy. He works with wood and other materials, such as Sabella, to create powerful substances. These substances are then combined with antimony and water, resulting in a talc-like mixture. The alchemist then uses this mixture to create a powerful substance called Falun, which can control the movements of celestial bodies. This substance is used in various magical practices, such as summoning spirits and demons and controlling the elements. The book also contains instructions for creating a special incense, which is used to communicate with spirits and demons. This incense is made from various ingredients, including sulfur, and is burned in a specific location to achieve the desired results. The book goes on to discuss the importance of understanding the celestial bodies and their influence on the world. The alchemists must study the stars and their movements in order to harness their power and use it for their own purposes. The book also contains instructions for creating various magical tools and talismans, which are used to aid the alchemists in their work. These tools include various types of stones, metals, and other materials which are combined and prepared in specific ways to create powerful magical objects. The book concludes with a discussion of the importance of prayer and devotion in the practice of alchemy. The alchemist must maintain a strong connection to the divine and the spiritual world in order to achieve success in their work. Quick note, for some reason GPT-4 decided to conclude these areas, 
It then said in the next paragraph, please note that there may be errors and inaccuracies in this translation due to the nature of the OCR text provided. We continue. In book two, the writing describes the creation of a magical substance using various materials and processes. The text mentions the use of tablets made from the dust of crushed stones, which are then mixed with other ingredients. The mixture is then subjected to various treatments, such as exposure to the elements or being soaked in water or vinegar. The resulting substance is then combined with other materials, such as ashes and clay, and shaped into a specific form. The text then describes a process of burying the object in the ground and leaving it there for a certain number of days. After this period, the object is retrieved and subjected to further treatments, such as exposure to fire or other elements. The entire process is repeated several times, with each repetition intended to increase the potency of the magical substance. In summary, the Book of the Cow contains detailed instructions for the creation of a magical substance using a combination of materials, processes, and rituals. The text is written in an obscure and cryptic style, making it difficult to understand without a deep knowledge of alchemy and the Latin language. It continues, In the name of the Lord, secure and mix it with the ant, and make a crane from them, like grain, which is to be carried out and supported on the altar. Prepare the liturgy and be attentive to the divine mystery. Another good thing is to undertake the third part of the mountain, the four parts made, not the meadows, the third part of the pass. The execution is beneficial, and the nobles are well served with old wine and honey. The fighters are nourished and grow in strength with food and drink. In the shade, they gather strength and find respite with the fruits and golden plates of the senators. They are satisfied and filled with old wine and cooked meat. They sing praises and prepare the ships for assault on all the mines. They carry out great works and press on the storeroom. The fortified arches and the towers shine with gold and stone, and the walls are well constructed. They complete the great works and cast shadows on the surrounding landscape. The nobles and their followers pass through in procession, and their forms, councils, and signs are recognized by their instruments and appearance. They do not hide anything, nor do they engage in lesser acts. Receive the white helmet and the entire armored suit. Move the small shield and place it in the location where the barking of dogs and the sound of their voices can be heard. Take care of the white eye and open the cooking water. Capture the light and gaze upon it with your own eyes. When the day comes, you will see the magnificence of their eyes, which will grow and prosper. In another vision of hospitality, take two eyes of a silo and two eyes of a good wood and two eyes of fishers. Crush the eyes of the two gates and place them for the Arab who came from Egypt. In the shade of the trees, they will find the rest and nourishment. Finish with the humble inheritance in the hermitage and serve them well. Look upon them with your own eyes and use the water of your faithfulness. They will speak with their voices and you will understand their meaning. Take a branch from a tree and make a sign of their power in their works and they will know the way. Please note that this translation may have inaccuracies and may not fully capture the meaning of the original Latin text. There could be room for improvement and I may be unsure about some words or characters. We continue. Enter from that food and praise the work of their hands, five palms and water, and from the mixtures of their substances, cut off and from the back, the third vein of the force, so that it may be the beginning of the third branch. Cut off the branch and place it in the patient's vein so that it may be the connection of the bond which you have cut off, so that it may become the maker of the truth. Let that be on the day of the feast of the true sun, sensing nothing but the theme of the sibyls to whom every beast is subject, whether it is a donkey, a mule, or a horse, or any other animal that comes to it. Give it in the name of the saints and the sect of the holy, and before the secret initiation. Establish it as a fact of the threefold nature, if it so desires. Infinite wisdom has given our house, from the earth itself, and from the honor and sanctity they made offerings in their possessions greatly celebrating the mysteries. Take the weight of the grave, and from your coffer, you will find a part of the secret that the Gagal has prepared. Half of the must have been made, which is equal to the weight of the omitted earth. The operation of the crow is good for the perpetual. The book is pressed. The eclipses are neither greater nor lesser, nor are the horses of the lesser nobility, nor are the firmaments of the book itself. Part of the origin of the pledge of our book and the eclipses themselves, the Apionese were not for us, nor for the affections of others, which is possible and allowed in this. 
that no one of men may know the root of this house, we have found the lesser, then the justice in the gate, or it may be that it was a matter of religion in the honey of truth, not of the future of the trial until we know ourselves in the practice of our book. But we repent in its place and then it is shown to us in the place where it is necessary to perish. The female herself, and with what evil knowledge of the rod of men it pertains, in that they may possess all the servants of the private, as many as the poison of all. Now let them approach them. They may know that which is of the wise and the learned, that which they do not serve in the ego, the excuse of that from the acquisition of water, the choice of that which is known in the centuries in the cutlery of prayer, which is unknown to the names of those who are called, the great and the small, that they may labor at the making of that and know the very maker of the gods, and let them make that which is out of this, that which is the effect of the disciples and with that which goes out of it, the excuse from that, and the greater piety and the difference from that which is the acceptance. Perhaps it is difficult, and through it is not the state in the whole, nor who in the end is in this, the opinion of what is the island, that which is the support of the heart of the workers. And the king, in the end, the honor of this, and I am, after all, the affirmation of the abbot, and the total, as I have opened up, that which precedes the pledge of my books. And it is to be the essence of all the plants that I have passed through the pasture, the state through the making of the face, the mouth, the will to separate the knowledge of the great state and the fruitfulness, the gift of men, the hour before that men may be, and for them, the love of the exalted, the fibit heli, the groans are the great use of the freedom, that in the floboto menaceum, the spirit of the divine, then the ethereal, from that day, if by the first, and the creator, the very essence in the shadow of the herbs, then the part of the sun, after that, the preparation of the medicine, receive the suture that is elevated, the holy matter, and when the prayers are in the golden prayer and the exorcism, they are in the station of the whole, after the pose in the palace with the voice of the song, the grains, the chosen ones, with you from the earth and make the whole for the extension of the earth into those of the future, for them, the earth, the bride, the action, the beginning, and the burial of the ashes, then call to the east, the cellar, and the whole house under its rule, the cohort of the judge, then the mandate, and make the end of the eight strong men, the hour, the ascent of the house, the pestle, the servitude, the good, the protection of all the great, and the frenzied one in their studies, or the circles, or the better ones, or the ones who receive others through the food of men, and you, and the communion from you, the abbot, the part of the resurrection of your health, the blessing of the men, not the excuse of the ends and the tables, and the entrance of the other iodine, the sowing of what is born from the earth, and where the elements are, the attraction of the cat, and the hyssop, and from the dry team, before the gift is made, the will of the operation, the sea, and many of them in the house, and the earth of the waters and the brothers, the service of the cohort of them, the nails of the purple, the birth of that, and the good, if God wills it. Know also, the brother, I wanted to sow the seed upon the term, the thousand, the hatred, that which is now known, the section of the matter, the hindrance, and the pain with it, from another direction, the ligature, the persecution of those who hold it in the cookery, lest it perish, that which is in the place of the vinegar, that which is with the E, in this, then, and, make the oxen so that they are like water from that which is from the sun and the moon, and protect them and combine them. Take the earth which God has given you and do not forget it, but take the earth which you have in the climate and make it the foundation of the camels upon it. Then pour the water from the camels and let it penetrate the fillings of the metals until it's dissolved and placed in a container. However, do this secretly, not before people, for the power of the elements is hidden in this work, bringing health to all. The purification of the elements will make the substances combine and rise together, so that they may pass through the gates of the celestial spheres in a divine manner, and move the spirits of the great and the small. Take the essence of the alchemical work and combine it with some pure substance, so that it may create a sign, and then rise them in holy fire so that all things may be purified and not be destroyed. In the mansions of the spirits, the great and the small shall be made equal, and the horses shall take the essence of the sacred work, which shall be made known by the power of the divine. Take the stone of the philosophers, 
and the tree of life, which is divided into two parts, and combine them with cumin and other ingredients so that a new creation may be born. Let this creation be consecrated and endowed with divine power, like a sacred temple, and let it rise above all things. In this temple, the spirit shall be bound and made subject to the will of the one who has created it. When the time comes, take the eyes of the spirits and the eyes of the angels and bind them together with the bonds of brotherhood, so that they may become one. Then, illuminate them with a the divine light and place them before the people so that they may see the power of the spirits and angels and be transformed into their forms. Take the silver and the gold and let them be made into a vessel and place within it the blood of the elements and the power of the celestial spheres. In this vessel, the spirits and the angels shall be bound and made to serve the will of the one who has created them. Take the hair of the spirits and the angels and bind them together with the bonds of brotherhood so that they may become one. Then, Illuminate them with the divine light and place them before the people so that they may see the power of the spirits and the angels and be transformed into their forms. Take the living essence of the elements and let it be made into a human form and let it be joined with the spirits and the angels so that it may become one with them. Place this creation in the midst of the people and they shall be drawn to it and at night they shall become like the angels and the spirits and they shall be filled with a divine fire. In this way, the divine power shall be made manifest in the world, and the secrets of creation shall be revealed to all who seek them. Okay, so quick note. This next section was difficult to OCR because of the nature of the handwritten text, so it had a difficult time, but it was letting us know some possible translations. I'll leave it here so you can see. We continue. In their efforts, they created a mixture from the cow and its properties were returned to their original state. Take a vessel and mix it carefully with a certain liquid, then add the white part of the sulfur. Make a strong solution and mix it with water. Pour it over the mixture and let it sit for a while. Then, place it on a stable surface and heat it gently. As it heats, add some water and various substances to the mixture, stirring it carefully. Continue this process until the mixture becomes a solid substance like a stone. In this sacred book, it is written that one should perform the process during the day and not at night lest it be harmful to the practitioner. Mix the substances carefully and add them to the stone, making sure to write down the process in the book for future reference. Use a special pen made of metal and ink to inscribe the instructions. Add some more substances to the mixture, such as ashes and earth, and mix them thoroughly. Write down the results in the book, making sure to include any observations or discoveries. As the mixture solidifies, it will become a powerful substance that can be used for various purposes. It is also written that one should protect themselves from the harmful effects of the process by wearing protective garments and using special tools. It's important to work in a well-ventilated area and to keep the workspace clean and organized. Once the stone is complete, it can be used to heal, protect, and bring prosperity to the user. It is said that those who possess the knowledge of the sacred book and follow its instructions will be blessed with great power and wisdom. However, it is also warned that those who misuse this knowledge or attempt to use it for evil purposes will suffer terrible consequences. The secrets of this book should be guarded carefully and shared only with those who are worthy of its teachings. In summary, the Book of the Cow is a profound and mysterious text that contains the secrets of alchemy and the creation of a powerful substance. By following its instructions and respecting its teachings, one can unlock the hidden powers of the universe and achieve great wisdom and success. Okay, so that was it. Now I know it's not perfect, but we're fairly positive that that is the Book of the Cow, and it seems to be not that far off, but wow. It's talking about some pretty insane stuff. We're being told these supernatural gifts that come with the creation of a homunculus. The ability to see into the spirit world, but it gets deeper. The ability to conquer the planets and reality itself. Also, the text seems to be using cryptic terms as the creation of the cow. There's no specific term for homunculus used, and or this may be a translation error. But I just want to make it very clear to people who may not know that much about GPT-4, but there's no way it just made all that up. And if you go try to do the same, it won't even get remotely close to anything like that. Also, we did no editing whatsoever to the output. That was all from the text that was provided in Latin. So this is one of the strangest books ever. 
and hopefully in the future we can get Latin translators to assist us in getting a final approved version with no errors. However, some of the things discussed in the book are just insane, including gaining the abilities to read minds and have access to the spirit realm. We can see why such a text would be hoarded, and this isn't the full version. We're seeing a text that was hidden within some massive medicine book, which may have been difficult to find really, a way for keeping certain texts hidden. It would seem the homunculus is much deeper than simply a little human in a flask, experimented with by medieval alchemists who most mainstream historians consider to just be imaginative madmen. But we've seen that the foundation of science comes from alchemy and that many reputable scientists in the early formation of the scientific method were intrigued and fascinated by the concept of the homunculus. It seems that this topic goes further back than just the medieval ages and that it was an ancient occult ritual practiced by secret occult orders. The homunculus was the greatest secret of not only the alchemist, but perhaps the church, as Jesus himself was a homunculus. This was shown through the ancient knowledge of spontaneous generation and the ancient rituals of generating bees from the carcass of an ox or horse, as with Begonia. This was the secret symbol of the ritualistic creation of artificial life. The ancient alchemists used this knowledge to create all sorts of hybrid creatures and monsters, eventually realizing that the process of creating a homunculus itself is tainted and can be dangerous, resulting in the creation of a demonic being. Ancient philosophers, using the scientific method, devised a method for curing this disease and creating a pure homunculus, as with the cosmic man by the master alchemist Ankabutha. This knowledge came from ancient times. It was passed from Greek Coptic text to Arabic, then to Latin, where it was learned by the monks in the church. This early time period of the ancient Greeks and Romans, who practiced their own unique rituals of creating a homunculus, are not as ancient as we're told. One solid proof of this is the frescoes themselves, the use of advanced medieval painting techniques and perspective, along with the same alchemical symbols. These practices were kept secret under initiation, and these rites are ancient in origin going back to strange fertility cults involving gruesome ceremonies and initiation. It would seem that there was a great power, possibly allowing the gift of making miracles occur. Perhaps the homunculus is a huge missing piece to how magic works, and there are even multiple levels to that. The occult double body or body of light allows you to directly influence the astral realm which would be considered a neophyte level ability. However, the creation of a supernatural physical homunculus created from talismanic astrological energies can create a physical cage or capture the planets and stars into a physical form. By doing this, they can cause certain magical events to happen. This practice is a black magic form of the homunculus, using it to create powerful planetary god humans that have special gifts and powers. But over time, this knowledge slipped into the hands of the church, or perhaps it was stolen. After a reset occurred, now we know that the alchemists were indeed trying to influence comets and astrological events. Maybe the homunculus was one of the means into causing certain resets. After this, whoever held this knowledge ruled the world, because they had the ability to create humans. With this knowledge, the church would then have the ability to create entire orders and populations of people they realized this was their golden egg. They could create Madonna's child for the king and eventually had mastered this secret. This was the means in which they would destroy and reseed populations, the story of Noah and Abraham. The Abrahamic religions were created. The art of the ritualistic creation of artificial life was the highest secret. This knowledge started with the early Phoenician Canaanite priests deciding to use this ancient wisdom for a hijack. This knowledge was used to create a divine homunculus, Jesus, and I believe he did exist, and they had multiple Jesus divine homunculi. Think about it, Jesus had miraculous powers and was born of a virgin, he can bring the heavens down, and he causes the reset on the last judgment on his second coming. This is all symbolism from the book of the cow. Remember the Ripley scroll? They found secret wisdom, kept everything secret, let out the parcels in exoteric format, and then used this knowledge to repopulate ancient cities that were taken over after cataclysms. 
what are the implications of all of this if it's true? Well, for me, it allows a deeper insight into the minds of the medieval writers and painters. It shows how deep the mysteries truly can be, and they have been pondered upon in a similar manner by medieval artists for centuries. This topic expands far more than just alchemy from the 15th to 16th centuries. We're talking about a lost ancient science that then after a hijack got turned into occult ritualistic practices, and then from there, it was converted into religion. The homunculus is a divine principle, just like magic. It is a talisman, the collection of divine energies into physical form. But it is also the union of opposites, soul and moon, creating our harmonized being, the balancing of both positive and negative forces. It's the ability to create astral forms and project intelligence into them, or even to use for astral projection. But we shall not leave this video concluding that the homunculus is purely metaphysical or philosophical. It was also possible literally. As above, so below. There are many more things to discuss, and this video really only scratches the surface. I wanted to give another final shout out to Juan on Juan. Please go send him some love as he really assisted us with notes and research, so I'm very thankful. I would also like to thank Hathmas, the Spanish translator for the channel. If you're Spanish, make sure to check that out. He also assisted with editing and researching which really helped trying to finalize this. This was a big project and I appreciate everyone for their assistance. If you want to support us, please come check out our website and subscribe so that we can keep you guys updated, check out our translation channels, and also if you want to join the community, share knowledge, or even shoot us a message, come check out the MU Discord. With that, we hope you all enjoyed the video. It's important to always treat this knowledge with respect and to never abuse. Stay curious, and may our minds be unveiled. Let go of everything you think to be true. Relax the mind and ask the question, do I truly understand what this reality is?